Zap, download it now. Reporting from near the epicenter of the worst earthquake to hit Morocco, I'm Tom Sufi Burridge. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, Israeli forces raid Gaza's largest hospital. Why the IDF says it's focused on that building, plus what officials say about new progress made on a possible deal to free hostages. The high-stakes summit for President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. What to expect as the two meet face-to-face -face for the first time in more than a year. Chaos at the Capitol amid a breakthrough vote. The next steps after the House passed a bill to keep the government running, plus the altercations before the vote, including a near fist fight in the Senate. And the mystery illness found in hundreds of dogs nationwide. We'll hear from two vets on how to keep your dogs safe. But we begin with Israeli forces raiding Gaza's biggest hospital. Israel says it's carrying out an hours-long, quote, targeted operation at Al-Shifa Hospital, claiming Hamas is using the building to support its military. Meanwhile, a source says progress is being made on a hostage deal and a breakthrough could come within days. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman is outside Ramla, Israel, where protesters are demanding the release of hostages held by Hamas. The Israeli military raiding Al-Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa Hospital. And releasing these videos, they say, show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital, where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering, according to the Hamas-run Ministry of Health, which also shared these images they say are from inside the hospital amid the raid, that ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around al-Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. We do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the al-Shifa hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within al-Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed-out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The Children's Hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. Dan, this is a march for the families of the hostages being held in Gaza. They're walking all the way from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. There are hundreds of marchers here. You can see this giant Israeli flag. They won't rest until they're back home. They won't rest until they're back home, they say. And we understand that progress is being made on a sizable deal for some of the hostages, about a quarter of the 239. It could be just two to three days away. We understand that the decision is now with the officials from Hamas inside Gaza. But there is some concern from U.S. officials that the raid on the Al-Shifa hospital could jeopardize that or something else might jeopardize that at the very last minute. Diane.
All right, Matt Gutman in Israel. Matt, thank you. And President Biden is set to meet with China's leader Xi Jinping today for the first time in more than a year. They'll meet face to face at a summit in San Francisco. U.S. officials say the leaders are going into that meeting with tempered expectations, hoping to manage tensions and reopen lines of communication. ABC News Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce is traveling with the president. Well, this is a high stakes and highly choreographed meeting. Every detail of this has been meticulously planned for weeks. And now the moment is almost finally here. In just a few short hours, President Biden and Chinese President Xi will sit down to talk for the first time in over a year as Biden tries to reshape this complicated relationship amid mounting tensions. We are told they're expected to meet for over four hours and discuss a wide range of issues, including growing economic competition between the two countries, concerns over Taiwan and Chinese military aggression. The wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, of course, will also be top of mind. Biden is expected to urge Xi to use his influence over Iran to try and stop Tehran's proxies from attacking U.S. forces in the region. But, Diane, don't expect any major announcements to come today. The White House is already downplaying expectations, in fact, but they are hoping for a win to reopen lines of communication. The president hoping to reestablish military to military communication that was severed last year. Biden saying he wants to be able to simply pick pick up the phone, speak directly during times of crisis. The goal, of course, is to be able to prevent any future conflict, Diane. All right, Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce, thank you. And while expectations for the meeting are low, experts tell our senior White House Correspondent Selena Wang there are several things President Xi is hoping to get out of that summit. There is deep mistrust between the U.S. and China. China's leader Xi Jinping is skeptical of America and believes that the U.S. is trying to contain China's rise. But he's willing to come to the table for several reasons. For one, experts tell me that he wants reassurances that the U.S. does not support Taiwan's independence. Second, he wants the U.S. to slow down export controls on advanced computer chips, which have had a big impact on China's tech ambitions. And third, she wants to show the world that China is open for business. He's dealing with a deep economic slowdown back home with rising unemployment and a sharp slowdown in foreign investment. For American companies doing business in China, operating there is becoming much riskier. Some companies have faced fines, raids, and greater government pressure from the Chinese. President Biden's goal of having this meeting with Xi Jinping is to restore military to military communications and to simply make it easier for these two leaders to pick up the phone and talk to each other when there's a major crisis. Xi Jinping shares that desire for greater stability, but beyond that, this meeting is not going to lead to any changes in the fundamental differences between these two leaders. Xi Jinping has a very different worldview. He's consolidated power in every facet of Chinese society. I lived through those changes when I was based there. He's an authoritarian leader who is trying to reshape the global order to benefit China's rise. Diane? Senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, thank you. And the race is on to avert a government shutdown. The Senate has to act before Friday deadline after the House passed a bill last night to keep the government running. But a lot of the focus wasn't on the critical vote, but rather on the behavior of members of Congress, from elbows allegedly thrown to name-calling and nearly a fist fight in the Senate. Senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest from Capitol Hill. Congress is one step closer to averting a government shutdown. The bill is passed. The House passing a short-term bill to keep the government funded through early next year. But the new speaker, Mike Johnson, faced significant opposition from his own party. Congressman Jordan, are you going to be supporting this plan? I don't think so. I think we're surrendering. 93 Republicans voting no. What did you tell those members who call your plan a mistake, who say it's a surrender? It's, we're not surrendering, we're fighting, but you have to be wise about choosing the fight. Johnson's bill passing with more support from Democrats than Republicans. Last month, the same move cost Kevin McCarthy his job, leading to weeks of paralysis and party infighting. And tensions clearly still running high. Congressman Tim Burchett, one of the eight Republicans who ousted the former speaker, accusing McCarthy of elbowing him in the kidneys. What kind of chicken move is that? You're, you're pathetic, man. You are so pathetic. And, you know, it was deliberate. It was just a it was just a cheap shot by a bully. McCarthy denying it ever happened. Did you elbow him? Okay, no, I did not elbow him. No, I would not elbow him. I would not hit him in a kidney. Across the Capitol in a Senate hearing on unions, Republican Senator Mark Wayne Mullen of Oklahoma challenging the witness, the president of the Teamsters, to a physical fight. You want to do it now? I'd love to do it right now. Well, stand your butt up then. You stand your butt up. Oh, hold on. Oh, oh, stop it. 
Is that your solution? Committee Chair oh. Bernie Sanders no, no, immediately down. jumping in. No, no, sit down. Sorry, Eric, sit down. Okay. You know, you're a United States senator. The sit scenes down. leaving other lawmakers it's embarrassed. Holding. There are dumb days on, on Capitol Hill, and there are dumber days on Capitol Hill. And this is one of the dumbest I've seen in quite a long time. <laughs> Confrontations like those are becoming more and more common here on Capitol Hill, but lawmakers do have a lot of work to do. And the first order of business in the Senate will be getting that bill on the floor to avert a government shutdown before the Friday deadline. Diane. All right, Jill Scott on Capitol Hill. Thank you. And six people, including three teenagers, are dead after a fiery crash on an Ohio highway. The chain reaction crash sent a semi truck slamming into a charter bus carrying 54 high school students. Alex Prashe has the latest. Investigators looking into what caused this fiery crash that left six people dead, including three teens, just east of Columbus, Ohio. We are being advised that there is children trapped on the bus. First responders rushing to the scene, urging students to jump out of the window. <laughs> Seconds later, an explosion. Officials say a chain reaction caused five vehicles to collide. One of them was a semi-truck slamming into this charter bus carrying the Tusky Valley Marching Band. 17-year-old Samantha Bossler, a saxophone player, was on the bus. There was immediate flames from the truck in the back. There's different stuff flying up on us. And we realized that what happened and looked around and there was a lot of kids stuck in seats. Of the three teens killed, the youngest was 15. Police confirming at least three other people were killed in a car that was also involved in the crash. And more than a dozen others were taken to hospitals. Samantha says she's okay. I just happened to choose the right seats. The charred remains of that bus towed away from the scene. Diane, the injured were taken to seven area hospitals, including here at Nationwide Children's. Now, the NTSB has a team on the ground here investigating in Ohio, and that truck company for the semi involved says that it's cooperating with authorities. Diane? Alex Prache in Columbus, Ohio, thank you. Coming up, thousands of Starbucks employees are set to strike across the country. Why it's happening and what it means for the company's famous Red Cup Day. Also ahead, the price of victory is high in the sports world, but so is the equipment. How two women are helping ease the financial burden for student athletes. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop, stop. Hey, hey, hey. Everybody was scared that you were showing up till right now. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real-life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind-boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. People in southwestern Iceland are being given one last chance to get pets and belongings and get out. As officials warn, a volcano could erupt at any moment. The warning comes after thousands of earthquakes hit the region. Foreign correspondent James Longman is in Iceland with more. Thousands of earthquakes. That's what officials in Iceland say has alerted them to what they call an imminent volcanic eruption and the significant likelihood it'll happen soon. Cracks in roads have opened up, steam pouring out of the ground as seismic activity intensifies in the southwestern part of the country. Over 700 quakes have struck in just the last day and more than 20,000 since October 25th. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma bubbling underground, threatening the small town of Grindavik. Authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people. We provide support and information when people are scared, they need that. Our cameras seeing multiple eruptions over the years in Iceland are Will Reeve, up close and personal in 2021. Look there, all that lava coming out, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And back in 2010, another volcano erupted and it disrupted air travel for days. Hi, Diane. Yeah, we're about as close as anyone can get to the town of Grindavik, the town that was evacuated close uh, to the volcano. Uh, the volcano itself is in the plains there behind me. But on Friday when all this began, and there have been thousands of volcanoes since then, people rushed out of their homes as quickly as they could, and they left a lot of stuff behind. So now, Authorities are giving them the chance to come back. They're being given five-minute intervals to run into their homes, pick up anything they can, and get out again, including animals. Pets uh, were left behind. And we've seen some people bringing trailers with them uh, to get some of those animals that they've uh, left behind in the town. There's huge cracks have opened up now through Grindavik. There's this nine-mile vault, which has basically opened up beneath the, the ground, where lava is rising. And the concern, of course, is that more of these cracks emerge as the seismic activity uh, worsens. Uh, but people, it's really obviously a race against time before uh, this volcano erupts and this lava moves into this area. There is a power station not far from here which provides power. It's a geothermal power station for Reykjavik, the capital. And there's concern that lava uh, could reach that power station. So teams are working night and day to build a wall around it to try to stop the lava from getting to it. Diane. All right, James Longman in Iceland. Stay safe, James. Thank you. And thousands of Starbucks workers are getting ready to go on strike. It's being called the Red Cup Rebellion, and it would impact hundreds of stores across the country. ABC's Whit Johnson has the latest. It's expected to be the biggest strike ever for unionized Starbucks baristas. That Red Cup Rebellion is planned for tomorrow on Red Cup Day, a massively popular promotional event when Starbucks gives out those holiday-themed reusable cups, typically one of the most profitable days of the year for the company. Thousands of unionized workers from hundreds of locations across the country are set to walk off the job. They're accusing Starbucks of refusing to bargain over staffing and other issues at a time when the company announced record sales. The union rep representing the baristas is demanding Starbucks turn off mobile ordering on future promotion days, saying the influx of customers without additional staffing creates unnecessarily stressful working conditions. Starbucks releasing a statement saying we are aware that Workers United has publicized a day of action at a small subset of our stores this week. We remain committed to working with all partners and alleging that Workers United hasn't agreed to meet to progress contract bargaining in more than four months. So both sides blaming each other. And this, of course, comes on what has been a record year for organized labor from the auto industry to actors and writers in Hollywood, workers across the country demanding change. With Johnson, thank you. Coming up, the stunning new development in the murder of a Florida state law professor, why his former mother-in-law has been arrested nearly a decade later. But first, leveling the playing field, how two women are helping ease the financial burden of youth sports so everyone can play. 
next. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families front. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop. Stop. Hey, 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 hey. Everybody was scared that you were showing up till right now. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real-life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind-boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head. That night, everything changed. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. I'm Mo Lenghi in Beirut, and wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, some American families spend thousands of dollars a year just to put one child in one sport. But what happens when you can't afford that? As part of our special Education Week series, senior national correspondent Steve Osinsami sat down with two women on a mission to ensure that any student who wants to play can. It's a Friday night game before the high school playoffs north of Atlanta. And there are at least a dozen teenagers from both teams, including cheerleaders, who have something important in common. Their families can afford to let them play thanks to these two women cheering from the stands. Last count, we've helped over 1,300 kids. Allison Giddens and her mother Donna Krejci started something special after a heart attack stole the life of Allison's father and Donna's husband in 2009. Dave Krejci was a local sports fan who couldn't find a little league or after school program he didn't love. So they thought the best way to honor him was to start raising money to help student athletes and their families. A lot of people don't realize how expensive it is. It's the last thing on a person who's already struggling with a budget. Yep. That comes last. Sports. You know, roof over the head. Right. Food, clothes, yep. you know, medical. What, yep. what else is on the list? Oh, by the way, Mom, I need $250 to play basketball. Yep. We've helped with helmets. One high school that specifically was turning kids away because they didn't have enough helmets. Many American families can spend thousands of dollars a year to put just one child in just one sport. What about jerseys? Jerseys are $120 a piece. Shane Queen is head football coach at one of the high schools here and says the mother and daughter have helped more than 100 of his kids stay on his team. Get over the by covering the registration fees that student athletes have to pay. And on his varsity team, that's more than $400 a year. We want our kids to know we'll find the money somewhere, some way. We saw a tear in his eye as he explained how he could relate back when he was the young athlete in these photos. Well, I do remember a certain time I wanted to play an extra season of baseball, and my dad was a truck driver and he couldn't afford it. And I had a necklace that my uncle had given me and I had to sell it to play sports. What are some of the fees that you're seeing that you guys are covering? Cheerleading is, a, is very expensive. Uh, we can see around here that could be $1,500. And you guys will cover 
portion or all of that for a child? A portion of it, yes. Portion. The idea is so that there always has to be a little bit of buy-in from a parent. Then we know the kid's a little more likely to show up to practice. Right. Mom or dad right. or grandma will make right. sure of it. How do you raise money? We've held a softball tournament. We had a 5K run. But we'll even do things for just the adults. You know, we'll have a wine tasting. And people want to give where they can see immediate impact. We make sure that the kids in the donors' backyards get help. One of those kids in the backyard is eight-year-old Jackson Schellinger, whose father died a few years ago. He's always going to remember this, always. And he tells me all the time, Mommy, thank you, thank you, thank you. Another is 11-year-old Cameron Major, whose mother says her son is absolutely a better student because of football. She just wishes his feet would stop growing. If you jump to an 11 and a half. That's another expense. You have to. Buy some more cleats. Are you putting your mama in the cleat business <laughs> <laughs> with these growing feet? <laughs> absolutely. You know? The parents, teachers, and after-school programs that are getting this help all underline that it's more than just fun and games for the kids. They're learning how to overcome disappointment. Oh, we didn't win. They're learning perseverance. They're learning so much from just this little opportunity to play a little basketball, do a little martial arts, or whatever that is. If you think of growing up as playing a sport, that's where you learn how to win and lose. That's when you get some of your best friends. I love the idea of other people in other cities copying this idea run with it. I don't own the idea. Every time the two of you see one of your kids in action or in a photo, I bet you you're smiling at the heavens and thinking of your dad, your husband. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. He'd get a kick out of it. Oh, he would. Our thanks to Steve Ose and Sami for that report. Coming up, the mystery illness affecting hundreds of dogs nationwide, the symptoms to look out for and how to keep your puppy safe. Also ahead, protecting your immune system. Dr. Patel shares ways you can stay healthy this holiday season. Plus, preparing for Thanksgiving can be a headache, but our group chat is here to help. We've got tips on budgeting, cooking hacks, and even how to navigate those tricky political conversations at the table. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. 
do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at New York City on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Israeli troops are storming Gaza's largest hospital, saying Hamas fighters are operating in tunnels underneath. Israel is calling it a targeted operation, saying they're taking steps to not harm civilians. Hamas says it holds the U.S. responsible for giving Israel the green light for what it calls a massacre against civilians. Meanwhile, a senior Israeli official says a deal could be within reach uh, within days to release more hostages being held by Hamas. Prosecutors in Georgia are seeking an emergency protective order in the election interference case against former President Trump and several co-defendants. The Fulton County DA's office is asking a judge to guard the evidence in the case after videos of confidential interviews with four defendants were obtained by news organizations. ABC News was first to report on portions of videos showing former Trump's attorney Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis telling prosecutors about their efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Ellis says one of Trump's top aides told her Trump would refuse to step down, saying he's, quote, is not going to leave under any circumstances. The judge is set to hold a hearing this afternoon. Closing arguments are expected today in the trial against the man accused of attacking former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer. Suspect David DePap took the stand yesterday, claiming he broke into Pelosi's home, trying to get to the bottom of an election conspiracy theory, but that when Nancy Pelosi wasn't home, he reacted and attacked Paul Pelosi instead. He's pleaded not guilty and faces life in prison if convicted. And it was a fighting start to last night's NBA game between the Timberwolves and the Warriors. Neither team had scored a point yet when the night's basket brawl broke out. It started with Klay Thompson and Jaden McDaniels getting into it at midcourt and ended with this viral moment of Warriors Draymond Green putting one of the Timberwolves in a chokehold. All three players were ejected. The Timberwolves ended up winning 104 to 101. And just one week after a Florida dentist was convicted in the murder of an FSU law professor, his mother is now charged in the plot. Police say the 73-year-old was arrested as she was boarding a flight in an attempt to flee the country. ABC's Victor Kendo is at Miami International Airport with the details. Nearly a decade after a prominent FSU law professor was shot and killed in a murder-for-hire plot, this morning, a shocking new development. Ma'am, you were arrested on a warrant from Leon County, Florida. Dan Markell's former mother-in-law, Donna Adelson, now facing murder charges. The 73-year-old arrested at Miami International Airport Monday night after attempting to board a one-way flight to Vietnam. She was apprehended on the jetway getting on that plane. She had literally checked in and was walking into the plane. 41-year-old Markell was gunned down in the driveway of his Tallahassee home in 2014 while in a bitter custody battle with his ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, who wanted to relocate their two boys to South Florida to be closer to her family. But Markell refused. That's why prosecutors say the Adelson family took matters into their own hands. So who did it appear had a motive to want Dan Markell dead? His own family. Just last week, Wendy's brother, Charles Adelson, was convicted for Markell's murder. The Florida dentist also found guilty of soliciting and conspiring with two hitmen to carry it out. Now prosecutors say their mother, Donna, helped arrange that murder plot, too. In this police surveillance video, an undercover FBI agent confronts Adelson and demands more money after the murder. Investigators say she later made this call to her son. That's some paperwork hand-delivered to me. Does it involve me or other people? Well, probably those people. According to the probable cause affidavit obtained by ABC News, Donna spoke to Charles in multiple jail calls over the past week where she told him she was getting things in order creating trust and making sure her grandchildren are taken care of. She even discussed plans for suicide or fleeing to a non-extradition country. 
Soon after, prosecutors claimed she booked that one-way flight to Vietnam with the layover in Dubai. When we found that she was leaving the country, extradition would have been an issue. And that was when the decision was made that we needed to kind of expedite. Adelson appearing before a Miami judge Tuesday morning, being held without bond. The Markell family not commenting on her arrest, but telling ABC News in September how relieved they were after Charles was arrested. Because it's taken so long. We want the people that are involved to pay the price. Both Donna and her daughter Wendy, Markel's ex, have previously denied any involvement in the crime. Wendy has never been charged. Diane? Victor Okendo at Miami International Airport for us. Thanks, Victor. And a mysterious illness is affecting dogs across the country. The respiratory sickness can be deadly if left untreated. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has more on what symptoms to watch for and what veterinarians are recommending. While research is still underway, vets calling the illness highly contagious and in some cases fatal. Most reported symptoms are similar to those of a typical kennel cough, including coughing, sneezing, nasal and or eye discharge and lethargy. Instead of that dry cough where the dog felt good, it was now this wet cough where the dog felt sick. Idaho dog owner Wendy Brown says her three golden retrievers, Bridge, Dooley and Lulu, each started showing symptoms earlier this month. Dooley started doing kind of this huffing and also seemed to feel quite lethargic. And not too long after, Bridge began to exhibit the symptoms. At first, Brown thought it was just a typical kennel cough, but when the symptoms didn't go away, she knew it was something more serious. And the vet started him on a 10-day cycle of doxycycline. Uh, today was day 10, and he is not a lot better. Brown says she's still in the dark as to what caused the illnesses in the first place. Experts say dogs showing any signs of consistent coughing is a good reason to get them checked out. We can ultrasound the lungs to see if there's a problem that is related to pneumonia or uh, the contagious pneumonia that seems to be going around. Now, if your dog does get sick, Dr. Kavanaugh says it's really important to keep that coughing dog away from other dogs, just like you would people. And she says you should do that for two weeks after the cough goes away so you don't spread it. Diane? All right, good tips, Eva Pilgrim. Thank you. And for more, let's bring in doctors Terrence Ferguson and Bernard Hodges, veterinarians and co-stars on National Geographic's Critter Fixers. Doctors, thank you both for being on. I know a lot of pet owners are really concerned right now. So, Dr. Ferguson, let's start with you. What do we know about this illness, and how concerned do you think dog owners need to be right now? Well, definitely right now it's a mystery. You know, um, going through this season, we often have a lot of respiratory disease that we have in dogs, but, you know, having one that we're not quite sure about kind of, you know, changes things. We have to try to figure out how do we treat these things, how severe they are, or, you know, how they're spreading. Dr. Hodges, uh, this illness can be deadly if left untreated. So what symptoms specifically do dog owners need to keep an eye out for? And what do you do if you start noticing them? So we definitely want to kind of look out for any kind of, you know, excessive coughing, eye discharge, any, you know, if we start to have a fever, difficulty breathing, any, any nasal discharge or lethargy. And if you start seeing these things, definitely get your animal to a veterinarian because you know, this is a mystery disease and it could, uh, you know, become fatal. Dr. Ferguson, what do we know about how this disease is spreading? Should dog owners be avoiding kennels and dog parks right now? Well, you know, at this point, we're not quite sure because it's still one of those mystery diseases. But if we look back on other illnesses that we have, like some of the influenza virus that we have, we definitely know they're spread by, you know, direct contact or sneezing. So if it's in an area where you're having an outbreak, I would definitely say probably avoid those um having your dog in a kennel or going to the groomer those are some of the things you may want to not do right now until we kind of figure this out and uh, get a little bit better control on it and, and dr hodges what are some small everyday things you think pet owners can do to keep our pets healthy so one of the things definitely you know vaccination is the key you know bordetella which causes kennel cough as well as flu Flu is a relatively new one. It kind of threw veterinarians for a loop a few years ago. And then it, just like our viruses, it mutated. So we got a second strain of the flu. So definitely vaccinate your, your pets. Make sure that, you know, when you take them out, that they're, in, you know, they're going around areas that there are a whole lot of pet population that are sneezing and coughing. You know, and just, just like with us, make sure that you proper, you make sure that you have regular veterinary checks and they're well vaccinated. 
All right, Doctors Terrence Ferguson, Bernard Hodges, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. Coming up, protecting your immune system. Dr. Patel shares ways you can stay healthy this holiday season. Also ahead, preparing for Thanksgiving can be a headache, but our group chat is here to help. We've got tips on budgeting, cooking hacks, even how to navigate those tricky political conversations at the table. Stay with us. Tonight, the high stakes face-to-face, -face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, A Killer Confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. It's time now for Patel It Like It Is, where Dr. Alok Patel shares health advice on the topics that matter most to you. Today, we're talking about five ways to take care of your immune system this holiday season. Here's Dr. Patel with his top tips. Raise your hand if you've seen a claim that a pill, potion, or powder can boost your immune system. You know what I'm talking about. I'm Dr. Alok Patel, an ABC News medical contributor, physician, and I'm all about supporting our immune systems, but by tried and true methods. My ABC family is gonna show you five things you can do every day to support your immune system. Let's go. Get moving! Regular exercise and maintaining a healthy weight is not only good for your heart, it reduces the risk of several diseases and directly supports the cells of your immune system. It's not that hard to incorporate movement in your everyday, is it? <laughs> Prioritize sleep. Sleep loss can mess with your immune system. So try to get seven to nine hours each night. And part of getting good sleep is developing good sleep habits and a solid bedtime routine. Just ask ABC News anchor and correspondent Diane Macedo, author of The Sleep Fix. Sweet dreams. Try and chill out a little. We live very hectic lives and stress can impair your immune system's ability to fight off infections. Try meditation, yoga, journaling, anything to put your body in relaxation mode. Even a little bit a day can make a difference. Eat a healthy diet that is full of vitamins and minerals. If your immune system could talk, it would say, please feed me vitamins A, D, C, E, B6, B12, zinc, iron, copper, selenium, all that good stuff. Help it out. Fill your plate with a rainbow of fruits and vegetables and not so full of processed and fatty foods. Now, in some cases, your doctor may recommend you take a vitamin or a supplement, but generally speaking, you want to stick with real foods. Stay up to date with checkups and vaccines. Your body, the machine, needs fine tuning and upgrades every now and then. So managing any health conditions, getting regular checkups, and staying up to date with shots can ensure your body's in peak performance and ready to handle any invaders that come its way. Have you gotten your flu shot yet? You know it. See, there's no gimmicks here. 
Just habits you've probably heard of that would make your parents very proud. And your immune system will love you and thank you by strapping on gloves and boxing out any threats that come your way. So stay nourished, stay active, but also rested and stress-free. And chat with your doctor if you have any questions. Stay healthy, everyone. And Dr. Alok Patel joins me now for more on this. Dr. Patel, let's do a little cold and flu rapid fire here. So products marketed as immune boosting or immune supplements, are they legit? I'm glad that you did this because typically they are not. If they're not FDA approved, a lot of them do not have the science to back their claims. And often these are marketed as things that are going to boost your immune system when natural methods like the ones we talked about are best. You want to go through and read all of them and, and kind of identify what might be in them. There is some evidence to suggest that zinc could reduce the duration of symptoms, but it's mixed reviews on vitamin C, elderberry, and everything else you see in the aisle, in the grocery store, or the pharmacy. So what does science show about stress and immunity? So acute or chronic stress can actually impair our ability to fight off infections. It puts our bodies in an inflammatory state, and this is not a good thing for many aspects of our health, including our ability to stay safe this holiday season, which is why it's so important to try is to chill out a little bit, the... take deep breaths, and make sure you get shot some, on some sleep. So let's say you start to feel sick, you feel run down, you're not really sure what it is. What would you immediately do? What I immediately do is I think about any exposures I may have had. If I exposed someone with COVID-19, with the flu, I try to think about the symptoms. Is it allergies? Is it my sinus? And then I immediately go to what gives me symptomatic relief, including my neti pot, honey for coughs. That's a great tip for parents of kids above the age of one. And those lozenges or those sore throat drops. Now, with the potential rise in RSV, flu, and COVID, do you recommend people wear masks in crowded areas again? So personally speaking, I keep a mask with me now? because you never know when you're going to be in a situation when you're in a crowded area and the person next to you is sneezing or coughing. But it's really important that with RSV, influenza and COVID, people pay attention to the fact that we have vaccines available for certain age groups, flu and COVID for nearly everyone. But with RSV for young children, pregnant women and adults above the age of 60. So that is our best form of preventing severe disease. So uh, one more uh, myth buster perhaps for you. Can being physically cold or spending long amounts of time in cold, can that give you a cold? I can hear my mom and all my aunties right now saying like, don't go outside without a jacket, you're gonna catch a cold. Colds, respiratory viruses actually come from infections, not from physically shivering and being cold. Now being cold could put you at a disadvantage in terms of fighting off infections. Sometimes when you're cold, you might go inside and be in a crowded room with people who may also give you an infection as well. So it's not necessarily the temperature that's gonna cause the virus to enter your body. But one last thing I will add, and I will add this again and again and again, is that sleep and hydration are so incredibly important. Do not neglect those two this holiday season. All right, I amen to that, Dr. Patel. Thank you. And remember, you. Dr. Patel is here to take your questions, so just leave a message on our Instagram feed at ABC News Live, and he might answer your question right here on Friday. Meanwhile, for the first time, Courtney Cox and Matt LeBlanc are sharing personal memories of their late friends co-star Matthew Perry. Their tributes come weeks after the cast shared a joint statement after Perry's sudden passing. Chris Connolly is in Los Angeles with more. You don't think we'd buy a house and not have a Joey room, do you? Oh, my God. <laughs> Courtney Cox and Matt LeBlanc sharing for the first time personal memories, laughter. I will not take this abuse. You're right, I'm sorry. Once I was a wooden boy, a little <laughs> and deep feelings for their beloved colleague and close pal, Matthew Perry. I love her. I love her. I love you, Monica. I love you too, Chandler. We're calling treasured times they had together on Friends. I am so grateful for every moment I had with you, Maddie, and I miss you every day. Cox writing on social media, there are thousands of moments I wish I could share. Recounting a favorite scene Harmonica Geller had with Perry's Chandler Bing. To give a little backstory, Chandler and Monica were supposed to have a one-night fling in London. But because of the audience's reaction, it became the beginning of their love story. I think you knew I was here. <laughs> In this scene, Cox recalls, before we started rolling, he whispered a funny line for me to say. The line was too racy for TV, but got a huge laugh. Okay, your turn. No, no, beginning. 
<laughs> he told me to say it. He did. He often did things like that. She concludes he was funny and he was kind. Can I talk to you for a second? And Matt LeBlanc, Joey on Friends, offering right. images of hilarity and hugs. Any chance you're trying to pick a fight to make all of this easier? Oh, dude, you see right through me. <laughs> While paying a From the Heart tribute as well, I will always smile when I think of you, and I'll never forget you. Never. Spread your wings and fly, brother. You're finally free. Much love. And I guess you're keeping the 20 bucks you owe me. That humor and that fondness, a big part of what made this Friends cast feel like a family. Back then and still today. Diane? It sure seems that way. Chris Connolly in Los Angeles, thank you. Coming up, <laughs> helping you prepare for Thanksgiving, how you can save, and tips for the kitchen after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop, stop. Hey, 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 hey. Everybody was scared that you were showing up to Laredo. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real-life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind-boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head. That night, everything changed. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from Miami, I'm Victor Okendo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Thanksgiving is almost a week away, and whether you're celebrating with family or joining a Friendsgiving, it can be a lot to prepare for. So today our group chat is taking on cooking hacks, how to save money, and even ways to keep the conversation civil at the table. I want to bring in ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus, executive chef for the restaurant chain Slutty Vegan, Jim O.K. Jackson, and national etiquette expert Diane Gotsman for more on this. Thank you all for coming on. Happy early Thanksgiving. Alexis, I want to start with the money part because especially with inflation, we've seen grocery prices go, go pretty up. high. So 
How do you save when buying all the stuff you need for Thanksgiving? Go to the store with a shopping list so you don't get distracted is my number one uh, tip. And also, when you get there, choose fresh produce that's in season. That's going to be cheaper, especially this year. Canned string beans, pumpkins, pumpkin um, pie filling, um, cranberries, they're all higher. Scale back the menu. You don't have to have seven sides and four desserts. Use coupons and saving apps. I like Ibotta and Shopkick. They offer rebates and cash back. Use a cash back rewards card if you go shopping. And plan for leftovers because you can get a lot of meals out of Thanksgiving and that'll cost you, save you some money as well. I love the distraction note too. I often will do online pickup or online order because I know once I get in the aisles, it's game Good over. For the you. next thing I know, it's like this. Um, Jumoki, you're known to some as the Bishop of Biscuits. I am. I'm very happy right, to see you brought some this biscuits morning. today. Alexis <laughs> and I are pumped about that. So what are some of your favorite side dishes to include on Thanksgiving? And are there any store-bought hacks for those of us who aren't chefs? Well, semi-made is probably the best way to go. Sure, you mix, right? Hat. You mix and mingle, you jizz it up, you make it your own. And the number one side dish is mashed potatoes. The reason why is because it's so easy to make, right? It's kind of like you put it in a pot and you forget about it. So those dishes that we can kind of combine everything together, stir it up or bake it or cook it on the stovetop and make it, those are the easiest ones to approach. And like you said, fresh produce, I always say quality ingredients to quality results. So you want to pick the things that are in season, fresh, and available to you. Now, Diane, potlucks are a nice way to spread the work, but they can be tricky in terms of figuring out what to bring or, as the host, what to ask for. So what are some potluck etiquette rules? So always check on dietary restrictions and allergies. And especially if you have the allergy, you can ask the host if you can bring something to share with everyone else. And make sure that you're bringing something that isn't going to require the host's oven or stovetop if they don't have enough space. So you might have to heat it gently and when you get there, put it in their oven. So always talk to the host to communicate and ask what is going to be best for them. Ask what they would like rather than surprising them. Yeah, that part about not being in the oven and not being in the way necessarily so huge when you're in the middle of a big meal. Jamoke, turkey we know is the star of the show for Thanksgiving, but not everyone eats meat. So yeah. any suggestions on good centerpieces for the table for those of us who don't? There are so much untraditional things that you can do. And even if I, because I specialize in vegan food, um, even the advancements in uh, protein-based, plant-based uh, plant foods have been phenomenal. So there's things like seafood, crab cakes, fish, um, even staple uh, vegetables you can kind of highlight. Everybody picks a cauliflower steak. You know, things like that you can absolutely make as your centerpiece. It doesn't have to be a turkey. And, and Diane, we're dealing with political tensions, two wars overseas, an upcoming presidential election. There's a lot to argue about. So how do you keep things civil at the table, especially if somebody brings up a hot topic? So I think we all have the responsibility, if we would like, to change a conversation. The host can start out by communicating their request. Let's have a wonderful, memorable experience at the table. I look forward to learning all about what's been happening with all of us. And if it turns ugly, um, then whoever's sitting next to that person or even the host can say, okay, okay, guys, let's, let's table this and let's talk about something more pleasant. So we have to be kind, polite, proactive, and it's not important for us to prove our point at the table. There's there's time and place, but not at the Thanksgiving table or holiday table. Another tip, you can just serve these biscuits because my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> you don't want people talking? Just give them one of these. Mouthful, conversation over. Business reporter Alexis Christophorus, executive chef for oh, Slutty Beat, do it, from OK oh, Jackson. <laughs> Thank you for the, my You're goodness, welcome. these are amazing. And national <laughs> etiquette expert, Diane Gossman. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Mm. Pumpkin? Happy Happy oh, these are sweet wow. potato. Oh, good. Right? Sweet potato. We'll be right back. <laughs> it's a sweet potato. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. Liar murderer and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu.
Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop, stop. Hey, 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 hey. Everybody was scared that you were showing up to Laredo. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real-life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind-boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, Israeli forces raid Gaza's largest hospital. Why the IDF says it's focused on that building, plus what an official says about the new progress made on a deal to free hostages. The high-stakes summit for President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. What to expect as the two meet face-to-face -face for the first time in more than a year. Chaos at the Capitol amid a breakthrough vote. The next steps after the House passed a bill to keep the government running, plus the altercations before the vote, including a near fist fight in the Senate. We begin with Israeli forces raiding Gaza's biggest hospital. Israel says it's carrying out an hours-long targeted operation at Al-Shifa Hospital, claiming Hamas is using the building to support its military. Meanwhile, a source says progress is being made on a hostage deal, and a breakthrough could come within days. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. The Israeli military raiding Al-Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa Hospital. And releasing these videos they say show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital, where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering, according to the Hamas-run Ministry of Health, which also shared these images they say are from inside the hospital amid the raid. That ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around al-Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. We do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the al-Shifa hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within al-Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We're, we're going to bring here 
a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The Children's Hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. And Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman joins me now from Tel Aviv, Israel, for more. Matt, earlier you were outside of Ramla, Israel, walking with protesters, demanding the release of hostages. What do they tell you, and where do these hostage negotiations stand? They were actually marching, Diane, from Tel Aviv all the way to Jerusalem, a five-day march, and they are demanding that Israel release, or that Hamas release, all of the hostages right now. And they're just trying to bring attention to this. What we understand about these hostage negotiations taking place in Doha, but also bouncing between Gaza and Jerusalem, is that there has been significant progress. We're talking about a deal uh, for a quarter of the, host of the 239 hostages, and it could take place in the next few days. Again, it is now with decision makers in Gaza, so getting the information to them, having them execute the decision and getting it back could take some time. There's also the issue of where these hostages are. They've likely been split up, we told, all over parts of Gaza from different factions as well, including the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So it might take time to arrange all of them and then get them to the Red Cross in order to transfer them to Israeli. So this is going to take some time, but we do hear there is progress, Diane. Now, Matt, the head of the United Nations Humanitarian Relief Operations is condemning the IDF's raid at Al Shifa Hospital, saying the protection of newborns, patients, and medical staff, and all civilians has to override all other concerns. How is Israel responding to that, and what more do you know about this operation? Israel says that it is being very targeted, very specific in this raid. They are not going after personnel so much, they said, as much as the infrastructure there. Although we've heard that there are and have been gunfights in the hospital yard, uh, that Israel has been interrogating some people, men, that they found inside. They didn't say if they were Hamas operatives or not. And the doctors there tell us that the situation inside is increasingly dire. Now, Israel says that it deposited some medical supplies there. Um, it's unclear if they're usable without electricity on hand. Um, but Israel is saying it's trying to be very, very directed here and not violate international law. They also say that Hamas operates these tunnels right beneath the hospital, which in itself violates the sanctity of the hospital and international law. And U.S. officials corroborating that, telling us that these are labyrinthine, uh, interconnected tunnels with probably several hundred Hamas operatives working there uh, with communications equipment, booby traps. Um, so this could go on for a long time, Diane. All right, Matt Gutman in Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you. Stay safe. And President Biden is set to meet with China's leader Xi Jinping today for the first time in more than a year. They'll meet face-to-face -face at a summit in San Francisco. U.S. officials say the leaders are going into this meeting with tempered expectations, hoping to manage tensions and reopen lines of communication. ABC's Karen Travers is in San Francisco traveling with the president. She's got more on that now. Uh, Karen, what went into organizing this meeting and preparing for it? Weeks of preparations, Diane, went into this meeting today that is going to take place over a couple of hours just south of San Francisco on the sidelines of an Asian Pacific Leaders Summit here in the city. And, Diane, the White House told me yesterday that there was meticulous planning that went into these meetings, that the president was huddled with senior advisors on the plane yesterday, but there was a lot of preparation that went into this. The choreography is very important for the Chinese side in terms of the greeting that the president will do when President Xi arrives on site today and even what the meeting site will look like. They are expected to be behind closed doors for several hours today. They have a very robust and lengthy agenda to get to. And then after that, President Biden is going to take questions where we'll get a sense of what was accomplished during that meeting. But Diane, White House officials are really downplaying expectations for any major breakthrough. They say this is all about improving the relationship and talking about managing competition between the two countries.
Now, these are two of the biggest economies in the world, Karen, but President mm -hmm. Biden said he welcomes competition, not conflict. So how does he plan to smooth things over to try to achieve one without the other? intense diplomacy. That's what the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said. The White House says they're going to have very frank and direct conversations. These are two leaders that know each other very well. They have met several times, but this conversation today is the first time they've had any direct conflict, uh, contact since their meeting last year in Bali. So it's been a very long time. That's why this meeting is considered to be so high stakes and why they have so much on the agenda. For, but for the president, this is all about face-to-face -face diplomacy. This is something he values very highly. They're going to be talking about Russia's war against Ukraine, the Israel-Hamas war, Iran, also, of course, managing competition between the U.S. and China, and also trying to reestablish military ties between the two countries, military communication. We're told that is the one thing that the president would very much like to see actually accomplished today in terms of walking away from this summit, saying that they got something done. Diane, those two, uh, the two militaries have not had direct communication since August of 2022, and the president would like to see those restored today during these meetings. He's Karen Travers in San Francisco. Karen, thank you. And while expectations for that meeting are low, experts say there are several things President Xi is hoping to get out of the summit. ABC News foreign correspondent Britt Clenet has the latest on that. Hi, Britt. Hi, Diane. Well, expectations might be low ahead of the meeting between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping, but the view from China is somewhat upbeat. State media touting Xi diplomacy and the need to build bridges and coexist peacefully, they say. The hope being that uh, getting relations back on track will also help the country's economy get back on track too. China is becoming frustrated by what it sees as the US refusing to relax trade restrictions. And looming over all of this is Taiwan presidential election in just two months time China is expected to seek a really firm pledge that the US won't kind of deviate from its one China policy or pursue formal independence especially with a candidate it despises as the front runner now I spoke a little earlier to Victor Gao he's a former Chinese diplomat and he said that China really is sending a message that the US should not hollow out or water down its one China policy that really counts to Taiwan as part of it. Taiwan is the reddest of red lines. And another sticking point could be the Ukraine and Middle East wars. China has been growing closer to Iran, which is a supporter of Hamas, but she will be reiterating that China is neutral and renewing China's calls for peace. Diane. All right. Foreign correspondent Brett Clinton, thank you. And the race is on to avert a government shutdown. The Senate has to act before a Friday deadline after the House passed a bill last night to keep the government running. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill. Um, Jay, now that Johnson's bill has passed the House, does it have the support to pass the Senate? Well, there were Senate Democrats who were skeptical about the House Speaker's plan, particularly because of what they called the novelty of it, in that it staggers funding deadlines and has some government funding expiring in mid-January, and then the bulk of the rest of government funding, defense spending, homeland security spending, et cetera, expiring in early February. Nonetheless, there was strong Democratic support for the Speaker's plan last night in that vote on the House floor. More Democrats, frankly, voted for it than Republicans. Republicans because there was opposition amongst hardline Republicans to the speaker's plan. And in the days since that plan was unveiled, in the days since that initial skepticism from Senate Democrats, we've seen Chuck Schumer, the top Democrat in the Senate, as well as Mitch McConnell, the top Republican in that chamber, both come out and say they're behind this plan. Schumer looks poised to put this on the floor any day now. Again, he's got that Friday deadline. We're not exactly sure when the Senate's going to vote for it, but when and if Schumer puts it on the floor, it's expected to pass, Diane. Now, tensions are clearly running high on the Hill, Jay. A congressman is accusing former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy of elbowing him. There was a near fist fight in the Senate. What are lawmakers telling you about that? What is happening there? Well, one of the factors that seems to be playing into this is Congress doesn't work in the way you and I work in that they go on recess for certain weeks in the year and they go to their districts and they fly home on Fridays and they've been working kind of in their version of around the clock over the last few weeks, really since Kevin McCarthy was ousted to try to first get a House Speaker and then avert a government shutdown. And so I've heard from lawmakers who say they just feel kind of burned out. Some of it played out yesterday when Tim Burchett alleges that Kevin McCarthy elbowed in the back. You see the pictures of the two of them 
them there. McCarthy denies that. And then there's that near fist fight between Senator Mark Wayne Mullen and a union leader in a hearing yesterday. Um, one McCarthy ally, Patrick McHenry, weighed in on all of this. Here is what he told one of my colleagues up here. Uh, yes, there are dumb days on, on Capitol Hill, and there are dumber days on Capitol Hill. And this is one of the dumbest I've seen in quite a long time. Dumb days on Capitol Hill, and then dumber days on Capitol Hill. But, Diane, all of it comes as Congress has some serious stuff on its plate, not the least of which is averting a government shutdown. All right, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Jay, thank you. Keep your dukes up. And southern Florida is bracing for heavy rain and flooding over the next 48 hours after record rain fell yesterday. The same storm system is expected to move up the east coast this weekend. ABC's meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. Hi, Samara. Hey, Diane. Good morning. Yeah, this is kind of really just amazing to think about and see. This is Oakland Park, Florida right now. You've got cars just trying to traverse all this water, roadways turning to riverways. And what I meant by this is amazing. Fort Lauderdale, you're on track for your rainiest year on record, okay? So you guys received about 2.7 inches with this most recent system here. So far to date, you're already at 101 inches. That is 44 inches above of the norm where you should be and it's only going to take like around two more inches to make this your rainiest year on record it's not just you we're looking at very heavy rain lining the east coast of florida from miami up to jacksonville orlando also going to get in on that you can see the heavier rain just riding parallel to the east coast of florida anywhere from three to five inches but some spots could see 10 inches of rain so what you're looking at right now is the future cast this shows us where the rain could be in the future as we push through wednesday look this is tomorrow morning 9 a.m. Still seeing rain with the heaviest of it on that Georgia-Florida border there. But we could see some heavy pockets of rain down near Miami as well. Central Florida getting in on that Wednesday, today, and tomorrow. As a result, of course, this would yield flood watches, okay? So we could see flooding. We're, well, we are seeing flooding, and we're likely to see flooding both today and tomorrow, where we could see 10 inches of rain locally in some spots. That's copious amounts of rains, my friend. Now, speaking of rain, we're going to head out to the West Coast. So they got their own thing going on. We have this disturbance. This is a warm core storm system here. So not a ton of snow with this, but still a good amount of rain, depending on where it meanders farther west, maybe less rain for the California coastline. If it moves a little closer east, we could see more rain. Nonetheless, your rain chance lingers through today into the weekend. About one to two inches of rain there. And I will say the bigger story is going to be the wind gusts with 50 mile per hour winds picking up. Speaking of winds headed to the tropics, the grill Jamaica, waves crashing there onto the rock. Well, we could, we will see things pick up in Jamaica as well because we're tracking the tropics. Remember, hurricane season is not over until November 30th. This 50% chance of development down near Central America is going to track into countries like Cuba, Jamaica, Haiti, and DR, bringing them tons of rain through the end of the week. Diane? ABC meteorologist Samara Theodore, thank you. Coming up, school boss... School boards, excuse me, across the country appear to be moving to the left. We'll talk with a Columbia University professor about what's driving the liberal shift in school board elections right after the break. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We've had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back to ABC News Live. School boards across the country appear to be moving to the left after Democrats, liberals, and moderates won seats over conservative candidates in several key states. Education has become a flashpoint issue ahead of the 2024 elections, with fights erupting in school board meetings over how race, sexual orientation, gender, and other topics are handled in the classroom. Now ABC News is marking American Education Week all across the network with a focus on the future of our schools as part of our series, The American Classroom. So let's bring in Sonia Douglas, professor at Columbia University's Teachers College and the founding director of the school's Black Education Research Center for more. Sonia, thanks so much for coming on. What's your reaction to last week's, uh, these elections, and this apparent shift away from conservative school board candidates? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, I think last week's school board elections were a sweeping rejection of conservative efforts to ban the teaching of race, gender, and sexuality in our nation's schools. Um, and they underscore the fact that Americans want to keep the culture wars out of education. Now, parental rights advocates say that they want more of an influence in what their children are taught and have access to at schools. So what's your reaction to some of the proposed book bans and curriculum restrictions that are often centered on topics of race, gender, and sexual orientation? Well, I think that the issue of book bans, um, again, was very much one that's focused on politics. There was, I believe, roughly 11 individuals who have been responsible for the majority of book challenges. Um, over the last couple of school years. Uh, and so at the Black Education Research Center, uh, we also found that most Americans agree that um, the CRT bans are main, ma mostly about politics. And so those attacks have not resonated. Um, we believe that the elections um, last week also showed that and are excited about the fact that most Americans support truth in teaching. So how do you respond to parents who are concerned that schools are moving away from core education and that they should be concentrating less on these topics and more on how students read, how they're writing, their math skills? Yeah, I think those are uh, appropriate concerns, but I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think teaching about these difficult topics, uh, which can be sensitive, are really valuable when we think about um, literacy and, and English um, language arts and even mathematics and science. Um, and so it's important that teachers have the freedom to teach, to teach the truth in all of the content areas. Um, and that that, again, the priority is to ensure that children have access to literacy instruction and other content areas that will allow them to be successful academically. Now, sex education is a big part of this debate. Some parents are concerned that schools are shoving sexual content on children too young. So when do you think it's appropriate to teach children about sex? And do you think it's up to parents or school officials to decide that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great question. Ultimately, I think parents and teachers need to work in partnership and support of children. Um, no matter the topic, I think parents do have to make a decision of what's best for their child. But it is appropriate to teach sex education in schools, especially or only under the only when uh, teachers are trained to do that and to do that in a supportive environment. So I really think um, this is an opportunity to think about how teachers and families and educators work together to support our young people because they really do need our support um, in this post-pandemic era. They sure do. Sonia Douglas, thank you. Thank you for having me. Coming up, the family celebrating the holidays with their honorary grandpa. Why they say they adopted their neighbor and what it means to the 82-year-old. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
Give it to me. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through? to get to his target. I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. A family in Rhode Island is getting ready to celebrate the holidays with their honorary grandpa. The family of seven said their 82-year-old neighbor welcomed them to the new neighborhood. Now they've welcomed him to their family. Here's their story. Last year, we purchased our, home, our first home. My husband and his cousins came over to, like, you know, renovate the house. And Paul seen them renovate, and he came across the street and introduced himself and allowed my husband to use one of his ladders. And then the rest is history. <laughs> I like people. It's easy to like people. I always tell people, you know, it's you got to work at being nasty, but it's easy to be nice. I worked on a plant with five with five thousand people, and when they had a problem, it was get Paul. You can imagine what that's like. We was kind of afraid to move into a na new neighborhood. We have five kids. They loud. They play. They run. They jump. And when you buy a home, you just can't up and move if you and your neighbors don't get along. So we was definitely nervous to move into our neighborhood. He came over one day with car seats. I have two little ones, so he's like, I got two brand new car seats in my car. And I feel like ever since then, like he's been here like every other day, like we spend holidays together. Um, Father's Day just recently passed. You know, we purchased him a Father's Day gift. Paul's really part of our family. When Paul comes over and the kids run up to him, right? Yeah. They run up to him. They just, they love Paul. They love Paul. Paul's like a grandfather to them at this point. He blow, will blow bubbles with them. He'll push them on their tricycle, play with them with the cards and stuff. So he's very entertaining with them. My children and Paul get along very, very well. I, sometimes I don't get halfway across the street and I got a child hanging onto the leg. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you a nice warm feeling when somebody else treats you like that. So many people reach out to me and like, oh my God, I can't stand my neighbor. Like, you're so lucky. We are very lucky. We are very blessed to have a neighbor like Paul. It definitely reinforced my um, faith in people because when I tell you that we, neither one of us see color, neither one of us see age, she's literally just a great, he's not even a neighbor at this point, he's a family. Just give your neighbors a chance. We have lovely neighbors across the board. I think God planted us here for a reason, but there's something special about Paul. How cute are they? Our thanks to our friends at GMA Digital for that story. And you can find more feel-good stories at goodmorningamerica.com. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. 
to crush the families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at New York City on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Israeli troops are storming Gaza's largest hospital, saying Hamas fighters are operating in tunnels underneath. Israel is calling it a targeted operation, saying they're taking steps to not harm civilians. Hamas says it holds the U.S. responsible for giving Israel the green light for what it calls a massacre against civilians. Meanwhile, a senior Israeli official says a deal could be within reach. Uh, within days to release more hostages being held by Hamas. Prosecutors in Georgia are seeking an emergency protective order in the election interference case against former President Trump and several co-defendants. The Fulton County DA's office is asking a judge to guard the evidence in the case after videos of confidential interviews with four defendants were obtained by news organizations. ABC News was first to report on portions of videos showing former Trump's attorney Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis telling prosecutors about their efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Ellis says one of Trump's top aides told her Trump would refuse to step down, saying he's, quote, is not going to leave under any circumstances. The judge is set to hold a hearing this afternoon. Closing arguments are expected today in the trial against the man accused of attacking former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer. Suspect David DePap took the stand yesterday, claiming he broke into Pelosi's home, trying to get to the bottom of an election conspiracy theory, but that when Nancy Pelosi wasn't home, he reacted and attacked Paul Pelosi instead. He's pleaded not guilty and faces life in prison if convicted. And it was a fighting start to last night's NBA game between the Timberwolves and the Warriors. Neither team had scored a point yet when the night's basket brawl broke out. It started with Clay Thompson and Jaden McDaniels getting into it at midcourt and ended with this viral moment of Warriors Draymond Green putting one of the Timberwolves in a chokehold. All three players were ejected. The Timberwolves ended up winning 104 to 101. And just one week after a Florida dentist was convicted in the murder of an FSU law professor, his mother is now charged in the plot. Police say the 73-year-old was arrested as she was boarding a flight in an attempt to flee the country. ABC's Victor Kendo is at Miami International Airport with the details. Nearly a decade after a prominent FSU law professor was shot and killed in a murder-for-hire plot, this morning, a shocking new development. Ma'am, you were arrested on a warrant from Leon County, Florida. Dan Markell's former mother-in-law, Donna Adelson, now facing murder charges. The 73-year-old arrested at Miami International Airport Monday night after attempting to board a one-way flight to Vietnam. She was apprehended on the jetway getting on that plane. She had literally checked in and was walking into the plane. 41-year-old Markell was gunned down in the driveway of his Tallahassee home in 2014 while in a bitter custody battle with his ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, who wanted to relocate their two boys to South Florida to be closer to her family. But Markell refused. That's why prosecutors say the Adelson family took matters into their own hands. So who did it appear had a motive to want Dan Markell dead? His own family. 
Just last week, Wendy's brother Charles Adelson was convicted for Markel's murder. The Florida dentist also found guilty of soliciting and conspiring with two hitmen to carry it out. Now prosecutors say their mother, Donna, helped arrange that murder plot too. In this police surveillance video, an undercover FBI agent confronts Adelson and demands more money after the murder. Investigators say she later made this call to her son. That's some paperwork hand delivered to me. Does it involve me or other people? Well, probably those people. According to the probable cause affidavit obtained by ABC News, Donna spoke to Charles in multiple jail calls over the past week where she told him she was getting things in order creating trust and making sure her grandchildren are taken care of. She even discussed plans for suicide or fleeing to a non-extradition country. Soon after, prosecutors claimed she booked that one-way flight to Vietnam with the layover in Dubai. When we found that she was leaving the country, extradition would have been an issue. And that was when the decision was made that we needed to kind of expedite. Adelson appearing before a Miami judge Tuesday morning being held without bond. The Markell family not commenting on her arrest, but telling ABC News in September how relieved they were after Charles was arrested. Because it's taken so long. I want the people that are involved to pay the price. Both Donna and her daughter Wendy, Markell's ex, have previously denied any involvement in the crime. Wendy has never been charged. Diane? Victor Okendo at Miami International Airport for us. Thanks, Victor. And a mysterious illness is affecting dogs across the country. The respiratory sickness can be deadly if left untreated. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has more on what symptoms to watch for and what veterinarians are recommending. While research is still underway, vets calling the illness highly contagious and in some cases fatal. Most reported symptoms are similar to those of a typical kennel cough, including coughing, sneezing, nasal and or eye discharge and lethargy. Instead of that dry cough where the dog felt good, it was now this wet cough where the dog felt sick. Idaho dog owner Wendy Brown says her three golden retrievers, Bridge, Dooley and Lulu, each started showing symptoms earlier this month. Dooley started doing kind of this huffing and also seemed to feel quite lethargic. And not too long after, Bridge began to exhibit the symptoms. At first, Brown thought it was just a typical kennel cough, but when the symptoms didn't go away, she knew it was something more serious. And the vet started him on a 10-day cycle of doxycycline. Uh, today was day 10, and he is not a lot better. Brown says she's still in the dark as to what caused the illnesses in the first place. Experts say dogs showing any signs of consistent coughing is a good reason to get them checked out. We can ultrasound the lungs to see if there's a problem that is related to pneumonia or uh, the contagious pneumonia that seems to be going around. Now, if your dog does get sick, Dr. Kavanaugh says it's really important to keep that coughing dog away from other dogs, just like you would people. And she says you should do that for two weeks after the cough goes away so you don't spread it. Diane. All right. Good tips, Eva Pilgrim. Thank you. And for more, let's bring in doctors Terrence Ferguson and Bernard Hodges, veterinarians and co-stars on National Geographic's Critter Fixers. Doctors, thank you both for being on. I know a lot of pet owners are really concerned right now. So, Dr. Ferguson, let's start with you. What do we know about this illness, and how concerned do you think dog owners need to be right now? Well, definitely right now it's a mystery. You know, um, going through this season, we often have a lot of respiratory disease that we have in dogs. But, you know, having one that we're not quite sure about kind of, you know, changes things. We have to try to figure out how do we treat these things, how severe they are, or, you know, how they're spreading. Dr. Hodges, uh, this illness can be deadly if left untreated. So what symptoms specifically do dog owners need to keep an eye out for? And what do you do if you start noticing them? So we definitely want to kind of look out for any kind of, you know, excessive coughing, eye discharge, any, you know, if we start to have a fever, difficulty breathing, any, any nasal discharge or lethargy. And if you start seeing these things, definitely get your animal to a veterinarian because you know, this is a mystery disease and it could, uh, you know, become fatal. Dr. Ferguson, what do we know about how this disease is spreading? Should dog owners be avoiding kennels and dog parks right now? Well, you know, at this point, we're not quite sure because it's still one of those mystery diseases. But if we look back on other illnesses that we have, like some of the influenza viruses that we have, we definitely know they're spread by, you know, direct contact or sneezing. So if it's in an area where you're having an outbreak, I would definitely say probably avoid those um, having your dog in a kennel or going to the groomer, those are some of the things you may want to 
not do right now until we kind of figure this out and uh, get a little bit better control on it. And, and Dr. Hodges, what are some small everyday things you think pet owners can do to keep our pets healthy? So one of the things definitely, you know, vaccination is the key. You know, Bordetella, which causes kennel cough, as well as flu. Flu is a relatively new one. It kind of threw veterinarians for a loop a few years ago. And then it, just like our viruses, it mutated. So we got a second strand of the flu. So definitely vaccinate your, your pets. Make sure that, you know, when you take them out, that they're, in, you know, they're going around areas that there are a whole lot of pet population that are sneezing and coughing. You know, and just, just like with us, make sure that you proper, you make sure that you have regular veterinary checks and they're well vaccinated. All right, doctors Terrence Ferguson, Bernard Hodges, thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. Coming up, protecting your immune system. Dr. Patel shares ways you can stay healthy this holiday season. Also ahead, preparing for Thanksgiving can be a headache, but our group chat is here to help. We've got tips on budgeting, cooking hacks, even how to navigate those tricky political conversations at the table. Stay with us. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. If you had a wish, I wish. Would you wish to go to the most magical place on Earth, Disneyland Paris? What if your wish could come true? Tell us why you deserve to go to Disneyland Paris. Scan this QR code right now to find out how to enter. And just maybe, your wish will come true. Wish. Wishes opening in theaters. Tickets are on sale now. It's time now for Patel It Like It Is, where Dr. Alok Patel shares health advice on the topics that are close to you. Today, we're talking about five ways to take care of your immune system this holiday season. Here's Dr. Patel with his top tips. Raise your hand if you've seen a claim that a pill, potion, or powder can boost your immune system. You know what I'm talking about. I'm Dr. Alok Patel, an ABC News medical contributor, physician, and I'm all about supporting our immune systems, but by tried and true methods. My ABC family is gonna show you five things you can do every day to support your immune system. Let's go. Get moving! Regular exercise and maintaining a healthy weight is not only good for your heart, it reduces the risk of several diseases and directly supports the cells of your immune system. It's not that hard to incorporate movement in your everyday, is it? <laughs> Prioritize sleep. Sleep loss can mess with your immune system. So try to get seven to nine hours each night. 
And part of getting good sleep is developing good sleep habits and a solid bedtime routine. Just ask ABC News anchor and correspondent Diane Macedo, author of The Sleep Fix. Sweet dreams. Try and chill out a little. We live very hectic lives and stress can impair your immune system's ability to fight off infections. Try meditation, yoga, journaling, anything to put your body in relaxation mode. Even a little bit a day can make a difference. Eat a healthy diet that is full of vitamins and minerals. If your immune system could talk, it would say, please feed me vitamins A, D, C, E, B6, B12, zinc, iron, copper, selenium, all that good stuff. Help it out. Fill your plate with a rainbow of fruits and vegetables and not so full of processed and fatty foods. Now, in some cases, your doctor may recommend you take a vitamin or a supplement, but generally speaking, you want to stick with real foods. Stay up to date with checkups and vaccines. Your body, the machine, needs fine tuning and upgrades every now and then. So managing any health conditions, getting regular checkups, and staying up to date with shots can ensure your body's in peak performance and ready to handle any invaders that come its way. Have you gotten your flu shot yet? You know it. See, there's no gimmicks here. Just habits you've probably heard of that would make your parents very proud. And your immune system will love you and thank you by strapping on gloves and boxing out any threats that come your way. So stay nourished, stay active, but also rested and stress-free. And chat with your doctor if you have any questions. Stay healthy, everyone. And Dr. Alok Patel joins me now for more on this. Doctor, let's do a little cold and flu rapid fire here. So products marketed as immune boosting or immune supplements, are they legit? I'm glad that you did this because typically they are not. If they're not FDA approved, a lot of them do not have the science to back their claims. And often these are marketed as things that are gonna boost your immune system when natural methods like the ones we talked about are best. You wanna go through and read all of them and, and kind of identify what might be in them. There is some evidence to suggest that zinc could reduce the duration of symptoms, but it's mixed reviews on vitamin C, elderberry, and everything else you see in the aisle, in the grocery store or the pharmacy. So what does science show about stress and immunity? So acute or chronic stress can actually impair our ability to fight off infections. It puts our bodies in an inflammatory state, and this is not a good thing for many aspects of our health, including our ability to stay safe this holiday season, which is why it's so important to try is to chill out a little bit, the... take deep breaths, and make sure you get shot some, on some sleep. So let's say you start to feel sick, you feel run down, you're not really sure what it is. What would you immediately do? What I immediately do is I think about any exposures I may have had. If I exposed someone with COVID-19, with the flu, I try to think about the symptoms. Is it allergies? Is it my sinus? And then I immediately go to what gives me symptomatic relief, including my neti pot, honey for coughs. That's a great tip for parents of kids above the age of one. And those lozenges or those sore throat drops. Now, with the potential rise in RSV, flu, and COVID, do you recommend people wear masks in crowded areas again? So personally speaking, I keep a mask with me because you never know when you're going to be in a situation when you're in a crowded area and the person next to you is sneezing or coughing. But it's really important that with RSV, influenza and COVID, people pay attention to the fact that we have vaccines available for certain age groups, flu and COVID for nearly everyone. But with RSV for young children, pregnant women and adults above the age of 60. So that is our best form of preventing severe disease. So uh, one more uh, myth buster perhaps for you. Can being physically cold or spending long amounts of time in cold, can that give you a cold? I can hear my mom and all my aunties right now saying like, don't go outside without a jacket, you're gonna catch a cold. Colds, respiratory viruses actually come from infections, not from physically shivering and being cold. Now being cold could put you at a disadvantage in terms of fighting off infections. Sometimes when you're cold, you might go inside and be in a crowded room with people who may also give you an infection as well. So it's not necessarily the temperature that's gonna cause the virus to enter your body. But one last thing I will add, and I will add this again and again and again, is that sleep and hydration are so incredibly important. Do not neglect those two this holiday season. All right, I amen to that, Dr. Patel. Thank you. And remember, you. Dr. Patel is here to take your questions, so just leave a message on our Instagram feed at ABC News Live, and he might answer your question right here on Friday. Meanwhile, for the first time, Courtney Cox and Matt LeBlanc are sharing personal memories of their late friend's co-star, Matthew Perry. Their tributes come weeks after the cast shared a joint statement after Perry's sudden passing. Chris Connolly is in Los Angeles with more. You don't think we'd buy a house and not have a Joey room, do you? 
Oh my God! Courtney Cox and Matt LeBlanc sharing for the first time personal memories, laughter. I will not take this abuse. You're right. I'm sorry. Once I was a wooden boy, a little. <laughs> and deep feelings for their beloved colleague and close pal Matthew Perry. I love her. I love her. <laughs> I love you, Monica. I love you too, Chandler. We're calling treasured times they had together on Friends. <laughs> I am so grateful for every moment I had with you, Maddie, and I miss you every day. Cox writing on social media. There are thousands of moments I wish I could share. Recounting a favorite scene her Monica Geller had with Perry's Chandler Bing. To give a little backstory, Chandler and Monica were supposed to have a one-night fling in London, but because of the audience's reaction, it became the beginning of their love story. Do you think you knew I was here? In this scene, Cox recalls, before we started rolling, he whispered a funny line for me to say. The line was too racy for TV, but got a huge laugh. Okay, your turn. No, no beginning. <laughs> He often did things like that, she concludes. He was funny and he was kind. Joey, can I talk to you for a second? Ooh. And Matt LeBlanc, Joey on Friends, offering right. images of hilarity and hugs. Any chance you're trying to pick a fight to make all of this easier? Oh, dude, you see right through me. <laughs> While paying a from the heart tribute as well. I will always smile when I think of you and I'll never forget you. Never. Spread your wings and fly, brother. You're finally free. Much love, and I guess you're keeping the 20 bucks you owe me. That humor and that fondness, a big part of what made this Friends cast feel like a family, back then and still today. Diane? It sure seems that way. Chris Connolly in Los Angeles, thank you. Coming up, <laughs> helping you prepare for Thanksgiving, how you can save, and tips for the kitchen after the break. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years my brother's death was this mystery was he pushed did he kill himself despite some human remains found at the bottom of north head and the body was naked committing suicide naked is almost unheard of what's going on here you had some chilling evidence oh my goodness no one knew it was coming it's about finding justice for my brother sometimes you just have to stir the pot Tonight, the high stakes face-to-face, -face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live.
Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Thanksgiving is almost a week away, and whether you're celebrating with family or joining a Friendsgiving, it can be a lot to prepare for. So today, our group chat is taking on cooking hacks, how to save money, and even ways to keep the conversation civil at the table. I want to bring in ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus, executive chef for the restaurant chain Slutty Vegan, Jim O.K. Jackson, and national etiquette expert Diane Gottsman for more on this. Thank you all for coming on. Happy early Thanksgiving. Alexis, I want to start with the money part because especially with inflation, we've seen grocery prices go, go pretty up. high. So how do you save when buying all the stuff you need for Thanksgiving? Go to the store with a shopping list so you don't get distracted is my number one uh, tip. And also, when you get there, choose fresh produce that's in season. That's going to be cheaper, especially this year, canned string beans, pumpkins, pumpkins um, pie filling, um, cranberries, they're all higher. Scale back the menu. You don't have to have seven sides and four desserts. Use coupons and saving apps. I like Ibotta and Shopkick. They offer rebates and cash back. Use a cash back rewards card if you go shopping. And plan for leftovers because you can get a lot of meals out of Thanksgiving and that'll cost you save you some money as well. I love the distraction note too. I often will do online pickup or online order because I know once I get in the aisles it's game Good over for you. the next thing I know it's like this. Um, Jim Oki, you're known to some as the Bishop of Biscuits. I am. I'm very happy right, to see you brought some this biscuits morning. today. Alexis and I are pumped about that. So what are some of your favorite side dishes to include on Thanksgiving and are there any store-bought hacks for those of us who aren't chefs? Well, semi-made is probably the best way to go. Sure, you mix, those. right? You mix and mingle, you jizz it up, you make it your own. And the number one side dish is mashed potatoes. The reason why is because it's so easy to make, right? It's kind of like you split it in a pot and you forget about it. So those dishes that we can kind of combine everything together, stir it up or bake it or cook it on the stovetop and make it, those are the easiest ones to approach. And like you said, fresh produce, I always say quality ingredients lead to quality results. So you want to pick the things that are in season, fresh, and available to you. Now, Diane, potlucks are a nice way to spread the work, but they can be tricky in terms of figuring out what to bring or, as the host, what to ask for. So what are some potluck etiquette rules? So always check on dietary restrictions and allergies. And especially if you have the allergy, you can ask the host if you can bring something to share with everyone else. And make sure that you're bringing something that isn't going to require the host's oven or stovetop if they don't have enough space. So you might have to heat it gently. And when you get there, put it in their oven. So always talk to the host to communicate and ask what is going to be best for them. Ask what they would like rather than surprising them. Yeah, that part about not being in the oven and not being in the way necessarily so huge when you're in the middle of a big meal. Jim, okay, turkey, we know, is the star of the show for Thanksgiving, but not everyone eats meat. So yeah. any suggestions on good centerpieces for the table for those of us who don't? There are so much untraditional things that you can do. And even if, uh, because I specialize in vegan food, um, even the advancements in uh, protein-based, plant-based uh, plant foods have been phenomenal. So there's things like seafood, crab cakes, fish, um, even staple uh, vegetables you can kind of highlight. Everybody picks a cauliflower steak. You know, things like that you can absolutely make as your centerpiece. It doesn't have to be a turkey. And Diane, we're dealing with political tensions, two wars overseas, an upcoming presidential election. There's a lot to argue about. So how do you keep things civil at the table, especially if somebody brings up a hot topic? So I think we all have the responsibility, if we would like, to change a conversation. The host can start out by communicating their request. Let's have a wonderful, memorable experience at the table. I look forward to learning all about what's been happening with all of us. And if it turns ugly, um, then whoever's sitting next to that person or even the host can say, okay, okay, guys, let's, let's table this and let's talk about something more pleasant. So we have to be kind, polite, proactive, and it's not important for us to prove our point at the table. There's there's time and place, but not at the Thanksgiving table or holiday table. Another tip, you can just serve these biscuits because my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> you don't want people talking. Just give them one of these. Mouthful conversation over. Business report Alexis Christophorus, executive chef in. for oh, Slutty Beat. Do it. Jim O.K. Oh, Jackson. <laughs> Thank you for the, my goodness, these are amazing. And national <laughs> etiquette expert, Diane Gossman. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Mm, pumpkin? Oh, these are sweet so potato. good. Right? Sweet potato. We'll be right back. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sweet potato. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families front. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the White House, I'm Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome to ABC News Live. First, you're looking at the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, where President Biden is set to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping in a high-stakes summit. It's their first meeting in over a year as President Biden tries to reshape their relationship amid mounting tensions. The leaders are expected to cover a wide range of issues, including managing economic competition, growing concerns over Taiwan, and Chinese military aggression. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo, along with ABC News Live anchor Kena Whitworth, leading our coverage from San Francisco. Hi, Kena. Hey, Diane, I'm so happy to be here, and it's a gorgeous day here in San Francisco. We're right along the heavily secured Embarcadero, and some people who live here say it almost appears that their city has been transformed. Of course, this is all ahead of the long-anticipated meeting between President Biden and Xi Jinping, and that will happen uh, in just a few hours off-site. And that meeting, when we're talking about it, I mean, every detail has been planned and choreographed for weeks. And besides the leaders of the world's two largest economies, there are also some 30,000 stakeholders here descending on San Francisco from all over the Pacific region. And multiple side events are going on throughout the city. That includes a CEO summit that begins today with speakers like California Governor Gavin Newsom and the CEOs of Uber and Google. So suffice to say, the city is locked down. There are 12 heads of state here for the summit, which presents, as you can imagine, a massive security challenge. There are road closures everywhere, large perimeters around all of these events. In fact, yesterday, on our way into San Francisco, we saw President Biden's motorcade rolling right through downtown. This is as we were trying to navigate those closures ourselves just to get to our hotel. And the strong security extends here again to the Embarcadero right behind me, where President Biden will be holding an event that will happen later tonight. And I want to also bring in our ABC News White House correspondent, Karen Travers. She's in San Francisco as well, traveling with the president. Karen, we're so happy to have you out west. And look, this meeting today, we know it's off-site, and there have been so many preparations. I mean, no detail is too small, even down to the type of flowers chosen. So what kind of work has gone into these preparations? Just an incredible amount of preparation has gone into this very high stakes meeting today between President Biden and China's President Xi. Kena, the White House told me yesterday it has been weeks of planning for the details of what will be on the agenda for these conversations, which are expected to take place over several hours. They have a very robust agenda talking about the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, talking about managing economic competition between the two countries, also about China's leverage over Iran in the Middle East. 
and trying to bring rein in and combat the illicit fentanyl trade. But the choreography is also very important. Who is sitting where in the room? How the table is laid out? How President Biden comes out to greet China's President Xi? Even the location of this summit, Kana, this meeting is not taking place in San Francisco, where we are right now. It's actually going to take place about an hour away, separate from the Apex Summit site. It kind of gives it a more heightened state of importance. It's not just part of this meeting where all the other world leaders are. This is something a little bit more special, rolling out more of a red carpet for the Chinese leader. And Karen, you mentioned some of these issues that we do imagine they will discuss and need to be discussed from fentanyl trafficking to uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. of course, is top of mind as well, and trade. But Karen, do you think that we could see any deliverables on any of these topics? Yeah. The White House is really trying to downplay expectations for any major breakthroughs. They do think that the combating of the fentanyl trade is one area where the two countries could perhaps see some common ground. But in terms of managing economic competition, that's a really big thing for the two countries to try to do. This is all about having a conversation. And as you said, this is the first time that the president has had any contact with China's President Xi in a year. That was their last face-to-face -face meeting in Bali of November of 2022. So the fact that this has taken this long for them to sit down together shows how significant it is to have this conversation yes, today. Yes. One other area that the president would like to see some significant progress on, military to military communications. The Chinese froze communications between the U.S. and China military back in August of 2022, sort of a protest over then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. This is a top priority for President Biden today, reestablishing those lines of communication National security officials say that this is so important to not tip this relationship into conflict or escalation when things start to heat up. Certainly important, and I know many are hoping maybe they find some common ground on tip topics like climate change as well. Karen Travers in San Francisco and traveling with the president today. Thank you very much. And for more on this, I want to now bring in Dominic Chu. Uh, he is a senior analyst for China and Northeast Asia at the Eurasia Group. And Dominic, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, the White House's goal for this meeting essentially is to stabilize U.S.-China relations. How do you see these talks going? And do you think it'll end with, as Karen just mentioned, an open line of communication between these two presidents? We expect modest outcomes from this meeting. Uh, it will not change the course of U.S.-China relations, which is on a slow decline due to key differences in their political vision and interests. It will reset and stabilize ties, uh, and it will... But the time of major breakthroughs and progress on advancing U.S.-China relations is behind us. Instead, what will likely emerge are tactical, incremental progress on addressing specific issues. For example, we know today that they will announce an agreement on that China will crack down on fentanyl precursors. They have a shape today agreeing on cooperating cl on climate change. Both countries will step up on restoring military, military dialogue, restoring people to people contacts, student exchanges, tourism, flights. Uh, there might also be corporate deals emerging. But these agreements are small in scale and will not fundamentally alter the decline in relations. Yeah, modest is the word we keep hearing when it comes to these agreements. And do you think that President Xi's motivations, what do you think they are for attending this meeting? I mean, you talked about some of the economic benefits he could have. Is it more than that? What is really at stake here for China? Yes. So she is meeting with Biden and wants to stabilize the relationship primarily because of domestic economic challenges. China is going through a tough year economically and has suffered a record loss of foreign investment in the third quarter of this year. And China wants to stop the outflow. And she knows that he has to send a signal to multinational companies that despite the tense political climate, China is open for business. That is also why he's having dinner with business executives and leaders tonight, where he's expected to send a reassuring message to corporate leaders in the U.S. and elsewhere. And where do you think they might land when it comes to Taiwan's independence? Taiwan's presidential elections are happening in January. How concerning is that for the Biden administration? Taiwan is always the elephant in the room when it comes to improving and stabilizing U.S.-China relations. In fact, any progress made in this meeting between Presidents Biden and Xi risk being derailed uh, by the Taiwan presidential elections, which are going to take place on January 13th. Um, they're, the pro-independence candidate, William Lai, is set to win the election, although the polling show that it's going to be a tough race either way. And Beijing wants Washington to come out 
and essentially box William Lai in and tell him to not proclaim independence, to not make any incremental moves that will lead to a further division between China and, and Taiwan. Uh, Washington is unlikely to agree to those, those terms. And so, uh, like I said, any progress made in this meeting between Xi and Biden will risk being derailed by the presidential elections. All right, something, something we will certainly be watching very closely. Dominic Chu, senior analyst for the Eurasia Group, thank you so much for your time. And Diane, of course, we will be out here throughout the day as we watch and wait for this highly anticipated meeting, and we'll be checking in with you throughout the day. Well, we'll send it back to you there in the studio in New York. Diane? It sounds good, Kana. I'm jealous of the view. It looks really beautiful there. Kana Whitworth, thank you. <laughs> And as Kana mentioned, she'll be joining us throughout the day for full coverage of that high-stakes summit between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping live from San Francisco. She'll also be anchoring special coverage from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, the race is on to avert a government shutdown. The Senate is now up against a Friday deadline after the House passed a bill to keep the government running. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill. Jay, this bill passed the House with more support from Democrats than Republicans. So what are its chances in the Senate? Well, earlier in the week, there were Senate Democrats who ex expressed some skepticism about this plan because it is novel. It hasn't been done before in terms of temporarily funding the government, but with two different fu deadlines for that funding to expire. Some funding expires in mid-January. The rest of the funding expires in early February. So there were Democrats that were skeptical of that, and certainly the White House was opposed to that plan. It was a plan created by the newly minted Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. But it passed the House yesterday. Like you said, it had broad Democratic support. There were hardline Republicans who were against it, but Democrats in favor of it. And then went over to the Senate, where Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who controls that chamber, has expressed he's now open to this plan. And in fact, just moments ago, earlier today, he began the procedural process of putting this bill on the floor for a vote. It's possible it could come up for a vote now as soon as today, as long as there are no procedural hiccups in the process of getting that vote on the Senate floor. And if it comes for a vote on the Senate, floor, which again, it's expected to do, it's expected to pass, Diane, and time is of the essence because, again, there is that Friday deadline. And while the White House, like Senate Democrats were, were skept was skeptical initially about this plan, they've also signaled that the last thing anyone wants is a government shutdown, meaning the president, if it passes the Senate, is very much likely to sign this legislation. All right. Uh, meanwhile, Jay, the House and Homeland Security Committee is holding this hearing on worldwide threats today. FBI Director Christopher Wray said since the attack against Israel on October 7th, they've seen a, a gallery, they say. They've seen a, all these calls for attacks against the U.S. from Hezbollah to al-Qaeda. What's the latest on that, and, and what do lawmakers want to hear? Well, the interesting part about this hearing is it's common because it happens just about once a quarter uh, in the House Homeland Security Committee and then the Senate has its own version. But it's now happening after that attack by Hamas on Israel. And, and in fact, the FBI director made mention of that in his opening statement. Here's a little bit of what he said. Actually, excuse me, this is the Homeland Security Secretary, but the FBI director mentioned it as well. They're both in this hearing today. But Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas said, quote, in the days and weeks since that attack he's referring to, we have responded to an increase in threats against Jewish, Muslim, and Arab American communities and institutions across the country. So that's just one of the prongs of the various threats facing the U.S. homeland that this hearing is, is, is hitting on today. We also heard Republican members bring up border security. We heard Democratic members bring up threats by Republican members on funding for the FBI and things of that nature. That hearing is still playing out this morning, Diane. All right, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you. And Israel says it's carrying out an hours-long targeted operation at Gaza's biggest hospital, claiming Hamas is using the building to support its military. Meanwhile, a source says progress is being made on a hostage deal and a breakthrough could come within days. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. The Israeli military raiding al-Shifa hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa hospital and releasing these videos they say show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering according to the Hamas-run Ministry of Health which also shared these images they say are from inside the hospital amid the raid that ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around al-Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. 
we do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the Al Shifa Hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within Al Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We're, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The Children's Hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. And ABC's Patrick Rieville joins me now from Tel Aviv, Israel, for more on this. Uh, Patrick, you spoke to families of hostages marching through Israel. They're demanding Hamas release their loved ones. What are they telling you? Hi, Dan. Yeah, we were in Tel Aviv as they set off on this march to Jerusalem, and they're marching to try and get to the office of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, where they're demanding basically that the Israeli government do more quicker to get their loved ones out. Most of them have had no news of their loved ones since they were taken by Hamas on October 7th. We met with one mother there of a 21-year-old hostage who she has had no news whatsoever of him since he was taken. Her name was Shelly Shem Tov. And she told, I asked her, you know, does she want a deal? Does she believe the Israeli government should negotiate to get them out? Take a listen to what she told us. And you think it should be, that should be through a deal, through negotiations? Is that the I don't know. Yeah, I don't project? know. Anyway. I don't care. You know, I don't care. I care about my son. Yeah, you hear just the raw emotion there from Shelley. I mean, and you could hear she just wants her son back. And that's the message we hear from a lot of the hostages. But there is some signs there may be progress in these talks. And many of them are now really just praying that there will be a deal and praying that the Israeli government will agree to a deal. Patrick, fighting seems to be focused on northern Gaza, but a senior U.S. administration official says they believe the majority of the hostages may be in southern Gaza. So what's the latest on efforts to find them or negotiations for their release? Yeah, I mean, I think since the beginning, since they were taken, there was a belief that it was likely that many of the many of the hostages would have been taken into southern Gaza. We know that the Israeli ground operation has obviously targeted northern Gaza. They've encircled Gaza City, and that's where the very heavy fighting is and where Hamas knew that the likely ground invasion would happen. And so it made sense from the beginning that they would try and move most of the hostages south. There are tunnels all over Gaza. And of course, that does make it more difficult for Israel to try and get them back. They could try and launch commando raids into southern Gaza, but that's very risky. So I think many people believe that the only, the best chance of getting these hostages out is through a deal. I mean, there has been some signs that there is progress in these talks that are being mediated by Qatar between Israel and Hamas to try and reach a deal that would see a large number of hostages released in exchange for a temporary ceasefire, likely just a few days. There was a number that was floating around today saying that a proposal has been 50 hostages for three days, three days, excuse me, of, um, of ceasefire. But we heard from one of our sources, one of our Israeli political sources has told us that's too few hostages. For now, those talks are still ongoing. There are signs of progress, but until it's done, the deal isn't done, you know? 
All right, that's right. It's not done until it's done. Patrick Rieville in Tel Aviv. Patrick, thank you. Coming up, Iceland on alert. How towns are racing to get people out as they brace for an expected volcano eruption. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. People in southwestern Iceland are being given one last chance to get pets and belongings and get out. As officials warn, a volcano could erupt at any moment. The warning comes after thousands of earthquakes hit the region. Foreign correspondent James Longman is in Iceland with more. Thousands of earthquakes. That's what officials in Iceland say has alerted them to what they call an imminent volcanic eruption and the significant likelihood it'll happen soon. Cracks in roads have opened up, steam pouring out of the ground as seismic activity intensifies in the southwestern part of the country. Over 700 quakes have struck in just the last day and more than 20,000 since October 25th. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma bubbling underground, threatening the small town of Grindavik. Authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people. We provide support and information. When people are scared, they need that. Our cameras seeing multiple eruptions over the years in Iceland are Will Reeve up close and personal in 2021. Look there at all that lava coming up, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And back in 2010, another volcano erupted and it disrupted air travel for days. James Longman in Iceland, thank you. Coming up, thousands of Starbucks employees are set to strike across the country. Why it's happening and what it means for the company's famous Red Cup Day. Tonight, the high stakes face to face. Plus, the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. Meet me with them good vibes. Pictures on my phone lies. Everything is so fine. Little bit of sunshine. Dance some more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. number one news 
source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, A Killer Confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. I'm Lindsay Davis reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Thousands of Starbucks employees are set to strike across the country, and that could cause some issues with getting your morning coffee. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophers has more on that and your other business headlines. Alexis, what are you watching today? Watching that strike and also retail sales, Diane, because I want to start with that summer spending spree cooling heading into the holiday shopping season. Retail sales dipping a tenth of a percent in October. That is the first decline we've seen since March, but it is still better than expected. Consumers spent less at auto dealerships, department hardware and furniture stores, but they continue to spend more at restaurants and bars, grocery stores and and online. Filling out a federal student aid form could soon be a lot easier and less time consuming. On December 31st, the Department of Education will release a streamlined version of its college financial aid form known as the FAFSA. Officials tell ABC News that instead of over 100 questions, the improved form will ask less than 20, and they say it should take most people about 10 minutes to fill out. This is the first major update to the student aid application since the 1980s, believe it or not. Mortgage rates are cooling down right along with inflation. Just a few weeks ago, mortgage rates were above 8%. Today, they are at 7.4%. As investors bet the Fed is done raising interest rates, at least for now, analysts predict we could see mortgage rates drop to 7% in a few months, maybe even 6% by the spring. And you might have a tough time getting your morning coffee at some Starbucks locations tomorrow. That's when nearly 2,000 unionized baristas in 25 states are planning a one-day strike. Nicknamed the Red Cup Rebellion, the walkout will fall on one of the coffee chain's busiest days, Red Cup Day, when it hands out those free, usable cups. The union says Starbucks refused to resolve staffing and scheduling issues during busy promotional events. A Starbucks spokesperson says the union has refused to negotiate and has not met to sign a contract agreement now for months, Diane. All right, interesting. Alexis Christophers, thank you. Sure. And if you have any finance questions for Alexis, leave a message on our Instagram feed. She might answer your question right here on Thursday. And you've probably heard of body dysmorphia, but have you heard of money dysmorphia? The mental health disorder makes people see money in a way that doesn't reflect reality, and it can take a toll on your emotions and your finances. Our Rebecca Jarvis explains. Money. When it comes to money, it's never simple. From not having enough. The looming student debt that I came out of undergrad and law school, I just never thought I could get over. To always wanting more. I certainly bought into this message societally that safety and security really came from money. Jordan Jacob and Allison Osborne both say they suffered from what some financial advisors, including Ali Katz, are calling money dysmorphia, a financial state where self-perception doesn't match reality. Is the distorted view that many of us have of our finances that causes us to make poor decisions about our non-renewable resources, time, energy, attention, health, relationships. Think that sounds like you? Kat says to look for these telltale signs. You're always just getting by. You never quite have enough. Or you're constantly chasing more, 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 more. Or you're, you're at rock bottom. To break the cycle, Kat says you first need to get really clear about needs and wants. Put a number on it. Exactly what attorney Jacob did. 
Don't worry about what everybody else has. Worry about what you have. Then assess your relationship with money. For Osborne, that meant unlearning old habits. I think if I didn't learn how to navigate money as the fuel to get to the destination versus the destination itself, I, I don't know that I'd be able to do this. Finally, take action. Get really clear on what do you actually need to live the life that you want? What are the resources that you have to create that? And then what do you need to fill in the gap between what you need and what you actually have? Well, thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that report. Interesting. And thanks to you for streaming with us. I am Diane Macedo. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi, I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, Israeli forces raid Gaza's largest hospital. Why the IDF says it's focused on that building, plus what an official says about the new progress made on a deal to free hostages. The high-stakes summit for President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. What to expect as the two meet face-to-face -face for the first time in more than a year. Chaos at the Capitol amid a breakthrough vote. The next steps after the House passed a bill to keep the government running, plus the altercations before the vote, including a near fist fight in the Senate. We begin with Israeli forces raiding Gaza's biggest hospital. Israel says it's carrying out an hours-long targeted operation at Al-Shifa Hospital, claiming Hamas is using the building to support its military. Meanwhile, a source says progress is being made on a hostage deal and a breakthrough could come within days. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. The Israeli military raiding Al-Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa Hospital. And releasing these videos, they say, show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital, where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering, according to the Hamas-run Ministry of Health, which also shared these images, they say, are from inside the hospital amid the raid, that ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around al-Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. 
we do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the Al-Shifa Hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within Al-Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed-out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The children's hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. And Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman joins me now from Tel Aviv, Israel, for more. Matt, earlier you were outside of Ramla, Israel, walking with protesters, demanding the release of hostages. What do they tell you, and where do these hostage negotiations stand? They were actually marching, Diane, from Tel Aviv all the way to Jerusalem, a five-day march, and they are demanding that Israel release, or that Hamas release, all of the hostages right now. And they're just trying to bring attention to this. What we understand about these hostage negotiations taking place in Doha, but also bouncing between Gaza and Jerusalem, is that there has been significant progress. We're talking about a deal uh, for a quarter of the, host of the 239 hostages, and it could take place in the next few days. Again, it is now with decision makers in Gaza, so getting the information to them, having them execute the decision and getting it back could take some time. There's also the issue of where these hostages are. They've likely been split up, we told all over parts of Gaza from different factions as well, including the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So it might take time to arrange all of them and then get them to the Red Cross in order to transfer them to Israeli. So this is going to take some time, but we do hear there is progress, Diane. Now, Matt, the head of the United Nations Humanitarian Relief Operations is condemning the IDF's raid at Al-Shifa Hospital, saying the protection of newborns, patients and medical staff and all civilians has to override all other concerns. How is Israel responding to that and what more do you know about this operation? Israel says that it is being very targeted, very specific in this raid. They are not going after personnel so much, they said, as much as the infrastructure there. Although we've heard that there are and have been gunfights in the hospital yard, uh, that Israel has been interrogating some people, men, that they found inside. They didn't say if they were Hamas operatives or not. And the doctors there tell us that the situation inside is increasingly dire. Now, Israel says that it deposited some medical supplies there. Um, it's unclear if they're usable without electricity on hand, um, but Israel is saying it's trying to be very, very directed here and not violate international law. They also say that Hamas operates these tunnels right beneath the hospital, which in itself violates the sanctity of the hospital and international law. And U.S. officials corroborating that, telling us that these are labyrinthine, uh, interconnected tunnels with probably several hundred Hamas operatives working there uh, with communications equipment, booby traps. Um, so this could go on for a long time, Diane. All right, Matt Gutman in Tel Aviv. Matt, thank you. Stay safe. And President Biden is set to meet with China's leader Xi Jinping today for the first time in more than a year. They'll meet face-to-face -face at a summit in San Francisco. 
U.S. officials say the leaders are going into this meeting with tempered expectations, hoping to manage tensions and reopen lines of communication. ABC's Karen Travers is in France, San Francisco traveling with the president. She's got more on that now. Uh, Karen, what went into organizing this meeting and preparing for it? Weeks of preparations, Diane, went into this meeting today that is going to take place over a couple of hours just south of San Francisco on the sidelines of an Asian Pacific Leaders Summit here in the city. And, Diane, the White House told me yesterday that there was meticulous planning that went into these meetings, that the president was huddled with senior advisors on the plane yesterday, but there was a lot of preparation that went into this. The choreography is very important for the Chinese side in terms of the greeting that the president will do when President Xi arrives on site today and even what the meeting site will look like. They are expected to be behind closed doors for several hours today. They have a very robust and lengthy agenda to get to. And then after that, President Biden is going to take questions where we'll get a sense of what was accomplished during that meeting. But Diane, White House officials are really downplaying expectations for any major breakthrough. They say this is all about improving the relationship and talking about managing competition between the two countries. Now, these are two of the biggest economies in the world, Karen, but President mm -hmm. Biden said he welcomes competition, not conflict. So how does he plan to smooth things over to try to achieve one without the other? intense diplomacy. That's what the National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said. The White House says they're going to have very frank and direct conversations. These are two leaders that know each other very well. They have met several times, but this conversation today is the first time they've had any direct conflict, uh, contact since their meeting last year in Bali. So it's been a very long time. And that's why this meeting is considered to be so high stakes and why they have so much on the agenda. For, but for the president, this is all about face-to-face -face diplomacy. This is something he values very highly. They're going to be talking about Russia's war against Ukraine, the Israel-Hamas war, Iran, also, of course, managing competition between the U.S. and China, and also trying to reestablish military ties between the two countries, military communication. We're told that is the one thing that the president would very much like to see actually accomplished today in terms of walking away from this summit saying that they got something done. Diane, those two, uh, the two militaries have not had direct communication since August of 2022, and the president would like to see those restored today during these meetings. He's Karen Travers in San Francisco. Karen, thank you. And while expectations for that meeting are low, experts say there are several things President Xi is hoping to get out of the summit. ABC News foreign correspondent Britt Clenet has the latest on that. Hi, Britt. Hi, Diane. Well, expectations might be low ahead of the meeting between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping, but the view from China is somewhat upbeat. State media touting Xi diplomacy and the need to build bridges and coexist peacefully, they say. The hope being that uh, getting relations back on track will also help the country's economy get back on track too. China is becoming frustrated by what it sees as the US refusing to relax trade restrictions. And looming over all of this is Taiwan presidential election in just two months time China is expected to seek a really firm pledge that the US won't kind of deviate from its one China policy or pursue formal independence especially with a candidate it despises as the front runner now I spoke a little earlier to Victor Gao he's a former Chinese diplomat and he said that China really is sending a message that the US uh, should not hollow out or water down its one China policy that really counts to Taiwan as part of it. Taiwan is the reddest of red lines. And another sticking point could be the Ukraine and Middle East wars. China has been growing closer to Iran, which is a supporter of Hamas, but she will be reiterating that China is neutral and renewing China's calls for peace. Diane. All right. Foreign correspondent Brett Clinton, thank you. And the race is on to avert a government shutdown. The Senate has to act before a Friday deadline after the House passed a bill last night to keep the government running. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill. Um, Jay, now that Johnson's bill has passed the House, does it have the support to pass the Senate? Well, there were Senate Democrats who were skeptical about the House Speaker's plan, particularly because of what they called the novelty of it, in that it staggers funding deadlines and has some government funding expiring in mid-January, and then the bulk of the rest of government funding, defense spending, homeland security spending, et cetera, expiring in early February. Nonetheless, there was strong Democratic support for the Speaker's plan last night in that vote on the House floor. More Democrats, frankly, voted for it than Republicans. 
Republicans because there was opposition amongst hardline Republicans to the Speaker's plan. And in the days since that plan was unveiled, in the days since that initial skepticism from Senate Democrats, we've seen Chuck Schumer, the top Democrat in the Senate, as well as Mitch McConnell, the top Republican in that chamber, both come out and say they're behind this plan. Schumer looks poised to put this on the floor any day now. Again, he's got that Friday deadline. We're not exactly sure when the Senate's going to vote for it, but when and if Schumer puts it on the floor, it's expected to pass, Diane. Now, tensions are clearly running high on the Hill, Jay. A congressman is accusing former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy of elbowing him. There was a near fist fight in the Senate. What are lawmakers telling you about that? What is happening there? Well, one of the factors that seems to be playing into this is Congress doesn't work in the way you and I work in that they go on recess for certain weeks in the year and they go to their districts and they fly home on Fridays and they've been working kind of in their version of around the clock over the last few weeks, really since Kevin McCarthy was ousted to try to first get a House Speaker and then avert a government shutdown. And so I've heard from lawmakers who say they just feel kind of burned out. Some of it played out yesterday when Tim Burchett alleges that Ken McCarthy elbowed him in the back. You see the pictures of the two of them there. McCarthy denies that. And then there's that near fist fight between Senator Mark Wayne Mullen and a union leader in a hearing yesterday. Um, one McCarthy ally, Patrick McHenry, weighed in on all of this. Here is what he told one of my colleagues up here. Uh, yes, there are dumb days on, on Capitol Hill, and there are dumber days on Capitol Hill. And this is one of the dumbest I've seen in quite a long time. Dumb days on Capitol Hill and then dumber days on Capitol Hill. But, Diane, all of it comes as Congress has some serious stuff on its plate, not the least of which is averting a government shutdown. All right, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Jay, thank you. Keep your dukes up. And southern Florida is bracing for heavy rain and flooding over the next 48 hours after record rain fell yesterday. The same storm system is expected to move up the east coast this weekend. ABC's meteorologist Samara Theodore is tracking it all for us. Hi, Samara. Hey, Diane. Good morning. Yeah, this is kind of really just amazing to think about and see. This is Oakland Park, Florida right now. You've got cars just trying to traverse all this water, roadways turning to riverways. And what I meant by this is amazing. Fort Lauderdale, you're on track for your rainiest year on record, okay? So you guys received about 2.7 inches with this most recent system here. So far to date, you're already at 101 inches. That is 44 inches above of the norm where you should be and it's only going to take like around two more inches to make this your rainiest year on record it's not just you we're looking at very heavy rain lining the east coast of florida from miami up to jacksonville orlando also going to get in on that you can see the heavier rain just riding parallel to the east coast of florida anywhere from three to five inches but some spots could see 10 inches of rain so what you're looking at right now is the future cast this shows us where the rain could be in the future as we push through wednesday look this is tomorrow morning Morning, 9 a.m. Still seeing rain with the heaviest of it on that Georgia Florida border there, but we could see some heavy pockets of rain down near Miami as well. Central Florida getting in on that Wednesday, today, and tomorrow. As a result, of course, this would yield flood watches, okay? So we could see flooding. We're, well, we are seeing flooding, and we're likely to see flooding both today and tomorrow, where we could see 10 inches of rain locally in some spots. That's copious amounts of rains, my friend. Now, speaking of rain, we're going to head out to the West Coast. So they got their own thing going on. We have this disturbance. This is a warm core storm system here. So not a ton of snow with this, but still a good amount of rain depending on where it meanders farther west. Maybe less rain for the California coastline. If it moves a little closer east, we could see more rain. Nonetheless, your rain chance lingers through today into the weekend. About one to two inches of rain there. And I will say the bigger story is gonna be the wind gusts with 50 mile per hour winds picking up. Speaking of winds headed to the tropics, the grill Jamaica waves crashing there onto the rock well we could th we will see things pick up in Jamaica as well because we're tracking the tropics remember hurricane season is not over until November 30th this 50 percent chance of development down near Central America is going to track into countries like Cuba Jamaica Haiti and DR bringing them tons of rain through the end of the week Diane ABC meteorologist Samara Theodore thank you Coming up, school, boss, school boards excuse me, across the country appear to be moving to the left. We'll talk with a Columbia University professor about what's driving the liberal shift in school board elections right after the break. Please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop, stop. Hey, 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 hey. Everybody was
was scared that you were showing up to Laredo. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. Tonight, the high stakes face-to-face, -face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. Boards across the country appear to be moving to the left after Democrats, liberals, and moderates won seats over conservative candidates in several key states. Education has become a flashpoint issue ahead of the 2024 elections, with fights erupting in school board meetings over how race, sexual orientation, gender, and other topics are handled in the classroom. Now ABC News is marking American Education Week all across the network with a focus on the future of our schools as part of our series, The American Classroom. So let's bring in Sonia Douglas, professor at Columbia University's Teachers College and the founding director of the school's Black Education Research Center for more. Sonia, thanks so much for coming on. What's your reaction to last week's, uh, these elections, and this apparent shift away from conservative school board candidates? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, I think last week's school board elections were a sweeping rejection of conservative efforts to ban the teaching of race, gender, and sexuality in our nation's schools. Um, and they underscored the fact that Americans want to keep the culture wars out of education. Now, parental rights advocates say that they want more of an influence in what their children are taught and have access to at schools. So what's your reaction to some of the proposed book bans and curriculum restrictions that are often centered on topics of race, gender, and sexual orientation? Well, I think that the issue of book bans, um, again, was very much one that's focused on politics. There was, I believe, roughly 11 individuals who have been responsible for the majority of book challenges. Um, over the last couple of school years. Uh, and so at the Black Education Research Center, uh, we also found that most Americans agree that um, the CRT bans are main, ma mostly about politics. And so those attacks have not resonated. Um, we believe that the elections um, last week also showed that and are excited about the fact that most Americans support truth in teaching. So how do you respond to parents who are concerned that schools are moving away from core education and that they should be concentrating less on these topics and more on how students read, how they're writing, their math skills? Yeah, I think those are uh, appropriate concerns, but I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think teaching about these difficult topics, uh, which can be sensitive, are really valuable when we think about um, literacy and, and English um, language arts and even mathematics and science. Um, and so it's important that teachers have the freedom to teach, to teach the truth in all of the content areas. Um, and that that, again, the priority is to ensure that children have access to literacy instruction and other content areas that will allow them to be successful academically.
Now, sex education is a big part of this debate. Some parents are concerned that schools are shoving sexual content on children too young. So when do you think it's appropriate to teach children about sex? And do you think it's up to parents or school officials to decide that? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great question. Ultimately, I think parents and teachers need to work in partnership and support of children. Um, no matter the topic, I think parents do have to make a decision of what's best for their child. But it is appropriate to teach sex education in schools, especially or only under the only when uh, teachers are trained to do that and to do that in a supportive environment. So I really think um, this is an opportunity to think about how teachers and families and educators work together to support our young people because they really do need our support um, in this post-pandemic era. They sure do. Sonia Douglas, thank you. Thank you for having me. Coming up, the family celebrating the holidays with their honorary grandpa, why they say they adopted their neighbor and what it means to the 82-year-old. start kissing each other and then she tells me no i get up on the beach and i kick her extremely hard in the face and then i push her off into the sea a liar a murderer and a psychopath i was able to turn around now and i had the power over him it angers me it makes me just want to return the favor to him I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Memphis, Tennessee, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. A family in Rhode Island is getting ready to celebrate the holidays with their honorary grandpa. The family of seven said their 82-year-old neighbor welcomed them to the new neighborhood. Now they've welcomed him to their family. Here's their story. Last year, we purchased our, home, our first home. My husband and his cousins came over to, like, you know, renovate the house. And Paul seen them renovate, and he came across the street and introduced himself and allowed my husband to use one of his ladders. And then the rest is history. I like people. It's easy to like people. I always tell people, you know, it's, you got to work at being nasty, but it's easy to be nice. I worked in a plant with 5,000 people, and when they had a problem, it was get Paul. You can imagine what that's like. We was kind of afraid to move into a new neighborhood. We have five kids. They're loud, they play, they run, they jump. And when you buy a home, you just can't up and move if you and your neighbors don't get along. So we was definitely nervous to move into our neighborhood. He came over one day with car seats. And I have two little ones, so he's like, I got two brand new car seats in my car. And I feel like ever since then, like he's been here like every other day, like we spend holidays together. Um, Father's Day just recently passed. You know, we purchased him a Father's Day gift. Paul's really part of our family. When Paul comes over, the kids run up to him, right? Yeah. They run up to him. They just, they love Paul. They love Paul. Paul's like a grandfather to them at this point. He will blow, blow bubbles with them. He'll 
push them on their tricycle, play with them with the cards and stuff. So he's very entertaining with them. My children and Paul get along very, very well. I, sometimes I don't get halfway across the street and I got a child hanging onto the leg. <laughs> it gives you a nice warm feeling when somebody else treats you like that. So many people reach out to me and like, oh my God, I can't stand my neighbor. Like, you're so lucky. We are very lucky. We are very blessed to have a neighbor like Paul. It definitely reinforced my um, faith in people because when I tell you that we, neither one of us see color, neither one of us see age, he's literally just a great, he's not even a neighbor at this point, he's a family. Just give your neighbors a chance. We have lovely neighbors across the board. I think God planted us here for a reason, but there's something special about Paul. How cute are they? Our thanks to our friends at GMA Digital for that story. And you can find more feel-good stories at goodmorningamerica.com. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. Tonight, the high stakes face-to-face, -face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. showing up till right on something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place we may have a serial killer on our hands friday night 2020 takes you inside a killing spree it's a real life thriller playing out on police cams it was shocking mind-boggling help me help me the one that got out it sounds like something out of a movie david muir deborah roberts the all-new 2020 friday night on abc this is abc news live the crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting on Capitol Hill, I'm Devin Dwyer. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome to ABC News Live. First, you're looking at the Bay Bridge in San Francisco, where President Biden is set to meet with Chinese President Xi Jinping in a high-stakes summit. It's their first meeting in over a year as President Biden tries to reshape their relationship amid mounting tensions. The leaders are expected to cover a wide range of issues, including managing economic competition, growing concerns over Taiwan, and Chinese military aggression. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo, along with ABC News Live anchor Kena Whitworth, leading our coverage from San Francisco. Hi, Kena. Hey, Diane, I'm so happy to be here, and it's a gorgeous day here in San Francisco. We're right along the heavily secured Embarcadero, and some people who live here say it almost appears that their city has been transformed. Of course, this is all ahead of the long-anticipated meeting between President Biden and Xi Jinping, and that will happen uh, in just a few hours off-site. And that meeting, when we're talking about it, I mean, every detail has been planned and choreographed for weeks. 
And besides the leaders of the world's two largest economies, there are also some 30,000 stakeholders here descending on San Francisco from all over the Pacific region. And multiple side events are going on throughout the city. That includes a CEO summit that begins today with speakers like California Governor Gavin Newsom and the CEOs of Uber and Google. So suffice to say, the city is locked down. There are 12 heads of state here for the summit, which presents, as you can imagine, a massive security challenge. There are road closures everywhere, large perimeters around all of these events. In fact, yesterday on our way into San Francisco, we saw President Biden's motorcade rolling right through downtown. This is as we were trying to navigate those closures ourselves just to get to our hotel. And the strong security extends here again to the Embarcadero right behind me, where President Biden will be holding an event that will happen later tonight. And I want to also bring in our ABC News White House correspondent, Karen Travers. She's in San Francisco as well, traveling with the president. Karen, we're so happy to have you out west. And look, this meeting today, we know it's off-site, and there have been so many preparations. I mean, no detail is too small, even down to the type of flowers chosen. So what kind of work has gone into these preparations? <laughs> Just an incredible amount of preparation has gone into this very high stakes meeting today between President Biden and China's President Xi. Kena, the White House told me yesterday it has been weeks of planning for the details of what will be on the agenda for these conversations, which are expected to take place over several hours. They have a very robust agenda talking about the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, talking about managing economic competition between the two countries, also about China's leverage over Iran in the Middle East. And trying to bring rein in and combat the illicit fentanyl trade, but the choreography is also very important. Who is sitting where in the room? How the table is laid out? How President Biden comes out to greet China's President Xi? Even the location of this summit, Kana. This meeting is not taking place in San Francisco, where we are right now. It's actually going to take place about an hour away, separate from the APEC summit site. It kind of gives it a more heightened state of importance. It's not just part of this meeting where all the other world leaders are, this is something a little bit more special, rolling out more of a red carpet for the Chinese leader. And Karen, you mentioned some of these issues that we do imagine they will discuss and need to be discussed from fentanyl trafficking to uh, artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. of course, is top of mind as well, and trade. But Karen, do you think that we could see any deliverables on any of these topics? Yeah. The White House is really trying to downplay expectations for any major breakthroughs. They do think that the combating of the fentanyl trade is one area where the two countries could perhaps see some common ground. But in terms of managing economic competition, that's a really big thing for the two countries to try to do. This is all about having a conversation. And as you said, this is the first time that the president has had any contact with China's President Xi in a year. That was their last face-to-face -face meeting in Bali of November of 2022. So the fact that it's taken this long for them to sit down together shows how significant it is to have this conversation yes, today. Yes. One other area that the president would like to see some significant progress on, military to military communications. The Chinese froze communications between the U.S. and China military back in August of 2022, sort of a protest over then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. This is a top priority for President Biden today, reestablishing those lines of communication National security officials say that this is so important to not tip this relationship into conflict or escalation when things start to heat up. Certainly important, and I know many are hoping maybe they find some common ground on tip topics like climate change as well. Karen Travers in San Francisco and traveling with the president today. Thank you very much. And for more on this, I want to now bring in Dominic Chu. Uh, he is a senior analyst for China and Northeast Asia at the Eurasia Group. And Dominic, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, the White House's goal for this meeting essentially is to stabilize U.S.-China relations. How do you see these talks going? And do you think it'll end with, as Karen just mentioned, an open line of communication between these two presidents? We expect modest outcomes from this meeting. Uh, it will not change the course of U.S.-China relations, which is on a slow decline due to key differences in their political vision and interests. It will reset and stabilize ties, uh, and it will... But the time of major breakthroughs and progress on advancing U.S.-China relations is behind us. Instead, what will likely emerge are tactical, incremental progress on addressing specific issues. For example, we know today that they will announce an agreement on that China will crack down on fentanyl precursors. They've today agreeing on cooperating on climate change. 
both countries will step up on restoring military, military dialogue, restoring people-to-people -people contacts, student exchanges, tourism, flights. Uh, there might also be corporate deals emerging. But these agreements are small in scale and will not fundamentally alter the decline in relations. Yeah, modest is the word we keep hearing when it comes to these agreements. And do you think that President Xi's motivations, what do you think they are for attending this meeting? I mean, you talked about some of the economic benefits he could have. Is it more than that? What is really at stake here for China? Yes. So she is meeting with Biden and wants to stabilize the relationship primarily because of domestic economic challenges. China is going through a tough year economically and has suffered a record loss of foreign investment in the third quarter of this year. And China wants to stop the outflow. And she knows that he has to send a signal to multinational companies that despite the tense political climate, China is open for business. That is also why he's having dinner with business executives and leaders tonight, where he's expected to send a reassuring message to corporate leaders in the U.S. and elsewhere. And where do you think they might land when it comes to Taiwan's independence? Taiwan's presidential elections are happening in January. How concerning is that for the Biden administration? Taiwan is always the elephant in the room when it comes to improving and stabilizing U.S.-China relations. In fact, any progress made in this meeting between Presidents Biden and Xi risk being derailed uh, by the Taiwan presidential elections, which are going to take place on January 13th. Um, the the pro-independence candidate, William Lai, is set to win the election, although the polling show that it's going to be a tough race either way. And Beijing wants Washington to come out and essentially box William Lai in and tell him to not proclaim independence, to not make any incremental moves that will lead to a further division between China and, and Taiwan. Uh, Washington is unlikely to agree to those, those terms. And so, uh, like I said, any progress made in this meeting between Xi and Biden will risk being derailed by the presidential elections. All right, certainly something we will certainly be watching very closely. Dominic Chu, senior analyst for the Eurasia Group, thank you so much for your time. And Diane, of course, we will be out here throughout the day as we watch and wait for this highly anticipated meeting, and we'll be checking in with you throughout the day. We'll send it back to you there in the studio in New York. Diane? That sounds good, Kana. I'm jealous of the view. It looks really beautiful there. Kana Whitworth, thank you. <laughs> And as Kana mentioned, she'll be joining us throughout the day for full coverage of that high-stakes summit between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping live from San Francisco. She'll also be anchoring special coverage from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live. Meanwhile, the race is on to avert a government shutdown. The Senate is now up against a Friday deadline after the House passed a bill to keep the government running. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now from Capitol Hill. Jay, this bill passed the House with more support from Democrats than Republicans. So what are its chances in the Senate? Well, earlier in the week, there were Senate Democrats who expressed some skepticism about this plan because it is novel. It hasn't been done before in terms of temporarily funding the government, but with two different deadlines for that funding to expire. Some funding expires in mid-January. The rest of the funding expires in early February. So there were Democrats that were skeptical of that, and certainly the White House was opposed to that plan. It was a plan created by the newly minted Republican Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson. But it passed the House yesterday. Like you said, it had broad Democratic support. There were hardline Republicans who were against it, but Democrats in favor of it. And then went over to the Senate, where Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, who controls that chamber, has expressed he's now open to this plan. And in fact, just moments ago earlier today, he began the procedural process of putting this bill on the floor for a vote. It's possible it could come up for a vote now as soon as today, as long as there are no procedural hiccups in the process of getting that vote on the Senate floor. And if it comes for a vote on the Senate floor, which again, it's expected to do, it's expected to pass, Diane, and time is of the essence because, again, there is that Friday deadline. And while the White House, like Senate Democrats were, were skept was skeptical initially about this plan, they've also signaled that the last thing anyone wants is a government shutdown, meaning the president, if it passes the Senate, is very much likely to sign this legislation. All right. Uh, meanwhile, Jay, the House and Homeland Security Committee is holding this hearing on worldwide threats today. FBI Director Christopher Wray said since the attack against Israel on October 7th, they've seen a, a gallery, they say. They've seen uh, all these calls for attacks against the U.S. from Hezbollah to al-Qaeda. What's the latest on that, and, and what do lawmakers want to hear? Well, the interesting part about this hearing is it's common because it happens just about once a quarter uh, in the House Homeland Security Committee and then the Senate has its own version. But it's now happening after that attack 
by Hamas on Israel. And in fact, the FBI director made mention of that in his opening statement. Here's a little bit of what he said. Actually, excuse me, this is the Homeland Security Secretary, but the FBI director mentioned it as well. They're both in this hearing today. But Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas said, quote, in the days and weeks since that attack he's referring to, we have responded to an increase in threats against Jewish, Muslim, and Arab American communities and institutions across the country. So that's just one of the prongs of the various threats facing the U.S. homeland that this hearing is, is, is hitting on today. We also heard Republican members bring up border security. We heard Democratic members bring up threats by Republican members on funding for the FBI and things of that nature. That hearing is still playing out this morning, Diane. All right, ABC's Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you. And Israel says it's carrying out an hours-long targeted operation at Gaza's biggest hospital, claiming Hamas is using the building to support its military. Meanwhile, a source says progress is being made on a hostage deal and a breakthrough could come within days. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman has the latest from Tel Aviv, Israel. The Israeli military raiding Al-Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa Hospital. And releasing these videos, they say, show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital, where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering, according to the Hamas-run Ministry of Health, which also shared these images they say are from inside the hospital amid the raid, that ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around al-Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. We do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the al-Shifa hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within al-Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed-out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The Children's Hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. And ABC's Patrick Rievel joins me now from Tel Aviv, Israel, for more on this. Uh, Patrick, you spoke to families of hostages marching through Israel. They're demanding Hamas release their loved ones. What are they telling you? Hi, Dan. Yeah, we were in Tel Aviv as they set off on this march to Jerusalem, and they're marching to try and get to the office of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, where they're demanding basically that the Israeli government do more quicker to get their loved ones out. Most of them have had no news of their loved ones since they were taken by Hamas on October 7th. We met with one mother there of a 21-year-old hostage who she has had no news whatsoever of him since he was taken. Her name was Shelly Shem Tov. And she told, I asked her, you know, does she want a deal? Does she believe the Israeli government should negotiate to get them out? Take a listen to what she told us. And you think it should be, that should be through a deal, through negotiations? Is that the I don't know. Yeah, I don't you, know. Any, anyway. I don't care. You know, I don't care. I care about my son. 
Yeah, you hear just the raw emotion there from Shelley. I mean, and you can hear she just wants her son back. And that's the message we hear from a lot of the hostages. But there is some signs there may be progress in these talks. And many of them are now really just praying that there will be a deal and praying that the Israeli government will agree to a deal. Patrick, fighting seems to be focused on northern Gaza, but a senior U.S. administration official says they believe the majority of the hostages may be in southern Gaza. So what's the latest on efforts to find them or negotiations for their release? Yeah, I mean, I think since the beginning, since they were taken, there was a belief that it was likely that many of the many of the hostages would have been taken into southern Gaza. We know that the Israeli ground operation has obviously targeted northern Gaza. They've encircled Gaza City, and that's where the very heavy fighting is and where Hamas knew that the likely ground invasion would happen. And so it made sense from the beginning that they would try and move most of the hostages south. There are tunnels all over Gaza. And, of course, that does make it more difficult for Israel to try and get them back. They could try and launch commando raids into southern Gaza, but that's very risky. So I think many people believe that the only, the best chance of getting these hostages out is through a deal. I mean, there has been some signs that there is progress in these talks that are being mediated by Qatar between Israel and Hamas to try and reach a deal that would see a large number of hostages released in exchange for a temporary ceasefire, likely just a few days. There was a number that was floating around today saying that a proposal has been 50 hostages for three days, three days, excuse me, of, um, of ceasefire. But we heard from one of our sources, one of our Israeli uh, political sources has told us that's too few hostages. For now, those talks are still ongoing. There are signs of progress, but until it's done, the deal isn't done, you know? All right, that's right. It's not done until it's done. Patrick Rievel in Tel Aviv. Patrick, thank you. Coming up, Iceland on alert. How towns are racing to get people out as they brace for an expected volcano eruption. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. People in southwestern Iceland are being given one last chance to get pets and belongings and get out. As officials warn, a volcano could erupt at any moment. The warning comes after thousands of earthquakes hit the region. Foreign correspondent James Longman is in Iceland with more. Thousands of earthquakes. That's what officials in Iceland say has alerted them to what they call an imminent volcanic eruption and the significant likelihood it'll happen soon. Cracks in roads have opened up, steam pouring out of the ground as seismic activity intensifies in the southwestern part of the country. Over 700 quakes have struck in just the last day and more than 20,000 since October 25th. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma 
bubbling underground, threatening the small town of Grindavik. Authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people. We provide support and information when people are scared, they need that. Our cameras seeing multiple eruptions over the years in Iceland are Will Reeve up close and personal in 2021. Look there at all that lava coming out, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And back in 2010, another volcano erupted and it disrupted air travel for days. James Longman in Iceland, thank you. Coming up, thousands of Starbucks employees are set to strike across the country. Why it's happening and what it means for the company's famous Red Cup Day. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting on the flooded streets of Treasure Island, I'm Ginger Z. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Thousands of Starbucks employees are set to strike across the country, and that could cause some issues with getting your morning coffee. ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophers has more on that and your other business headlines. Alexis, what are you watching today? Watching that strike and also retail sales, Diane, because I want to start with that summer spending spree cooling heading into the holiday shopping season. Retail sales dipping a tenth of a percent in October. That is the first decline we've seen since March, but it is still better than expected. Consumers spent less at auto dealerships, department hardware, and furniture stores, but they continue to spend more at restaurants and bars, grocery stores, and and online. Filling out a federal student aid form could soon be a lot easier and less time consuming. On December 31st, the Department of Education will release a streamlined version of its college financial aid form known as the FAFSA. Officials tell ABC News that instead of over 100 questions, the improved form will ask less than 20, and they say it should take most people about 10 minutes to fill out. This is the first major update to the student aid application since the 1980s, believe it or not. Mortgage rates are cooling down right along with inflation. Just a few weeks ago, mortgage rates were above 8%. Today, they are at 7.4%. As investors bet the Fed is done raising interest rates, at least for now, analysts predict we could see mortgage rates drop to 7% in a few months, maybe even 6% by the spring. 
And you might have a tough time getting your morning coffee at some Starbucks locations tomorrow. That's when nearly 2,000 unionized baristas in 25 states are planning a one-day strike. Nicknamed the Red Cup Rebellion, the walkout will fall on one of the coffee chain's busiest days, Red Cup Day, when it hands out those free, usable cups. The union says Starbucks refused to resolve staffing and scheduling issues during busy promotional events. A Starbucks spokesperson says the union has refused to negotiate and has not met to sign a contract agreement now for months, Diane. All right, interesting. Alexis Christophers, thank you. Sure. And if you have any finance questions for Alexis, leave a message on our Instagram feed. She might answer your question right here on Thursday. And you've probably heard of body dysmorphia, but have you heard of money dysmorphia? The mental health disorder makes people see money in a way that doesn't reflect reality, and it can take a toll on your emotions and your finances. Our Rebecca Jarvis explains. Money. When it comes to money, it's never simple. From not having enough. The looming student debt that I came out of undergrad and law school, I just never thought I could get over. To always wanting more. I certainly bought into this message societally that safety and security really came from money. Jordan Jacob and Allison Osborne both say they suffered from what some financial advisors, including Ali Katz, are calling money dysmorphia, a financial state where self-perception doesn't match reality. Is the distorted view that many of us have of our finances that causes us to make poor decisions about our non-renewable resources, time, energy, attention, health, relationships. Think that sounds like you? Kat says to look for these telltale signs. You're always just getting by. You never quite have enough. Or you're constantly chasing more, 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 more. Or you're, you're at rock bottom. To break the cycle, Kat says you first need to get really clear about needs and wants. Put a number on it. Exactly what attorney Jacob did. Don't worry about what everybody else has. Worry about what you have. Then assess your relationship with money. For Osborne, that meant unlearning old habits. I think if I didn't learn how to navigate money as the fuel to get to the destination versus the destination itself, I, I don't know that I'd be able to do this. Finally, take action. Get really clear on what do you actually need to live the life that you want? What are the resources that you have to create that? And then what do you need to fill in the gap between what you need and what you actually have. Well, thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that report. Interesting. And thanks to you for streaming with us. I am Diane Macedo. We'll be right back. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at New York City on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. Israeli troops are storming Gaza's largest hospital, saying Hamas fighters are operating in tunnels underneath. Israel is calling it a targeted operation, saying they're taking steps to not harm civilians. Hamas says it holds the U.S. responsible for giving Israel the green light for what it calls a massacre against civilians. Meanwhile, a senior Israeli official says a deal could be within reach. Uh, within days to release more hostages being held by Hamas. Prosecutors in Georgia are seeking an emergency protective order in the election interference case against former President Trump and several co-defendants. The Fulton County DA's office is asking a judge to guard the evidence in the case after videos of confidential interviews with four defendants were obtained by news organizations. ABC News was first to report on portions of videos showing former Trump's attorney Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis telling prosecutors about their efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Ellis says one of Trump's top aides told her Trump would refuse to step down, saying he's, quote, is not going to leave under any circumstances. The judge is set to hold a hearing this afternoon. Closing arguments are expected today in the trial against the man accused of attacking former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer. Suspect David DePap took the stand yesterday, claiming he broke into Pelosi's home, trying to get to the bottom of an election conspiracy theory, but that when Nancy Pelosi wasn't home, he reacted and attacked Paul Pelosi instead. He's pleaded not guilty and faces life in prison if convicted. And it was a fighting start to last night's NBA game between the Timberwolves and the Warriors. Neither team had scored a point yet when the night's basket brawl broke out. It started with Clay Thompson and Jaden McDaniels getting into it at midcourt and ended with this viral moment of Warriors' Draymond Green putting one of the Timberwolves in a chokehold. All three players were ejected. The Timberwolves ended up winning 104 to 101. And just one week after a Florida dentist was convicted in the murder of an FSU law professor, his mother is now charged in the plot. Police say the 73-year-old was arrested as she was boarding a flight in an attempt to flee the country. ABC's Victor Kendo is at Miami International Airport with the details. Nearly a decade after a prominent FSU law professor was shot and killed in a murder-for-hire plot, this morning, a shocking new development. Ma'am, you were arrested on a warrant from Leon County, Florida. Dan Markell's former mother-in-law, Donna Adelson, now facing murder charges. The 73-year-old arrested at Miami International Airport Monday night after attempting to board a one-way flight to Vietnam. She was apprehended on the jetway getting on that plane. She had literally checked in and was walking into the plane. 41-year-old Markell was gunned down in the driveway of his Tallahassee home in 2014 while in a bitter custody battle with his ex-wife, Wendy Adelson, who wanted to relocate their two boys to South Florida to be closer to her family. But Markell refused. That's why prosecutors say the Adelson family took matters into their own hands. So who did it appear had a motive to want Dan Markell dead? His own family. Just last week, Wendy's brother, Charles Adelson, was convicted for Markell's murder. The Florida dentist also found guilty of soliciting and conspiring with two hitmen to carry it out. Now prosecutors say their mother, Donna, helped arrange that murder plot, too. In this police surveillance video, an undercover FBI agent confronts Adelson and demands more money after the murder. Investigators say she later made this call to her son. I've got some paperwork hand-delivered to me. Does it involve me or other people? Well, probably those people. According to the probable cause affidavit obtained by ABC News, Donna spoke to Charles in multiple jail calls over the past week where she told him she was getting things in order, creating trust, and making sure her grandchildren are taken care of. She even discussed plans for suicide or fleeing to a non-extradition country. Soon after, prosecutors claimed she booked that one-way flight to Vietnam with a layover in Dubai. 
when we found that she was leaving the country, extradition would have been an issue. And that was when the decision was made that we needed to kind of expedite. Adelson appearing before a Miami judge Tuesday morning, being held without bond. The Markell family not commenting on her arrest, but telling ABC News in September how relieved they were after Charles was arrested. Because it's taken so long. I want the people that are involved to pay the price. Both Donna and her daughter Wendy, Markel's ex, have previously denied any involvement in the crime. Wendy has never been charged. Diane? Victor Okendo at Miami International Airport for us. Thanks, Victor. And a mysterious illness is affecting dogs across the country. The respiratory sickness can be deadly if left untreated. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has more on what symptoms to watch for and what veterinarians are recommending. While research is still underway, vets calling the illness highly contagious and in some cases fatal. Most reported symptoms are similar to those of a typical kennel cough, including coughing, sneezing, nasal and or eye discharge and lethargy. Instead of that dry cough where the dog felt good, it was now this wet cough where the dog felt sick. Idaho dog owner Wendy Brown says her three golden retrievers, Bridge, Dooley and Lulu, each started showing symptoms earlier this month. Dooley started doing kind of this huffing and also seemed to feel quite lethargic. And not too long after, Bridge began to exhibit the symptoms. At first, Brown thought it was just a typical kennel cough, but when the symptoms didn't go away, she knew it was something more serious. And the vet started him on a 10-day cycle of doxycycline. Uh, today was day 10, and he is not a lot better. Brown says she's still in the dark as to what caused the illnesses in the first place. Experts say dogs showing any signs of consistent coughing is a good reason to get them checked out. We can ultrasound the lungs to see if there's a problem that is related to pneumonia or uh, the contagious pneumonia that seems to be going around. Now, if your dog does get sick, Dr. Kavanaugh says it's really important to keep that coughing dog away from other dogs, just like you would people. And she says you should do that for two weeks after the cough goes away so you don't spread it. Diane? All right, good tips, Eva Pilgrim. Thank you. And for more, let's bring in doctors Terrence Ferguson and Bernard Hodges, veterinarians and co-stars on National Geographic's Critter Fixers. Doctors, thank you both for being on. I know a lot of pet owners are really concerned right now. So, Dr. Ferguson, let's start with you. What do we know about this illness, and how concerned do you think dog owners need to be right now? Well, definitely right now it's a mystery. You know, um, going through this season, we often have a lot of respiratory disease that we have in dogs, but, you know, having one that we're not quite sure about kind of you know, change the things. We have to try to figure out how do we treat these things, how severe they are, or, you know, how they're spreading. Dr. Hodges, uh, this illness can be deadly if left untreated. So what symptoms specifically do dog owners need to keep an eye out for? And what do you do if you start noticing them? So we definitely want to kind of look out for any kind of, you know, excessive coughing, eye discharge, any, you know, if we start to have a fever, difficulty breathing, any, any nasal discharge or lethargy. And if you start seeing these things, definitely get your animal to a veterinarian because, you know, this is a mystery disease and it could, uh, you know, become fatal. Dr. Ferguson, what do we know about how this disease is spreading? Should dog owners be avoiding kennels and dog parks right now? Well, you know, at this point, we're not quite sure because it's still one of those mystery diseases. But if we look back on other illnesses that we have, like some of the influenza viruses that we have, we definitely know they're spread by, you know, direct contact or sneezing. So if it's in an area where you're having an outbreak, I would definitely say probably avoid those. Um, having your dog in a kennel or going to the groomer, those are some of the things you may want to not do right now until we kind of figure this out and uh, get a little bit better control on it. And Dr. Hodges, what are some small everyday things you think pet owners can do to keep our pets healthy? So one of the things definitely, you know, vaccination is the key. You know, Bordetella, which causes kennel cough, as well as flu. Flu is a relatively new one. It kind of threw veterinarians for a loop a few years ago. And then it, just like our viruses, it mutated. So we got a second strand of the flu. So definitely vaccinate your, your pets. Make sure that, you know, when you take them out, that they're in, you know, they're going around areas that they're on a whole lot of pet population that are sneezing and coughing. You know, and just, just like with us, make sure that you proper, you make sure they have regular veterinary checks and they're well vaccinated. All right, Drs. Terrence Ferguson, Bernard Hodges, thank you both. 
Thank you. Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. Coming up, protecting your immune system. Dr. Patel shares ways you can stay healthy this holiday season. Also ahead, preparing for Thanksgiving can be a headache, but our group chat is here to help. We've got tips on budgeting, cooking hacks, even how to navigate those tricky political conversations at the table. Stay with us. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. It's time now for Patel It Like It Is, where Dr. Alok Patel shares health advice on the topics that matter most to you. Today, we're talking about five ways to take care of your immune system this holiday season. Here's Dr. Patel with his top tips. Raise your hand if you've seen a claim that a pill, potion, or powder can boost your immune system. You know what I'm talking about. I'm Dr. Alok Patel, an ABC News medical contributor, physician, and I'm all about supporting our immune systems, but by tried and true methods. My ABC family is going to show you five things you can do every day to support your immune system. Let's go. Get moving. Regular exercise and maintaining a healthy weight is not only good for your heart, it reduces the risk of several diseases and directly supports the cells of your immune system. It's not that hard to incorporate movement in your everyday, is it? <laughs> Prioritize sleep. Sleep loss can mess with your immune system. So try to get seven to nine hours each night. And part of getting good sleep is developing good sleep habits and a solid bedtime routine. Just ask ABC News anchor and correspondent Diane Macedo, author of The Sleep Fix. Sweet dreams. Try and chill out a little. We live very hectic lives. And stress can impair your immune system's ability to fight off infections. Try meditation, yoga, journaling, anything to put your body in relaxation mode. Even a little bit a day can make a difference. Eat a healthy diet that is full of vitamins and minerals. If your immune system could talk, it would say, please feed me vitamins A, D, C, E, B6, B12, zinc, iron, copper, selenium, all that good stuff. Help it out. Fill your plate with a rainbow of fruits and vegetables and not so full of processed and fatty foods. Now, in some cases, your doctor may recommend you take a vitamin or a supplement, but generally speaking, you want to stick with real foods. Stay up to date with checkups and vaccines. Your body, the machine, needs fine tuning and upgrades every now and then. So managing any health conditions, getting regular checkups, and staying up to date with shots can ensure your body's in peak performance and ready to handle any invaders that come its way. Have you gotten your flu shot yet? You know it. See, there's no gimmicks here. 
just habits you've probably heard of that would make your parents very proud. And your immune system will love you and thank you by strapping on gloves and boxing out any threats that come your way. So stay nourished, stay active, but also rested and stress-free. And chat with your doctor if you have any questions. Stay healthy, everyone. And Dr. Alok Patel joins me now for more on this. Dr. let's do a little cold and flu rapid fire here. So products marketed as immune boosting or immune supplements, are they legit? I'm glad that you did this because typically they are not. If they're not FDA approved, a lot of them do not have the science to back their claims. And often these are marketed as things that are going to boost your immune system when natural methods like the ones we talked about are best. You want to go through and read all of them and, and kind of identify what might be in them. There is some evidence to suggest that zinc could reduce the duration of symptoms, but it's mixed reviews on vitamin C, elderberry, and everything else you see in the aisle in the grocery store or the pharmacy. So what does science show about stress and immunity? So acute or chronic stress can actually impair our ability to fight off infections. It puts our bodies in an inflammatory state, and this is not a good thing for many aspects of our health, including our ability to stay safe this holiday season, which is why it's so important to try is to chill out a little bit, the... take deep breaths, and make sure you get shot some, on some sleep. So let's say you start to feel sick. You feel run down. You're not really sure what it is. What would you immediately do? What I immediately do is I think about any exposures I may have had. If I expose someone with COVID-19, with the flu, I try to think about the symptoms. Is it allergies? Is it my sinus? And then I immediately go to what gives me symptomatic relief, including my neti pot, honey for coughs. That's a great tip for parents of kids above the age of one. And those lozenges or those sore throat drops. Now, with the potential rise in RSV, flu, and COVID, do you recommend people wear masks in crowded areas again? So personally speaking, I keep a mask with me because you never know when you're going to be in a situation when you're in a crowded area and the person next to you is sneezing or coughing. But it's really important that with RSV, influenza, and COVID, people pay attention to the fact that we have vaccines available for certain age groups, flu and COVID for nearly everyone, but with RSV for young children, pregnant women, and adults above the age of 60. So that is our best form of preventing severe disease. So uh, one more uh, myth buster perhaps for you. Can being physically cold or spending long amounts of time in cold, can that give you a cold? I can hear my mom and all my aunties right now saying like, don't go outside without a jacket, you're gonna catch a cold. Colds, respiratory viruses actually come from infections, not from physically shivering and being cold. Now being cold could put you at a disadvantage in terms of fighting off infections. Sometimes when you're cold, you might go inside and be in a crowded room with people who may also give you an infection as well. So it's not necessarily the temperature that's going to cause the virus to enter your body. But one last thing I will add, and I will add this again and again and again, is that sleep and hydration are so incredibly important. Do not neglect those two this holiday season. All right. I amen to that, Dr. Patel. Thank you. And remember, you. Dr. Patel is here to take your questions. So just leave a message on our Instagram feed at ABC News Live, and he might answer your question right here on Friday. Meanwhile, for the first time, Courtney Cox and Matt LeBlanc are sharing personal memories of their late Friends co-star Matthew Perry. Their tributes come weeks after the cast shared a joint statement after Perry's sudden passing. Chris Connolly is in Los Angeles with more. You don't think we'd buy a house and not have a Joey room, do you? Oh, my God. Hey. Courtney Cox and Matt LeBlanc sharing for the first time personal memories, laughter. I will not take this abuse. You're right. I'm sorry. Once I was a wooden boy, a little... <laughs> and deep feelings for their beloved colleague and close pal, Matthew Perry. I love her. I love her. <laughs> I love you, Monica. I love you too, Chandler. We're calling treasured times they had together on Friends. <laughs> I am so grateful for every moment I had with you, Maddie, and I miss you every day. Cox writing on social media. There are thousands of moments I wish I could share. Recounting a favorite scene her Monica Geller had with Perry's Chandler Bing. To give a little backstory, Chandler and Monica were supposed to have a one-night fling in London. But because of the audience's reaction, it became the beginning of their love story. You think you knew I was here? <laughs> In this scene, Cox recalls, before we started rolling, he whispered a funny line for me to say. The line was too racy for TV, but got a huge laugh. Okay, your turn. No, no beginning. 
<laughs> he told me to say it. He did. He often did things like that, she concludes. He was funny and he was kind. Joey, can I talk to you for a second? And Matt LeBlanc, Joey on Friends, offering right. images of hilarity and hugs. Any chance you're trying to pick a fight to make all of this easier? Oh, dude, you see right through me. <laughs> While paying a From the Heart tribute as well. I will always smile when I think of you, and I'll never forget you. Never. Spread your wings and fly, brother. You're finally free. Much love. And I guess you're keeping the 20 bucks you owe me. That humor and that fondness, a big part of what made this Friends cast feel like a family. Back then, and still today. Diane? It sure seems that way. Chris Connolly in Los Angeles, thank you. Coming up, <laughs> helping you prepare for Thanksgiving, how you can save, and tips for the kitchen after the break. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So, what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from the aftermath of the Maui fires, I'm Melissa Adon. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, Thanksgiving is almost a week away, and whether you're celebrating with family or joining a Friendsgiving, it can be a lot to prepare for. So today, our group chat is taking on cooking hacks, how to save money, and even ways to keep the conversation civil at the table. I want to bring in ABC News business reporter Alexis Christophorus, executive chef for the restaurant chain Slutty Vegan, Jim O.K. Jackson, and national etiquette expert Diane Gotsman for more on this. Thank you all for coming on. Happy early Thanksgiving. Alexis, I want to start with the money part because especially with inflation, we've seen grocery prices go, go pretty up. high. So how do you save when buying all the stuff you need for Thanksgiving? Go to the store with a shopping list so you don't get distracted is my number one uh, tip. And also, when you get there, choose fresh produce that's in season. That's going to be cheaper, especially this year. Canned string beans, pumpkins, pumpkin um, pie filling, um, cranberries, they're all higher. Scale back the menu. You don't have to have seven sides and four desserts. Use coupons and saving apps. I like Ibotta and Shopkick. They offer rebates and cash back. Use a cash back rewards card if you go shopping. And plan for leftovers because you can get a lot of meals out of Thanksgiving and that'll cost you, save you some money as well. I love the distraction note too. I often will do online pickup or online order because I know once I get in the aisles, it's game Good over. For the next thing I know, it's like this. Um, Jumoki, you're known to some as the Bishop of Biscuits. I am. I'm very happy <laughs> to see you brought some this biscuits morning. today. Alexis and I are pumped <laughs> about that. So what are some of your favorite side dishes to include on Thanksgiving? And are there any store-bought hacks for those of us who aren't chefs? Well, semi-made is probably the best way to go. Sure, you mix, those. right? You mix and mingle, you jizz it up, you make it your own. And the number one side dish is mashed potatoes. The reason why is because it's so easy to make, right? It's kind of like you put it in a pot and you forget about it. So those dishes that we can kind of combine everything together, stir it up or bake it or cook it on the stovetop and make it, those are the easiest ones to approach. And like you said, fresh produce, always say quality ingredients 
lead to quality results. So you want to pick the things that are in season, fresh, and available to you. Now, Diane, potlucks are a nice way to spread the work, but they can be tricky in terms of figuring out what to bring or, as the host, what to ask for. So what are some potluck etiquette rules? So always check on dietary restrictions and allergies. And especially if you have the allergy, you can ask the host if you can bring something to share with everyone else. And make sure that you're bringing something that isn't going to require the host's oven or stovetop if they don't have enough space. So you might have to heat it gently. And when you get there, put it in their oven. So always talk to the host to communicate and ask what is going to be best for them. Ask what they would like rather than surprising them. Yeah, that part about not being in the oven and not being in the way necessarily so huge when you're in the middle of a big meal. Jamoke, turkey, we know, is the star of the show for Thanksgiving, but not everyone eats meat. So yeah. any suggestions on good centerpieces for the table for those of us who don't? There are so much untraditional things that you can do. And even if, I, because I specialize in vegan food, um, even the advancements in uh, protein-based, plant-based uh, plant foods have been phenomenal. So there's things like seafood, crab cakes, fish, um, even staple uh, vegetables you can kind of highlight. Everybody picks a cauliflower steak. You know, things like that you can absolutely make as your centerpiece. It doesn't have to be a turkey. And Diane, we're dealing with political tensions, two wars overseas, an upcoming presidential election. There's a lot to argue about. So how do you keep things civil at the table, especially if somebody brings up a hot topic? So I think we all have the responsibility, if we would like, to change a conversation. The host can start out by communicating their request. Let's have a wonderful, memorable experience at the table. I look forward to learning all about what's been happening with all of us. And if it turns ugly, um, then whoever's sitting next to that person or even the host can say, okay, okay, guys, let's, let's table this and let's talk about something more pleasant. So we have to be kind, polite, proactive, and it's not important for us to prove our point at the table. There's there's time and place, but not at the Thanksgiving table or holiday table. Another tip, you can just serve these biscuits because my gosh, this is amazing. You don't want people talking. Just give them one of these. Mouthful conversation over. Business report, Alexis Christophorus, executive chef for Slutty Beat, do it, yeah. from OK Jackson. Thank you for the, my goodness, these are amazing. And national <laughs> etiquette expert, Diane Gossman. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving to all of you. Pumpkin? Oh, these are sweet so potato. good. Right? Sweet potato. We'll be right back. <laughs> this is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Ciudad Juarez on the U.S.-Mexico border, I'm Matt Rivers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
today on ABC News Live, Biden and Xi face to face, breaking a year long silence, hoping to smooth tensions and strengthen ties. Arcana Whitworth is live in San Francisco. Plus, why Gaza's largest hospital has become ground zero for IDF raids, Israeli forces insisting Hamas is operating beneath Al Shifa as patients remain trapped and doctors run out of medical supplies. And the man accused of bludgeoning Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer taking the stand in his own defense. He says he just wanted to talk to her about the Russians and 2016 election. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour is in San Francisco, where the diplomatic stakes are high as the leaders of two of the most powerful countries in the world meet to hash out their differences. President Biden meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping at APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. Those world leaders breaking a year-long silent treatment and meeting face-to-face -face for the first time in more than a year. President Biden with tempered expectations, but still hoping to boost the U.S. relationship with China from trade to technology to the restoration of military ties. Arcana Whitworth is there and will be joining us throughout the APEC summit. Kana, good to see you and what a beautiful background. <laughs> Isn't it gorgeous out here? I mean, San Francisco really putting on a show for you, Kira, and it's good to be with you. As you know, President Biden and President Xi are set to discuss a number of issues, including China's military aggression, the flow of fentanyl into the U.S., and also, of course, the growing concerns over Taiwan and managing the increasing economic competition. And the tension in the Middle East, of course, top of mind as well. This as Israel's war against Hamas intensifies by the minute. And because of the nature of this event, San Francisco is upping its security protocol all around the city. In fact, a U.S. Secret Service agent warning an extraordinary amount of police, military, and public safety personnel will be on the ground and in the air. You actually might even hear a helicopter above me right now. They're saying this is well above any kind of security detail that anyone has ever seen before. We have 12 world leaders in the city right now. Also, ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers is in San Francisco as well. And Karen, it's so good to have you out west. And we know it's been nearly a year since Biden and she have met. And it's been six years since she's been to the United States at all. So preparations mm -hmm. for this meeting, Karen, were extensive, to say the least, down to that smallest detail. Tell us about those logistics. Yeah, there has been intense preparations underway for the past couple of weeks, Kena, as they got to this point where President Biden sits down with China's President Xi. As you said, this is their first meeting in over a year, their first conversation in a year. So this is a very high stakes meeting. The officials on the White House side have been working with their Chinese counterparts to get ready for this day. But it even goes back months before that with three cabinet secretaries and the president's climate envoy, John Kerry, traveling to China to lay the groundwork for today. That's the preparation for the agenda and the conversations. You also have all of the preparation for the choreography and all of the details that go into every minute of a day like today. We're talking about how the car pulls up to the meeting site, where that meeting takes place. Kana, it's not happening in San Francisco. The two leaders are going to meet about an hour away from here, showing the significance of this meeting. It's not just a part of the APEC summit. It's something a bit more special. They're trying to elevate this to something that is uh, significant for the White House, showing a red carpet, really, for the Chinese leader. We're talking about details like the flowers, the seating, how the president will shake Xi's hand when they first arrive. All of this stuff has been planned to a very significant detail. Nothing left to chance. Those meetings are going to be several hours today here on the sidelines of this big summit. And Karen, as you detail that, it's clear that the pressure is on here. There are several key objectives for President Biden, and that, of course, includes military communication, trade, climate action, mm -hmm. fentanyl as well. And we know the expectations they keep saying are moderate, Karen. But does the White House think that they'll have any deliverables come out of this meeting? Yeah, they're really downplaying expectations for any major breakthroughs, Kena, trying to say that this is about a conversation and managing competition, having a frank and very direct conversation between two leaders who know each other very well, but as I say, have not had much direct contact now in the last year. So for the president, one of the key things that he would like to walk away from this meeting with is the restoration of those military-to-military -military communications. The Chinese froze those contacts back in August 
August of 2022, after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made that visit to Taiwan. This was a protest move by China, and for the president, he would like to see those ties restored. The White House says this is very significant when you have a complex, complicated relationship like the one between the U.S. and China. They want to make sure that if there are tensions between the two countries, it doesn't escalate and tip over into conflict. Kana? And Karen, this meeting, of course, comes amid the Israel-Hamas war with fears that this conflict could widen. Eyes are on Beijing's relationship with Iran specifically. What do we expect from that conversation? Yeah, this is going to be a big topic for President Biden. China is the biggest purchaser of Iranian oil. So the administration sees this as China having potentially considerable sway over Iran. So administration officials say that the president today will be pushing for China to use that leverage over Iran to stop Iran, uh, to, to have that message to Iran to stop those proxy groups from launching attacks on U.S. forces in the region and also to put pressure on Iran to try and mitigate any escalation in the region and not expand this war between Israel and Hamas. That's a potentially big ask, but the United States saying that China could have significant leverage over Iran and it's something the president will push China's President Xi on today. Kana? A big ask, that one, but one that needs to be made there. And Karen, of course, mm -hmm. the U.S. is also closely watching these upcoming elections in Taiwan. Uh, the United States mm -hmm. will also tell China, you know, not to interfere there during that meeting today. What do you see happening? Yeah, there is a concern about Chinese interference in that upcoming election in Taiwan, and that's going to be a message from the president. Do not do that. Also extending to the United States election next year as well, no interference there. But for the president, his message on Taiwan will be status quo from the United States side. The one China policy still stands. Our colleague Selena Wang asked the White House about that today, and they say that will be the message from the president, status quo when it comes to Taiwan. All right, Karen Travers with us in San Francisco. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. And of course, all throughout San Francisco, we've started to see protests break out. They were expected. It doesn't come as a surprise. And currently, they are now gathering near the Moscone Center. Uh, that's actually where this APEC conference is being held. Uh, there are hundreds in attendance at this moment, and some are growing increasingly aggressive. Uh, they're also clashing with police at times. I want to check in now with ABC's Jacqueline who is live near those protests with with more and Jacqueline I know that we've seen these protests break out and it's also starting to rain where I'm at I'm sure it is where you're at as well what is that scene like well, Kena, it just started raining two minutes ago, um, but I will say the protesters are still out here. They've been chanting all morning. Now, what we've been seeing is anyone who is wearing a suit, any delegate who was trying to walk into APEC earlier this morning, a lot of them were coming from this direction. And as they walked, you would see dozens of protesters swarm them, physically put their hands on them to prevent them from entering APEC. Um, and, and so the delegates were then being rerouted by the police to walk over here around the building to then get into uh, APEC through a different direction. Now, earlier, we saw dozens of police officers forming a line here as things got progressively worse. The police just left about five minutes ago. So at the moment, we're just seeing the protesters here. Uh, ultimately, the protesters say they're trying to make their voice heard. They're trying to show the delegates who are at APEC that they are not standing for their policies, Kena. And Jacqueline, you know, when I arrived last night, couldn't even get into the hotel because there was a big demonstration outside of the hotel. And those demonstrators at that point were calling for a ceasefire. They were marching to the Israeli consulate. What kind of protests are you seeing today? What are they calling for? So they are saying, uh, say no to APEC. Actually, right over here, let me point this out. You can hear these protesters chanting and screaming at delegates they see. Again, anyone that you see in a suit, they will go after them. They're yelling shame. Um, and, and say no to APEC is part of more than 170 uh, grassroots organizations, as well as members from the union, who are saying that the policies that APEC promotes ultimately support climate change. They say it leads to human rights violations. Um, and they're also calling for a ceasefire uh, with Israel and Palestine. They are ultimately trying to bring more attention to third world countries and how the policies put on by uh, some of the wealthiest corporations. Oh, look at this, Kena, over here. You can see they're following delegates and yelling shame. 
physically putting their bodies in the way of delegates who are either who are trying to leave APEC, getting into altercations. There are no police currently in this corner. And you can see, you see they're physically putting their hands on the delegate or anyone who is seen as corporate greed. So as you can see, it's, it's very aggressive here, Kena, and the second they see someone come out, they'll start chanting shame. Shame, and the tension's certainly rising there, and you're so right to point that out, Jacqueline, as they turn that corner and there's no police there. Uh, they're coming in direct contact with those protesters. And we've seen these protesters throughout the week, Jacqueline, but we've also seen local residents who feel like their city here has been transformed in an essence. And we've had people in San Francisco complaining about crime and other things, and they say that essentially it's changed overnight ahead of APEC. What are they telling you? Well, so San Francisco has been battling uh, a homelessness crisis, a crime crisis. A lot of residents have said that it's very sad that it took something like APEC for the city to finally, finally clean up. Residents have been saying they've been very disappointed. The city has been going downhill. Um, so they're saying some sort of policies need to be enacted to, to change the direction of the city. Kate. All right, Jacqueline Lee, live for us in San Francisco. We really appreciate that, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. And while expectations for this meeting that we're waiting for this afternoon are low or moderate between President Biden and Xi Jinping, some say there are several things that President, President Xi is hoping to get out of this summit specifically. So ABC News foreign correspondent Britt Clenet has the latest for us. Britt? Hi, Kara. Well, expectations might be low ahead of the meeting between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping, but the view from China is somewhat upbeat. State media touting xi diplomacy and the need to build bridges and coexist peacefully, the hope being that getting relations back on track will also help get the country's economy back on track too. China is becoming frustrated by what it sees as the U.S. refusing to relax trade restrictions. And looming over all of this is Taiwan's presidential election in just two months' time. China is expected to seek a firm pledge that the U.S. won't encourage Taiwan to pursue formal independence, especially with a candidate it despises as the frontrunner. Now, I spoke to Victor Gao a little earlier. He's a former Chinese diplomat. He told me that China is warning the U.S. against hollowing out the One China policy that counts Taiwan as part of it no matter what. Taiwan is the reddest of red lines for China. Now, another sticking point could be the Ukraine and Middle East wars. China has been growing closer to Iran, a supporter of Hamas. But she will be reiterating that China is neutral and renewing China's calls for peace. Kira. And that is Britt Clinton reporting for us from Hong Kong. Britt, thank you so much. And as a reminder to all of you, we have special coverage uh, today during President Biden's high stakes meeting with Chinese President Xi. And you can join me right here on ABC News Live at 5 p.m. Eastern. And also, Kira, we are expecting the president to have a 4 p.m. presser. Uh, that's 4 p.m. local Pacific after that meeting. And then, Kira, right behind me, he will be holding an event here. Uh, the, the U.S. State Department doesn't want to too many details to be let out, but it will be <laughs> happening here right behind me. We'll be watching out for it, Kira. All right, and we'll see you then. Kana, thank you so much, and we'll see you throughout uh, every program this afternoon. Much more ahead on ABC News Live. Why Gaza's largest hospital has become ground zero for IDF raids as patients remain trapped and doctors run out of medical supplies. Whenever news breaks. The crushing families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. 
please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop. Hey, stop. Hey, hey, hey. Everybody was scared that you were showing up to Laredo. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real-life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind-boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, see all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. you're streaming with us. Well, the Israeli military using tanks and troops raiding Gaza's biggest hospital. The IDF says it has concrete proof that Hamas is using the medical complex as its headquarters to support its terrorist operations and house hostages. Hamas says Israel is killing civilians and President Biden is to blame. Our chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is there. The Israeli military raiding Al Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa Hospital. And releasing these videos, they say, show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital, where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering, according to the Hamas run Ministry of Health, which also shared these images they say are from inside the hospital amid the raid, that ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around Al Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. We do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the Al Shifa Hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within Al Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The Children's Hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. Bring them home! Bring them home! In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. And our thanks to Matt Gutman for that. Straight ahead here at home, six people, including three teenagers, have died after a caused crash that left six people dead, including three teens, just east of Columbus, Ohio. We are being advised that there is children trapped on the bus. First responders rushing to the scene, urging students to jump out of the window. <laughs> Seconds later, an explosion. Officials say a chain reaction caused five vehicles to collide. One of them was a semi-truck slamming into this charter bus carrying the Tuskegee Valley Marching Band. 
17-year-old Samantha Bossler, a saxophone player, was on the bus. There was immediate flames from the truck in the back. There's different stuff flying up on us. And we realized that what happened and looked around and there was a lot of kids stuck in seats. Of the three teens killed, the youngest was 15. Police confirming at least three other people were killed in a car that was also involved in the crash. And more than a dozen others were taken to hospitals. Samantha says she's okay. I just happened to choose the right seats. The charred remains of that bus towed away from the scene. Kira, the injured were taken to seven area hospitals, including here at Nationwide Children's. Now, the NTSB has a team on the ground investigating in Ohio. That truck company for the semi involved says that it's cooperating with authorities. Kira. All right, Alex Prochet, thanks so much. And coming up, the man accused of attacking Nancy Pelosi's husband on trial and in tears as he takes the stand in his own defense. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. Start kissing each other and then she tells me no I get up on the beach and I kick her extremely hard in the face and then I push her off into the sea a liar a murderer and a psychopath I was able to turn around now and I had the power over him it angers me it makes me just want to return the favor to him I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We're coming to you from the top of Carnarvon Castle in Wales. I'm Maggie Rooley. Whatever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Other stories we're tracking for you this hour. Closing arguments expected today in the trial of the man accused of attacking former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer. David DePap taking the stand, even breaking down in tears as he detailed the events leading up to the attack. He said he wanted to ask Nancy Pelosi about government corruption, 
post video of it online while not intending to hurt her husband. He says he acted out when he realized his plan was ruined. If convicted, DePat faces life in prison. Las Vegas police arrest eight teenagers in connection with the beating death of 17-year-old Jonathan Lewis. Police say that the teen died from blunt force injuries after he was jumped by 15 people outside a high school earlier this month. The suspects are all between 13 and 17 years old and are expected to face murder charges. More arrests are expected in the case. Warner Brothers reversing its decision to shelve Coyote vs. Acme, a comedy centered around Looney Tunes character Wile E. Coyote for a tax write-off. After backlash, the company will instead allow the film's director to shop it to other studios and streamers. But the bad press that came with the original decision isn't going away. Congressman Joaquin Castro dropping the anvil, calling for the Justice Department and the FTC to review the studio's practice of scrapping completed projects for tax breaks, calling them predatory and anti-competitive. Well, people in southwestern Iceland are being given one last chance to get their belongings and get out. Officials there are warning that a volcano could erupt at any moment. And thousands of residents have already evacuated the small town there in Iceland following a massive uptick of earthquakes. Our foreign correspondent James Longman is on the scene. Thousands of earthquakes. That's what officials in Iceland say has alerted them to what they call an imminent volcanic eruption and the significant likelihood it'll happen soon. Cracks in roads have opened up, steam pouring out of the ground as seismic activity intensifies in the southwestern part of the country. Over 700 quakes have struck in just the last day and more than 20,000 since October 25th. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma bubbling underground, threatening the small town of Grindavik. Authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people. We provide support and information when people are scared, they need that. Our cameras seeing multiple eruptions over the years in Iceland are Will Reeve up close and personal in 2021. Look there at all that lava coming up, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Back in 2010, another volcano erupted and it disrupted air travel for days. And we'll continue to follow, of course, the story with our James Longman. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on your favorite streaming channel, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tonight, the high stakes face-to-face, -face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live.
We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For non-stop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Today on ABC News Live, Biden and Xi face to face, breaking a year long silence, hoping to smooth tensions and strengthen ties. Arcana Whitworth is live in San Francisco. Plus, why Gaza's largest hospital has become ground zero for IDF raids. Israeli forces insisting Hamas is operating beneath Al Shifa as patients remain trapped and doctors run out of medical supplies. And the man accused of bludgeoning Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer taking the stand in his own defense. He says he just wanted to talk to her about the Russians and 2016 election. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour is in San Francisco, where the diplomatic stakes are high as the leaders of two of the most powerful countries in the world meet to hash out their differences. President Biden meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping at APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. Those world leaders breaking a year-long silent treatment and meeting face-to-face -face for the first time in more than a year. President Biden with tempered expectations, but still hoping to boost the U.S. relationship with China from trade to technology to the restoration of military ties. Arcana Whitworth is there and will be joining us throughout the APEC Summit. Kana, good to see you and what a beautiful background. <laughs> Isn't it gorgeous out here? I mean, San Francisco really putting on a show for you, Kira, and it's good to be with you. As you know, President Biden and President Xi are set to discuss a number of issues, including China's military aggression, the flow of fentanyl into the U.S., and also, of course, the growing concerns over Taiwan and managing the increasing economic competition. And the tension in the Middle East, of course, top of mind as well. This is Israel's war against Hamas intensifies by the minute. And because of the nature of this event, San Francisco is upping its security protocol all around the city. In fact, a U.S. Secret Service agent warning an extraordinary amount of police, military, and public safety personnel will be on the ground and in the air. You actually might even hear a helicopter above me right now. They're saying this is well above any kind of security detail that anyone has ever seen before. We have 12 world leaders in the city right now. Also, ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers is in San Francisco as well. And Karen, it's so good to have you out west. And we know it's been nearly a year since Biden and she have met. And it's been six years since she's been to the United States at all. So preparations mm -hmm. for this meeting, Karen, were extensive, to say the least, down to that smallest detail. Tell us about those logistics. Yeah, there has been intense preparations underway for the past couple of weeks, Kana, as they got to this point where President Biden sits down with China's President Xi. As you said, this is their first meeting in over a year, their first conversation in a year, so this is a very high-stakes meeting. The officials on the White House side have been working with their Chinese counterparts to get ready for this day, but it even goes back months before that with three cabinet secretaries and the president's climate envoy, John Kerry, traveling to China to lay the groundwork for today. That's the preparation for the agenda and the conversations. You also have all of the preparation for the choreography and all of the details that go into every minute of a day like today. We're talking about how the car pulls up to the meeting site, where that meeting takes place. Kana, it's not happening in San Francisco. The two leaders are going to meet about an hour away from here, showing the significance of this meeting. It's not just a part of the APEC summit. It's something a bit more special. They're trying to elevate this to something that is uh, significant for the White House, showing a red carpet, really, for the Chinese leader. We're talking about details like the flowers, the seating, how the president will shake Xi's hand when they first arrive. All of this stuff has been planned to a very significant detail. Nothing left to chance. Those meetings are going to be several hours today here on the sidelines of this big summit.
And Karen, as you detail that, it's clear that the pressure is on here. There are several key objectives for President Biden, and that, of course, includes military communication, trade, climate action, mm -hmm. fentanyl as well. And we know the expectations, they keep saying, are moderate, Karen. But does the White House think that they'll have any deliverables come out of this meeting? Yeah, they're really downplaying expectations for any major breakthroughs, Kena, trying to say that this is about a conversation and managing competition, having a frank and very direct conversation between two leaders who know each other very well, but as I say, have not had much direct contact now in the last year. So for the president, one of the key things that he would like to walk away from this meeting with is the restoration of those military to military communications. The Chinese froze those contacts back in August of 2022, after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made that visit to Taiwan. This was a protest move by China, and for the president, he would like to see those ties restored. The White House says this is very significant when you have a complex, complicated relationship like the one between the U.S. and China. They want to make sure that if there are tensions between the two countries, it doesn't escalate and tip over into conflict. Kana? And Karen, this meeting, of course, comes amid the Israel-Hamas war with fears that this conflict could widen. Eyes are on Beijing's relationship with Iran specifically. What do we expect from that conversation? Yeah, this is going to be a big topic for President Biden. China is the biggest purchaser of Iranian oil. So the administration sees this as China having potentially considerable sway over Iran. So administration officials say that the president today will be pushing for China to use that leverage over Iran to stop Iran, uh, to, to have that message to Iran to stop those proxy groups from launching attacks on U.S. forces in the region and also to put pressure on Iran to try and mitigate any escalation in the region and not expand this war between Israel and Hamas. That's a potentially big ask, but the United States saying that China could have significant leverage over Iran and it's something the president will push China's President Xi on today. Kana? A big ask, that one, but one that needs to be made there. And Karen, of course, mm -hmm. the U.S. is also closely watching these upcoming elections in Taiwan. Uh, the United States mm -hmm. will also tell China, you know, not to interfere there during that meeting today. What do you see happening? Yeah, there is a concern about Chinese interference in that upcoming election in Taiwan, and that's going to be a message from the president. Do not do that. Also extending to the United States election next year as well, no interference there. But for the president, his message on Taiwan will be status quo from the United States side. The one China policy still stands. Our colleague Selena Wang asked the White House about that today, and they say that will be the message from the president, status quo when it comes to Taiwan. All right, Karen Travers with us in San Francisco. Thank you so much. We appreciate that. And of course, all throughout San Francisco, we've started to see protests break out. They were expected. It doesn't come as a surprise. And currently, they are now gathering near the Moscone Center. Uh, that's actually where this APEC conference is being held. Uh, there are hundreds in attendance at this moment, and some are growing increasingly aggressive. Uh, they're also clashing with police at times. I want to check in now with ABC's Jacqueline Lee, who is live near those protests with with more and Jacqueline I know that we've seen these protests break out and it's also starting to rain where I'm at I'm sure it is where you're at as well what is that scene like well, Kena, it just started raining two minutes ago, um, but I will say the protesters are still out here. They've been chanting all morning. Now, what we've been seeing is anyone who is wearing a suit, any delegate who was trying to walk into APEC earlier this morning, a lot of them were coming from this direction. And as they walked, you would see dozens of protesters swarm them, physically put their hands on them to prevent them from entering APEC. Um, and, and so the delegates were then being rerouted by the police to walk over here around the building to then get into uh, APEC through a different direction. Now, earlier, we saw dozens of police officers forming a line here as things got progressively worse. The police just left about five minutes ago. So at the moment, we're just seeing the protesters here. Uh, ultimately, the protesters say they're trying to make their voice heard. They're trying to show the delegates who are at APEC that they are not standing for their policies. Kena. And Jacqueline, you know, when I arrived last night, couldn't even get into the hotel because there was a big demonstration outside of the hotel. And those demonstrators at that point were calling for a ceasefire. They were marching to the Israeli consulate. What kind of protests are you seeing today? What are they calling for? So they are 
are saying uh, say no to APEC. Actually, right over here, let me point this out. You can hear these protesters chanting and screaming at delegates they see. Again, anyone that you see in a suit, they will go after them. They're yelling shame. Um, and, and say no to APEC is part of more than 170 uh, grassroots organizations as well as members from the union who are saying that the policies that APEC promotes ultimately support climate change. They say it leads to human rights violations. Um, and they're also calling for a ceasefire uh, with Israel and Palestine. They are ultimately trying to bring more attention to third world countries and how the policies put on by uh, some of the wealthiest corporations. Oh, look at this, Kena, over here. You can see they're following delegates and yelling shame, physically putting their bodies in the way of delegates who are either, who are trying to leave APEC, getting into altercations. There are no police currently in this corner. And you can see, you see they're physically putting their hands on the delegate or anyone who is seen as corporate greed. So as you can see, it's, it's very aggressive here, Kena, and the second they see someone come out, they'll start chanting shame. Shame. And the tension's certainly rising there, and you were so right to point that out, Jacqueline, as they turn that corner and there's no police there. Uh, they're coming in direct contact with those protesters. And we've seen these protesters throughout the week, Jacqueline, but we've also seen local residents who feel like their city here has been transformed in an essence. And we've had people in San Francisco complaining about crime and other things, and they say that essentially it's changed overnight ahead of APEC. What are they telling you? Well, so San Francisco has been battling uh, a homelessness crisis, a crime crisis. A lot of residents have said that it's very sad that it took something like APEC for the city to finally, finally clean up. Residents have been saying they've been very disappointed. The city has been going downhill. Um, so they're saying some sort of policies need to be enacted to, to change the direction of the city. Katie. All right, Jacqueline Lee, live for us in San Francisco. We really appreciate that, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. And while expectations for this meeting that we're waiting for this afternoon are low or moderate between President Biden and Xi Jinping, some say there are several things that President, President Xi is hoping to get out of this summit specifically. So ABC News foreign correspondent Britt Clenet has the latest for us. Britt? Hi, Kena. Well, expectations might be low ahead of the meeting between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping, but the view from China is really somewhat upbeat. State media touting xi diplomacy and the need to build bridges and coexist peacefully. The hope being that getting relations back on track will also help get the country's economy back on track too. China is becoming really frustrated by what it sees as the U.S. refusing to relax trade restrictions and it hopes that this will kind of turn that around. Looming over all of this is Taiwan's presidential election in just two months' time. China is expected to seek a really firm pledge that the U.S. won't encourage Taiwan to pursue formal independence, especially with a candidate it despises as the front-runner. And Victor Gao, a former Chinese diplomat, uh, he told me a little earlier that uh, China is warning the U.S. against hollowing out the one-China policy that counts Taiwan as part of it no matter what. Another sticking point could be the Ukraine and Middle East wars. China has been growing closer to Iran, which is a supporter of Hamas. But she will be reiterating that China is neutral in all of this and renewing China's calls for peace. Kena. And that is Britt Clinton reporting for us from Hong Kong. Britt, thank you so much. And as a reminder to all of you, we have special coverage uh, today during President Biden's high stakes meeting with Chinese President Xi. And you can join me right here on ABC News Live at 5 p.m. Eastern. And also, Kira, we are expecting the president to have a 4 p.m. presser. Uh, that's 4 p.m. local Pacific after that meeting. And then, Kira, right behind me, he will be holding an event here. Uh, the, the U.S. State Department doesn't want too many details to be let out, but it will be <laughs> happening here right behind me. We'll be watching out for it, Kira. All right, and we'll see you then. Kana, thank you so much, and we'll see you throughout uh, every program this afternoon. Much more ahead on ABC News Live. Why Gaza's largest hospital has become ground zero for IDF raids as patients remain trapped and doctors run out of medical supplies.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights. America's most honored streaming news program. Only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news. you're streaming with us. Well, the Israeli military using tanks and troops raiding Gaza's biggest hospital. The IDF says it has concrete proof that Hamas is using the medical complex as its headquarters to support its terrorist operations and house hostages. Hamas says Israel is killing civilians and President Biden is to blame. Our chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is there. The Israeli military raiding Al Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa Hospital. And releasing these videos, they say, show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital, where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering, according to the Hamas run Ministry of Health, which also shared these images they say are from inside the hospital amid the raid, that ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around al-Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. We do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the al-Shifa hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within al-Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. 
It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We're, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The Children's Hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. Here at home, six people, including three teenagers, have died after a fiery crash on an Ohio highway. The chain reaction crash sent a semi-truck slamming into a charter bus carrying 54 high school students. Our Alex Brechet has the latest. Investigators looking into what caused this fiery crash that left six people dead, including three teens, just east of Columbus, Ohio. We are being advised that there is children trapped on the bus. First responders rushing to the scene, urging students to jump out of the window. <laughs> Seconds later, an explosion. Officials say a chain reaction caused five vehicles to collide. One of them was a semi-truck slamming into this charter bus carrying the Tusky Valley Marching Band. 17-year-old Samantha Bossler, a saxophone player, was on the bus. There was immediate flames from the truck in the back. There's different stuff flying up on us. And we realized that what happened and looked around, and there was a lot of kids stuck in seats. Of the three teens killed, the youngest was 15. Police confirming at least three other people were killed in a car that was also involved in the crash. And more than a dozen others were taken to hospitals. Samantha says she's okay. I just happened to choose the right seats. The charred remains of that bus towed away from the scene. Kira, the injured were taken to seven area hospitals, including here at Nationwide Children's. Now, the NTSB has a team on the ground investigating in Ohio. That truck company for the semi-involved says that it's cooperating with authorities. Kira. All right, Alex Prochet, thanks so much. And coming up, the man accused of attacking Nancy Pelosi's husband on trial and in tears as he takes the stand in his own defense. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her extremely hard in the face, and then I push her off into the sea. Liar murderer and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. When the announcer calls my name, the world almost fades away. It's the biggest, it's the most famous dog event there is. Welcome to Crux, the world's greatest dog show. The competition in dog dancing is very stiff. Here, every dog has its day on the dance floor. Dancing with my dog is the closest thing to magic. Our winner, our Crux 2023. The Secret Life of Dancing Dogs, streaming only on Hulu, November 17th. Reporting from the White House, I'm Elizabeth Schulze. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Other stories we're tracking for you this hour. Closing arguments expected today in the trial of the man accused of attacking former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer. David DePap taking the stand, even breaking down in tears as he detailed the events leading up to the attack. He said he wanted to ask Nancy Pelosi about government corruption, post video of it online while not intending to hurt her husband. He says he acted out when he realized his plan was ruined. If convicted, DePap faces life in prison. Las Vegas police arrest eight teenagers in connection with the beating death of 17-year-old Jonathan Lewis. Police say that the teen died from blunt force injuries after he was jumped by 15 people outside a high school earlier this month. The suspects are all between 13 and 17 years old and are expected to face murder charges. More arrests are expected in the case. Warner Brothers reversing its decision to shelve Coyote vs. Acme, a comedy centered around Looney Tunes character Wile E. Coyote for a tax write-off. After backlash, the company will instead allow the film's director to shop it to other studios and streamers. But the bad press that came with the original decision isn't going away. Congressman Joaquin Castro dropping the anvil, calling for the Justice Department and the FTC to review the studio's practice of scrapping completed projects for tax breaks, calling them predatory and anti-competitive. Well, people in southwestern Iceland are being given one last chance to get their belongings and get out. Officials there warning that a volcano could erupt at any moment. And thousands of residents have already evacuated the small town there in Iceland following a massive uptick of earthquakes. Our foreign correspondent James Longman is on the scene. Thousands of earthquakes. That's what officials in Iceland say has alerted them to what they call an imminent volcanic eruption and the significant likelihood it'll happen soon. Cracks in roads have opened up, steam pouring out of the ground as seismic activity intensifies in the southwestern part of the country. Over 700 quakes have struck in just the last day and more than 20,000 since October 25th. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma bubbling underground, threatening the small town of Grindavik. Authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people. We provide support and information. When people are scared, they need that. Our cameras seeing multiple eruptions over the years in Iceland are Will Reeve up close and personal in 2021. Look there at all that lava coming up, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And back in 2010, another volcano erupted and it disrupted air travel for days. And we'll continue to follow, of course, the story with our James Longman. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on your favorite streaming channel, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Give it to me. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Today on ABC News Live, Biden and she face to face, breaking a year long silence, hoping to smooth tensions and strengthen ties. Arcana Whitworth is live in San Francisco. Plus, why Gaza's largest hospital has become ground zero for raids by the Israeli Defense Forces, uh, who are insisting that Hamas is operating beneath Al Shifa Hospital as patients remain trapped there and doctors run out of medical supplies. And the man accused of bludgeoning Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer taking the stand in his own defense. He says he just wanted to talk to her about the Russians and the 2016 election. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour is in San Francisco, where the diplomatic stakes are high as the leaders of the two of the most powerful countries in the world are meeting today to hash out their differences. President Biden is holding talks with Chinese President Xi Jinping today at APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. The world leaders face to face for the first time in more than a year. The White House says President Biden has, quote, tempered expectations in his plan to boost the U.S. relationship with China, but he does want to deliver what they are calling substantial outcomes on a number of issues, including the restoration of military ties. Arcana Whitworth is tracking the latest from San Francisco, and she'll be joining us throughout the APEC Summit. Hey, Kana. Hey, Kira and Terry, so happy to be with you here in San Francisco. And as you said, President Biden and President Xi are discussing a number of major issues, including China's military aggression. Also, of course, the flow of fentanyl top of mind for many. The U.S. has growing concerns as well over Taiwan and managing the increasing economic competitions, as well as looking at that tension in the Middle East as Israel's war against Hamas intensifies by the minute. And because of the nature of this event, San Francisco is upping its security protocol all around the city. In fact, a U.S. Secret Service agent warning, quote, an extraordinary amount of police, military and public safety personnel will be on the ground. They say well above what anyone has seen before. So they're taking this very seriously as we have some 12 world leaders here. Also here is our ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers. She is at APEC in San Francisco with all of the details. And again, Karen, glad to have you out west with us. And let's start first with Biden's hopes for today's meeting. What do we expect these two leaders to discuss? I know there's a wide array of topics. What's on your mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, really modest expectations from the White House about what can be accomplished in just a couple of hours of meetings between President Biden and China's President Xi. They're really downplaying expectations for any major breakthroughs. But a couple things that they say the president would like to see. One, you mentioned that restoration of military to military communications between the U.S. and China. China froze those communications in August of 2022 after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. That was something that 
that really upset the Chinese. So they froze those communications in protest. But the president today has made that a priority to try to restore those lines because they feel that when you have a relationship like this that is complicated, that is very complex, any sort of provocations between the two militaries, you want to have those open lines of talk so you can pick up the phone and bring things down so they're not escalating into conflict. Kena? And what is motivating President Xi to attend this meeting at this point, Karen? Yeah, Taiwan is one big issue that the, the Chinese are seeking assurances from the United States that there will not be a change in status quo from the U.S. perspective when it comes to Taiwan's independence. We are told from senior officials that that is what the president will say today. No change in the U.S. position of the one China policy on Taiwan's independence. Still, we are told, though, that the president will make it clear to China and President Xi that they do not want to see China interfere in Taiwan's upcoming elections. That's going to happen in January. Also, China is experiencing an economic downturn, rising unemployment, a slowdown in their economy there. So a message today is they're open for business after COVID lockdowns. They also want to see more foreign investment in China. So for China's President Xi, this is obviously a very important meeting with President Biden, but he's also going to be meeting with top CEOs here in the United States to try and lure that investment into his country. Kena? Certainly is, Karen. And also, we know that we've heard the U.S. and the president talk about hoping to reestablish this military to military communication mm -hmm. once again. And the president even saying, you know, he'd like to be able to just pick up the phone. Is that a realistic ask? Yeah. It is. It's actually the one thing where senior officials were willing to say that they think this is something that could be the deliverable, to give a little bit of diplomatic speak. The one thing that at the end of this uh, summit with President Xi, the president can say, we accomplished that. And I think they are trying to downplay the expectations on the other big things in terms of economic competition, because that's a big issue. They're not going to reach any major agreements over just a couple of hours. But in terms of restoring those military ties, that is something something they do think they can achieve. One other thing that they think is achievable by the end of these conversations is some agreement of common ground on combating the illicit fentanyl trade in the United States. That's a very big deal for President Biden, something he's going to push China's President Xi on today. And potentially finding some common ground on climate change as well, combating that. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen Travers, our thanks to you. And as many of you have seen throughout the nation, as all eyes are on San Francisco, there have been protests. And there have been many of them already this week. And some of them are gathering right now. It's actually happening near the Moscone Center, where is where that's where the conference is actually being held. Uh, hundreds are in attendance for this protest. And some of them have been growing increasingly aggressive. Sometimes they're clashing uh, with police as well as diplomats and people trying to go into these meetings. Uh, ABC News' Jacqueline Lee is joining us live uh, at the protest now with more on this. So Jacqueline, I know that you've been out there all morning. Uh, and so tell us exactly what you're seeing is you show, pointed out to us last time, uh, sometimes demonstrators are actually putting their hands on people. Yeah, that's right. That's right, Kena. And you know, actually, the protest ended just a few minutes ago. And here is why: they say their entire objective today was to delay APEC as long as possible. So what they were doing is they were blocking the uh, two sides over there and over here uh, from anyone entering. So if they saw someone in a suit, so a delegate who was trying to enter APEC, they would swarm them, put their hands on them, chant shame, chant say no to APEC, and physically block them from entering. Now, uh, one of the protest leaders tell me the reason why they ended the protest is because they say they achieved their objective and that they were successful, you know. Okay, so if they feel that they achieved their objective and they delayed this, we also saw, Jacqueline, though, you know, some other calls during these demonstrations. In fact, when I got in town last night, we couldn't even get into our hotel because there was a large demonstration, people calling for a ceasefire as they marched towards the Israeli consulate uh, here in San Francisco. So have you seen other calls like that as well? Yes, yeah, so the Say No to APEC Coalition, who was in charge of this protest here, is made up of more than 170 grassroots organizations and unions. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to bring more attention to the policies that they say are promoted by APEC. They say that APEC policies promote climate change, 
They say it uh, leads to corporate greed, and they say you know, the, the agreements that are brokered here at the conference ultimately lead to human rights violations. They're trying to bring awareness about workers' conditions, the wages. They say that um, it increases the wage gap between the wealthy and the poor. They're also calling for a ceasefire between Israel and Palestine. Kena. It appears they have a litany of issues and they want their voices heard. Also, Jacqueline, I mean, the security around this area is tremendous. And I saw it last night as well, authorities out there in their riot gear. What are you seeing in terms of a police response? Yes, yeah, so this is where the protest was happening. But actually, right over here on the corner is you see a row of police officers in their riot gear. And they actually uh, formed a few hours after the protesters were here. So there were two spots that police formed. It was behind us over there as well as over here. Once things started getting a little more aggressive, then you saw them pull out what they call their less lethal shotguns. We heard them rack them. They put on their helmets, um, and then they formed their own human barricade to prevent protesters uh, from moving past this intersection, Kena. And Jacqueline, for many people that live here in San Francisco, some of them say that, you know, their city has completely changed in the wake uh, of APEC. Essentially, they're talking about the security barricades that I'm seeing right behind me. I'm sure that you're seeing them as well. But they also are concerned about crime, and they're worried that it took an event like this to highlight some of the issues that this city is experiencing. Are, are you hearing a similar sentiment? Yep, that's right. You know, it's no secret that San Francisco has been battling a homelessness crisis, a crime crisis. And so what residents have said is they say it's a shame that it took something like APEC for the city to finally clean up its streets. They're calling for changes to policy because they say ultimately San Francisco has really gone downhill in the last few years. They say it used to be a really beautiful, wonderful place to live. Um, but now they, they live in fear based off of just uh, crime and homelessness just taking over. So they say they're just increasingly frustrated with local leaders came out. All right, Jacqueline Lee, thank you for your reporting just outside APEC. We appreciate that. Of course, we are waiting uh, for this meeting. It is imminent between Biden and Xi, and we, of course, will have special coverage all throughout the day today in regards to this meeting, this high-stakes meeting happening momentarily. And you can always join me again right here on ABC News Live at 5 p.m. Eastern. And uh, Terry and Kira, I know that we're watching for that meeting as well, and we expect the president to have a press conference later today as well. And then uh, right behind me, he will be holding some kind of event, uh, the State Department keeping things pretty secret, uh, but that will be <laughs> happening here as well, Kara and Terry. Hmm. All right, great. And we'll be um, dipping in live for all the events. Kana, appreciate you. Thank you so much. Also coming up, the Israeli military raiding the hospital where it says Hamas is operating a command center. But Hamas says thousands of civilians are taking shelter there. We'll take you to Israel and also talk about the delicate negotiations to free hostages next. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? It had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Thanks for streaming with us. So we've got a live look there at Woodside, California, just outside San Francisco, where President Biden's expected to meet Chinese President Xi Jinping in person any moment now. And we're going to go there live as soon as things get started there in Woodside. Glad you're streaming with us. Uh, the Israeli military right now is using tanks, troops, raiding Gaza's biggest hospital. The Israeli Defense Forces says it has quote, concrete proof that Hamas is using the medical complex as its headquarters to support its terrorist operations and house hostages. Hamas says Israel's killing civilians. President Biden is to blame. ABC's chief national correspondent Matt Gutman is there. The Israeli military raiding Al-Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa Hospital and releasing these videos they say show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering, according to the Hamas-run Ministry of Health, which also shared these images they say are from inside the hospital amid the raid, that ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around al-Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. We do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the Al-Shifa Hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within Al-Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies uh, from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The Children's Hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. What was it like to be there in that rally? It I mean, was, we were uh, amazed at the amount of people that just converged there on the mall. A huge number of people, American flags, Israeli flags. There were Jews, Christians, Muslims there as well. And there were two things they wanted to do, solidarity with Israel, of course, but also support for each other. And we're going to go right now to a special events coverage of the Biden this Jesus is an and ABC Summit. News special report. Now reporting, David Muir. Good afternoon. We're coming on the air for a short time here because of this high stakes summit between President Biden and China's President Xi about to get underway. The two leaders coming face to face just outside San Francisco. This will be their first in-person talks 
in more than a year. You can see the motorcade carrying President Xi pulling up there uh, in outside San Francisco. This is being called the Woodside Summit by the White House. Uh, let's watch here. Doors. Ready. Pop. And there he is, President Xi of China. The two leaders have known each other for Ready. decades. Close. And President Biden, of course, greeting him. Ready. Today's Ready. meeting expected to last uh, more than four hours. President Biden, of course, hoping to rebuild this strained relationship between the U.S. and China amid mounting tensions uh, and deep mistrust between the countries. Both leaders, quite frankly, need this. The White House hoping to reestablish lines of military communication with China. Among the many issues on the table today as they wave there to the cameras and turn now walking into the estate, uh, they'll be discussing the economic competition between the world's two largest economies. Also, the U.S. has growing concerns over China's military aggression targeting Taiwan, while China wants to ensure the U.S. will not support Taiwan's independence. Of course, there are also two major conflicts to address Israel's war against Hamas, China's ties to Iran in this along with the war in Ukraine and President Xi's recent meeting with Vladimir Putin. Let's bring in our chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, also in Woodside, just outside San Francisco. Mary, you saw the image there moments ago. Both leaders wanted that image to be seen by the world. And David, when you look at that greeting, it's hard not to think about all of the meticulous planning that went into that. This is a high stakes and highly choreographed meeting between these two leaders. This is the first time they are meeting, the first time they are even talking in a year. And it comes as President Biden is really trying to reshape this complicated and consequential relationship amid this time of really mounting tension. We are told that the two leaders are now expected to meet for over four hours, and they are going to discuss a wide range of issues as as you note, including managing growing economic competition, tensions in Taiwan, China's military aggression, also, of course, the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. But the White House has been rather blunt. You should not expect any major announcements to come of this. They have been setting expectations. One thing the president is hoping to come away from this meeting with is a promise to restore those military to military communications that were severed last year by the Chinese. The president says, look, he wants to be able to pick up the phone. He wants to be able to speak directly to the Chinese in case they come into any times of crisis. We saw that during that incident with that Chinese spy balloon when the Pentagon tried to reach out and simply no one picked up the phone in China. They weren't able to get in touch with their Chinese counterparts. The goal here is to restore those lines of communication, David, so that they can prevent any future conflict. That was an extraordinary moment seen by the world, uh, the balloon flying over North America, over the U.S., and the fact that when the Pentagon reached out to China's military, they simply didn't pick up the phone. They didn't. And David, you know, the president later said that, in fact, President Xi wasn't fully read in on that incident. He didn't realize that that spy balloon, that that vessel was there, uh, something the president said was a deep embarrassment for President Xi. The Chinese, of course, also have a lot riding on this meeting. This comes at a time of a real, you know, economic strain in China. Part of the message that President Xi is trying to send here is that China is open for business as he faces rising unemployment, a slowdown in foreign investment. So both leaders here, David, have a lot at stake. Again, we're looking at those pictures just moments ago. Mary, thank you. That's President Xi being greeted by President Biden just outside San Francisco in Woodside, uh, California, uh, just moments ago again. And as Mary points out, these two leaders will be talking about economic competition between these two countries. Of course, China's relationship also with Russia and Iran, giving these two world conflicts we're watching unfold, Israel's war with Hamas, and of course, Ukraine fighting it back against uh, the Russian invasion uh, now for quite some time. And of course, the recent meeting between uh, President Xi and Vladimir Putin. So a lot on their plate, as Mary just reported. They're expected to meet uh, for some four hours today in California. And these two leaders have quite a history together, uh, having spent many visits together, many hours together before traveling some uh, 17,000 miles together during their trips, uh, according to the White House and according to President Biden. Uh, they meet again today, four hours to discuss uh, the U.S. and China, the relationship that has been very strained as of late and whether or not they can do anything to manage that as we move forward. Our coverage continues on ABC News Live, abcnews.com. And of course, I'll be back with Mary and the entire team for World News Tonight a little later today. I'm David Muir in New York. We'll see you then. This has been a special report from ABC News. 
David, thank you. And as you just witnessed, President Biden finally coming face to face with Chinese President Xi Jinping for the first time in more than a year there at the Fuley Historic House and Gardens in Woodside, California. The two world leaders expected to cover a wide range of topics today. Chinese military aggression, managing increasing economic competition, growing concerns over Taiwan, of course, and then the flow of fentanyl right here into the United States. Uh, there's also uh, major conflicts around the world that they are addressing. Israel's war against Hamas, the continuing war in Ukraine, where Xi Jinping uh, has been very close to Russia and Vladimir Putin and uh, provided a, a bright spot of support in a world uh, that has opposed, much of which has opposed Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine. President Biden is also hoping to discuss China's ties to Iran and President Xi's recent meeting with Putin. So the, the, the relations between these two countries are probably at the worst uh, that they've been in decades, and the United States publicly saying that we want to decouple, de-risk uh, from China, our economic uh, dependence on China, manufacturing and other things, and that is going to make for a very tricky conversation. Well, and critics have even said that they don't really have high expectations for the outcome of what could take place here, but anything is possible. <laughs> Let's bring in our ABC News Live evening anchor, Kena Whitworth. She is there in San Francisco. Uh, Kena, you know, what, it, what has it been like leading up to um, actually seeing the pictures live of the two leaders shaking right. hands, walking across the red carpet there. Right. I mean, we keep saying it's been highly anticipated, and there is certainly no question about that. I know the mayor of San Francisco said, you know, we do big events well, and so every preparation was considered. And when you're talking about that handshake, absolutely nothing was overlooked in terms of preparation, from exactly how the car pulled up to the color of the suits they were wearing, the ties they were wearing, to where people were standing. All of that was planned. And then as they walked that red carpet and they opened the door, you saw... They shook hands yet again. It was a second handshake, and then they sort of opened the door, and, and you kind of see President Biden almost usher him in. So again, nothing is overlooked. And as you're seeing some of these pictures here, uh, when they plan a meeting like this, they're talking about they know exactly where they will sit, what they will eat, the kinds of flowers that will be in the room because they represent certain things. So this meeting has certainly been planned out uh, for months, and it is finally happening. They'll be sitting and, just, and talking for some four hours here. And while we continue to hear there may only be modest gains of this. There may nothing be nothing deliverable that actually comes yeah, out of this meeting. This uh, the president is it's expected to talk here later today. He will be year, giving a day press day conference, and so symbolic. certainly some people are hoping for that. And it sounds like the president is speaking now. Since so let's go ahead and listen in. Key members of our teams have had important discussions on issues matters to both our nations and to the world. But as always, there is no substitute to face-to-face -face discussions. I've always found our discussions straightforward and frank, and I've always appreciated them. Mr. President, we know each other for a long time. We haven't always agreed, which was not a surprise to anyone. But our meetings have always been candid, straightforward, and useful. I never doubted what you've told me in terms of your candid nature in which you speak. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. And we also have to manage it responsibly, that competition. That's what the United States wants and what we intend to do. We also, I also believe that's what the world wants for both of us, candid exchange. We also have a responsibility to our people and the work in the world uh, to work together when we see it in our interest to do so. And a critical global challenge that we face from climate change to counter narcotics to artificial intelligence demand our joint efforts. So I look forward to beginning this discussion and I welcome you and the floor is yours, Mr. President. And again, welcome back. Mr. President, good morning. Coming here, I thought of, I think of your trip to China when 
I was the vice president of China. We had a meeting. It was 12 years ago. I still remember our interactions very vividly. And it always gives me a lot of thoughts. Last time we met in Bali, you said it was a year and a day ago. A lot has happened since then. The world has emerged from the COVID pandemic, but is still under its tremendous impacts. The global economy is recovering, but its momentum remains sluggish. Industrial and supply chains are still under the threat of interruption and protectionism is rising. All these are grave problems. The China-U.S. relationship, which is the most important bilateral relationship in the world, should be perceived and envisioned in a broad context of the, gl of the accelerating global transformations unseen in a century. It should develop in a way that benefits our two peoples and fulfills our responsibility for human progress. China-U.S. relationship has never been smooth sailing over the past 50 years or more, and it always faces problems of one kind or another. Yet it has kept moving forward amid twists and turns. For two large countries like China and the United States, turning their back on each other is not an option. It is unrealistic for one side to remodel the other, and conflict and confrontation has unbearable consequences for both sides. I'm still of the view that major country competition is not the prevailing trend of current times and cannot solve the problems facing China and the United States or the world at large. Planet Earth is big enough for the two countries to succeed, and one country's success is an opportunity for the other. It is an objective fact that China and the United States are different in history, culture, social system, and development path. However, as long as the, they respect each other, coexist in peace, and pursue win-win cooperation, they will be fully capable of rising above differences and find the right way for the two major countries to get along with each other. I firmly believe in the promising future of the bilateral relationship. Mr. President, you and I, we are at the helm of China-U.S. relations. We shoulder heavy responsibilities for the two peoples, for the world, and for history. I look forward to having an in-depth exchange of views and reach new, reach new understandings with you on strategic and overarching issues critical to the direction of China-U.S. relations and on major issues affecting world peace and development. I wish to thank you for your thoughtful arrangements for our meeting today and for our participation at the APEC meeting. Thank you. Official saying there as they hustle the reporters out of the room, the leaders of the two most powerful countries in the world, Joe Biden and Xi Jinping, uh, making nice there in their opening statements before the formal meetings begin. Uh, you heard President Biden say there's no substitute for face-to-face -face discussions and that tapping into the personal history be between uh, these two men, he said, I've always found our discussions straightforward and frank and I've always appreciated them. He said, I've never doubted what you've told me, he said to Xi Jinping, in terms of your candid nature in which you speak. He em emphasized in those brief remarks that, quote, we have to ensure competition does not veer into conflict. And Xi Jinping kind of 
corresponded to that. He said that major country competition is not going to solve any problems, either in your country or in my country. And he, too, referenced their personal history together. Remembering back 12 years ago, Biden has talked about this as well, and they had a long conversation together. He says, give me plenty of food for thought over the years. Uh, now they will have their formal meetings, and let's bring in our White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, who's on the scene there. And, Mary, I do want to just get your reaction to what we just heard, this first kind of public interaction between the two men and that personal history that they both publicly drew on to talk about this relationship. Yeah, a lot of niceties there off at the top, right, setting the scene for what is expected to be an intense four hours of conversation now. But, Terry, before we get into that, what actually always strikes me most about these moments, especially when, the Ch when it comes to the Chinese, is what happened at the very end. This is not a leader who often is forced to face questions from the press. And it is a powerful image and a powerful reminder of the freedom of the press when you see President Xi Jinping standing there, essentially being shouted questions at by reporters, by the press like that. Of course, he didn't answer them uh, because everything about this meeting is carefully scripted carefully handled this has been meticulously planned for weeks because of just how high the stakes are it is highly choreographed and you did hear both leaders essentially arguing that yes while they have their differences that it is important especially at this moment to come together and try and find a way for them both to exist and to work together I mean you heard uh, President Xi there essentially saying there is room here for all of us um, and Biden feels very strongly that there is simply no substitute for these face-to-face -face talks this is the first time they have sat down. Actually, the first time they've even spoken to each other in a year. That is just how tense relations have become between the two countries. The White House, of course, has been pretty blunt that they aren't expecting any major announcements to come out of this. But one thing the White House is hoping for is to reopen lines of communication, to restore that military to military communication that was severed a year ago uh, after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, a move that deeply irritated the Chinese. But the president feels that it's important to restore the, this communication so that they can prevent any misunderstandings, prevent any miscommunication that could lead to any kind of full-blown crisis or, or future conflict, Terry. Restore communication, but what about restoring images? Let's bring in our national mm -hmm. security and defense analyst and former deputy assistant secretary of defense, Mick Mulroy. I mean, Mick, when you look at it, okay, they're meeting face to face. They say nice things to each other. They're going to discuss certain issues. It's the first time that they have talked in more than a year. Okay, they're having conversation. They're saying we need to uh, avoid uh, miscommunication, uh, misconceptions of, of every any kind, conflict, competition. But when it comes down to it, aren't they? just using this international gathering to bump their image. You have President uh, Biden, who's dropping flat in the polls, and then you have the president of China, who's under a lot of scrutiny uh, there in a bit of a beleaguered regime. I mean, is this just a time for them to sort of work on their image versus actually getting something done? So, Kara, I do think there's going to be some of that, but of course, it is very, very important that they restart military to military communications. During the entirety of the Cold War, the U.S. maintained communications militarily with the Soviet Union. Why? Because it was in both countries' interest, nuclear weapons, chances of uh, miscommunication, chances of escalation, and a war that neither would want. And that still exists. It exists now, in addition to Russia, with China. And I think China does not want to do it because they think it gives us some kind of uh, allowance to. Uh, be in their waters and be near their airspace, near their waters and near their airspace. But the United States is going to do that anyway. So this needs to happen. I think it's the one deliverable that we're all hoping to see out of this. Neither side should should want a war that they certainly did not want to start. And this is one of the basic ways to prevent that. Hmm. So uh, tapping into that uh, structure, as you point out, Mick, and during the Cold War of relationship, Mary, Bruce touched on, and I want to bring in Daryl Blocker, who was with the CIA for many years and one of our contributors on these matters. Mary Bruce, Daryl brought up this cultural difference that at the end there, you know, they hustle the reporters out because certainly the, the leader of China doesn't want to answer any questions. I tried that once in China. <laughs> we were told not to ask a guy's name was Zhang Zemin. Don't ask him any questions, and I did. And uh, yeah, I almost got deported. It was, uh, it was not a good thing, although I'm glad I did. But the cultural differences here, they're really part of the source of the competition uh, and managing, managing that. We're very different countries, very different regimes, and that's one of the things that the, that the leaders have to deal with as well.
Carol? Was that not a question? That was a question yeah. to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort oh, of. I'm yeah. sorry, Terry. So, no, there, there there are a lot of cultural differences, and I think that's where some people are might be overplaying the fact that she and Biden haven't spoken. But I'm I'm confident that their representatives in New York, their representatives in Geneva, their representative in the major capitals where there are U.S. and Chinese presence, there are discussions going on. So once we lose that, then you know, then where I think we should be concerned. But this meeting, I believe, has the potential to be as significant as Nixon Mao in the sense that the two major global economies at that time were Russia and the United States, and today it's United States and, and China. So we need to look at that because the Chinese economy is tied to Iran, which if we go to war with them is going to be a huge problem on the oil. Uh, they're tied to Russia, which of course we know has had significant uh, uh, sanctions placed against them. So it is in Xi's best interest economically to have something positive come out of this meeting. Hmm. Mick, let's follow up with you uh, with regard to that. As, as Daryl mentions Iran, as we talk about what's happening in the Middle East right now and in Israel and Iran's uh, support of, of Hamas. We see what's happening there. We can say that the two leaders will talk about trade and technology, but when it comes down to it, they, they need to start talking about these ongoing ongoing wars as well. And, and where does she stand? Well, that's exactly right, Kira. So uh, obviously we're, our partners are, for example, Ukraine and Israel. Uh, China's partners are Russia and Iran. So basically two uh, opposing sides here. It's really important that I think the United States shows how much we do support our partners. So when it comes to these funding bills that are going through Congress, that indicates, I think, to China that if we do support them, that they will be less likely to start a conflict of their own in Taiwan. So I really do think they will discuss these things, of course, uh, probably not resolve anything, but it is very important that the U.S. shows a steadfast uh, determination in, in, in being with our partners, because that's how we fight. Coalitions and coalitions are built of partnerships. And I think this does send a message uh, to China that we stay with our partners. And so they ought to consider that if they're looking at any military action against Taiwan. Hmm. So high stakes there. Let's go to our White House correspondent, Karen Travers, who's in San Francisco. And Karen, the White House ha has been downplaying expectations, but you don't get that many people sitting across from each other, uh, each other at a long table at a summit without some business to be done. Uh, you know, there, there is an agenda in there. W w are there any deliverables, as they say, concrete things that might come out of this? What are they telling you? Well, I thought it was notable that President Biden talked about areas that he felt that he and President Xi could come to some understanding on. He mentioned counter narcotics, uh, climate change, artificial intelligence. He said these are things that demand our joint efforts between the two countries. But for the White House, you know, they have really been trying to downplay expectations for any major breakthrough, saying you're not going to reach big things in just a couple of hours of meetings. That this is really about having what the president continued to call frank and candid conversations to sort of reset the relationship right now. But one thing that is very important that you guys have talked about is that military to military communications. This is something that the White House does believe President Biden can walk away from this summit having achieved and restoring those communications between the U.S. and China. This is a very significant deal because uh, China did suspend those talks between the two countries back in August of 2022 after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made her visit to Taiwan. China was not happy about that, so it was a protest move to cut those ties. This is a priority for the president, though, to restart that. And the White House senior officials say it's important to do that, because when you have a complex, complicated relationship like this, any provocations by the Chinese military, which we've seen several times in the last couple of months, they don't want this to tip over into conflict, any escalation to tip over. That's why it's so important to have those lines of communication to be open between the two countries. Let's bring on ABC News Live evening anchor Kana Whitworth now, who's also there in San Francisco. So when you touch down, Kana, just up to the moment now where we are seeing the two world leaders meet, I mean, San Francisco is an interesting place for this. They've been struggling with a rising crime rate, um, mm. so much so um, that businesses are, are closing down. Areas of San Francisco have turned into ghost towns. Um, 
how is the city receiving this visit? And do you see it in some ways possibly becoming a bit of an economic boost or, or at least um, hmm. a confidence boost for those there in the city? Well, yeah, city leaders certainly hope for an economic boost. I mean, the hotel rooms are booked despite the amount of protests that we saw when we landed. But really, it comes down to preparation here in the city of San Francisco. The mayor says, you know, big events is something that we do, and we do them very well. And so they were prepared for the arrival of these leaders. They came in yesterday into San Francisco International Airport, and we actually saw the president's motorcade driving through downtown San Francisco last night. And this was happening just after there was a large protest moving through downtown San Francisco. Now, this protest in particular was people calling for a ceasefire, and they were marching to the Israeli consulate, and they were writing words like ceasefire uh, on the sides of buildings. But we're also seeing uh, protests for other issues as well, other voices that they want to be heard, and we're seeing that all throughout the city. And again, authorities here and city leaders have been prepared for that. Uh, there's an extraordinary amount of of law enforcement, uh, military, and public safety personnel around. Uh, in fact, when you're talking about just the perimeter of this event, uh, California Highway Patrol officers added an additional 1,000 officers, and they've started doing pretty dramatic things like closing lanes on the Bay Bridge, and they're doing that for security and fast response reasons. Uh, and then they have this additional, what they call, you know, an inner high security zone, and that's at the Moscone Center where APEC is taking place. And around that, they have 14-foot fences that they are they say are unscalable. So, of course, this high-stakes meeting here is happening off-site in a place that has been well-planned. But as you can see behind me, it is a beautiful day here in San Francisco, and they've done a lot around the city. I'm at the Embarcadero, and you can even see fences here that have been set up. And I'm seeing uh, police officers amassing over here uh, in the parking lot as well. And again, later today, there will be another large event happening here. Terry and Kira. Well, you couldn't get a better backdrop, that mm -hmm. is for sure. Kena, thank you so much. Also, Karen, uh, Mick, Daryl, appreciate all of you. We're going to take a quick break. More coverage of the APEC Summit as we move forward. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
glad you're streaming with us. Well, the Israeli military using tanks and troops raiding Gaza's biggest hospital. The IDF says it has concrete proof that Hamas is using the medical complex as its headquarters to support its terrorist operations and house hostages. Hamas says Israel is killing civilians and President Biden is to blame. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, is there. The Israeli military raiding Al Shifa Hospital, the largest in Gaza, calling it a precise and targeted operation against Hamas in a specified area in the Shifa Hospital. And releasing these videos, they say, show troops operating on the ground before entering the hospital, where thousands of Palestinians are believed to be sheltering, according to the Hamas run Ministry of Health, which also shared these images they say are from inside the hospital amid the raid, that ward filled with thick dust. Though Hamas has denied it operates around al-Shifa, the Pentagon saying it declassified U.S. intelligence supporting Israel's claims about Hamas's use of hospitals. We do have information that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad uses some hospitals in the Gaza Strip, including the al-Shifa hospital, as a way to conceal and support their military operations and hold hostages. They have tunnels underneath these hospitals. Within al-Shifa, the situation desperate. Doctors telling us fuel and supplies have run out. Workers now saying they were forced to use gardening tools and their bare hands to bury scores of decomposing bodies in a mass grave. We managed to bury around 180 bodies within the hospital. You have buried 180 bodies from within the hospital in that mass grave? Absolutely, yeah. It comes just a day after the Israeli military took us deep into Gaza to see Hamas tunnels that it said led into this children's hospital. Outside that hospital, we could hear the fierce fighting. Inside, Israel claiming Hamas had a command and control post in the bombed out basement. Israel's chief military spokesman showing us another room where they believe Hamas kept some of the hostages, claiming Hamas had retrofit these rooms for the hostages. What makes you think that this was a spot where somebody was held hostage? We're, we're going to bring here a forensic team. The only reason I brought you here, and I'm taking a huge risk, because you see the fighting outside. Tying hostages on a chair in his facility in a basement. The Children's Hospital director denying Israel's claims. A senior administration official also telling us they believe the majority of the 239 hostages may be in southern Gaza, not in those hospital tunnels. In Washington, over a quarter of a million people in the nation's capital calling for the release of the hostages and marching for Israel. Our Terry Moran right there speaking to a woman whose three-year-old grandniece was taken by Hamas. She's now alone in Gaza. I think today is an opportunity for us all to come together and say we are united against terrorism. We're united against hate and to really try to celebrate our heart and humanity and what brings us together. Here at home, six people, including three teenagers, have died after a fiery crash on an Ohio highway. The chain reaction crash sent a semi-truck slamming into a charter bus carrying 54 high school students. Our Alex Brechet has the latest. Investigators looking into what caused this fiery crash that left six people dead, including three teens, just east of Columbus, Ohio. We are being advised that there is children trapped on the bus. First responders rushing to the scene, urging students to jump out of the window. Seconds later, an explosion. Officials say a chain reaction caused five vehicles to collide. One of them was a semi-truck slamming into this charter bus carrying the Tuskegee Valley Marching Band. 17-year-old Samantha Bossler, a saxophone player, was on the bus. There was immediate flames from the truck in the back. There's different stuff flying up on us. And we realized that what happened and looked around and there was a lot of kids stuck in seats. Of the three teens killed, the youngest was 15. Police confirming at least three other people were killed in a car that was also involved in the crash. And more than a dozen others were taken to hospitals. Samantha says she's okay. I just happened to choose the right seats. The charred remains of that bus towed away from the scene. Kira, the injured were taken to seven area hospitals, including here at Nationwide Children's. Now, the NTSB has a team on the ground investigating in Ohio. That truck company for the semi involved says that it's cooperating with authorities. Kira. All right, Alex Prochet, thanks so much. And coming up, the man accused of attacking Nancy Pelosi's husband on trial and in tears as he takes the stand in his own defense.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. Reporting from Ocala, Florida, I'm Victor Okendo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Other stories we're tracking for you this hour. Closing arguments expected today in the trial of the man accused of attacking former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer. David DePap taking the stand, even breaking down in tears as he detailed the events leading up to the attack. He said he wanted to ask Nancy Pelosi about government corruption, post video of it online while not intending to hurt her husband. He says he acted out when he realized his plan was ruined. If convicted, DePap faces life in prison. Las Vegas police arrest eight teenagers in connection with the beating death of 17-year-old Jonathan Lewis. Police say that the teen died from blunt force injuries after he was jumped by 15 people outside a high school earlier this month. The suspects are all between 13 and 17 years old and are expected to face murder charges. More arrests are expected in the case. Warner Brothers reversing its decision to shelve Coyote vs. Acme, a comedy centered around Looney Tunes character Wile E. Coyote for a tax write-off. After backlash, the company will instead allow the film's director to shop it to other studios and streamers. But the bad press that came with the original decision isn't going away. Congressman Joaquin Castro dropping the anvil, calling for the Justice Department and the FTC to review the studio's practice of scrapping completed projects for tax breaks, calling them predatory and anti-competitive. Well, people in southwestern Iceland are being given one last chance to get their belongings and get out. Officials there warning that a volcano could erupt at any moment. And thousands of residents have already evacuated the small town there in Iceland following a massive uptick of earthquakes. Our foreign correspondent James Longman is on the scene. Thousands of earthquakes. That's what officials in Iceland say has alerted them to what they call an imminent volcanic eruption and the significant likelihood it'll happen soon. Cracks in roads have opened up, steam pouring out of the ground as seismic activity intensifies in the southwestern part of the country. Over 700 quakes have struck in just the last day and more than 20,000 since October 25th. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma bubbling underground, threatening the small town of Grindavik. Authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people. We provide support and information. When people are scared, they need that. Our cameras seeing multiple eruptions over the years in Iceland. Our Will Reeve, up close and personal in 2021. Look there at all that 
out lava coming out 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And back in 2010, another volcano erupted and it disrupted air travel for days. And we'll continue to follow, of course, the story with our James Longman. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News to all the stories that matter to you. You can always find us on your favorite streaming channel, the ABC News app. And, of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Santa Fe, New Mexico, I'm Lindsay Davis. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, Biden and Xi face to face, breaking a year long silence, hoping to smooth tensions and strengthen ties. We're live in San Francisco. Why Gaza's largest hospital has become ground zero for IDF raids. Israeli forces insist Hamas is operating beneath Al Shifa as patients remain trapped and doctors run out of medical supplies. And show me the money. All it takes is 20 questions in 10 minutes, so says the Department of Education. What these changes mean for the millions of you trying to get student loans. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story today, however, is in San Francisco, where the diplomatic stakes are high as the leaders of two of the most powerful countries in the world meet to hash out their differences. President Biden holding talks this hour with Chinese President Xi Jinping at the APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. The world leaders face to face for the first time in more than a year. Mr. President, we know each other for a long time. We haven't always agreed, which would not have surprised anyone. But our meetings have always been candid, straightforward, and useful. I've never doubted what you've told me in terms of your candid nature in which you speak. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. Our White House correspondent Karen Travers is there. So, Karen, let's just talk about Biden's hopes here for today's meeting. And can we expect these two leaders to accomplish anything? Kira, the White House has really been downplaying expectations for any major breakthrough from these meetings that the president will have with China's President Xi. They're going to sit down for possibly four hours of conversations, and they have a very lengthy agenda, including the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. They're going to be talking about economic competition between the two countries. And the president also talked about ways that there could be a joint effort between the U.S. and China on things like counter-narcotics, artificial intelligence, and also... Uh, 
uh, climate change, very important, of course, for President Biden. But this is a very lengthy agenda that they're continuing to say, look, they want to at least have a restart of the conversation, a chance for the president to have what he says is a frank, direct conversation with his Chinese counterpart. But in terms of a major deliverable, the one thing the White House continues to say that the president would like to see from this meeting is the restoration of military to military communications between the two countries. That has been frozen since August of 2022 when China put those on pause after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi traveled to Taiwan. China was not happy about that visit, so there was a protest move there, and they suspended the military conversations. This is a big priority for President Biden and perhaps something he can actually achieve, a tangible deliverable after these hours of meetings today with the Chinese president. Kira? And there's a lot at stake for both leaders, uh, both of them having image problems in two totally different countries, opposite sides of the world. There's a lot at stake not only for Biden, but also for Xi. There's a big economic focus for China's President Xi while he is here in San Francisco. You've got the meetings today with President Biden and senior U.S. officials, including cabinet secretaries like the Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is there, the Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo also there. And that is important for China because one of their messages here is that China is open for business. They've had an economic downturn since COVID and the shutdowns there, and they are experiencing a slowdown in growth. They're also experiencing an increase in unemployment and a slowdown in foreign investment. So part of Xi's goal here is to say to American companies, you know, come back to China, invest in China. He's going to be having those meetings with U.S. officials, but also meeting with U.S. companies. So a big part of that message from China then is, of course, economic related. I thought it was very interesting that uh, the Chinese president in his brief remarks there when he was sitting across the table from uh, President Biden talked about COVID, talked about the uh, still lingering effects of that shutdown. And he said the global economy is recovering, but it remains sluggish. That is nowhere more important than we're seeing in China right now. Well, the meeting comes as Israel clearly uh, continues to mm -hmm. intensify its war against Hamas. A lot of concerns about the conflict widening there in the Middle East. Uh, let's talk about China's role in this conversation that must be had. Yeah, Iran is going to be a big point that President Biden will bring up with China's President Xi because China is Iran's biggest buyer of oil. And the White House thinks that that gives China significant or special leverage over Iran. So the president is going to be talking about this today with Xi and trying to get Iran to rein in those proxy attacks on U.S. forces in the Middle East. Also, a message to Iran to not expand this conflict beyond Israel and Hamas. This has been a big concern for the administration. So given China's economic ties and diplomatic ties with Iran, the administration feels that that gives them sway over Iran. And President Biden's going to push China to try to use that leverage and uh, have some actual uh, considerable sway there with Iran. Well, what can we expect, you think, for the two leaders uh, just throughout the rest of the day? We know they're at the table yeah. right now. We took our viewers there live. How will this play out? Yeah, they're going to be behind closed doors now, Kira, for the next several hours. The White House has blocked off about four hours for these meetings. This is really intense, but the president likes this. He values this face-to-face -face diplomacy. He's talked about his long relationship with China's President Xi. He's talked about the straightforward, candid conversations they've had in the past and how much he appreciates that and wants to have it today. So many hours of meetings. The next time we expect to see President Biden is later tonight when he has a Press conference. That'll be the first readout we get of those meetings. He'll take questions from reporters, and there is a lot to ask him about tonight here in San Francisco. And we'll be covering it all. Karen Travers, thanks so much. Now let's head overseas to Israel's war against Hamas. The Israeli military operation at the Al Shiva Hospital in Gaza is deepening. Our correspondent Patrick Rebel now is following this for us out of Tel Aviv. So let's talk about the latest on the situation there outside the hospital as the IDF says it's continuing its raids, Patrick. Hi, Kira. Yeah, we spoke a little while ago to a journalist who says that he is inside um, Al Shifa and who's been there for the last few days. And he says that he can see Israeli tanks outside the hospital, that he can hear fighting outside the hospital, he can hear tanks firing. He says they're not firing onto the hospital. He says also that Israeli forces earlier after that raid took away about 30 Palestinian men. 
and arrested them, in his words, and took them out of the hospital and away. And we obviously, this, there's a great deal of uncertainty around the situation around the hospital because of the fog of war and because we're getting such conflicting reports from both sides. But ultimately, we know what we know from both sides so far is that the Israelis um, approached the hospital, went inside the hospital, as far as we can understand, and they've now released photos and images showing them where they claim that they found a small number of weapons. I mean, but one of the things that we've been saying for the last few weeks, we've been hearing from the, Ukra from the, um, from the Israelis that basically there is a Hamas headquarters inside Al Shifa Hospital. But so far, the, the weapons that they found, the things that they found inside the hospital, do not seem to show any kind of major presence there. That doesn't mean that there necessarily won't be in the future, but right now, it doesn't seem to match up with the claims that Israel had been making beforehand. And we know that, of course, this is, an, this is a hospital where there are thousands of people sheltering. There are several thousand people sheltering and there are hundreds of patients and we've also heard from a doctor tonight that 40 patients who are in the ICU who are on, on oxygen have died since Sunday because oxygen has run out there so essentially this hospital has been under siege for the last several days the Israelis say they had to go in because they say it was a Hamas headquarters but so far what they found doesn't seem to necessarily show that and so obviously the situation there is very very disturbing we also know that we've seen these videos of, of, hundred, of hundred and, uh, over a hundred bodies lying out in the open in the courtyard hearing these awful stories from doctors there who are saying that people have been digging with their bare hands to bury these bodies. And so obviously just a really disturbing situation there. The head of the WHO saying that, the hospital, that this is unacceptable what Israel has done around this hospital. Well, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also paid a trip uh, to troops there on the ground in the region. What do we know about his visit, where he went, with whom he met? Yeah, President Netanyahu has been making a, a number of visits up to the border to try and show um, that he's in command and show that he is in control. But it obviously, it's having, at the moment, basically polls show that he is having severe problems um, among Israelis. He has a, about a 4% poll rating right now, which comes from the fact that basically many Israelis hold him um, responsible for what happened on October 7th and for the failure to prevent Hamas from co conducting its, its, um, its atrocities against Israelis um, in the kibbutzes uh, up near close to Gaza. And so it, he is facing a severe problem here, which has major consequences for how long this war might go on, because many experts believe that Netanyahu now um, believes he has to keep prosecuting this war in order to try and remain in power. And Patrick, speaking of Netanyahu, he's also facing new calls to resign, even from inside his own government. Can you just break that down for us? I mean, this comes amid all the protests prior to this war. As he was trying to overhaul the judicial system, people were protesting uh, to give him the boot then, too. Yeah, so the leader of the opposition, Yair Lapid, had um, called tonight for Netanyahu to step down. I mean, there have been a number of calls for him to step down over the course of this. He currently is heading a unity government, with people saying, essentially, the message you hear from most Israelis is, first, we finish the war, then we deal with Netanyahu, and we must have a new government after that. And that's what you hear from, really, a very large number of Israelis, because this was an extremely polarized country before the Hamas attacks. You know, we were seeing protests here where you would see 300,000 people on the street because of these judicial reforms that many people here saw as a power grab an attempt to, to basically make Israel more authoritarian and to basically an attack on the independence of its judiciary. But he did, you know, survive that crisis. I think now, though, he, after most people we hear, most people we speak to here really do say to us that he, they hold him responsible for this war, and as soon as it's over, they are going to have to try and deal with him afterwards. All right, Patrick Rebel there in Tel Aviv. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. And coming up... Show us the money. All it takes is 20 questions in 10 minutes, so says the Department of Education. What these changes mean for the millions of you trying to get student loans right now. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story, 
Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, the man suspected in the Gilgo Beach murders is back in court today in New York. For the first time since his arrest, his wife was there also just one week after she visited him in prison. Asa Ellerup filed for divorce six days after her husband, Rex Hewerman, was arrested back in July for the murder of three sex workers on Long Island. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all counts. Our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky, has been following this from the beginning. So let's be clear here. This was just a scheduling hearing, right? So did Rex Hewerman's wife decide that she wanted to come for what reasons? It's a good question. She did not make any particular statement either on her way in or way out of court today. And, and Asa Ellerup had not been to court previously during Hewerman's appearances. But her attorney says she now wants to come to court every time he's due to appear going forward because she wants to see the evidence for herself. It's not clear today whether Hewerman and his wife made eye contact or whether he knew that she was there, but his attorney said he appreciates the support uh, and, and the defense attorneys believe that, that Ellerup does not believe her husband to have been capable of committing the crimes that he's accused of, namely the murders of three women uh, on Long Island, whose bodies were all found along a marshy stretch in Gilgo Beach wrapped in burlap. Kira, there may be one additional reason which was uh, left unsaid, and that is that Asa Ellerup has recently signed a, what we think to be sizable uh, deal with a production company to tell her story, and it may be uh, that she came to court uh, in furtherance of that. Interesting. So this may have nothing to do with visiting her husband to see how he's doing, but it could be centered around what she could add to a production deal. Maybe. And it's, it's just speculation. We don't know. As I say, she didn't make any, any particular statements either on her way in or way out of court, but we know that she recently visited him uh, in jail. He's uh, charged with, with murder and obviously being held without bail. So, uh, she recently visited him uh, briefly, hour or so, in the, in the Suffolk County Jail. Uh, visit was authorized. We're not sure what they discussed, but uh, she may have had a camera following her for part of that as well. Interesting. Uh, well, it definitely would be uh, quite a riveting interview, no doubt. <laughs> I'd rather see you do it, um, but we'll follow it. Now, Hewerman is also the prime suspect in the death of a fourth woman now, right? What do we know about that? He's been charged in the deaths of three women, and he is the prime suspect in the death of a fourth. Maureen Brainerd Barnes was found right with the other three that Hewerman is accused of killing. Uh, all four were found wrapped in burlap along this marshy stretch uh, on Long Island. And, and prosecutors said today that they are close to wrapping up that part of the investigation and making a decision whether to charge Hewerman 
with a fourth murder. Now, there were 10 sets of remains, all told, found along that area of Gilgo Beach. It had long been uh, a, a dumping ground for bodies, so it's not clear that Hewerman's going to be linked to all 10 sets of human remains, but it's a good bet, Kira, that prosecutors are going to move forward, charging him with the death of Maureen Brainerd Barnes, sometimes per perhaps as soon as next month. Aaron, thanks. Now to the Department of Education's new efforts to overhaul the federal student loan application. The new financial aid form will now be less than 20 questions and it's expected to take about 10 minutes. That's compared to the current application process, which is more than 100 questions and who knows how long that could take. Let's bring in our ABC News correspondent, Elizabeth Schulze, who actually got an exclusive look at the new forms. So. What more did you learn about the process? And tell us about these forms. What stood out to you? Well, Kara, and this really is a big deal for millions of high school students and their families who are going through the college application process. Anyone who has used the financial aid form known as FAFSA knows it's cumbersome, it's complicated, and it can take hours to complete. So we were able to get a look at some of the changes that are in place coming into place for this form, particularly the number of questions on it is going to go down. From In some cases, the number of questions is over 100. That will go down to as few as 18 questions, which means it could take a lot less time to fill this out out. The design of the form is, is simplified. Some students will find that it could take 10 minutes to complete the process. Uh, others will take a little bit longer depending on how complicated their financial situation is. The big difference here is that this form will pull data automatically from your household, your family's uh, income from the IRS. So that just takes a lot of the, the burden on you out when it comes to actually filling out this information. And this is a change that was mandated by law from Congress. The point was to try to say a huge barrier for so many students when it comes to college is obviously the cost. And if more people can find ways to apply and if that process can be simplified, that can help overcome that barrier at least a little bit, Kira. So how will this impact low-income families just in terms of Pell Grant eligibility? Right, so the Department of Education tells us that more than 600,000 low-income households will now qualify for Pell Grants because of the changes to FAFSA, which includes a simplified process, but also a changes in who's eligible here. So that's a pretty significant number when you think about the number of families who could receive uh, grants from the government. And we're talking about Pell Grants. These are uh, these are actual uh, grants we're talking about, not loans. So this is not money that you actually need to pay back to the federal government. So that is a really significant program that's widely taken advantage of by so many students. This is determined by the size of your family and your where you stand when it comes to the federal poverty level, but a pretty significant difference when it comes to some of those low-income households and who could qualify under this uh, aid program, Kara. So are there downsides here? Or there are potential always, downsides. <laughs> right, and there are always trade-offs. When we're talking about money from the federal government, there's always going to be, say, well, does this mean that someone else might not qualify? And what analysts have found is that because of some of the changes to the federal aid rules, there are some higher income households who might not get as much aid from the government. And then some students who actually have siblings in college might not qualify for as much financial aid. So, of course, in any of these time in any of these instances where there's an overhaul of a federal system where the goal is to simplify to try to eliminate some of that bureaucracy, there will be trade-offs and that's what some advocacy groups have pointed to. The other change and the other kind of barrier to this is that it will take some time for some of these changes to go in place, Kira. So, if you fill out this new form, it might take time for that information to actually get transmitted to the college you're applying for. You might not know exactly how much aid you qualify for, and that could, of course, affect the decision you're making when you're looking at trying to figure out which college or university to attend. All right, great job getting access to those forms, and there are going to be a lot of families uh, and students very interested in what you just said. Elizabeth, thank you. Thanks. And coming up, Iceland on alert. How towns are racing to get people out as they brace for an expected volcano eruption. Tonight, the high stakes face-to-face, -face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone.
terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis weeknights on ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Reporting from federal court in downtown Miami, I'm Aaron Katursky. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Some other top stories that we're tracking for you this hour. Las Vegas police arrest eight teenagers in connection with the beating death of 17-year-old Jonathan Lewis. Police say the teen died from blunt force injuries after he jumped by 15 after he was jumped by 15 people outside of high school this month. The suspects are all between 13 and 17 years old, are expected to face murder charges now, and more arrests are expected in this case as well. One well, accused gunman allegedly threatened employees at a bakery and said he might snap. Well, this ended up being the accused gunman in the deadly rampage in Lewiston, Maine. Police say that they got word of that incident at the bakery uh, involving Robert Card too late, though, to stop the bloodshed that he did go on to cause because a police report was never filed after the shootings. Card is accused of killing 18 people before taking his own life. A large span of an L.A. area expressway will remain closed for weeks following a massive blaze on Saturday. Crews are working around the clock now to get traffic moving on I-10, just one of the nation's busiest roadways. The fire was started by an arsonist, according to police, but there's no word yet on a suspect in the case. So officials in Iceland are monitoring the threat of a possible vote volcanic eruption now. The Icelandic Meteorological Office reporting an eruption is very likely to occur in the next few days as thousands of residents have already been evacuated from a small town there following an uptick of earthquakes. Our foreign correspondent James Longman is on the scene.
Thousands of earthquakes. That's what officials in Iceland say has alerted them to what they call an imminent volcanic eruption and the significant likelihood it'll happen soon. Cracks in roads have opened up, steam pouring out of the ground as seismic activity intensifies in the southwestern part of the country. Over 700 quakes have struck in just the last day and more than 20,000 since October 25th. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma bubbling underground, threatening the small town of Grindavik. Authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people. We provide support and information when people are scared. They need that. Our cameras seeing multiple eruptions over the years in Iceland are Will Reeve, up close and personal in 2021. Look there at all that lava coming out, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Back in 2010, another volcano erupted and it disrupted air travel for days. All right, James, thank you. We will follow it. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News. To all the stories that matter to you, ABC News Live is here for you 24-7. We we'll take you to a just outside California there, a live look of uh, not far, that's actually the Embarcadero, along uh, the wa beautiful waterfront, Golden Gate Bridge in the back, and not far from there, as you know, the high-stakes Apex Summit, where the president is meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. We're following it all throughout the day. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News Live, Biden and Xi face-to-face, -face, breaking a year-long silence, hoping to smooth tensions and strengthen ties. We're live in San Francisco. Why Gaza's largest hospital has become ground zero for IDF raids. Israeli forces insist Hamas is operating beneath al-Shifa as patients remain trapped and doctors run out of medical supplies. And show me the money. All it takes is 20 questions in 10 minutes, so says the Department of Education. What these changes mean for the millions of you trying to get student loans. Hello everyone, I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story today, however, is in San Francisco, where the diplomatic stakes are high as the leaders of two of the most powerful countries in the world meet to hash out their differences. President Biden holding talks this hour with Chinese President Xi Jinping at the APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. The world leaders face to face for the first time in more than a year. Mr. President, we know each other for a long time. We haven't always agreed, which was not a surprise to anyone. 
But our meetings have always been candid, straightforward, and useful. I've never doubted what you've told me in terms of your candid nature in which you speak. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. Our White House correspondent Karen Travers is there. So, Karen, let's just talk about Biden's hopes here for today's meeting. And can we expect these two leaders to accomplish anything? Kira, the White House has really been downplaying expectations for any major breakthrough from these meetings that the president will have with China's President Xi. They're going to sit down for possibly four hours of conversations, and they have a very lengthy agenda, including the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East. They're going to be talking about economic competition between the two countries. And the president also talked about ways that there could be a joint effort between the U.S. and China on things like counter-narcotics, artificial intelligence, and also... Uh, climate change. Very important, of course, for President Biden. But this is a very lengthy agenda that they're continuing to say, look, they want to at least have a restart of the conversation, a chance for the president to have what he says is a frank, direct conversation with his Chinese counterpart. But in terms of a major deliverable, the one thing the White House continues to say that the president would like to see from this meeting is the restoration of military to military communications between the two countries. That has been frozen since August of 2022 when China put those on pause after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi traveled to Taiwan. China was not happy about that visit, so there was a protest move there, and they suspended the military conversations. This is a big priority for President Biden and perhaps something he can actually achieve, a tangible deliverable after these hours of meetings today with the Chinese president. Kira? And there's a lot at stake for both leaders, uh, both of them having image problems in two totally different countries, opposite sides of the world. There's a lot at stake, not only for Biden, but also for Xi. There's a big economic focus for China's President Xi while he is here in San Francisco. You've got the meetings today with President Biden and senior U.S. officials, including cabinet secretaries like the Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is there, the Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo also there. And that is important for China because one of their messages here is that China is open for business. They've had an economic downturn since COVID and the shutdowns there, and they are experiencing a slowdown in growth. They're also experiencing an increase in unemployment and a slowdown in foreign investment. So part of Xi's goal here is to say to American companies, you know, come back to China, invest in China. He's going to be having those meetings with U.S. officials, but also meeting with U.S. companies. So a big part of that message from China then is, of course, economic related. I thought it was very interesting that uh, the Chinese president in his brief remarks there when he was sitting across the table from uh, President Biden talked about COVID, talked about the uh, still lingering effects of that shutdown. And he said the global economy is recovering, but it remains sluggish. That is nowhere more important than we're seeing in China right now. Well, the meeting comes as Israel clearly uh, continues to mm -hmm. intensify its war against Hamas. A lot of concerns about the conflict widening there in the Middle East. Uh, let's talk about China's role in this conversation that must be had. Yeah, Iran is going to be a big point that President Biden will bring up with China's President Xi because China is Iran's biggest buyer of oil. And the White House thinks that that gives China significant or special leverage over Iran. So the president is going to be talking about this today with Xi and trying to get Iran to rein in those proxy attacks on U.S. forces in the Middle East. Also, a message to Iran to not expand this conflict beyond Israel and Hamas. This has been a big concern for the administration. So given China's economic ties and diplomatic ties with Iran, the administration feels that that gives them sway over Iran. And President Biden is going to push China to try to use that leverage and uh, have some actual uh, considerable sway there with Iran. Well, what can we expect, you think, for the two leaders uh, just throughout the rest of the day? We know they're at the table yeah. right now. We took our viewers there live. How will this play out? 
Yeah, they're going to be behind closed doors now, Kira, for the next several hours. The White House has blocked off about four hours for these meetings. This is really intense, but the president likes this. He values this face-to-face -face diplomacy. He's talked about his long relationship with China's President Xi. He's talked about the straightforward, candid conversations they've had in the past and how much he appreciates that and wants to have it today. So many hours of meetings. The next time we expect to see President Biden is later tonight when he has a press conference. That'll be the first readout we get of those meetings. He'll take questions from reporters, and there is a lot to ask him about tonight here in San Francisco. And we'll be covering it all. Karen Travers, thanks so much. Now let's head overseas to Israel's war against Hamas. The Israeli military operation at the Al Shiva Hospital in Gaza is deepening. Our correspondent Patrick Rebel now is following this for us out of Tel Aviv. So let's talk about the latest on the situation there outside the hospital as the IDF says it's continuing its raids, Patrick. Hi, Kira. Yeah, we spoke a little while ago to a journalist who says that he is inside um, Al Shifa and who's been there for the last few days. And he says that he can see Israeli tanks outside the hospital, that he can hear fighting outside the hospital, he can hear tanks firing. He says they're not firing onto the hospital. He says also that Israeli forces earlier, after that raid, took away about 30 Palestinian men and arrested them, in his words, and took them out of the hospital and away. And we obviously, this, there's a great deal of uncertainty around the situation around the hospital because of the fog of war and because we're getting such conflicting reports from both sides but ultimately we know what we know from both sides so far is that the Israelis um, approached the hospital went inside the hospital as far as we can understand and they've now released photos and images showing them where they claim that they found a small number of weapons I mean but one of the things that we've been saying for the last few weeks we've been hearing from the Ukraine from the um, from the Israelis that basically there is a Hamas headquarters inside Al Shifa Hospital, but so far the, the weapons that they found, the things that they found inside the hospital, do not seem to show any kind of major presence there. That doesn't mean that the necessity won't be in the future, but right now it doesn't seem to match up with the claims that Israel had been making beforehand. And we know that, of course, this is an, this is a hospital where there are thousands of people sheltering. There are several thousand people sheltering, and there are hundreds of patients. And we've also heard from a doctor tonight that 40 patients who are in the ICU who are on on oxygen have died since Sunday because oxygen has run out there so essentially this hospital has been under siege for the last several days the Israelis say they had to go in because they say it was a Hamas headquarters but so far what they found doesn't seem to necessarily show that and so obviously the situation there is very very disturbing we also know that we've seen these videos of, of hundred of a hundred and uh, over a hundred bodies lying out in the open in the courtyard hearing these awful stories from doctors there who are saying that people have been digging with their bare hands to bury these bodies and so obviously just a really disturbing situation there the head of the WHO saying that the hospital that this is unacceptable what Israel has done around this hospital. Well, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu also paid a trip uh, to troops there on the ground in the region. What do we know about his visit, where he went, with whom he met? Yeah, President Netanyahu has been making a, a number of visits up to the border to try and show um, that he's in command and show that he is in control. But it obviously, it's having, at the moment, basically polls show that he is having severe problems um, among Israelis. He has about a 4% poll rating right now, which comes from the fact that basically many Israelis hold him um, responsible for what happened on October 7th and for the failure to prevent Hamas from co conducting its, its, um, its atrocities against Israelis um, in the kibbutzes uh, up near close to Gaza. And so it, he is facing a severe problem here, which has major consequences for how long this war might go on, because many experts believe that Netanyahu now um, believes he has to keep prosecuting this war in order to try and remain in power. And Patrick, speaking of Netanyahu, he's also facing new calls to resign, even from inside his own government. Can you just break that down for us? I mean, this comes amid all the protests prior to this war. As he was trying to overhaul the judicial system, people were protesting uh, to give him the boot then, too. Yeah, so the leader of the opposition, Yair Lapid, had um, called tonight for Netanyahu to step down. I mean, there have been a number of calls for him to step down o over the course of this. He currently is heading a unity government, but people saying essentially the message you hear from most Israelis is, first we finish the war, 
then we deal with Netanyahu and we must have a new government after that. And that's what you hear from really a very large number of Israelis because this was an extremely polarized country before the Hamas attacks. You know, we were seeing protests here where you would see 300,000 people on the street because of these judicial reforms that many people here saw as a power grab, an attempt to basically make Israel more authoritarian and to basically an attack on the independence of its judiciary. But he did, you know, survive that crisis. I think now, though, he, after most people we hear, most people we speak to here really do say to us that he, they hold him responsible for this war and as soon as it's over they are going to have to try and deal with him afterwards. All right, Patrick Rebel there in Tel Aviv. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. And coming up, show us the money. All it takes is 20 questions in 10 minutes, so says the Department of Education. What these changes mean for the millions of you trying to get student loans right now. America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? How <laughs> cute. <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, the man suspected in the Gilgo Beach murders is back in court today in New York for the first time since his arrest. His wife was there also just one week after she visited him in prison. Asa Ellerup filed for divorce six days after her husband, Rex Ewerman, was arrested back in July for the murder of three sex workers on Long Island. Ewerman has pleaded not guilty to all counts. Our senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Kutersky, has been following this from the beginning. So let's be clear here. This was just a scheduling hearing, right? So did Rex Huerman's wife decide that she wanted to come for what reasons? It's a good question. She did not make any particular statement either on her way in or way out of court today. And, and Asa Ellerup had not been to court previously during Huerman's appearances. But her attorney says she now wants to come to court every time he's due to appear going forward because she wants to see the evidence for herself. It's not clear today whether Huerman and his wife made eye contact or whether he knew that she was there, but his attorney said he appreciates the support uh, and, and the defense attorneys believe that, that Ellerup does not believe her husband to have been capable of committing the crimes that he's accused of, namely the murders of three women uh, on Long Island, whose bodies were all found along a marshy stretch in Gilgo Beach wrapped in burlap. Kira, there may be one additional reason which was uh, left unsaid, and that is that Asa Ellerup has recently signed a, what we think to be sizable uh, deal with a production company to tell her story. And it may be uh, that she came to court uh, in furtherance of that. 
Interesting. So this may have nothing to do with visiting her husband to see how he's doing, but it could be centered around what she could add to a production deal. Maybe, and it's it's just speculation. We don't know, as I say, she didn't make any any particular statements either on her way in or way out of court, but we know that she recently visited him uh, in jail. He's uh, charged with, with murder and obviously being held without bail. So uh, she recently visited him uh, briefly, hour or so, in the, in the Suffolk County Jail. Uh, visit was authorized. We're not sure what they discussed, but uh, she may have had a camera following her for part of that as well. Interesting. Uh, well, it definitely would be uh, quite a riveting interview, no doubt. <laughs> I'd rather see you do it, um, but we'll follow it. Now, Hewerman is also the prime suspect in the death of a fourth woman now, right? What do we know about that? He's been charged in the deaths of three women, and he is the prime suspect in the death of a fourth. Maureen Brainerd Barnes was found right with the other three that Hewerman is accused of killing. Uh, all four were found wrapped in burlap along this marshy stretch uh, on Long Island. And prosecutors said today that they are close to wrapping up that part of the investigation and making a decision whether to charge Hewerman with a fourth murder. Now, there were 10 sets of remains, all told, found along that area of Gilgo Beach. It had long been uh, a, a dumping ground for bodies, so it's not clear that Hewerman's going to be linked to all 10 sets of human remains, but it's a good bet, Kira, that prosecutors are going to move forward, charging him with the death of Maureen Brainerd Barnes, sometimes per perhaps as soon as next month. Aaron, thanks. Now to the Department of Education's new efforts to overhaul the federal student loan application. The new financial aid form will now be less than 20 questions and it's expected to take about 10 minutes. That's compared to the current application process, which is more than 100 questions and who knows how long that could take. Let's bring in our ABC News correspondent Elizabeth Schulze, who actually got an exclusive look at the new forms. So. What more did you learn about the process? And tell us about these forms. What stood out to you? Well, Kara, and this really is a big deal for millions of high school students and their families who are going through the college application process. Anyone who has used the financial aid form known as FAFSA knows it's cumbersome, it's complicated, and it can take hours to complete. So we were able to get a look at some of the changes that are in place coming into place for this form, particularly the number of questions on it is going to go down. From In some cases, the number of questions is over 100. That will go down to as few as 18 questions, which means it could take a lot less time to fill this out. Out. The design of the form is, is simplified. Some students will find that it could take 10 minutes to complete the a process. Uh, others will take a little bit longer depending on how complicated their financial situation is. The big difference here is that this form will pull data automatically from your household, your family's uh, income from the IRS. So that just takes a lot of the, the burden on you out when it comes to actually filling out this information. And this is a change that was mandated by law from Congress. The point was to try to say, a huge barrier for so many students when it comes to college is obviously the cost. And if more people can find ways to apply and if that process can be simplified, that can help overcome that barrier at least a little bit, Kira. So how will this impact low-income families just in terms of Pell Grant eligibility? Right, so the Department of Education tells us that more than 600,000 low-income households will now qualify for Pell Grants because of the changes to FAFSA, which includes a simplified process, but also a changes in who's eligible here. So that's a pretty significant number when you think about the number of families who could receive uh, grants from the government. And we're talking about Pell Grants. These are uh, these are actual uh, grants we're talking about, not loans. So this is not money that you actually need to pay back to the federal government. So that is a really significant program that's widely taken advantage of by so many students. This is determined by the size of your family and your where you stand when it comes to the federal poverty level, but a pretty significant difference when it comes to some of those low-income households and who could qualify under this uh, aid program, Kara. So are there downsides here? There or are potential always, downsides. Right, and there are always <laughs> trade-offs. When we're talking about money from the federal government, there's always going to be, say, well, does this mean that someone else might not qualify? And what analysts have found is that because of some of the changes to the federal aid rules, there are some higher income households who might not get as much aid from the government. And then some students who actually have siblings in college 
might not qualify for as much financial aid. So, of course, in any of these times and any of these instances where there's an overhaul of a federal system where the goal is to simplify, to try to eliminate some of that bureaucracy, there will be trade offs. And that's what some advocacy groups have pointed to. The other change and the other kind of barrier to this is that it will take some time for some of these changes to go in place, Kira. So if you fill out this new form, it might take time for that information to actually get transmitted to the college you're applying for. You might not know exactly how much aid you qualify for, and that could, of course, affect the decision you're making when you're looking at trying to figure out which college or university to attend. All right, great job getting access to those forms, and there are going to be a lot of families uh, and students very interested in what you just said. Elizabeth, thank you. Thanks, Kara. And coming up, Iceland on alert. How towns are racing to get people out as they brace for an expected volcano eruption. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Harvard University, I'm Selena Wang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Some other top stories that we're tracking for you this hour. Las Vegas police arrest eight teenagers in connection with the beating death of 17-year-old Jonathan Lewis. Police say the teen died from blunt force injuries after he jumped by 15 after he was jumped by 15 people outside a high school this month. The suspects are all between 13 and 17 years old, are expected to face murder charges now, and more arrests are expected in this case as well. One well, accused gunman allegedly threatened employees at a bakery and said he might snap. Well, this ended up being the accused gunman in the deadly rampage in Lewiston, Maine. 
Police say that they got word of that incident at the bakery uh, involving Robert Card too late, though, to stop the bloodshed that he did go on to cause because a police report was never filed after the shootings. Card is accused of killing 18 people before taking his own life. A large span of an L.A. area expressway will remain closed for weeks following a massive blaze on Saturday. Crews are working around the clock now to get traffic moving on I-10, just one of the nation's busiest roadways. The fire was started by an arsonist, according to police, but there's no word yet on a suspect in the case. So officials in Iceland are monitoring the threat of a possible vote volcanic eruption now. The Icelandic Meteorological Office reporting an eruption is very likely to occur in the next few days as thousands of residents have already been evacuated from a small town there following an uptick of earthquakes. Our foreign correspondent James Longman is on the scene. Thousands of earthquakes. That's what officials in Iceland say has alerted them to what they call an imminent volcanic eruption and the significant likelihood it'll happen soon. Cracks in roads have opened up, steam pouring out of the ground as seismic activity intensifies in the southwestern part of the country. Over 700 quakes have struck in just the last day and more than 20,000 since October 25th. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma bubbling underground, threatening the small town of Grindavik. Authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people. We provide support and information when people are scared. They need that. Our cameras seeing multiple eruptions over the years in Iceland are Will Reeve up close and personal in 2021. Look there at all that lava coming out, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Back in 2010, another volcano erupted and it disrupted air travel for days. All right, James, thank you. We will follow it. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips from Breaking News. To all the stories that matter to you, ABC News Live is here for you 24-7. We we'll take you to a just outside California there, a live look of uh, not far, that's actually the Embarcadero, along uh, the wa beautiful waterfront, Golden Gate Bridge in the back, and not far from there, as you know, the high-stakes Apex Summit, where the president is meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. We're following it all throughout the day. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. Please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop, stop. Hey, hey, hey. Everybody was scared that you were showing up to Laredo. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real-life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind-boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the front lines of the war in Israel, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching for you right now on ABC News Live. Starting outside San Francisco, where the diplomatic stakes are high as the leaders of two of the most powerful countries in the world meet to hash out their differences. President Biden holding talks this hour with Chinese President Xi Jinping at the APAC Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. The world leaders addressing each other face to face for the first time in more than a year. Mr. President, we know each other for a long time. We haven't always agreed, which would not have surprised anyone. But our meetings have always been candid, straightforward, and useful. I've never doubted what you've told me in terms of your candid nature in which you speak. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. Two leaders are discussing a number of issues, including China's military aggression, Taiwan's independence, and the growing concerns over a widening conflict in the Middle East amid Israel's war with Hamas. The White House saying President Biden has tempered expectations, but is still hoping today's meeting can boost the U.S. relationship with China. So the closing bell ringing on Wall Street. Stocks in the green today, continuing yesterday's rally on the heels of strong inflation data. The Nasdaq and S&P 500 both coming off their best day since April. Shares of Target leading the pack, up close to 20 percent after third quarter numbers came in better than expected. And closing arguments wrapping up in the trial of the man accused of attacking former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer. David DePap taking the stand, even breaking down in tears as he detailed the events leading up to the attack. DePap says that he wanted to ask Nancy Pelosi about government corruption, post video of it online while not intending to hurt her husband. He says that he acted out when he realized his plan was ruined. If convicted, DePap faces life in prison. And a quick programming note just before we go, special coverage of President Biden's high stakes summit there with Chinese President Xi with our Kena Whitworth right here on ABC News Live. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on your favorite streaming channel, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. Israeli commandos and tanks launch what's being called a precise and targeted operation against the terror group Hamas inside Gaza's largest hospital. Thousands of people have taken refuge at the hospital in the war between Israel and Hamas. Our Matt Gutman and his team with the latest, including the protests to bring the Israeli hostages home. We understand that there is progress being made on a deal with Hamas that would bring about a quarter of the hostages back. And Texas passing a bill authorizing police officers to arrest migrants, one of the strictest immigration laws in the country. Maria Villarreal with our GMA3 deep dive into the controversial measure. And the American Classroom, our network-wide series during Education Week. Today, my report on some innovative ways students and faculty are using artificial intelligence. Plus Tories, deals and steals with guest Adam Glassman, revealing some of Oprah's sparkling favorites of the holiday season. My boss at the time was a guy who, who has the most Scottish name I have ever heard of in my life. His name was, and I'm not kidding, Willie Macbeth. <laughs> like, I'm Scottish, I think that's a bit too Scottish. And late night funny man Craig Ferguson is up to something new. He joins us here in the studio on his podcast, All About Joy. And speaking of joy, feast your eyes on this post. The miracle recovery of star Jeremy Renner, the Avenger sharing his latest accomplishment. Now from Times Square, DeMarco Morgan and Eva Pilgrim with Dr. Jen Ashton and what you need to know. 
That's a good one there. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to What You Need to Know. It is Wednesday, which means it's hump day. And I got to tell you guys, this woman right here is the queen of Philly, oh, Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah. They love you. Of your adventure down to Philadelphia. Oh, it so much fun. It's love such a great family. place. We love that family. Oh. Mm -hmm. And Miss Wanda, 92 years young. Oh, my God. Gorgeous. She look, didn't even look a day over no. 70. She looks like she's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> a ton of fun. <laughs> too much fun because she still rides motorcycles and stuff, too. What? Yeah, she's a boss. 92. She is a boss. That is crazy. <laughs> wow. Yes. All right, let's talk to America's favorite doctor if we can, shall okay, we? Hey, my friend. All right, Dr. Jen, the American Heart Association is looking at new risk factors for heart disease impacting younger women. Yeah, so this has been an initiative with the American Heart Association and the world of cardiology for a few years now, really connecting the dots between women's health issues and a risk of heart disease. Two recent studies done by the American Heart Associations, let me take you through it, uh, looking at reproductive and cardiovascular conditions in young women women, as you said, the first study looked at teenagers, girls 13 through 17 years of age with PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, what they found is that in that population, there was a 30% increased risk for a diagnosis of high blood pressure. In the second study, they looked at women under the age of 50 with painful periods known as dysmenorrhea. They found that population two times greater risk for heart disease. And again, big, big picture here one in three women will die of cardiovascular disease. Mm. So this initiative about getting uh, an idea earlier than later about who's at risk so that you can intervene and then prevent is really important. Thanks, Dr. Chan. You bet. We turn now to ABC's Ike Ajachi in Washington with our latest headlines. Good afternoon to you, Ike. Good afternoon, Eve. Uh, we're going to begin with the... <sighs> Sigh of relief here on Capitol Hill, a big step closer to keeping the government funded after the House passed a bill to avert a possible shutdown. New Speaker Mike Johnson's measure getting more support from Democrats than from fellow Republicans. Fireworks on other matters erupting across the chamber, a congressman accusing former Speaker Kevin McCarthy of elbowing him in the kidney as the two passed, which McCarthy denied, and a heated confrontation at a hearing. Senator Bernie Sanders reprimanding a fellow lawmaker when tempers flared, along with threats of a physical confrontation with a Teamsters official. Now to President Biden's high-stakes meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping taking place in San Francisco today. There's been a chill between the two countries. The Biden administration hoping to reopen lines of communication in an effort to prevent future conflicts. And you may want to rethink that early cup of joe tomorrow. The potential walkout by baristas and other workers at hundreds of Starbucks stores nationwide on one of the company's most profitable days of the year, known as Red Cup Day. When Starbucks unveils those holiday-themed cups, both sides blaming each other. The company saying they remain, quote, committed to working with all partners. And we turn now to Ginger Z for a look at your weather. Flash flooding again in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I say that because they have had an epic year on track to be the wettest year on record. They've had 101 inches of rain so far, and that's about 44 inches above normal. So they're going to get even more with this next system. That's what should easily put them into that top spot from the Space Coast down to Miami. We've got flood watches. Locally, they could see up to 10 inches in a couple of small pockets. Overall, kind of a two to four inch range. And finally here, some magic to marvel at. Avengers star Jeremy Renner posting his run on a steep driveway after that terrible snowplow accident just this past winter. There were fears he'd never walk again or even survive it. Renner saying his family and friends are his fuel. The stunning recovery, so great to see. We're all cheering him on, guys. Yes, we are. Nice to see you, Spragus. And somebody's hanging up their jersey. They're getting out of the game. Someone has been engaged. Yes, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that you're hanging out his jersey. Oh, yeah, he's yeah. put the jersey down. You got to get out the game at some point. And she's beautiful. Uh, she's <laughs> worth it. Yes. Yes, yes. I am hanging up those proverbial <laughs> cleats for good. Uh, yeah. That is Faven Gatana, Dr. Faven Gatana, the, the love of my life. We Aww. met just a couple of years ago. I surprised her with 50 of her friends and family. She had no idea. I was very stressful doing both this and that at the same time. I heard you had a drone. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a drone? <laughs> You know what? If it weren't for those strict laws in Washington, D.C., the drone would have been deployed, but I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to remain oh, employed. So oh, there's no drone. Yes, lucky we are so happy for you. And, and what a gentleman. All right, yes. thank you, man. Congrats. Thank you.
<laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, still ahead here on GMA3, what we are now learning about that unfolding military showdown between Israel and Hamas at the site of Gaza's largest hospital. Our team is on the ground with the latest. Plus, the new immigration law in Texas sparking controversy. ABC's Maria Viral with a deep dive. We'll have more GMA3 in just a bit. <laughs> it almost happened. <laughs> Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! Now I knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. America every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, folks, welcome back to GMA3. Now to the latest in the Israel-Hamas war. Overnight, Israeli Defense Forces are raiding the largest hospital in Gaza. The IDF claiming the hospital serves as a base for Hamas, which Hamas denies, by the way. But U.S. officials say they have intelligence backing up that IDF claim. This news coming just as a senior Israeli source tells ABC News a breakthrough on the hostage deal could come within a matter of days. Joining us now with all the latest from Israel is ABC News chief national correspondent Matt Gutman. Matt, thanks so much for being with us. Let's start with that raid of the hospital overnight. They're calling it a targeted operation. What do we know here? Eva, we understand it's still ongoing. The Israeli military is saying that it went into specified areas of the hospital, going in through the basement and first floors. We understand they're also trying to find uh, perhaps Hamas operatives to interrogate. They say they're mostly after the infrastructure, but not necessarily Hamas personnel themselves. Uh, they've also put uh, medicine and medical supplies in the hospital. But from what we understand from doctors at the hospital, the situation there continues to deteriorate. And of course, U.S. officials telling us beneath Al Shifa Hospital is a command and control node belonging to Hamas. They believe that it's extensive, multi layered, that there are hundreds of operatives possibly inside with communications devices, even booby traps. So Matt, we know the Michael. hospital is still operating. Uh, what do we know about the patients and their safety? Well, first of all, the, to say that it's operating is perhaps an overstatement, right? We understand that there are doctors there, there is some medicine, but basically they don't have food, water, electricity, gas for generators. They've had to take um, 40 babies off their incubators put them on a warm bed just to keep them alive because they had no electricity to run the incubators. And right now, their situation is extraordinarily tenuous. So maybe they get more supplies coming in. Maybe this ends it all. But the doctors I've spoken to say the situation is beyond grim. Just yesterday, the head of plastic surgery telling me they had to dig a mass grave because there were 180 unburied bodies, corpses in the courtyard of that hospital that they had to get underground because of the stench there. 
That's how bad it is. Mm, that's really, really mm -hmm. horrible. Um, we have to talk about the latest on these hostage negotiations. How could this raid complicate all of those talks? We don't yet know. Israel has been in the Gaza Strip for a number of weeks already. There have been so many raids, uh, many Palestinians killed, obviously many Hamas operatives as well, we understand, killed as well. So we don't know if this is going to be the thing that kills this deal. Uh, we understand that it is progressing, that something could happen in the next two, three, four days. We understand the deal is now sitting with Hamas leaders in Gaza, which could take some time to get back to Doha in order for um, officials there to get it back to Israel. So we're still a few days away. This could be a deal for up to a quarter of the 239 hostages. So there is some hope here, and it really is unclear what this raid of the Shifa hospital is going to do to it. The only thing people are telling us is we're going to have to wait and see. ABC's Matt Gutman, thank you so much for joining thank us. You, Matt. Thanks, Eva. Well, just ahead here on GMA3, the new immigration law just passed in Texas. And some critics are calling it racist. Amadea Villarreal is on the ground with the latest for us. Come on back. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach and I kick her extremely hard in the face, and then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Marcus Moore covering the wildfires in Greece. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. All right, folks, we're now back with a new measure being called one of the strictest immigration laws in the country, the Texas House Bill, a passing authorizing officers to arrest migrants. And it's expected to have major implications for migrants in Texas and all across the country. Let's bring in ABC's Maria Villarreal. She is in Dallas with the latest in... Maria, I know there's a lot of uproar over this bill, so break down for us exactly what's in it. Hey, good morning, guys. Listen, it's no uh, surprise, right, that Texas Governor Greg Abbott, he does not agree with the Biden administration's handling of the border. So he really has implemented his own initiatives and strategies over the last few years. And now that comes along with more funding. Last night we saw SB4 uh, voted on and passed. Um, and, and really what this allows 
uh, Texas to do is it puts two new laws in place. One that says that law enforcement officers in the state, so sheriff's deputies, uh, constables, police officers, they can arrest someone they believe has entered or re-entered into the state illegally. But then it also allows judges to send those people back to the country where they crossed over from. And if migrants don't comply, they could face up to 20 years in prison. So some very strict laws now potentially going into place here in, in the state of Texas. So what are you hearing from migrants they are already living in Texas? You know, DeMarco, I think there is a real concern here. A lot of advocates that we've spoken to, attorneys that are already working on what their next step will be, have said that this is causing a lot of fear in the migrant community. People who are here going through the actual process of, you know, trying to live here in the U.S. legally. I think the bigger concern for people that are crossing over at the border is, you know, how are, how are they going to implement these laws? I mean, advocates say, listen, if the only way you have is to look at them and say, like, that they might not be here legally, well, then that's racial profiling. So there is a big concern about what sort of implications this may have for them. And a lot of migrants are also very fearful that if they do cross the border um, and they are arrested, will they be separated from their children? Also, what does this do to the asylum-seeking process? So really, a lot of big concerns here that could have some constitutional implications um, further down the road. And, and also, I'm curious about the foreign relations that goes into this. Could this cause some sort of dispute with Mexico if these judges are sending people back across the border? Absolutely. Look, over the last few years, as uh, Governor Abbott has started to do his own thing here along the border, um, each time he implements a new strategy, a new plan, puts in place, you know, we do hear from Mexico's president be, be very outspoken about his frustration, his anger with what that does to their own border communities. I mean, really, this will stress their system even more than what they are already dealing with right now. Um, and there is a big concern about the safety of migrants as they are being pushed back into Mexico uh, without any sort of safety precautions in place and so yeah I, I can imagine we will hear from the president very soon of Mexico talk about what this law could potentially do to their country as well. And Maria do we know when Governor Abbott could get the bill and when it could go into law? You know, as of right now, they're not giving us a timetable for this. I mean, it's very clear that, the, uh, that Governor Abbott really did want more funding to go to border security. So there is a good likelihood, right, that he will sign this. But no idea when it'll actually get to his desk. What is very clear, as of late last night, as soon as this bill passed, we heard from a number of advocacy groups, ACLU being the biggest right now. They are already saying we are vowing to take this to court. We want to make sure that we keep this from being implemented. Uh, and we want to make sure that we keep this from, um, you know, out of the the, the, the court system or into the court system and make sure that we don't see law enforcement officers trying to implement this uh, before we actually have a discussion about it. So again, I think we have a long ways for this to go, uh, but, but clearly um, Texas wants to move forward with it. Yeah, and definitely not the last time we will be talking about it. ABC's Maria Villarreal, thank you so much for Good being with us. Good to see you, friend. Thanks, guys. Up next here on GMA3, Dr. Jen's prescription for those who can start to feel a little down as the days get shorter. Yeah, we're both listening, right? Plus, the American classroom. I'm taking you inside a school in Newark, New Jersey, using artificial intelligence in innovative ways. GMA3, when we come back. thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. 
I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Give it to me. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Hi, right, folks, we're back now with a major talk event. It's sure to spark conversation wherever you are. This is after Patrick Mahomes. I confess to wearing the same underwear for every NFL game since rookie year. So Dr. Gene is here to break down the psychology <laughs> behind all of them. this. He, he does he wash did. it. He said he washes them. He said them. he washes them. But I found this. Okay. No, that would be a whole different health discussion. <laughs> but I think this is interesting in the world of psychology and mental preparedness whether it's sports and athletes or anyone that's in a in a performance kind of field or other people by the way the importance of rituals and the benefit of rituals i found fascinating from a psychological standpoint so uh, according to psychologists it can give an increased sense of control of things that are not in your control obviously mm -hmm. a football game is not Mm -hmm. totally under his control it can lower anxiety and I, I think that it can also kind of put some you know some aspect of uh, cosmic you know a force bigger than ourselves out there which is so of cool people listening like. to you trying to make this make sense no, but, <laughs> I know, but like in the world of psychology it's been pretty well studied mm -hmm. and they've also done really interesting studies where they take people who do a behavioral ritual like you know, having their cup of coffee or eating mm -hmm. their chocolate. And the people who have a formal ritual around it actually subjectively tend to enjoy it more. I know, but how do you keep underwear the same underwear for that long? Because, like, don't you have to replace them? I would ask his wife, because she secretly though. replaced them and he doesn't know it. <laughs> well, we don't know if he wears them other times, just the games. That's physical activity. I hope just but the games. But athletes are well <laughs> known to do this. You know, everything has to be in the same kind of way and routine. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I find it very interesting. Again, not a psychologist, but it's apparently working for Patrick Mahomes. Just clearly. <laughs> right. All right, folks, back in a moment. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop. Stop. Hey, 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 hey. Everybody was scared that you were showing up to Laredo. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real-life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind-boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach, and I kick her ex extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu.
Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. everyone, I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching for you right now on ABC News Live this hour, starting outside San Francisco, where the diplomatic stakes are high. The leaders of two of the most powerful countries in the world meeting to hash out their differences. President Biden holding talks this hour with Chinese President Xi at APEC, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. The world leaders addressing each other face to face for the first time in more than a year. Mr. President, we know each other for a long time. We haven't always agreed, which would not have surprised anyone. But our meetings have always been candid, straightforward, and useful. I've never doubted what you've told me in terms of your candid nature in which you speak. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. The two leaders discussing a number of issues, including China's military aggression, Taiwan's independence, and growing concerns over the widening conflict in the Middle East amid Israel's war with Hamas. The White House saying President Biden has tempered expectations, but is still hoping today's meeting can boost the U.S. relationship with China. The National Transportation Safety Board now investigating the scene of yesterday's deadly highway crash in Ohio involving a charter bus filled with high school students that left at least six people dead and 18 injured. The director of the agency said there was conflicting information about the sequence of events that led to the chain reaction crash there. The bus was carrying students and their chaperones to a music conference in Columbus. People in southwestern Iceland being given one last chance to get their belongings and get out. Apparently, a volcano could erupt in the next couple of days. Thousands of residents have already evacuated the small town of Grindavik, Iceland, following a massive uptick of earthquakes. Scientists say there's a nine-mile-long stretch of magma bubbling underground, and authorities have declared a state of emergency, evacuating nearly 4,000 people now. And the 2024 Oscars, well, they have a host ready to go. Jimmy Kimmel will once again host the Oscars next year with the late night comedian signing on to host the 96th Academy Awards. It will be the fourth time he takes on this role. And a quick programming note just before we go, we have special coverage of President Biden's high stakes meeting with Chinese President Xi at APEC there in San Francisco with Arcana Whitworth. That will be right here on ABC News Live, 5 p.m. Eastern. Thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. You can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and, of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops, neither do we. More GMA3 right now. Oh, the conversations we had in commercial. Yes. Welcome back to GMA3. Dr. Jen joins us once again with one of your medical questions. So here it is. Are there medications that can treat uterine fibroids? Mm. Short answer is yes, that can temporarily shrink them. They're hormonal medications. And I actually have a huge section about fibroids and the varieties and options of treatments in my next magazine, which is coming out next month. Nice. Um, but, but fibroids affect anywhere from 50 to 80% of women, much more common in black women. Uh, a lot of women don't even know they have fibroids until they get an ultrasound or sonogram for another reason. And what I like to say is, if it's not bothering you, you don't have to bother it. It depends on the size um, and the location, whether or not you need to manage or treat those fibroids. Um, but traditionally, the medication that can treat them is not pleasant for the rest of the body. It kind of puts you into a temporary menopause to cut off that hormonal stimulation, which oftentimes fuels or feeds that fibroid. So at menopause, 
the good news is that fibroids will shrink a little bit, about 30%. They'll never totally disappear. Mm. All right, your prescription for wellness. All right, has to do with some self-care tips for those seasonal blues that a lot of people get as we mm -hmm. get to this time of the year, uh, seasonal affective disorder. Number one, uh, make your environment sunnier and brighter. Even moving closer to a window where you can see natural sunlight will help, or again, those lamps. Exercising regularly, incredibly important. It releases all those feel-good uh, neurotransmitters. And then keeping a consistent sleep routine, you guys, I cannot oh. emphasize this enough. It, that sleep hygiene, going to bed around the same time, waking up around the same time, within about an hour most days of the week is so important. Um, but are there are a lot of people who are incredibly sensitive to less sunlight. Mm. And advice for people in morning TV? Um, we're, we're in trouble. There's we're in nothing trouble. that can be done for us. Nothing we can do. I understand how important sleep is because if you don't get it enough, That's right. Especially and if sunlight. you have a toddler at home. Yeah, too. yeah, that one too. All right, folks, hit us up. We'd love to hear from you on Instagram with all of your medical questions at ABC GMA3. Up next, we're taking you on a GMA3 field trip. Get ready to an American classroom for a look at how this school is using the tool of artificial intelligence. Plus, deals and steals with a little extra holiday sparkle. Tori's taking us shopping for some of Oprah's favorite When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Ready, America? Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Tonight, the high stakes face to face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television World News Tonight with David Muir. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. This week on all ABC News platforms, we are celebrating and showcasing classrooms around mm -hmm. the country. And a hot topic in schools right now, AI. Today, DeMarco is taking a deep dive into this emerging technology that's impacting students and teachers. And what a dive it was. Well, I got a chance to hang out with some amazing people at First Avenue Elementary School in Newark, New Jersey to see exactly how artificial intelligence is being used. And then if it's wrong, it'll tell you that's wrong, but in a nice way. It was correct. Oh, uh, it was correct? Yes. Boom. Okay. It's working for me. 
Sixth grade student Amy Peralta has been using artificial intelligence in school since last year. At Newark's First Avenue Elementary, students and teachers are now using Conmigo, an AI guide that is a tutor for students and an assistant for teachers that looks like a chat box. Conmigo is powered by Chat GPT-4 and is integrated into Khan Academy, an education platform. You know, something else that you mentioned that was so cool to me and, and very kind to hear was when you said it, it, it responds in a, in a nice way. I feel like a positive attitude could help somebody a lot, especially when they're frustrated on doing something. Some generative AI tools lack guardrails, raising privacy concerns. Khan Academy says it complies with federal and state privacy regulations and that Conmigo user data is protected. Conmigo is currently a pilot program. This year, more than 28,000 students and teachers are trying it out in more than 30 school districts across the country. It doesn't give them the answer. So if they ask a question, it will tell them the how and the why, but not the result. Fifth grade math teacher Anna Saran says that the AI program has been positive, helping her students build confidence and critical thinking skills, while also helping her stay prepared. It raises the level of being independent in the classroom. It helps me prepare for lessons. I use it to find strategies that I can implement in the classroom. It has so many possibilities for the teachers as well as the students. And it seems to me that it puts kids on an equal playing field, regardless of your financial background, your family background, where you live. Exactly. This levels that platform for them. It gives them the opportunity to research and find the knowledge that they're seeking. Before we started using AI, we had a couple of days where we discussed what AI was and the fact that anything that you type, you're held accountable for. I can see their conversations. I can look back on their history, on their chat, and see if it's appropriate. You guys started? Mm -hmm. We are. Timothy Nelligar and Alan Yusharinko made the push to have Conmigo implemented into the school. They believe educating students, parents, and teachers about new technology like AI will help them succeed outside the classroom. We felt it was really important to do digital citizenship with our teachers and our students, make sure our teachers understand it. It'll never replace a teacher in the classroom, but there are times that our students are home where they don't have access to a teacher at that time. It'll also help our students who speak other languages or are trying to find more challenging work. What's the overall goal? I think for us, just in having the kids engage in this new technology and sort of spearheading this new initiative and coming up with all of these answers and these innovative strategies is the way to help prepare them for the future. Although First Avenue Elementary is still in the early stages of this program, the possibilities for changing the way teachers and students experience learning are exciting. If a student has a question about any historical figure, they can actually have a conversation with the historical figure. So we're talking about figures like Frederick Douglass, Thomas Edison, you name it. Anybody that has made a contribution to our society, they can talk to. Love. Well, how, how cool is that? that and is where cool. was it when we were coming up? I know. I think of all the questions we could have asked the computer. Yeah. If you could speak with you a historical figure, who would it be? Oh my God, there's so many. Maybe Martha Washington would be the first one. I just want to know if George was telling the truth. <laughs> Eva, <laughs> wow. We can know. Try to get to the bottom of it. And be sure to tune in for more reports on the American classroom across all ABC platforms all week long. And you can join the conversation online using the hashtag the American classroom. Well done. Mm, thank you, friend. Well, coming up when we come back, tis the season for Oprah's favorite things here on GMA3. Everybody's been blowing me up about this one in my DMs. Stick around. Tori's here with the Deck the Halls deals and steals, and she's got some company. Back in a moment. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. 
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hit me with them good vibes Bitches on my phone lights Everything is so fine Little bit of sunshine Dance some more, just a little bit Breathe more, just a little bit Smile a little more in a minute Ah, 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 ah Okay, you know that we think about everybody out there across America who watches GMA every day, just like extended family. Well, now we are looking to celebrate one GMA fan. So, are you the biggest GMA fan out there? Scan this QR code and find out how to submit a video that tells us why and how you watch GMA your way. We can't wait to see your videos, and who knows, maybe you'll end up on GMA. Reporting from the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm Olivia Rubin. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. GMA3, get ready to be happy. My favorite things are coming to GMA3. I love some favorite things. Welcome back. To, and what a better way to ring in deals and steals than with a little help from Oprah. I yes. mean, just say that name one time and everybody's watching. I'm glued. Yes. And today we're not, we're joined not only by Tori Johnson, but also we're here with the creative director of Oprah Daily, Oprah Daily Adam Glassman. Adam Thanks is so here. Good, morning, Good to see you guys. Friends. And they are bringing us some big savings from small businesses on some of Oprah's favorite things. And folks, you can start shopping for these deals by pointing your cell phone camera to the QR code on your screen. So Adam and Tori, take it away. What oh, do we got? We're going to start with Bukowski Bears. This is an incredible line, the first time ever in the United States. Family owned company out of Sweden since mm. 1990. They are the softest, most cuddly, snuggly they bears. Right. And, and all plush animals. I mean, they have little rabbits. This one I think is very cute that says nobody is perfect. We picked them this year because we've had our eye on it for a few years. Oprah, mm. in fact, has this one, Eva, that you have uh. on her sofa that she keeps year-round, and she just loves the feel of it. It's so soft. It's you so can't soft. Pick a favorite, no, though. As a it's mom hard. of twins, I can tell you, you can't pick a favorite, and that's like how I feel here. You yeah. can't I know, you do want them all, yeah, you do, and yes. today's a good day to get them, because they're all 50% off, starting at just $9. They're soft, yeah. too. Yeah, so they that's very good. They can't each other. Nobody gets hurt. Head covering. Hair brella mm -hmm. is elevated head covering. The genius part about this is it's waterproof, of course, but inside it's satin lined. Ooh, so you wow. do not ruin your hair style. Okay. It protects really? your hair. Even with no this hat one? head. Yes, no Sorry. hat head, which I, I think is wonderful. I was dying to wear this. Oh well, there I you know, go. I know. There you it go. It looks good on you. You look good. I will say that this sun hat is the one that Oprah picked because she's a hiker. She likes that it. it's lightweight. Really? It's entirely waterproof. And it's just a genius hat. And you could just take it to the beach. You could wear it all the time. And we have a large variety, including, including this strap hat. Yes. Yes. And it's cool. they are all slashed in half. Oh, keep it on, Eva. Keep it on for the rest of the Eva, you see? Your hair yeah. looks good. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I know. It's a miracle. Okay. Okay. okay, we all love hot sauce. Yes, we do. I have to say. And Hot and Saucy has really genius ones mm. with wonderful flavors. Everything from <gasps> collards and Collard ghost pepper. Ghosts. Oh, this one is great. The garlic and pepperoncini. Okay. Okay. What is so wonderful is that you taste the vegetables first, Carrot. then the peppers. Carrot and chipotle. It's really good. I'm telling you, really okay. good. Okay. And we're what, 
make a believer out of it. We are. We're make a believer it, it's out all of you. natural. It's made in the United States. You get the entire set. So the whole set. you can the give that set. to someone, or you could break it up and make them into little stocking stuffers, Ooh. which I think is also a fun idea. I like idea. that. And yeah. it's a good day to get in on it because yeah. it's half price at twenty two fifty. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Ooh. Now for the dog lovers in you, we have Pride and Groom, which is a genius grooming line. Mm. It's just wonderful because it's made in clean beauty labs. So it's like. You could use it yourself as a, as a human, quite frankly. The scents are the wonderful. The scent is, is what, really unbelievable. Come on. The Oprah's scent dog is uses what it. Does it. Our the dogs scent is use so it. Good. I, I don't even know if I allowed that to be open because I was hoping to take it. Ooh. It's so good. I, I know, it's so we good. We have a huge assortment from them. If you have a dog or a dog lover in your life, you need this. The sets they created for us are slashed in half. They start at $31. I know, so and the toolkit is really good Super in between cute. shampoos. Beautiful. So good. And then Ami Cole creates makeup that celebrates women of all skin tones. And I have to say that this piece right here is a one and done multi-stick. So you just need this for your lips and your cheeks for a light wash of color. Ooh. It really gives you, you a natural look. Oh yes, I'll open yeah. that one up so right there's, here. The sets are a variety mm -hmm. of colors. There's a variety of different and colors so and the sets. We like they the are so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yes. Lips okay. and exactly. cheeks, lips which and I think cheeks. the beauty lover will love this as a gift. Mm -hmm. And they put together a bunch of different sets so that it's all of their best-selling products, including the Oprah favorites, all slash in half. The sets start at $10. Yeah. Amazing. That's yeah. a good one. It's a really good one. Finally, he has provisions. This so is a great good. gift set. They're mm -hmm. delicious. They're heat and eat artisanal heat pretzels. And eat. Heat and eat. They come like this. You put them in the oven. You put whatever toppings oh, you want on grape. it. Do you want to try the cheese sauce with it? It's I don't a, want to be a double dipper. Okay. <laughs> it is a fan favorite. You get all of this plus. Eva knows this line. You know. I know. You she know this line pretzels. well. You can the actually candle do this by yourself smells home, like warm pretzels. Candle? How, is that incredible? Isn't that great? Don't you love the scent wow. of warm pretzels? Yes. That's like a little mind blowing how that smells like a pretzel. Wonderful. That's a, that's yeah. a exactly brand like a new addition that they put in there so that you always want your pretzels. And you are a candle guy. Oh, you know what I am? You're a candle guy. I take all the candles that she brings in the show. This is such a good set, though. It's an incredible gift to either keep in your freezer for when guests come yep. and you can immediately look like you're prepared or to send it as a gift. We even have a gift message option that you'll find online. The whole set from them today is $30. I it's am sold. Yeah. Right. Okay. And, they and you like get the candle flavors. with it. You get the different candle with flavors, it. Different flavors, yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you again, Tori and Adam. We partner with all of these companies on these great deals and to get yours today, you can scan the QR code on your screen or visit our website for all of the best deals. Oh. And I got to chew that pretzel up mm. and eat it while mm. you read that tease. Just in time. Uh, just ahead here on GMA3, he's delivering laughs around the country on his fancy rascal tour. We love this guy. There he is, Craig Ferguson, and he's zeroing in on a subject on his podcast that we can all get behind. Joy, when we come back. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Give it to me.
America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. My boss at the time was a guy who, who has the most Scottish name I have ever heard of in my life. His name was, and I'm not kidding, Willie Macbeth. <laughs> like, I'm Scottish, I think that's a bit too Scottish. <laughs> Willie Macbeth! Like, I'm not kidding. Welcome back. It was the peak of the fancy Rascal Comedy Tour. I featured our next guest who has been making his way around the country and delivering big laughs. He's also the host of a new podcast taking mm -hmm. a close look at modern day joy with the second most Scottish name of all time. Please help us welcome to the studio Emmy Award winning actor, comedian, and podcast host, Craig Ferguson. Woo! Hi, everyone. It's very nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for having we me. I'm feel delighted. Joy. To... Now, this is Good Morning America, but in the afternoon. Yeah. yeah. You guys you are crazy. You this is... I like it because I've reached a point now in my life where I like, you know, you don't want to get up too early. Yeah. Too early. No. And you don't want to leave it too late. This is round about dinner time for me right <laughs> now. Can you say that again? Keep saying it. Yeah, you? I like it. I, it's great. It's we very civilized. It. It's a respectable hour to It eat. is a respectable hour, and I love what you've done with the play. <laughs> It's just great. We try. Okay, so we got to talk about your podcast, Joy. Okay. okay. How did you land upon Joy as the topic well, of your I'll tell podcast? You, I'll tell you exactly what it was. It was an idea I had when I was doing stand-up about, about a few years ago, five or six years ago, I decided I wasn't going to do any politics mm -hmm. ever again when I was doing stand-up because I don't know about you, but I'm, now, I can't even listen to the people I agree with. I'm like, I, enough. I, okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. So I wanted to talk about something else. So I wanted to talk to people I was interested in about what brings them happiness. That's yeah. it. And, and that's really what the format is, nothing more than that. So it's people I'm interested in and I talk to them. But, but people who are kind of like, you know, I'll talk to celebrities because you got to. Uh, <laughs> I understand, you got to do it. But also, you know, I talked to a guy called William Villanova, who's like a big undertaker in New York City or... Uh, Dr. Uh, Serafino that I was talking to you about, who's a robotic surgeon. He's not a robot. He works for He's not an actual <laughs> robot. He's not like a, I will perform your surgery. <laughs> Although maybe he is, I don't know. Yeah. But the, uh, to talk about people who have difficult jobs and how they manufacture or how they cope with, with, uh, with a difficult situation, how they manufacture joy for themselves. So that's kind of what drew me in. I'm, I'm interested mm. in that. Okay, so we have to turn the tables now on you mm. because as a comedian who is now doing a podcast about joy, how do you bring joy into your life? Uh, I, like, I like to do what I do. I like to do stand-up. It makes me, you know, I, I kind of enjoy entertaining people if, if it works. And, <laughs> and, it, and if it doesn't, I kind of enjoy that too because I have very low self-esteem. But, the, the, but also, I, I like working. I, you know, uh, my family, I, I like to eat uh, a lot, you know, and then, uh, and, you know, uh, just live. You know, that's it. I do want to ask you this question. In a world, you know, of social media, it's so easy to fake your joy. How can you help someone, you know, find their joy that you know they're really not happy? Any advice on that? Uh, I, I'm not qualified for that. I mean, I think that if you're, I, I think if you're faking stuff on social media, I think you're just robbing yourself. I mean, I, I don't really get why, you know, I'm having such a great time and you're not having a great time. I don't know why you would do that. But it happens. But, yeah, sure. People do it all the time. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> but the... But the but it, it does happen, <laughs> but the, you, you got to fake it sometimes, I guess. I get it. I think you really do have joy, man. Uh, yeah, I, I have a good time. Well, we're you glad know. you faked it with us today. No, I don't know if I did. You'll never know either. No. We love you, man. Again, Craig Ferguson, let's Thank give it up for Craig one more time. Thank you. Thank you. And you can listen to Joy, a podcast on the Everywhere Podcasts Are Heard. <laughs> I love that. And that is what you need to know for this Wednesday. I'm DeMarco Morgan. I'm Eva Pilgrim. And I'm Dr. Jen Ashton. And I'm Craig Ferguson. <laughs> good afternoon in the morning. Or good morning in the afternoon. Have a great, great one. Great one. <laughs> I feel like it's in your blood. When you're, when you're sky. Yeah.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, the high stakes face-to-face, -face, plus the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. For 30 years, my brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. Hi, I'm Kate Whitworth here in San Francisco for ABC News Live special coverage of President Biden's historic meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. The two leaders are sitting down face to face for the first time in a year on the sidelines of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. What the White House is saying about the agenda, including the wars in the Middle East and Ukraine, as well as America's policy on Taiwan and our nation's deadly fentanyl epidemic. All of this as demonstrators here in the streets in force fighting with police, what the protesters are saying, and the stepped up security measures that are in place to handle it. But we, of course, begin with the historic hours long sit down between President Biden and President Xi. The meeting kicking off earlier today at a rural estate just outside the city here. Now, the two leaders greeting each other, smiling, shaking hands. In their opening conversations, President Biden telling President Xi that there is no substitute for these face-to-face -face meetings. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. Well, President Xi is saying that the two leaders shoulder heavy responsibilities for the world and for history. For two large countries like China and the United States, turning their back on each other is not an option. It is unrealistic for one side to remodel the other, and conflict and confrontation has unbearable consequences for both sides. Well, this is the first meeting between Presidents Biden and Xi since last year when they sat down together in Bali. And in the moments, in the months that have followed there, the tensions have soared between China and the U.S. And among the biggest issues here is China's ties to Iran and Russia during the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, where Iranian-backed militant groups have been waging attacks on U.S. forces. Two U.S. officials confirming to ABC News that just today, an American Navy destroyer in the Red Sea shot down a drone that was launched from Yemen that they say was headed toward the U.S. ship. Well, other points of contention between the U.S. and China are the downing of that Chinese spy balloon earlier this year off the coast of South Carolina. Also, Chinese fighter jets performing those dangerous maneuvers while confronting U.S. aircraft in the Indo-Pacific. U.S. policy toward the self-ruled island of Taiwan is also something under consideration because, remember, China considers that part of its territory. And America's deadly fentanyl epidemic that has devastated cities like here, like 
like San Francisco and others around the U.S. And it is fueled by precursor chemicals that come from China. So all of this, as protesters gather in San Francisco in force, they're fighting with police, they're blocking the streets, they're trying to disrupt this APEC summit. And we will have complete coverage throughout the next two hours. But right now, we want to start with our ABC News White House correspondent, Karen Travers, here traveling with the president. And so, Karen, right now, what is the White House saying about its aims for this meeting? We know that one of the big goals here is restoring those open lines of communication between the U.S. and Chinese militaries. That is a big goal for President Biden, a top priority for him today, Kena, in these meetings with China's President Xi. But the White House went to great lengths in the days leading up to today's summit, trying to downplay expectations for any major breakthroughs. But they did say that military to military communications, restoring those ties between the U.S. and China, is something that they did feel that they could achieve. And it was, again, something that was a big priority for the president. Now, the backstory on that is that the two countries did have those open lines of communication. But back in August of 2022, China put them on pause after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made a trip to Taiwan that was very upsetting to China. And in a protest move, they cut off those ties between the two militaries. This is something that the president wants to see restarted because, as officials have put it, when you have a relationship like this that is complex, difficult, and complicated, any provocative moves, anything that could veer into escalation, they don't want to see that also then tip over into conflict. And that's why it's so important, as the president himself has said, to be able just to pick up the phone and talk to counterparts on the Chinese side. Kana. <laughs> And Karen, you just mentioned Taiwan. So, of course, tension continues to grow here between the U.S. and China over Taiwan's push for independence. What do we know about how President Biden plans to navigate that conversation? Yeah, it's a flashpoint between the two countries and one that China was coming into this meeting hoping for reassurances from the U.S. side that there would be no change in position from the Biden administration. We're told that the president was not going to announce anything significant on that. It was still going to be status quo from the Biden administration with the one China policy when it came to China considering Taiwan a territory. Now, one message, though, that the president is going to push today with China's President Xi is that China should not be meddling in Taiwan's upcoming elections that are scheduled to take place in January. Senior officials made that very clear that they do not want to see any interference in those elections. And also, maybe a, a kind of a following of that conversation, the president will make it clear they don't want to see China doing any interference in the U.S. elections taking place this time next mm -hmm. year. Certainly, of course, as well, Karen, as you know, the Israel-Hamas war top of mind here. Uh, the president is expected to broach this issue of China's diplomatic and trade relationships with Iran, who we know supports several proxy groups in that area. So what is the White House hoping for in terms of that? The White House wants to see China use what they feel is significant leverage over Iran. China is the biggest buyer of Iranian oil. So they feel that that economic connection, as well as diplomatic relations that China has with Iran, gives it significant sway over Tehran. And one thing that the president is going to push on today is that Iran needs to get these proxy groups to back off in their attacks on U.S. forces in the region and also have the message that Iran cannot expand this conflict between Israel and Hamas to different fronts, whether that's Hezbollah or other parts of the region. So what the White House is looking to have President Biden do today is to send that message to China that you have economic and diplomatic sway over Tehran, and the United States wants to see China's President Xi use it. And Karen, as you're talking, we keep replaying this initial handshake by these two leaders and we show them walking into this meeting room. Look, this meeting was tightly managed by both the U.S. and the Chinese governments. I mean, everything mm -hmm. from the tight security to the most minuscule things, right, Karen? I mean, even the flowers in the room. I immense preparations were underway for the last couple of weeks to get every detail nailed for this meeting today between the two presidents. And, and really, these preparations have been going on for months now, whether that was three cabinet secretaries and the climate envoy John Kerry traveling to China in recent months to start laying the groundwork for today's meetings by talking about the issues that would be on the agenda. But the choreography today is also very important to the Chinese officials. And they are talking about, you know, where the car would 
pull up? Who puts their hand out first for the handshake? Is there going to be a red carpet? Yes, there was. They did roll that out for China's President Xi. And what that handshake would look like when they walked inside to sit down for the meetings. Uh, these are all things that were very important to that side. White House officials weren't going to get into details on the record about some of the negotiations behind the scenes, but you saw all that play out. And then when they sat down across the table from each other, gave brief remarks, both leaders, but notably, no questions were taken. That's not surprising, given that President Biden's going to have a press conference later tonight at that same summit site. China's President Xi, though, not usually taking questions from reporters and didn't take any there today in the room, including one from our colleague, Selena Wang, who tried. I was thinking the same thing. He, he did not take her question either, despite her best efforts. Also, uh, Karen, I spoke with a spokesperson from the Eurasia Group this morning, and they said they expect a definitive announcement to crack down on fentanyl to come out of this meeting. Is that something that you're also hearing from the White House? And if not, what other deliverables do you really expect out of this meeting? The White House was not confirming that that was something that was going to get locked down during the meetings today, but it is something they hope that they could achieve. White House officials say it was going to be on the agenda. And President Biden himself, in those brief remarks before the meeting began, sitting across from China's President Xi, said that there are areas where they could reach some common ground, and he mentioned counter-narcotics. So clearly he was going to be pushing on that. Uh, so that is one possible area, military-to-military -military communications that we talked about about another area where they're hoping to have an actual deliverable and diplomatic speak, as they would put it. But the president also said that other areas where they could work together include climate change and artificial intelligence, two issues that are very big priorities for the Biden administration. And certainly highly watched here in San Francisco. Karen, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Also today, one thing we've been watching here in San Francisco is the hundreds of protesters that have been blocking the streets near the Moscone Center. That is where this APEC summit is actually being held. And the confrontations among these participants, these protesters, and police are growing more and more aggressive. As you're watching this video here, you can see just how aggressive it actually got at one point. I want to bring in our ABC's Jacqueline Lee, who has been down there at the protest for more on this. And so, Jacqueline, one thing that we've been talking about here today is that we've seen these protests go on and off, and they seem to have a multitude of different goals here and voices that they want heard. What are you saying? That's right, Kena. They were out here for hours, and they say their main objective earlier this morning was to delay APEC as long as possible. So what they were doing is they were physically blocking the delegates from entering the Moscone Center. So what they would do is the second they saw someone coming out in a suit or if they had some sort of lanyard on, they would literally form a human chain, be shouting in their face, touching them, like pushing them off. Uh, so it was very, very aggressive. And so ultimately, police did have to move the delegates and have them reroute to enter the Moscone Center a different way. Kata. That's so interesting and a little bit scary again as we keep watching that video. But also, Jacqueline, how are the residents here in San Francisco feeling about this cleanup, this so-called cleanup that the city has done in preparation for this summit? Uh, essentially, they've you know scrubbed several blocks that were known for crime and homelessness as well, all in preparation for this big summit and these official visits. Well, Kena, it's no surprise San Francisco has had quite a few issues from homelessness, from crime. And residents tell us they've been very frustrated with how downhill the city has has come. Um, and they say that, you know, it's frustrating to see that it took something like APEC to finally clean up their city. So many are calling on their local leaders to find a more permanent solution to, uh, to help make it a little bit safer. Kena. All right, Jacqueline Lee in downtown San Francisco, thank you so much. Also, now we're looking at the rising military tensions. These are key points of this discussion that we expect to happen today between these two presidents. I want to bring in our ABC News senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, along with ABC News national security defense analyst, Mick Mulroy, for more on this. So, Louis, let's start here with you. First of all, we know China has rapport with Iran. And even today, officials confirming that a U.S. Navy actually shot down a drone from Yemen that was headed right towards this ship. And this, of course, comes as we know these Iranian proxies have increased attacks on U.S. troops in that region. So what else are we learning about that incident? And Louis, do you think that the president will ask Xi Jinping to de-escalate those tensions? 
Okay, now we know that the United States has been pressuring China to de-escalate tensions with Iran to use their leverage, as you heard uh, from Karen Travers there during her live shot. Uh, but what we do know about this incident, it involves the Iranian-backed Houthis, potentially, uh, because it involves a drone that was brought down by a U.S. Navy destroyer. Um, and what happened is that the USS Thomas Hudner had fired uh, uh, used evasive measures, essentially, to bring down this drone that was headed in its direction. Now, the question is, was it headed towards the ship? Was it headed towards Israel? Remember, about three weeks ago, we had that other incident uh, back in mid-October when another American destroyer fought, brought down four uh, drones that were fired by the Houthis as well as, I'm sorry, excuse me, four missiles fired by the uh, Houthis as well as 15 drones. So that's another escalation. And don't forget, just last week, uh, we have that shoot down by the Houthis of an American uh, military MQ-9 Reaper drone flying over international airspace. So uh, a lot of concern here about ex exactly what is happening with regards to Yemen and whether it could potentially be an escalation. Remember, everything is seen through this filter of Israel Hamas potentially broadening in, into a larger conflict. This is certainly, and makes you, you know, the U.S. has underscored concerns, if you will, over China's, quote, dangerous and unlawful actions across the East and South China Seas. And that includes sending warships and aircraft carrier into the seas all around Taiwan, really boiling tensions between the two. But Mick, Biden has taken a pretty bold stance here, uh, even at times saying that the U.S. would defend Taiwan if China were to attack. And Mick, I know that, you know, U.S. officials say that's not formal policy, but how will that be perceived by Xi? So, Kena, one of the one of the means that we've used with this policy, the one China policy, yet we also have the Taiwan Relations Act, which requires us to support uh, Taiwan militarily, not to defend it with our troops, but to provide them military equipment and ammunition, is that we have this strategic ambiguity. So that the, the idea behind that is that China doesn't really know what we'll do. And I think part of what President Biden was doing was giving him a little more of that ambiguity. Will we defend Taiwan? Will we use our own forces? That's obviously not going to be decided now, but they want China to think uh, long and hard when it comes to anything that they might do to Taiwan, whether it's actually an invasion or a blockade or anything like that. We would like China to really not know whether the United States would come in and defend Taiwan, and we want to leave that decision space for that time. Keeping it ambiguous on purpose. Uh, Louis, to you. Uh, the Pentagon really has kept an eye on China's military reports, which cautions that China continues to build its nuclear ICBM fleet. Why is that such a concern, Louis? Well, it's a major concern, Kena, because we're talking about uh, China modernizing its ICBM fleet in hundreds of numbers of, uh, of missiles. Essentially, right now, they have a goal that by 2035, they're going to have 1,500 uh, ICBMs with nuclear warheads. Right now, they're progressing very quickly towards that goal. Ahead of schedule is what American officials believe. They believe that they now have 500. Now, this is a decades-long process, as Mick was talking about. Uh, this is the process of modernizing China's military. China has a goal that by 2049, which would be the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China, that they will become a global military power. So they have a step-by-step -step process. You may have heard 2027. That's when they want to be militarily capable of potentially having the need, what is needed to launch a strike against uh, Taiwan. Uh, by 2035, they want to have the modernization process complete. And by 2049, they want to be a global military power. So uh, that whole modernization process is being closely watched here at the Pentagon, and obviously something that is of concern to the White House as well. And Mick, let's not forget about this Chinese spy balloon. Uh, it spent a week, you know, hovering over the U.S. in early February. I'm sure you remember the Pentagon says they tried to call their counterparts in China and that no one would pick up the phone. So, Mick, that sort of highlights this need here to restore at least the military to military communications. Would you agree? I do agree. I think that's one of the takeaways that the administration really wants to get is this military to military communication restarted. If you think about it, during the Cold War, the United States spoke to the Soviet Union the entire time, military to military. Why? Because we didn't want something uh, that was, uh, was ambiguous to start something that neither side wanted. And it's really important that happens again. I mm -hmm. think that's going to be the biggest push uh, to do so. But there's a lot of potential confrontations that could happen in the international waters around China, in the international airspace around China. And we want to be able to talk to them so that we can clearly understand intent 
and, and, and avoid something escalating that neither country would want. Right. We know we've heard the president say he wants to be able to just pick up the phone, make that phone call. Uh, Mick Mulroy and Louis Martinez, thank you both for your expertise. We appreciate it. And coming up next here, the high stakes summit between President Biden and China's Xi Jinping. What the Chinese president is really hoping to accomplish with today's meeting and why Beijing says it's optimistic about the two leaders finding some common ground. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was his mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. And welcome back. We have more continuing coverage of this high-stakes summit between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. We're just outside here in San Francisco, and the two leaders are meeting in a rural area just outside as well. They're setting, some would call it a low bar to clear when it comes to strengthening U.S.-China relations. But Chinese officials say they're moderately optimistic ahead of today's APEC summit. Again, that's happening right here in California. And this face-to-face -face meeting, it follows a series of tense interactions over this last year. At this point, experts are saying that even an agreement to continue talking would be considered a victory. ABC News foreign correspondent Britt Clenet is in Hong Kong with more on Beijing's perspective. Hi, Kana. Well, expectations might be low ahead of the meeting between President Biden and Chinese leader Xi Jinping, but the view from China is really somewhat upbeat. State media touting Xi diplomacy and the need to build bridges and coexist peacefully. The hope being that getting relations back on track will also help get the country's economy back on track too. China is becoming really frustrated by what it sees as the U.S. refusing to relax trade restrictions, and it hopes that this will kind of turn that around. Looming over all of this is Taiwan's presidential election in just two months' time. China is expected to seek a really firm pledge that the U.S. won't encourage Taiwan to pursue formal independence, especially with a candidate it despises as the front-runner. And Victor Gao, a former Chinese diplomat, uh, he told me a little earlier that uh, China is warning the U.S. against hollowing out the one-China policy that counts Taiwan as part of it no matter what. Another sticking point could be the Ukraine and Middle East wars. China has been growing closer to Iran, which is a supporter of Hamas. But she will be reiterating that China is neutral in all of this and renewing China's calls for peace. Kena. All right, Britt Clinton in Hong Kong for us. Thank you so much. And coming up next here from San Francisco, could there be a breakthrough in talks to release the hostages being held in Gaza? We'll bring you the latest when we come back.
This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight, the high stakes face to face. Plus, the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target? And how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders. A determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Seoul, South Korea, I'm Brick Planet. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. The high-stakes meeting between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping here in San Francisco will include both leaders addressing the crisis in the Middle East as the war rages on between Israel's military and Hamas. Israeli forces today going into the Al Shifa hospital standing by their claims that Hamas is using the building as a command post. Also, this is just in here. Sources are telling ABC News that a breakthrough deal for the hostages could come within days now. In fact, this comes as ABC News can now report, according to multiple officials in the U.S. and Israel, that negotiations are progressing towards a U.S. and Qatar brokered hostage release. This deal would be between Israel and Hamas, and the potential deal would see Hamas free dozens of Israeli hostages that were taken on October 7th in exchange for Israel's release of jailed Palestinians. And this would happen during a multiple day ceasefire in Gaza. Now these, deal, uh, these details are still being worked out, but joining us for more on this conflict is ABC News Patrick Revel. He's in Tel Aviv with more. Patrick, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Hi, Kena. Yeah, and as you say, we're just learning details about this potential progress that's being made towards this deal. We've been hearing for some time, of course, about these talks that are being mediated by Qatar that are trying to reach a deal between Hamas and Israel. As you say, would see potentially um, Hamas releasing potentially dozens of hostages in exchange for a temporary ceasefire that would be only a matter of days. And we know from what we've been hearing from our sources that basically the sticking point right now seems to be how many hostages in exchange for how many days and whether it's going to be a matter of, I mean, the number that has been suggested at the moment is perhaps 50 hostages in exchange for perhaps three to five days, something like that. But there is no, at the moment, agreement on that. And so for the time being, we're still waiting to find out. You know, they're, they're still debating, they're still discussing. And until the deal is reached, you know, the deal isn't done. And when it's not done, it's just not there yet. Patrick Revel in Tel Aviv, thank you so much. And again, those officials are saying that an agreement seems to be within reach, uh, but multiple and similar proposals have fallen apart in the past. We will, of course, uh, keep a close watch on that. We have much more news ahead here on ABC News Live. Uh, in today's big story, President Biden and President Xi in their first face-to-face sit-down in a year, I'll be speaking with former State Department and National Security Council official 
about the recent tensions over the downing of that Chinese spy balloon, close calls between fighter jets, Taiwan, and other issues. Also in our spotlight, the focus on chemicals coming out of China that are fueling America's deadly fentanyl epidemic, which has devastated cities like here, like San Francisco. Our panel will weigh in just ahead. start kissing each other and then she tells me no i get up on the beach and i kick her ex extremely hard in the face and then i push her off into the sea a liar a murderer and a psychopath i was able to turn around now and i had the power over him it angers me it makes me just want to return the favor to him I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Please, stop right there. Turn around. Stop. Hey, stop. Hey, hey, hey. Everybody was scared that you were showing up to Laredo. Something was wrong and bodies were being found all over the place. We may have a serial killer on our hands. Friday night, 2020 takes you inside a killing spree. It's a real-life thriller playing out on police cams. It was shocking. Mind-boggling. Help me, help me. The one that got out. It sounds like something out of a movie. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Well, the leaders of the world's two biggest economies are sitting down face to face for a high stakes summit. I'm Kana Whitworth here in San Francisco, and that is, of course, our big story today. President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping breaking a year long impasse meeting at an estate just outside the city here. I'll be speaking with former State Department and National Security Council official about tensions over China's support for Iran and Russia and the downing of that Chinese spy balloon, close calls between fighter jets and U.S. policy toward Taiwan. Also in our spotlight, China blamed for helping fuel America's deadly fentanyl epidemic, which has devastated San Francisco and other cities. So can Beijing stop the flow of precursor chemicals? Our panel weighs in.
We do start, though, with our big story, this historic meeting between President Biden and President Xi, the two leaders making public remarks before kicking off this four-hour meeting, both acknowledging strains in this relationship, but reaffirming the importance of maintaining ties and avoiding conflict. And joining me right now is Jamie Metzl, a former State Department and National Security Council official and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Jamie, thank you so much for being with us. And we know here, there's a lot at stake. This is the first time these two have met in more than a year, nearly a year. Uh, we know the expectations of any actual deliverables coming out of this meeting are minimal. But officials still believe that at least this is an opportunity to reduce friction in what many see as the world's most dangerous rivalry. Do you agree? I do agree. It's perhaps the world's most dangerous uh, rivalry. And it's probably the world's most important relationship. And so we don't have the luxury of just writing off China, whatever they're doing wrong. And certainly China is doing a lot of bad things around the world. We have no choice but to push for the best possible relationship with China. Uh, we need to keep lines of communication open. And we, we need to find whatever opportunities there are for collaboration. So economic ties remain the crux of these U.S.-China relations between Bre um, President Biden says that China has some real economic problems and essentially said, you know, it's up to President Xi to uh, turn things around. Xi mentioned this slow economy, though, in the wake of the pandemic, and he mentioned that in these remarks today before this meeting started, and he added that one country's success is an opportunity for the other. You think that's how the president sees it? There is certainly an opportunity for a mutually beneficial economic relationship uh, between the United States and China. That's why the United States welcomed China into the World Trade Organization more than 20 years ago. It's why the United States has opened our markets to, uh, to China and Chinese imports, and why we've invested so much in, ed in educating an entire generation of, uh, of Chinese economic, scientific, and other leaders. Uh, but there's a growing and widespread bipartisan sense in the United States that rather than working toward a collaborative, cooperative relationship, China has been promoting a zero-sum parasitic uh, relationship, uh, seeking to leverage its economic ties um, to steal intellectual property from uh, the United States uh, to try to use the benefits of this trade to, to, in many ways, undermine the international trade system the United States and our allies have built since the end of the Second World War. And so the U.S. government is trying to be pretty clear to China there are two paths forward. One is the path of collaboration and integration and supporting a rules-based international order that benefits everyone. And the other is continuing on the path of mercantilism and zero-sum thinking that China is is on. So this is yet another opportunity to deliver that message. I mean, look, Jamie, clearly this is not a relationship built in trust. Uh, and we see this with these rising war tensions. Uh, China's war aggression is a real concern for the Pentagon, the White House as well. Uh, we saw things escalate. You think of that spy balloon. How can we move forward when both parties here really have their own foreign agendas? Well, the United States guarantees a lot of peace and security around the world, including in the South China Sea, where China is being extremely aggressive, militarily occupying uh, essentially territorial, uh, extended territorial waters of the, uh, of the Philippines. So I know we're all um, people who want peace and love peace, uh, but China is taking advantage of that to try to push its its interests forward. It's already militarized these islands in the in the South China Sea. It's declared it's essentially best friends forever uh, with Putin in the just before uh, the invasion of Ukraine. So there are a lot of very big issues, and the United States needs to be tough and firm, but make clear that we don't want conflict. We'd rather have peace.
Yeah, walking that fine line. Jamie Metzl, thank you so much for your expertise. I want to now bring our big story to our panel here. So joining us today is our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host, Mike Muse, along with ABC News political contributor and former Democratic senator from North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp, and ABC News political contributor and former Trump administration official, Sarah Isker, and ABC News White House correspondent, Karen Travers, who is also here with me in San Francisco traveling with the president. So thank you all for being with us. And Karen, you just listened to that conversation. Uh, is there anything major that President Biden and Xi Jinping could possibly announce after this meeting today? Kena, the White House was really going to great lengths to try to downplay expectations for any major breakthrough, mm -hmm. saying, you know, this is a conversation that the two leaders are having. You heard the president earlier today saying it was going to be direct, it would be straightforward and frank, but really it was about resetting the relationship and less on coming up with a big list afterwards of all of the things the two mm -hmm. sides agreed to. One big thing, though, that the United States would like to walk away from this meeting having accomplished, a big priority for the president, is Storing military to military communications, having the ability to pick up the phone and get on directly with Chinese military officials. That's significant, and it's been on pause since August of 2022 because the Chinese put it on pause after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made her trip to Taiwan. That trip angered China, and they did this in a protest move. So for the president, he has said this is very important. It's a top priority and something that administration officials believe they can actually accomplish today during these conversations. So that's one thing. But Heidi, you know, President Biden is facing a lot of pressure going into this meeting. So would leaving this meeting without any major breakthrough agreement hurt his image here at home and abroad? Well, I think so. I think that the president has to deliver something. But if you're China right now and you just watch the Republican debates, guess what? There's a big fight now in this country to be see who can be mo most hawkish. You saw that one of the attack lines against Nikki Haley has been her, you know, uh, attitude towards China when she was governor of South Carolina. And so uh, Xi has a, has a purpose in, in meeting with President Biden and actually maybe bolstering President Biden's political chances given what you're seeing from the Republican Party. And so I think, I think that for most Americans, they look at this and they aren't thinking about the South China Sea. They're thinking about fentanyl and they're thinking about drugs coming into the country and they're thinking about how this Chinese relationship affects their life and affects their ability to live a complete life. And with, with drugs coming in, I think there's an opportunity there and I hope the president comes to some kind of terms with uh, Chi on, on fentanyl uh, precursors. And we do keep hearing from some people there may be some kind of announcement, at least on that. But Sarah, let's take that to you. I mean, what are Republicans saying about this meeting and about U.S.-China relations? This is the problem with China. China's economy, its growth over the last 20 years, has been built off American support by and large. Now, some of that support hasn't been voluntary. Some of it's been illegal. They've been stealing intellectual property. They've been spying, uh, all in the hopes of building their economy to be a real competitor with the United States. Their economy is nowhere near as large as ours, but they are the second economy in the world. So when you want to talk you know, domestic politics, when it's something like climate change, for instance, that doesn't make any sense unless you bear in mind that China has no interest in being part of that conversation in any real sense. And so hurting the U.S. economy to slow the effects of climate change does nothing if China then accelerates to build their own economy. All you're doing is creating a rival for the United States uh, when it comes to the military, when it comes to our allies, uh, and even when it comes to our own uh, existential interests long term. So I don't know what can come out of this meeting that will work for the Biden administration, but you certainly, as Heidi said, have the Republicans uh, beating the hawk drum on China. Now that in and of itself, when you get into power is tough because we don't want another Cold War, but China might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting perspective, Sarah. And Mike, to you, you know, we're here in San Francisco right now, and there are residents here that have called out and criticized the increased preparations for this summit. And they're not talking about security, but they're talking about crime and homelessness and what they did to get this city ready for this meeting. Uh, how, what is your take on how San Francisco cleaned up ahead of this summit? And I think, as, what's, your, what's your stance on as to why they did it so quickly? 
I think it's important because, you know, I've, I've toured, just as you have, a big part of Northern California and the Northwest of America. And a part of the challenge in that era, area of America is uh, the homeless population. And part of that homeless population is uh, overuse of drug and drug addiction. And part of that is the opioid crisis and what is happening with fentanyl and uh, the way that fentanyl has been able to get into the United States from China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Mexico. And so it's important that San Francisco obviously wants to make sure that, you know, is a welcoming site while at the same time using this as an opportunity, which we did see the mayor of San Francisco engaging in conversations about putting pressure on China to make them a partner in really addressing the flow of fentanyl into the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I would really like to see readouts uh, from this summit today really looking at what does that look like, what does that mean, uh, and particularly from a supply chain perspective perspective and how is China going to mm -hmm. put checks and balances on the supply chain of fentanyl leaving its distribution centers of China from pharmaceuticals into chemical companies to ensure that we decrease the amount of fentanyl that is coming to the United States and hopefully eliminating the amount of percentage of homelessness uh, that exists in our streets of San Francisco and in Portland and other areas of America. Yeah, and we are not done with this fentanyl conversation. I want to thank you all, Mike, Sarah, Karen, and Heidi. Uh, thank you very much. And we will, again, talk more about fentanyl coming up here, the fight against it, and how a deal with the Chinese could potentially have a major impact on the opioid crisis and what it would mean for those that are affected by that addiction. We discuss that with our panel after the break. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Thirty years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? We had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness! No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts.
Welcome back. It's time for our spotlight. President Biden and President Xi could seal a deal this week. It is possible. This one is focused around getting China's help in fighting this fentanyl crisis here in the United States. We have some numbers for you. In 2021 alone, there were 106,000 drug overdose deaths, with over 70,000 of those deaths due to fentanyl in America. And as this opioid crisis escalates, the U.S. continues to struggle with solutions on how to combat it. So it will definitely be a talking point at today's summit in California, where over 6,000 people died in 2022 due to fentanyl overdose. So I want to bring back my panel here, Mike Muse, Heidi Heitkamp, Sarah Isker, and joining us here is ABC News' Maria Villarreal. Thank you all for being with us. And Sarah, we'll start here with you. What actions could we expect here from China to really clamp down on this fentanyl trade? The Trump Department of Justice that I worked in and now the Biden uh, administration have all been pressuring China to do something about fentanyl, its analogs, its precursors. But what is in China's interest here is totally different. China doesn't have a lot of incentive on their own to stop the flow of fentanyl into the United States. So the question really is what is the United States willing to give China in exchange? And Maria, I mean, you recently wrote about Congress being able to secure at least enough funding to try to secure this flow of fentanyl across the borders and try to reduce it. Do you think that the White House will be able to make some progress in that area? I mean, the short answer to that, Kena, is is no, right? Uh, they're asking for $14 billion. The problem that we are seeing is that, you know, the, the stopping the flow of fentanyl, you know, coming across our borders, it's actually lumped in with a big sum of money that is also going to technology, let's just say, for example. It's all border security encompassing. Um, and, and to have both sides of the aisle come together to try and, and have a, a compromise on what border security really means, I mean, you're just not going to have that right now with the way things are going in, in D.C. Um, what's very clear to us after talking with our DHS contacts is that they need this money now, right? They want more technology. They need more technology. Uh, they are uh, cap capturing all these precursors coming in uh, from China, going into super labs into Mexico. And then obviously that is what is pushing the flow of fentanyl into the U.S. Um, they are very concerned that this problem will continue to grow if they don't get the funding they need, not just for manpower, but technology and resources as well. It's hard to imagine that it could get worse. Heidi, the fentanyl is already the leading cause of death for people under 50. So has the Biden administration done enough to fight this crisis? Well, I think there's two things. It's the supply demand. I spent eight years running the Drug Enforcement Agency in the state of North Dakota, and you're never going to supply side your way out of this problem. And so, as a couple people said on the Republican debate, you've got to look at addiction treatment. You've got to look at mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. But at the bottom line, you also have to look at how much these drugs cost on the street. And the more, the tighter you can make that market and drive the price up, the more there is a lower incentive or there's a higher incentive to get treatment. Now, with that said, China, this isn't a major part of China's economy. And so it seems like an yeah. easy way to give the Biden administration a win to basically say, we are going to work with you to stop the precursors and analogs from coming into Mexico where they're then processed into fentanyl. Right, it's those separate chemicals being sent from China into Mexico and being put together and then coming into the U.S. And, and Mike, look, all eyes on California this week. Governor Newsom recently released California's plan to try to tackle the fentanyl crisis, investing a billion dollars to crack down on opioid trafficking and to combat overdoses. But what else needs to be done as far as education? And as Heidi pointed out, with, you know, the mental health awareness. I think it's a two-pronged approach that needs to happen. One from a, a health crisis approach and then the second from a diplomatic diplomatic approach. And so from the health crisis approach, there needs to be part of that money and from the federal government too as well, needs to be a PSA and awareness so that we move away from the criminality of opioid and fentanyl and actually looking at a health crisis and prevention and how we can recognize it both in our students um, who are in K-12 public school systems and private school systems and also to individuals who partake in recreational drugs when they're out and about social
socializing, let's say, in nightclubs, how to use strips to maybe detect uh, issues of fentanyl that are in their drinks or in other recreational drugs that they're choosing. That is a very uncomfortable conversation to have, but that is how we need to switch it in order to be preventative and hopefully look at causes and to help people come off of the addiction to fentanyl. From a diplomatic perspective, what my caution, Kena, has been is watching two disparate conversations. One, uh, with the President Xi and with the President of Mexico having conversation with fentanyl. President Biden and President Xi having conversation about fentanyl. I would like to see diplomatic officials from both Mexico, China, and the U.S. sit together to figure out how do they address the flow of fentanyl coming from China into Mexico, into the United States, to create more overseas and checks and balances to ensure that there is a decrease of that, particularly look at the drug cartels of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. All right, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and Maria, thank you so much for being with us. And coming up next here on ABC News Live, it's our last call. Chinese President Xi inviting some old friends to dinner tonight. We'll tell you about his special connection with some very regular folks from Iowa when we come back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight, the high stakes face to face. Plus, the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure were here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, OK, who's the target? And how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders. A determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from South Korea, I'm Juhi Cho. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Okay, it's time for our last call. Chinese President Xi is spending the day with President Biden, but this evening he will dine with a group of his old friends from Iowa. Yes, you heard that right. President Xi's relationship with Iowa goes back, Iowa goes back nearly 40 years. In fact, in 1985, President Xi was a 31-year-old county-level official, and he visited Iowa as part of a food processing delegation. Xi took part in a pig roast, in farm tours, and a Mississippi River boat ride. And tonight, Xi invited many of those same everyday people to dinner in California. So for more, I want to bring back our panel, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and also joining us is Kevin Baskins, a reporter from the Des Moines Register and responsible for us knowing all this amazing information. So uh, Kevin, tell us about those Xi trips and also why this China relationship with, you know, our Midwest is so important. Well, obviously, um, 
the United States and China are two of the superpowers, not only in um, armament, but also in agriculture. And there's a great deal of commonality that comes um, with that link. Uh, China has a lot of people to feed, and the United States uh, mm -hmm. is a big supplier of food for them. And Heidi, this somewhat folksy dinner, if you will, with everyday people, it really comes in stark contrast, of course, to the very cold relationship that we are used to seeing between Washington and Beijing. So what's your take? Well, I think these um, relationships were founded a long time ago. Um, one of the things I think that made a big difference is, as you mentioned, um, President Xi came as, you know, kind of a low-level official, but yet he was treated almost like a president when he was here in 1985. Mm -hmm. And I think that was an impression that obviously has stayed with him all these years and through um, many different changes. Yeah, and I'll take that to you, Heidi Heitkamp. You know, you always hear that term, Iowa nice, right? It really showed. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, the answer is soybeans, soybeans, soybeans. We grow a lot of them in the Midwest, <laughs> and uh, China buys a lot of them. And so it doesn't surprise me, but smart politics on Xi's part because, see, I'm not a bad guy. These wonderful, nice people from Iowa want to uh -huh. have dinner with me. So it's a good look for Xi. Yeah, and Sarah, what's your response to that? And what do you think about Xi's apparent affinity for Iowa? Yeah, this is pure politics. This is the same guy who's keeping 10,000 Uyghur minorities in concentration camps. So don't be fooled by the photo op. Don't be fooled. And Mike, look, this guest list uh, tonight includes also Gary Dvorak and his sister Paula. Their parents, they say, actually let G sleep in Gary's Star Trek themed bedroom in their home back in the 80s. And I mean, really to Sarah's point, like the optics are everything here. And, and that's a pretty good one for Americans to see. It is. It puts a new twist on guess who's coming to dinner. Uh, but we are yeah. one of the agriculture is one of the biggest exports into China, and so I think it's a really cool way to normalize relations with that to keep that going. Yeah, look to our farmers in the Midwest. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for your time. That is our last call. Uh, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and Kevin, thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact they have on you. Now, the news never stops. Neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families front. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live.
When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Traveling with President Biden in Ireland, I'm Karen Travers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. All right, I'm Kenna Whitworth here in San Francisco for ABC News Live special coverage of President Biden's historic meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. The two leaders sitting down face to face for the first time in a year on the sidelines of the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. What the White House is saying about the agenda, including the wars in the Middle East and Ukraine, as well as America's policy on Taiwan and our nation's deadly fentanyl epidemic. All of this as demonstrators here hit the streets in force fighting with police, what the protesters are saying, and the stepped-up security measures that are in place. But of course, we begin with this historic, hours-long sit-down between President Biden and President Xi. This meeting kicking off earlier today, it's happening at a rural estate just outside of the city here. Now, the two leaders are greeting each other. They're smiling and shaking hands. And in their opening conversations, President Biden telling President Xi that there is no substitute for face-to-face -face meetings. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. We have to ensure that competition does not veer into conflict. Well, President Xi is saying that the two leaders shoulder heavy responsibilities for the world and history. For two large countries like China and the United States, turning their back on each other is not an option. It is unrealistic for one side to remodel the other, and conflict and confrontation has unbearable consequences for both sides. Well, this is the first meeting between presidents uh, since last year, and that was when they sat down together in Bali. That is something that President Xi even referenced in those opening statements as well. But in the months that have followed, tensions have soared between China and the U.S. And among the biggest issues here is China's ties to Iran and Russia during the wars in Ukraine and the Middle East, where Iranian-backed militant groups have been waging attacks on U.S. forces. And two U.S. officials confirmed to ABC News that just today, Day, an American Navy destroyer in the Red Sea shot down a drone launched from Yemen that was headed toward the ship. Also, other points of contention between the U.S. and China is the downing of that Chinese spy balloon earlier this year off the coast of South Carolina and Chinese fighter jets performing dangerous maneuvers while confronting U.S. aircraft in the Indo-Pacific. A U.S. policy toward the self-ruled island of Taiwan, which China considers part of its territory. Also at issue is America's deadly fentanyl epidemic that has devastated San Francisco and other U.S. cities as well. And it's fueled by these precursor chemicals that come from China. So all of this, as protesters have gathered here in San Francisco in force, they're fighting with police, they're blocking the streets, and they're trying to disrupt the APEX summit. And we will have complete coverage uh, for the next few hours here, starting at ABC News. Uh, we're going to start with ABC News White House correspondent Karen Travers. Uh, she's been traveling with the president. She's here in San Francisco with me. And so, Karen, what is the White House saying about its aims for this meeting? I mean, we know that a big goal here is restoring the lines of communication between the U.S. and Chinese militaries. 
Kana, that's a big priority for President Biden and maybe the one big deliverable, to put it in diplomatic speak, the one big thing that the president will be able to announce after his meetings with President Xi that they could reach an agreement on. The White House went to great lengths in the lead up to today's summit to really downplay expectations for any major breakthrough, saying that this was about restarting conversations. As you noted, they have not had any contact since their meeting in person last year in Bali, a full year of no contact between the two presidents. So it's significant that they're even meeting today here outside San Francisco. So for the president, though, restarting those military to military communications is a very big priority because they feel that when you have a relationship like this between the U.S. and China, one that officials candidly described as complex, complicated, at times difficult, that when there are provocations like the ones you mentioned by the Chinese military, that you don't want that to tip into conflict. You don't want that to escalate. You need those lines of communication to be open. The president himself has said you need to be able to pick up the phone and have a conversation with your counterpart on the Chinese side. Kena. Well, and also, Karen, you know, the Israel-Hamas war is certainly top of mind. The president mm -hmm. is expected to broach that issue of China's diplomatic and trade relationships with Iran, who we know supports several proxy groups in that area. What is the White House hoping for in terms of that? The White House hopes that China can use what the White House believes is significant influence over Iran to get Iran to have those proxy groups back off in their attacks on U.S. forces in the region and also to rein in any potential for this conflict spreading beyond Israel and Hamas, involving Leb uh, Lebanon and Hezbollah, or spreading anywhere else in the region. China is the biggest buyer of Iranian oil, so there is a significant economic tie there. There's also diplomatic relations between China and Iran. And the White House feels that that gives China potential significant sway over Tehran to send a tough message. So the president is expected to say to China's President Xi that the White House would like them to use that sway to try and rein in Iran and those proxy groups and what they're doing in the region. And Karen, what about Taiwan? Tensions continue to grow between the U.S. and China over Taiwan's push for independence. Mm -hmm. So what do we know about how President Biden plans to navigate that conversation? We're told that the Chinese were coming into this meeting looking for reassurances from President Biden that there would be no change in the administration's policy when it comes to Taiwan. And White House officials said that that is exactly what would happen. It would still be status quo that the president would not be supporting independence for Taiwan. The one China policy would remain in place. But there will be a message from President Biden to China's President Xi that China cannot interfere in the upcoming elections or meddle in any way in the elections that Taiwan is holding early next year. That's something the president's going to emphasize. And likely a follow-up part of that could be the president also saying don't meddle or interfere in the U.S. elections that are taking place a year from now as well. Right, certainly. All right, Karen, so we will see what actual deliverables we may get here. We appreciate your reporting. Thank you. Also today, right here in San Francisco, you know, we saw a lot of protests, hundreds of protesters blocking streets near the Moscone Center, and that is where this APEC summit is actually being held. And the confrontations among participants, I, mean, I look at this, the protesters and police, this is really aggressive. Uh, so I want to bring in our ABC News, Jacqueline Lee, with more on this. So Jacqueline, I know that you were down there at a protest earlier today, and I know that you saw firsthand these protesters actually putting their hands on people as they tried to go into APEC. Yeah, that's right, Kena. Their ultimate objective was to delay APEC for as long as possible so they would physically block these delegates from entering. Uh, you'd see them get into their faces. They would be sh uh, chanting shame. They would say, say no to APEC. Ultimately, this is made up... Um, the Say No to APEC Coalition is made up of 170 organizations and unions, and their ultimate goal is to raise more awareness about uh, human rights violations, climate change, and they say the APEC policies ultimately promote those things. Tana. And Jacqueline, you know, when I arrived in San Francisco last night coming through downtown, we saw protests as well. These were people uh, that were calling for a ceasefire and they were marching down to the Israeli consulate. So there's certainly a lot of different voices that you're hearing out there. But also another thing, Jacqueline, that we're hearing from residents in San Francisco is their feeling about the city's decision to really clean up the city and everything that they've done in preparation for the summit, scrubbing several blocks that were known for crime and homelessness in preparation for this visit and in preparation for APEC, but not really for the residents themselves. What are you hearing, Jacqueline? 
That's right, Kena. We've just been hearing a lot of frustration from residents. They've been feeling this way for years, and they say, uh, you know, not only have they been battling a massive homelessness crisis, but also a crime crisis. And so they say that they just find it very frustrating that it took APEC to happen here in the city for local officials to clean it up rather than want to do so on behalf of residents. So they hope that there will be policy changes in the near future so that ultimately San Francisco can become a better place for them to live. Kena. Yeah, Jacqueline Lee, our thanks to you. We also now turn to the next story in our broadcast here is ABC News senior Pentagon reporter Louis Martinez and our ABC News national security defense analyst Mick Mulroy are joining us as well. Uh, so, gentlemen, thank you for being here. And Louis, we know that China has, of course, this rapport with Iran. And Louis, just today, officials confirmed that a U.S. Navy, they actually shot down this drone from Yemen that they say was headed towards the ship. So is that still the reporting that we have there? No, that is still the reporting, Kay. Now, this is the USS, the, uh, the destroyer USS Thomas Hudner, which was located in the southern Red Sea, close to Yemen. And they detected that a drone was coming in its direction uh, from Yemen. And that direction meant that it's either headed towards Israel or it's headed towards the ship. And so the team aboard uh, essentially took decisive action in bringing down this drone. Now, if it is proven that this was the Houthis who are backed by Iran, uh, then again, it's going to be yet another escalation by the Houthis who have been launching uh, missiles towards Israel over the last couple of weeks. But three weeks ago, remember, the United States actually shot down four cruise missiles and 15 drones that were headed towards Israel uh, by a yet another U.S. destroyer that brought those down. And then just last week, we saw that a, a United States Reaper drone was shot down in international airspace by the Houthis. So how do you deal with the situation with the Houthis in Yemen, uh, obviously backed by Iran? And as you say, how do we try to relate this with China? China can exert pressure on Iran uh, because they are one of their major consumers of oil. And so they can try to exert pressure potentially mm -hmm. on Iran to rein in the activities of these militia groups that they support in the region. And no doubt President Biden will be bringing that up today. And mix to you, the U.S. has underscored concerns over China's, quote, dangerous and unlawful actions across the East and the South China Seas. And that includes actually sending warships and an aircraft carrier into the seas around Taiwan. Tensions really boiling, essentially. Uh, but Biden, Mick, has taken a pretty bold stance here. At times, he's actually said the U.S. would defend Taiwan if China attacked. And Mick, I know that officials say that is not a formal policy. But then how is that received by Xi? So, Kena, the, the formal policy is we have a one-China rule uh, policy. However, uh, there is a Taiwan Relations Act which requires the United States by herself to defend ta uh, Taiwan with military uh, support, not troops, but with uh, equipment, ammunition. So we would like to see Taiwan remain an independent de democracy that's part of uh, China. So it is somewhat of an ambiguous uh, policy. And this strategic ambiguity is what I think the president is trying to get at, where it's unclear to China whether we will militarily defend Taiwan with our own forces to try to change their calculation on whether it would be worth it to do a blockade or an actual invasion. And I think that is what the president is trying to get at. He's trying to show uh, uh, the Chinese that their efforts may have to deal with the United States if they elect to go that path. All right. And Louis, tell me about this growing concern here from the Pentagon uh, about China's military reports, which cautions that China continues to build its nuclear ICBM fleet. Yes, this is part of China's major modernization program. They want to be uh, a global power. That is their stated goal, uh, that on the 100th anniversary of the establishment of the People's Republic of China, that they will become a global military power. So as part of that, they are undertaking a major modernization of their ICBM fleet. And the goal that the United States believes is that they have is that they want to have 1,500 ICBMs with nuclear warheads on them um, by 2035. As of this year, they expect that they're at about a third of that way because they, they believe that they have 500 of these IBCBMs already uh, built and in silos in Western China. So the concern here is what is exactly is China trying to do? Well, they're trying to modernize themselves. They're trying to become a global power. Um, but also, they're trying to modernize themselves for the possibility of 
launching some kind of an operation towards Taiwan. That's something that has actually become a political talking point on Capitol Hill, because we're talking about the year 2027. That's when China says that they want to have the military capabilities available to them in case they need to do something like that. But the goal here is uh, modernizing China's military. But again, when you have these tensions that you've mentioned about South China Sea and elsewhere, um, it's very concerning. Certainly. And Mick, to you, look, we cannot forget about this Chinese spy balloon. Uh, it spent a week just sort of hovering over the U.S. in early February. And you may remember here, the Pentagon says, you know, they tried to call their counterparts in China, and they say that no one picked up the phone. So, Mick, that really highlights the need to restore at least these military-to-military -military communications. And Karen says she thinks that might be the one thing they get out of this meeting. And that's absolutely right. In fact, actually, it was first spotted right here where I am in Montana, where we have uh, some of our, our land-based intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles. So we have 400. To, to Louis's point, they're trying to outpace us on that. We have 400 between Montana, Wyoming, and North Dakota. And that's where the balloon was first spotted, and one of the reasons why it was so concerning. But to the question of uh, military to military communications, it's incredibly important that we reinstate that. I think that is one of the main do-outs for this uh, summit, if you will, because that is critical to ensure that any kind of confrontation that we may have by just uh, negligent activities by the Chinese military, it doesn't escalate into something that neither side wants. All right, something that a phone call could help prevent if they can actually do it. Uh, Louis Martinez and Mick Mulroy, our thanks to both of you. And coming up next here on ABC News Live, President Xi's American reunion, how the Chinese leader's love of agriculture led him to a decades-long friendship with a group of Iowa farmers. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. And welcome back. Chinese President Xi's long history with the state of Iowa coming full circle tonight in San Francisco. In 1985, when he was a 31-year-old county-level official, Xi visited Iowa as part of a food processing delegation on a mission to get a view of American agriculture. Xi actually took part in a pig roast and farm tours and a Mississippi River boat ride. Well, tonight, Xi inviting many of those same everyday people to dinner 
in California. So joining us now is Kevin Baskins, a reporter for the Des Moines Register and responsible for this information. And Kevin, we're so happy to have you with us. And look, as we're talking about this face-to-face -face meeting, uh, at first it seemed a little bit unlikely, now it's happening. Uh, but first, I want you to tell us about the relationship between China and the American Midwest in terms of agriculture exports. Um, you know, last year, I believe, uh, we set USDA records um, in terms of agricultural exports to China. Um, China has always been one of the top customers, or most time been one of the top customers of Iowa's agricultural goods. They obviously have more people to feed than what the United States has. So um, for the most part over the years, that's been a, a trade um, arrangement that has been good for both. And we're taking you live right now as we were just listening to Kevin. What you're looking at is live images here of President Biden and President Xi. They're taking a walk out there in Woodside, California at this sprawling estate where they just had this their first face-to-face -face meeting in nearly a year. Um, and so every single detail of this meeting has been planned and talked about for months, including, I'm sure, this walk that you're witnessing there. Um, and it, I know that someone's standing right in front of the camera, but as they're taking this turn and they're going up the steps, you're seeing they're both wearing similar colored suits, but different colored ties. Uh, mm -hmm. They're walking slowly together. They also waved at the cameras. And so this is a very poignant moment and, and one that we're seeing um, right it, it appears after this meeting, we knew it was supposed to last some four hours. They had a litany of important issues to discuss. And as soon as we learn more about that, we will let you know. But I want to bring back Kevin here because um, he is talking with us about President Xi's long relationship with farmers in Iowa and agriculture in the American Midwest in general. And Kevin, I have to tell you, I spent some time in Iowa myself with some farmers. And one thing that they know for sure is they understand the relationships with China and they understand the importance of their exports there? Uh, they definitely do. I mean, it's more than just raising the crop. It, uh, once that crop is grown, you know, you have to have markets that produce the income that it takes to be able to make a life out in the countryside. And what do you think that President Xi really gained by visiting Iowa in terms of how maybe he views America all these years later? Here's what I think is the key. Um, when that delegation came in 1985, one of the little glitches that happened was that uh, they didn't have hotel space in Muscatine. So uh, the arrangements were made to put people in private homes. One of the stories that we hear quite frequently is that President G was in um, a room that actually had Star Wars decor on it. And that prompted, you know, just routine discussions with people um, in Iowa about things like movies. So all of a sudden we're communicating with somebody um, from a different country that has different attitudes and beliefs, but there was those commonalities that the people were able to form relationships over. And that's something that the president of China has never forgotten. Um, that's why we are seeing what we're seeing tonight in terms of that dinner. That's why we saw what we did in 2012 when just before he became president, he returned to Iowa. Yeah, certainly. So he is inviting many of those people to dine with him tonight all of these years later. Certainly that trip sticking with them. Uh, Kevin Baskins with the Des Moines Register. Thank you for being with us and thank you for your reporting as well. We appreciate it. And coming up next here, big question for you, parents out there. How clean is the water at your kid's school? An ABC News investigation into the safety of drinking water at public schools all across this country might alarm you. We'll be back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news.
Give it to me. Tonight, the high stakes face to face. Plus, the hospitals in the middle of the war zone. Terrorists for sure here. And the potential deal to free hostages in Gaza. More Americans turn to the most watched program on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through? to get to his target. I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small-town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinsami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back, everybody. We want to show you video of President Biden and President Xi walking together just moments ago. This is at the historic high stakes so-called Woodside Summit, if you will. And that's happening just outside of San Francisco there in Woodside, California. And so we're told that what you're watching here is the two presidents taking a walk after they um, after they enjoyed a lunch together, a working lunch that they said. And they again, this meeting was scheduled to be some four hours long. We have reached that mark and we are expecting the president to address the nation at a press conference later today, which, of course, we will bring to you. Uh, we also now want to share with you our network-wide series on education. It's called The American Classroom. And today, we're looking at the danger of lead-contaminated water in many public schools. Our ABC News investigative team looked into dozens of schools across the country. And our 2020 co-anchor, Deborah Roberts, brings us this report. Francis Galicia, a high school junior in Spring Valley, New York, is focused on sports and class activities. School is a happy place, except for when you're thirsty. Why can't you use the water fountain? Uh, because there's lead contamination in our water. And how long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. For seven years now, Francis, along with 10,000 students in the East Ramapo Central School District, have used school-provided water coolers or brought their own bottles because of the dangers of lead in the water equipment. If a child is exposed to lead over a longer period of time, it can cause brain damage. It's unclear how widespread the problem is nationally, with no federal regulation requiring the majority of schools to test lead in their waters, and state requirements varying. Unfortunately, schools regulation is mostly voluntary. Mostly folks don't know what's going on uh, out of any of the taps of their schools. And a note here that the school district says they are working with New York State to fix those water issues. Be sure to catch Deb Roberts' full report, and you can watch that on ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis coming up tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern right here on ABC News Live and, of course, streaming on Hulu. We have a lot more news ahead here on ABC News Live. And today's big story, President Biden and President Xi in their first face-to-face -face sit down in a year. I'll speak with former State Department and National Security Council official about recent tensions over the downing of that Chinese spy balloon, the close calls between fighter jets, Taiwan, and other issues. Also in our spotlight, the focus on chemicals coming out of China fueling America's deadly fentanyl epidemic, which has devastated San Francisco and other cities. Our panel weighs in just ahead. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
for 30 years. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? There's been some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh, my goodness. No one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Extraordinary, fascinating, a compelling insider's view of a presidency like no other. A film as graceful and laser-focused as its subject. That's a large order for a woman. The Lady Bird Diaries, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Well, the leaders of the world's two biggest economies are sitting down face to face for a high stakes summit. I'm Kana Whitworth here in San Francisco, and that is, of course, our big story today. President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping breaking a year long impasse meeting at an estate just outside the city here. I'll be speaking with former State Department and National Security Council official about tensions over China's support for Iran and Russia and the downing of that Chinese spy balloon, close calls between fighter jets and U.S. policy toward Taiwan. Also in our spotlight, China blamed for helping fuel America's deadly fentanyl epidemic, which has devastated San Francisco and other cities. So can Beijing stop the flow of precursor chemicals? Our panel weighs in. We do start, though, with our big story, this historic meeting between President Biden and President Xi, the two leaders making public remarks before kicking off this four-hour meeting, both acknowledging strains in this relationship, but reaffirming the importance of maintaining ties and avoiding conflict. And joining me right now is Jamie Metzl, a former State Department and National Security Council official and senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Jamie, thank you so much for being with us. And we know here there's a lot at stake. This is the first time these two have met in more than a year, nearly a year. Uh, we know the expectations of any actual deliverables coming out of this meeting are minimal. But officials still believe that at least this is an opportunity to reduce friction in what many see as the world's most dangerous rivalry. Do you agree? I do agree. It's perhaps the world's most dangerous uh, rivalry. And it's probably the world's most important relationship. And so we don't have the luxury of just writing off China, whatever they're doing wrong. And certainly China is doing a lot of bad things around the world. We have no choice but to push for the best possible relationship with China. Uh, we need to keep lines of communication open. And we, we need to find whatever opportunities there are for collaboration. So economic ties remain the crux of these U.S.-China relations between Bre um, President Biden says that China has some real economic problems and essentially said, you know, it's up to President Xi to uh, turn things around. Xi mentioned this slow economy, though, in the wake of the pandemic, and he mentioned that in these remarks today before this meeting started, and he added that one country's success is an opportunity for the other. You think that's how the president sees it? There is certainly an opportunity for a mutually beneficial economic relationship uh, between the United States and China. That's why the United States welcomed China into the World Trade Organization more than 20 years ago. It's why the United States has opened our markets to, uh, to China and Chinese imports, and why we've invested so much in, ed in educating an entire generation of, uh, of Chinese economic, scientific, and other leaders. Uh, but there's a growing and widespread bipartisan sense in the United States 
that rather than working toward a collaborative, cooperative relationship, China has been promoting a zero-sum parasitic uh, relationship, uh, seeking to leverage its economic ties um, to steal intellectual property from uh, the United States, yeah. uh, to try to use the benefits of this trade to, to, in many ways, undermine the international trade system the United States and our allies have built since the end of the Second World War. And so the U.S. government is trying to be pretty clear to China there are two paths forward. One is the path of collaboration and integration and supporting a rules-based international order that benefits everyone. And the other is continuing on the path of mercantilism and zero-sum thinking that China is, is on. So this is yet another opportunity to deliver that message. I mean, look, Jamie, clearly this is not a relationship built in trust. Uh, and we see this with these rising war tensions. Uh, China's war aggression is a real concern for the Pentagon, the White House as well. Uh, we saw things escalate. You think of that spy balloon. How can we move forward when both parties here really have their own foreign agendas? Well, the United States guarantees a lot of peace and security around the world, including in the South China Sea, where China is being extremely aggressive, militarily occupying uh, essentially territorial, uh, extended territorial waters of the, uh, of the Philippines. So I know we're all um, people who want peace and love peace, uh, but China is taking advantage of that to try to push its, its interests forward. It's already militarized these islands in the, in the South China Sea. It's declared it's essentially best friends forever uh, with Putin in the just before uh, the invasion of Ukraine. So there are a lot of very big issues, and the United States needs to be tough and firm, but make clear that we don't want conflict. We'd rather have peace. Yeah, walking that fine line. Jamie Metzl, thank you so much for your expertise. I want to now bring our big story to our panel here. So joining us today is our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host, Mike Muse, along with ABC News political contributor and former Democratic senator from North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp, and ABC News political contributor and former Trump administration official, Sarah Isker, and ABC News White House correspondent, Karen Travers, who is also here with me in San Francisco traveling with the president. So thank you all for being with us. And Karen, you just listened to that conversation. Uh, is there anything major that President Biden and Xi Jinping could possibly announce after this meeting today? Kena, the White House was really going to great lengths to try to downplay expectations for any major breakthrough, mm -hmm. saying, you know, this is a conversation that the two leaders are having. You heard the president earlier today saying it was going to be direct, it would be straightforward and frank, but really it was about resetting the relationship and less on coming up with a big list afterwards of all of the things the two mm -hmm. sides agreed to. One big thing, though, that the United States would like to walk away from this meeting having accomplished, a big priority for the president, is restoring Restoring military to military communications, having the ability to pick up the phone and get on directly with Chinese military officials. That's significant, and it's been on pause since August of 2022 because the Chinese put it on pause after then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made her trip to Taiwan. That trip angered China, and they did this in a protest move. So, for the president, he has said this is very important. It's a top priority and something that administration officials believe they can actually accomplish today during these conversations. So that's one thing. But Heidi, you know, President Biden is facing a lot of pressure going into this meeting. So would leaving this meeting without any major breakthrough agreement hurt his image here at home and abroad? Well, I think so. I think that the president has to deliver something. But if you're China right now and you just watch the Republican debates, guess what? There's a big fight now in this country to be see who can be mo most hawkish. You saw that one of the attack lines against Nikki Haley has been her, you know, uh, attitude towards China when she was governor of South Carolina. And so uh, she has a, has a purpose in, in meeting with President Biden and actually maybe bolstering President Biden's political chances given what you're seeing from the Republican Party. And so I think, I think that for most Americans, they look at this and they aren't thinking about the South China Sea. 
they're thinking about fentanyl and they're thinking about drugs coming into the country and they're thinking about how this Chinese relationship affects their life and affects their ability to live a complete life. And with, with drugs coming in, I think there's an opportunity there and I hope the president comes to some kind of terms with uh, Qi on, on fentanyl uh, precursors. And we do keep hearing from some people there may be some kind of announcement, at least on that. But, Sarah, let's take that to you. I mean, what are Republicans saying about this meeting and about U.S.-China relations? This is the problem with China. China's economy, its growth over the last 20 years, has been built off American support, by and large. Now, some of that support hasn't been voluntary. Some of it's been illegal. They've been stealing intellectual property. They've been spying, uh, all in the hopes of building their economy to be a real competitor with the United States. Their economy is nowhere near as large as ours, but they are the second economy in the world. So when you want to talk you know, domestic politics, when it's something like climate change, for instance, that doesn't make any sense unless you bear in mind that China has no interest in being part of that conversation in any real mm -hmm. sense. And so hurting the U.S. economy to slow the effects of climate change does nothing if China then accelerates to build their own economy. All you're doing is creating a rival for the United States uh, when it comes to the military, when it comes to our allies, uh, and even when it comes to our own uh, existential interests long term. So I don't know what can come out of this meeting that will work for the Biden administration, but you certainly, as Heidi said, have the Republicans uh, beating the hawk drum on China. Now that in and of itself, when you get into power is tough because we don't want another Cold War, but China might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting perspective, Sarah. And Mike, to you, you know, we're here in San Francisco right now, and there are residents here that have called out and criticized the increased preparations for this summit. And they're not talking about security, but they're talking about crime and homelessness and what they did to get this city ready for this meeting. Uh, how, what is your take on how San Francisco cleaned up ahead of this summit? And I think, as, what's, your, what's your stance on as to why they did it so quickly? I think it's important because, you know, I've, I've toured, just as you have, a big part of Northern California and the Northwest of America. And a part of the challenge in that era, area of America is uh, the homeless population. And part of that homeless population is uh, overuse of drug and drug addiction. And part of that is the opioid crisis and what is happening with fentanyl and uh, the way that fentanyl has been able to get into the United States from China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Mexico. And so it's important that San Francisco obviously wants to make sure that, you know, is a welcoming site while at the same time using this as an opportunity, which we did see the mayor of San Francisco engaging in conversations about putting pressure on China to make them a partner and really addressing the flow of fentanyl into the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I would really like to see readouts uh, from this summit today really looking at what does that look like, what does that mean, uh, in particular from a supply chain perspective perspective and how is China going to mm -hmm. put checks and balances on the supply chain of fentanyl leaving its distribution centers of China from pharmaceuticals into chemical companies to ensure that we decrease the amount of fentanyl that is coming to the United States and hopefully eliminating the amount of percentage of homelessness uh, that exists in our streets of San Francisco and in Portland and other areas of America. Yeah, and we are not done with this fentanyl conversation. I want to thank you all, Mike, Sarah, Karen, and Heidi. Uh, thank you very much. And we will again talk more about fentanyl coming up here, the fight against it, and how a deal with the Chinese could potentially have a major impact on the opioid crisis and what it would mean for those that are affected by that addiction. We discuss that with our panel after the break. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Give it to me. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know,
know you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. We start kissing each other, and then she tells me no. I get up on the beach and I kick her extremely hard in the face. And then I push her off into the sea. A liar, a murderer, and a psychopath. I was able to turn around now, and I had the power over him. It angers me. It makes me just want to return the favor to him. I would love to return the favor to him. Natalie Holloway, a killer confesses. The stunning new Impact by Nightline, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. It's time for our spotlight. President Biden and President Xi could seal a deal this week. It is possible. This one is focused around getting China's help in fighting this fentanyl crisis here in the United States. We have some numbers for you. In 2021 alone, there were 106,000 drug overdose deaths, with over 70,000 of those deaths due to fentanyl in America. And as this opioid crisis escalates, the U.S. continues to struggle with solutions on how to combat it. So it will definitely be a talking point at today's summit in California, where over 6,000 people died in 2022 due to fentanyl overdose. So I want to bring back my panel here, Mike Muse, Heidi Heitkamp, Sarah Isker, and joining us here is ABC News' Maria Villarreal. Thank you all for being with us. And Sarah, we'll start here with you. What actions could we expect here from China to really clamp down on this fentanyl trade? The Trump Department of Justice that I worked in and now the Biden uh, administration have all been pressuring China to do something about fentanyl, its analogs, its precursors. But what is in China's interest here is totally different. China doesn't have a lot of incentive on their own to stop the flow of fentanyl into the United States. So the question really is what is the United States willing to give China in exchange? And Maria, I mean, you recently wrote about Congress being able to secure at least enough funding to try to secure this flow of fentanyl across the borders and try and reduce it. Do you think that the White House will be able to make some progress in that area? I mean, the short answer to that, Kena, is is no, right? They're asking for $14 billion. The problem that we are seeing is that, you know, the, the stopping the flow of fentanyl, you know, coming across our borders, it's actually lumped in with a big sum of money that is also going to technology, let's just say, for example. It's all border security encompassing. Um, and, and to have both sides of the aisle come together to try and, and have a, a compromise on what border security really means, I mean, you're just not going to have that right now with the way things are going in, in D.C. Um, what's very clear to us after talking with our DHS contacts is that they need this money now, right? They want more technology. They need more technology. Uh, they are uh, cat capturing all these precursors coming in uh, from China, going into super labs into Mexico. And then obviously that is what is pushing the flow of fentanyl into the U.S. Um, they are very concerned that this problem will continue to grow if they don't get the funding they need, not just for manpower, but technology and resources as well. It's hard to imagine that it could get worse. Heidi, the fentanyl is already the leading cause of death for people under 50. So has the Biden administration done enough to fight this crisis? Well, I think there's two things. It's the supply demand. I spent eight years running the Drug Enforcement Agency in the state of North Dakota, and you're never going to supply side your way out of this problem. And so, as a couple people said on the Republican debate, you've got to look at addiction treatment. You've got to look at mental health treatment. Mm -hmm. But at the bottom line, you also have to look at how much these drugs cost on the street. And the more, the tighter you can make that market and drive the price up, the more there is a lower incentive or there's a higher incentive to get treatment. Now, with that said, China, this isn't a major part of China's economy. And so it seems like an yeah. easy way to give the Biden administration a win to basically say, we are going to work with you to stop the precursors and analogs from coming into Mexico where they're then processed into fentanyl. 
Right, it's those separate chemicals being sent from China into Mexico and being put together and then coming into the U.S. And Mike, look, all eyes on California this week. Governor Newsom recently released California's plan to try to tackle the fentanyl crisis, investing a billion dollars to crack down on opioid trafficking and to combat overdoses. But what else needs to be done as far as education? And as Heidi pointed out, with, you know, the mental health awareness. I think it's a two-pronged approach that needs to happen. One from a health crisis approach and then the second from a diplomatic approach and so from the health crisis approach there needs to be part of that money and from the federal government too as well needs to be a PSA and awareness so that we move away from the criminality of opioid and fentanyl and actually looking at a health crisis and prevention and how we can recognize it both in our students um, who are in K-12 public school systems and private school systems and also to individuals who partake in recreational drugs when they're out and about socializing let's say in nightclubs how to use strips to maybe detect uh, issues of fentanyl that are in their drinks or in other recreational drugs that they're choosing. That is a very uncomfortable conversation to have, but that is how we need to switch it in order to be preventative and hopefully look at causes and to help people come off of the addiction to fentanyl. From a diplomatic perspective, what my caution, Kena, has been is watching two disparate conversations. One, uh, with the President Xi and with the President of Mexico having conversation with fentanyl. President Biden and President Xi having conversation about fentanyl. I would like to see diplomatic officials from both Mexico Mexico, China, and the U.S. sit together to figure out how do they address the flow of fentanyl coming from China into Mexico, into the United States, to create more overseas and checks and balances to ensure that there is a decrease of that, particularly look at the drug cartels of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike. All right, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and Maria. thank you so much for being with us. And coming up next here on ABC News Live, it's our last call. Chinese President Xi inviting some old friends to dinner tonight. We'll tell you about his special connection with some very regular folks from Iowa when we come back. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. Reporting from Columbiana, Ohio, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Okay, it's time for our last call. Chinese President Xi is spending the day with President Biden, but this evening he will dine with a group of his old friends from Iowa. 
Yes, you heard that right. President Xi's relationship with Iowa goes back, Iowa goes back nearly 40 years. In fact, in 1985, President Xi was a 31-year-old county-level official, and he visited Iowa as part of a food processing delegation. Xi took part in a pig roast, in farm tours, and a Mississippi River boat ride. And tonight, Xi invited many of those same everyday people to dinner in California. So for more, I want to bring back our panel, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and also joining us is Kevin Baskins, a reporter from the Des Moines Register and responsible for us knowing all this amazing information. So uh, Kevin, tell us about those Xi trips and also why this China relationship with, you know, our Midwest is so important. Well, obviously, um, the United States and China are two of the superpowers, not only in um, armament, but also in agriculture. And there's a great deal of commonality that comes um, with that link. Uh, China has a lot of people to feed, and the United States uh, mm -hmm. is a big supplier of food for them. This somewhat folksy dinner, if you will, with everyday people, it really comes in stark contrast, of course, to the very cold relationship that we are used to seeing between Washington and Beijing. So what's your take? Well, I think these um, relationships were founded a long time ago. Um, one of the things I think that made a big difference is, as you mentioned, um, President Xi came as, you know, kind of a low-level official, but yet he was treated almost like a president when he was here in 1985. Mm -hmm. And I think that was an impression that obviously has stayed with him all these years and through um, many different changes. Yeah, and I'll take that to you, Heidi Heitkamp. You know, you always hear that term, Iowa nice, right? It really showed. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, the answer is soybeans, soybeans, soybeans. We grow a lot of them in the Midwest, <laughs> and uh, China buys a lot of them. And so it doesn't surprise me, but smart politics on Xi's part because, see, I'm not a bad guy. These wonderful, nice people from Iowa want to uh -huh. have dinner with me. So it's a good look for Xi. Yeah, and Sarah, what's your response to that? And what do you think about she's apparent affinity for Iowa? Yeah, this is pure politics. This is the same guy who's keeping 10,000 Uyghur minorities in concentration camps. So don't be fooled by the photo op. Don't be fooled. And Mike, look, this guest list uh, tonight includes also Gary Dvorak and his sister Paula. Their parents, they say, actually let G sleep in Gary's Star Trek themed bedroom in their home back in the 80s. And I mean, really, to Sarah's point, like the optics are everything here. And, and that's a pretty good one for Americans to see. It is. It puts a new twist on guess who's coming to dinner. Uh, but we are, yeah. one of the, agriculture is one of the biggest exports into China. And so I think it's a really cool way to normalize relations with that to keep that going. Yeah, look to our farmers in the Midwest. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for your time. That is our last call. Uh, Mike, Heidi, Sarah, and Kevin, thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Kana Whitworth. Follow ABC News Live on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and more. And coming up here at 7 p.m. Eastern, be sure to catch ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis for the day's biggest stories and the impact they have on you. Now, the news never stops. Neither do we. Keep it right here on ABC News Live. My brother's death was this mystery. Was he pushed? Did he kill himself? Despite some human remains found at the bottom of North Head, and the body was naked. Committing suicide naked is almost unheard of. What's going on here? You had some chilling evidence. Oh my goodness, no one knew it was coming. It's about finding justice for my brother. Sometimes you just have to stir the pot. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
Extraordinary, fascinating, a compelling insider's view of a presidency like no other. A film as graceful and laser focused as its subject. That's a large order for a woman. The Lady Bird Diaries, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Tonight, all the day's major stories here on Prime. Two global superpowers meet with Presidents Biden and Xi coming face to face for the first time in more than a year. Amid tensions, they discuss some of the most pressing issues impacting the two countries. What we're learning about their sit down as Biden addresses the nation. Plus, if your water cooler runs out at school mm -hmm. and you're thirsty, what do you do? You stay thirsty. It's a crisis impacting public schools across the country. In tonight's Prime Focus, ABC's Deborah Roberts investigates the danger lead-contaminated water is posing and what's being done about it. And we take you around the world visiting the rare wonders on land, sea, and air, bringing them to you in ways you've never seen before. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following some developing stories tonight, including a potential breakthrough on Israel's hostage negotiations with Hamas. But we do begin with that high stakes meeting between President Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping in San Francisco's Bay Area. And we are awaiting the president speaking tonight and taking questions. We'll bring you that live when it happens. That sit down, of course, required careful choreography after the frosty relations for some time now. But today, that handshake there and a smile after the two had not spoken in a year. The pair talked for three and a half hours amid the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, as well as Russia's war in Ukraine. They also took a walk together. What was on the table? As we mentioned, we're standing by to hear from the president. But first, ABC's chief White House correspondent, Mary Bruce, is at that meeting site in Woodside, California, about 30 miles south of San Francisco. Today, the car pulling up. Inside, China's leader, President Xi, about to get out and greet President Biden. The two leaders had not spoken in a year. At one point, China not even picking up the phone when the Pentagon called. But today, the handshake seen by the world. President Xi just met with Vladimir Putin and has a relationship with Iran. But today, he was side by side with the U.S. president. Biden escorting Xi inside, and at the top of the stairs, a wave. Inside, President Biden, who's had more than a dozen visits with Xi through the years, said it was good to see you. The two men sitting across the table started by delivering a message to each other. President Biden went first. There's no substitute to face-to-face -face discussions. Biden pointing to years of talks between the two, saying they have always been straightforward and frank. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. President Xi then said there is room for the U.S. and China. For two large countries like China and the United States, turning their back on each other is not an option, he said. Planet Earth is big enough for the two countries to succeed, and one country's success is an opportunity for the other. But there have been growing tensions. The war in Ukraine and China's relationship with Russia. Israel's war with Hamas and China's relationship with Iran. The economic competition, technology, microchips made here and in China, protecting U.S. intellectual property and China's role in deadly fentanyl coming into the U.S. Just this past year, the Chinese spy balloon floating over the U.S. And that call from the Pentagon, China would not answer. But today, President Xi signaled a turn, calling the ties between the two countries the most important bilateral relationship in the world. 
And let's bring in our Selena Wang. Selena, I know you've been shouting questions at the pair all day. Uh, it, it struck me when I saw one, a note from you earlier in the day when you said that you asked uh, Xi Jinping in Mandarin if he trusted President Biden. Uh, tell us about that response there. Yeah, Lindsay, pretty surreal. I've been in China for years, but yet the closest I've ever gotten to the Chinese leader was here in the U.S. at this very important high-stakes summit. And yeah, he clearly heard my question, looked at me, removed his earpiece so he could hear what I was saying in Mandarin, and kind of smiled a bit, but didn't answer the question. There's no surprise there, given that she does not engage with the press, and this is a highly scripted and choreographed event. This summit has wrapped up after four hours of meetings, roughly, and as those leaders were walking out briefly, I asked the president, how did the talk he gave a thumbs up and said, well, and Lindsay, I'm just learning from a senior administration official that one of the key agreements that came out of this meeting is agreements to cooperate on fentanyl. The senior administration official saying that they've been working intensively for numbers of steps for the Chinese to go after specific companies making precursors for fentanyl. In addition to that, one of President Biden's key goals from this summit was to have military and military engagement resumed. Unclear if America got everything that it wanted on this front. However, we are learning that there is going to be more senior level engagement on military to military engagement. Also, these two leaders talked about artificial intelligence, the opportunities, the risks here. We've also learned that President Biden asked Xi Jinping if, you could, if he could use his influence and leverage with Iran to get Iran to not take steps that would be escalatory in terms of the conflict in the Middle East. A huge number of topics covered here, only a few areas of overlap and agreement, Lindsay. And what is China hoping to get out of all of this? Yeah, well, look, the relationship is incredibly tense. China still views America very skeptically. Xi Jinping believes that America is trying to contain China's rise, but they're willing to come to the table for several reasons here. One is that, according to experts, China is hoping to get some reassurances from America when it comes to Taiwan, that America does not support Taiwan's independence. Secondly, China has been suffering from America's export controls on advanced semiconductor chips. That is a roadblock to China's tech ambitions. China would like to see a slow down in those types of tech curves. And thirdly, Xi Jinping wants to show the world that China is open for business. China is dealing with a deep economic downturn right now, serious rising unemployment, especially youth unemployment, as well as a sharp slowdown in foreign investment. So a number of reasons here for Xi to want to come to the table. But look, one meeting alone is not going to resolve the deep ideological differences between these two leaders. Xi Jinping has seriously consolidated power within China, increased the power of the Communist Party and the economy and the society, changes I witnessed when I was based there. This one meeting, not going to resolve those differences. Obviously, and Selena, just before you go, obviously there was a, a relatively low bar that was going to constitute a successful meeting today. Fair to say that that mission was accomplished? Definitely fair to say that, Lindsay. And as you say, an incredibly low bar. Really, the goal of this is just to talk to each other more. The president even said himself before this meeting that he just wants to be able to pick up the phone and talk to this leader more easily so that these two superpowers can avoid this competition, this conflict and confrontation from spilling over into conflict because that would be bad for the U.S., bad for China, and bad for the world. Selena, our thanks to you. Appreciate your reporting. ABC News Live anchor Kena Whitworth is in San Francisco as well tonight. And Kena, this high-stakes summit is dealing with tensions with China overseas, but it's also expected to touch on the fentanyl crisis here in the U.S., as we just heard from yeah. Selena touch on that. Explain China's role there and how that crisis is impacting the city of San Francisco, where you are right now. Well, yes, yeah, Lindsay, so if you look at California statewide here, some 6,000 6, people died in 2022 due to fentanyl overdoses. And the issue is, is that many of these precursors and these chemicals are coming from China and they're going into Mexico and they're going into these super labs in Mexico and then they're brought into the United States by cartels. And the numbers, Lindsay, are utterly staggering. If you look at 2021, 106,000 drug overdose deaths in the United States, 70,000 of them are linked to fentanyl specifically. And so the big question surrounding this meeting and on this issue in particular is what is China's interest in curbing these illicit chemicals that leave their country? And what would the U.S. be willing to give China for that to stop? Well, clearly some kind of agreement was made between these two leaders to work on this. And as you're watching this handshake over and over again, Lindsay, we know that every part of this meeting was 
dictated very specifically, including this, as they turn around there and the two men wave and then they turn right back around and they're ushered into this meeting. So again, fentanyl at this point seems to be uh, part of a success story so far in this meeting. It's the one thing that we know for sure. And as you mentioned there, Lindsay, they were hoping for maybe modest gains here. The bar was set relatively low. So this is at least one thing that President Biden may discuss when he addresses the American people here later today. We'll be expecting to hear about that. And this summit is also coming with some unprecedented security measures there in the Bay Area. Describe the scene, what you're observing on the ground there. Yeah, Lindsay, so actually, if you look right behind me, you can actually see people up there with, like, long guns. They're, they've just gone on top of that building there right behind me. And part of that reason is, Lindsay, uh, the president is getting ready to hold a big event here right on the Embarcadero. And so the security is, like you said, unprecedented. So we have the Secret Service. You can see the Sheriff's Department. It's our understanding that uh, they, the California Highway Patrol bought, brought up an additional 1,000 officers to help out. And and Lindsay, they're doing things like closing lanes on the Bay Bridge, and not only for security, but for fast response if that's needed as well. And then they also have what they called an inner high security zone. And so that is right at the Moscone Center where this Apex Summit is also taking place. And Lindsay, around there in particular, they had some 14 high, uh, the fences there are 14 feet high. They say they are unscalable. So again, the security presence here is is unprecedented, but that has not stopped the protests that we've seen throughout the city. All right, Kena, thank you so much. Of course, we're going to check back in with you after we hear from the president tonight. Jacqueline Lee joins us now from San Francisco. Uh, Jacqueline, there have been protests all day. Uh, what's the latest? That's right, Lindsay. There were protests starting as early as 6.30 in the morning here in San Francisco, and they were out here for hours. The protesters say their ultimate objective was to delay APEC as long as possible. And the way they did that was by physically blocking the entrances to APEC. What they would do is they would gather in front, and if they saw any sort of delegate, anyone wearing a lanyard or wearing a suit, dozens of the protesters would then swarm that delegate, scream in their face, even physically touch them and push them back telling them to walk around, go a different way. They would chant, say no to APEC or chant shame, uh, ultimately preventing them from entering the, the summit through the main entrances, forcing them to be delayed and then go through another route. Lindsay. And Jacqueline, what are the protesters trying to achieve here? So the Say No to APEC coalition is made up of 170 grassroots organizations and unions, and they're trying to raise awareness about different issues like climate change, um, human rights abuses. They were saying that, you know, I mean, today was the, was the CEO summit, so some of the wealthiest corporations in the world, state leaders, uh, world leaders, they're all here. And so by, they say, standing in front and by, you know, chanting what they are. They're trying to bring attention to those issues. They say the agreements brokered at the summit ultimately lead to um, an increase in the wage gap between the wealthy and the poor. They're saying that there's massive human rights abuses in third world countries and they want these leaders to be aware that they are watching and they want these policies to change. Lindsay. All right, Jacqueline Lee Forrest, our thanks to you. A potential breakthrough tonight in negotiations for hostages taken by Hamas. This comes after Israeli forces raided Gaza's massive Al-Shifa hospital. The Israeli army released this video of their operation. They say the raid is aimed at dismantling Hamas infrastructure, claiming they found this display of weapons and ammo inside that hospital. The Gaza Health Ministry says medics rushed to evacuate patients like these premature babies all 36 are still alive. Now, multiple officials tell ABC News that negotiations are progressing for the release of at least 50 hostages. ABC's Matt Gutman explains what Hamas would get in exchange. He reports from Tel Aviv tonight. Tonight, this is the evidence that Israel says it has found at Gaza's largest hospital so far, including these rifles and body armor, claiming Hamas uses Al-Shifa Hospital as a command center, saying Israeli soldiers are still inside. The Gaza Health Ministry, run by Hamas, releasing video from before the raid showing the perilous conditions for patients and doctors, smoke-filled hallways, and damage inside. The raid starting around 2 a.m. local time, the Israeli military describing it as precise and targeted, saying they killed several militants outside the hospital, and that they now control part of the complex of nine buildings conducting interrogations and searches. We're now, as you can see, in an MRI room. 
In this video, an Israeli spokesman showing weaponry and what he calls a go bag that he claims was found behind MRI machines. There is a, an AK-47, there are cartridges, am ammo, uh, there are uh, grenades in here, of course, uniform, and all of that. this was hidden very conveniently, secretly, behind the MRI machine. Hamas calling the allegations a blatant lie. ABC News could not independently verify those claims, but the White House says U.S. intelligence supports Israel's assertions. And tonight, we press the Israeli military. AK-47s are not supposed to be in an MRI room. Them being there is clear evidence that Hamas is using it. But does that justify laying siege to a hospital where there are hundreds of patients who are already in dire circumstances? We're fighting Hamas. We know that this is another stronghold by Hamas, and we're going after them wherever they are. And they have also said there are tunnels underneath the hospital, and we pressed them. Did they find them? Is there any evidence of the tunnels being, or the entrances to the tunnels being inside the hospital? We've found hundreds of tunnel shafts that have already been exposed, uh, booby-trapped, many of them. But I mean at the hospital? Yeah, so I'm saying in the surrounding area, there's hundreds of tunnel shafts that we've already found. Now, this is, it takes time to find them, and that's where we're now looking, and we're continuously looking inside the hospital and also in its vicinity. The Israeli military also releasing these images, saying it shows soldiers delivering much-needed supplies. But tonight, one doctor inside that hospital describing a harrowing scene, saying he can still hear Israeli tanks and bulldozers at the hospital gates. So you're actually yeah, hearing it right now? Yeah, yeah, I can hear it. So the, the tanks are just uh, here. They claim the ICU is out of oxygen and about 40 patients on ventilators have died. So we started six days ago with six to three patients in the ICU. Now we have 20 patients only in the ICU. Mm. But news on those 36 premature babies removed from their incubators due to the lack of electricity. <laughs> All 36 tonight still alive. And tonight, a potential breakthrough involving the hostages. U.S. and Israeli sources saying a deal is progressing to free at least 50 hostages, women and children, in exchange for a temporary ceasefire and the release of some Palestinian women and minors from Israeli jails. Bring them home now. So many eager to hear any news about the hostages. Matt Gutman joins us once again from Israel. Matt, it has now been 40 days since Hamas took 239 people hostage, including Americans. What more are you learning about the potential breakthrough in talks? U.S. and Israeli officials, Lindsay, tell us they are cautiously up optimistic about this hostage deal for at least 50 hostages, probably women and children. And there are still some sticking points, including the number of hostages to be released and the number of Palestinian prisoners, women and minors to be released. And probably the toughest one is that Israel wants as short a ceasefire as possible. Hamas wants it to be seven days long. Lindsay. Um, all right. Matt Gutman, they still seem pretty far apart in that. Matt, runs again, reporting for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much. And there are new tensions in the Middle East tonight, with the Pentagon saying a U.S. warship was forced to shoot down an attack drone from Yemen heading in its direction. ABC's chief global affairs anchor Martha Raddatz joins us now. Martha, this is just the latest in a number of incidents coming from Iranian-backed militias. I explain what's been happening here. Well, Lindsay, the U.S. has tried to deter, they've tried to de-escalate, but it's not working. Tonight, the Pentagon saying the Iranian-backed Houthis in Yemen launched that drone right in the direction of a U.S. destroyer in the Red Sea, prompting the crew to shoot it out of the sky. In late October, the U.S. says Carney, another destroyer, shot down four cruise missiles and 15 drones from Yemen that were headed in the direction of Israel. And just last week, the Houthis brought down a U.S. Reaper drone over international waters waters off the coast of Yemen, but today's drone launch again by an Iranian-backed group raising the tension in the region even higher. Lindsay? Lots of concern there. Martha Raddatz, our thanks to you. A federal jury in San Francisco is deliberating in the attack on Paul Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi's husband. Just 24 hours ago on the stand, suspect David DePap told the court Paul Pelosi was not his target. ABC's Mola Lange has the latest. Tonight, the fate of David DePap, the man who brutally attacked Paul Pelosi with the hammer, is now in the hands of the jury. Drop the hammer. Um, nope. Hey, 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 hey. That chilling assault captured on body camera as police responded. DePap seen on surveillance breaking into the family home. Paul Pelosi came face to face with his attacker in court, telling jurors how he woke up to an intruder with a hammer and zip ties. DePap threatening to kidnap and possibly torture his wife. 
Paul Pelosi calling 911. This gentleman just uh, came into the house uh, and he wants to wait here for my wife to come home. DePat struck Pelosi three times in the head, fracturing his skull. Just 24 hours ago in court, DePat broke down crying on the stand, saying Paul was never my target and I'm sorry that he got hurt. But he acknowledged his plan was to confront then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi about what he believed were lies from government officials, pointing to right-wing conspiracy theories he found online. Prosecutors playing DePap's own words from an interview he gave to police the day after the attack. I was going to basically hold her hostage and I was going to talk to her and basically tell her what I do. And and hold her hostage and do what? And talk to her. And she told the truth, I let her go stop her. Right. If she Mm. Our thanks to Mola Lange for that. The 18-year-old Iowa teen pleading guilty to murdering a Spanish teacher is now sentenced to life in prison with a possibility of parole in 25 years. He gave an emotional apology on the stand. Here's ABC's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, one of the two teenagers convicted of murdering their Spanish teacher over a grade learns his fate. And you could have stopped this from happening, and you know that. Jeremy Goodale sentenced to life in prison. He and his classmate Willard Miller pleading guilty to killing their Fairfield High School teacher, 66-year-old Noema Graber, two years ago. Goodale emotional as he read an apology before the judge spoke. I know that my words will never be enough, but to Miss Graber and all her family, I'm truly sorry. Graber's remains later discovered in a park, hidden under a tarp, wheelbarrow, and railroad ties. Prosecutors saying Goodale talked about the killing in these callous Snapchat posts detailing the attack. Before the sentence was handed down, Graber's oldest son showing compassion to the person who murdered his mother. I really do believe that you, that you feel half of what you did, and, and, and I believe in you, and I do forgive you to Ariel Reshef. The Federal Communications Commission has enacted new rules intended to eliminate discrimination in access to internet services, a move which regulators are calling the first major U.S. digital civil rights policy. The rules package would empower the agency to review and investigate instances of discrimination by broadband providers to different communities based on income, race, ethnicity, and other protected classes. The order also provides a framework for the FCC to crack down a range of digital inequities, including the disparities in the investment of services for different neighborhoods. Harrowing new images show a deadly boating accident in the Bahamas. A ferry carrying about 100 tourists went under while traveling to a popular island. Some jumped into the water to escape. A 74-year-old woman from Colorado was killed. ABC's Victor Akendo has this story. Tonight, the horror aboard this ferry in the Bahamas, leaving one American dead. About 100 tourists enjoying their vacation when the boat taking them to the popular Blue Lagoon Island, suddenly begins taking on water. Everybody's freaking out. Passengers recording the chaotic scene. Literally sinking. Yelling for help. Life preservers thrown to those overboard. The catamaran clearly listing to one side. Nearby boaters responding quickly, plucking people from the water, rescuing passengers and crew members from the sinking vessel, and taking them to the nearest dock. A 74-year-old woman from Colorado found in the water unresponsive. They performed CPR, but she did not survive. Really tragic story there. Thanks to Victor for that. Texas lawmakers have approved a new immigration bill that would allow police to arrest migrants who enter the country illegally and let local judges order them to leave the country. It's a direct challenge to the federal government's authority to police the borders and would become one of the nation's strictest bills if it takes effect. Governor Greg Abbott has said he will sign it, but that the legal challenges are expected. Now to Iceland, where there are urgent warnings tonight that a massive volcanic eruption could happen at any moment. Thousands have already been forced to evacuate with very little warning. And now there's a race to protect a major power station. ABC's James Longman is in Iceland for us. Lindsay, Iceland is preparing for an imminent volcanic eruption. There's been massive seismic activity around the volcano in the southwest of the country. There have been massive earthquakes felt, thousands of them in the last few days, some reaching as far as here in Reykjavik. The focus is on Grindavik, which is a nearby town to the volcano. A nine-mile river of lava passes right underneath it. Huge cracks have opened up in people's homes and in roads. Uh, residents were given five minutes to rush back to their homes to pick up any belongings that they left 
left behind when they were evacuated uh, on Friday. There's also work going on to build a wall around a power station where officials are worried if the lava does spew out, it could hit. It's a really tense wait here in Iceland to see if this volcano erupts. Lindsay? You can imagine. James Longman for us. Thanks so much, James. In a first-of-its-kind lawsuit, New York State is suing Pepsi over its use of plastic packaging. State Attorney General Letitia James is accusing PepsiCo, the largest food and beverage company in North America, of contributing to the pollution in the Buffalo River. She says much of the plastic pulled from the river is from Pepsi products. She's also accusing the company of misleading the public about its recycling program. A PepsiCo spokesperson says the company is, quote, serious about plastic reduction and effective recycling. And we still have much more ahead to get to here on Prime. A judge hands down a sentence for a mother charged after her six-year-old son took her gun and shot his teacher. And she says a police cruiser hit and killed her son, but no one ever told her he died. The mother of Dexter Wade tells us about her fight for answers and accountability. But next, you've seen stories about concerns about water in communities. But what about lead contamination in schools? We go inside the issue at one district in our network-wide series, The American Classroom. Why can't you use the water fountain? Because there's lead contamination in our water. And how long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. Since you were in the fourth grade? Yeah, since I was in the fourth grade. And you're a junior in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. Whenever news breaks, to crush the families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. We certainly heard about the frightening stories about contaminated water in Flint, Michigan, but it turns out there's also reason for concern about lead contaminated drinking water in many of our nation's public schools. So our ABC News investigative team looked into dozens of schools and discovered that in one district just 40 miles outside of New York City, children haven't been able to use their school water fountains for years. ABC's Deborah Roberts has that story for our network-wide series, The American Classroom. I wake up at 6 in the morning, I get ready, my bus comes at 7 o'clock, usually a little bit earlier than that. Having the right to an education is very important to me because I come from a family who didn't have access to education and I try my best to get the education that I need so I can succeed. 16-year-old Francis Galicia, a high school student at the East Ramapo Central School District in New York, is fighting for something many Americans take for granted. We don't have access to running water where you have a water fountain. They don't acknowledge the fact that we're struggling. 
But now I'm here telling you that we are struggling. In this school district just north of New York City, nearly 10,000 students who attend the 13 public schools in the area have limited access to safe running drinking water. Why can't you use the water fountain? Because there's lead contamination in our water. And how long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. Since you were in the fourth grade? Yeah, since I was in the fourth grade. And you're a junior in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. Some drinking fountains in the district were shut off in 2016 after lead was detected in the water, traced back to the school's fixtures. The school district says it's providing bottled water for the students to drink while waiting for a more permanent fix. Are they fixing the problem? No, they're not, because we run out of that water as soon as it gets hot. If your water cooler runs out at school mm -hmm. and you're thirsty, what do you do? You stay thirsty. A state-mandated survey of the public school buildings this year found them to be in failing condition, partly due to the lack of clean running water. There are those who would argue that school systems are scrambling to do more with less. They're tapped out when it comes to money. They're you working know, hard to do a lot with what they have, what little they have. This isn't a new problem in East Ramapo. Every child has the right to go to the public schools in East Ramapo, like every place else. And the government is responsible to make those schools a place where education happens and that is safe. The kids of East Ramapo are not alone. Across the nation, many schools are dealing with issues of lead, which can enter the water through pipes or plumbing fixtures containing lead. Lead is baked into how it is we deliver water through the pipes and in our homes. Even if you go to a hardware store and you find something that's labeled lead-free, they allow 0.25% lead. Medical experts say children are particularly vulnerable to lead's toxic effects. It can cause brain damage. It can cause these irreversible long-term changes that can affect things such as behavior, attention, learning. The list goes on and it's devastating. But no one really knows how widespread the danger is in schools because there's no federal law requiring testing for lead in schools that get water from public water systems, which supply water to about 90% of the U.S. population. And state regulations for schools vary, with the majority not requiring tests. Unfortunately, school regulation is mostly voluntary. Unless the states or local school districts are prioritizing it, mostly folks don't know what's going on. Lead can be odorless. The water can still appear clear. It's not like if your water is tainted with lead, it's going to be brown or it's going to have some symbol where you can say, this is lead. The EPA does require schools and daycares that operate on their own water system, about 10% of all schools, to test and make the results public. An ABC News analysis of this data revealed that of the more than 7,000 school systems required to test by the EPA, 77% of test samples had some level of lead contamination, 16% were in the double digits, and 6% exceeded the EPA's recommended maximum threshold. It's important for people to understand that there is no safe level of lead for consumption. We wanted to know where schools stand now with lead levels in their water. So it's the same water line. So ABC News teamed up with eight ABC TV stations across the nation to gain access and information from schools about lead in their water. Reaching out to more than 130 school districts across 11 states, with so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Buried. Some saying they were part of a voluntary testing program. Others saying they plan to test soon. 15 school districts or companies that tested on their behalf did agree to speak with our team. Like in Indiana. Do you think that people would be surprised to find out that there is lead found in our schools? I think they would be. Atlanta. We gotta protect our students. We gotta protect our employees. And Jersey City, where fixing the problem came at high costs. 
it's about another five million dollars to finish this project. It's very expensive. Some school districts, like in Chicago, describing their results. Roughly 10 percent of the samples exceed the lead standard. So that's concerning. It is, but that's why we continually test flush no uh, to make sure that we're meeting that Illinois Department of Public Health standard. But seven districts declined our request, and the majority of schools we reached out to, 75 districts, ignored our request, not responding at all. In a number of states, they have passed uh, testing and remediation. Unfortunately, those regulations are not health protective and sometimes lead school districts just to decide to turn off all the water, which is not a good solution. He's one of many water safety advocates pushing for a more proactive approach. There's a really good cost-effective and efficient solution that's health protective, and that's called filter first. It's a strategy now followed by schools in Flint, Michigan, a community recently at the center of controversy after dangerous levels of lead were found in its water supply. We turned now to Michigan and to the battle over lead in the water in the city of Flint. Michigan's Governor Gretchen Whitmer signed the Filter First bills in October, which require schools and daycares to install and maintain lead-removing filters at all designated drinking and cooking water outlets. Professors Laura Sullivan and Nancy Love, we're going to take five samples, and we taped it together to make it easy for you, are part of a team that worked with Flint schools, like Accelerated Learning Academy, to get water filters installed on school fountains, equipment paid for by a foundation run by Elon Musk. I've been um, working with students here for a while, just learning about how air and water are filtered. The team regularly tests the water. ABC News was invited to see the process. We are actually getting the water going in and we're getting the water coming out. Our focus is lead, and so we're definitely monitoring for lead. They're joined by two students this day, Maya and Ariel, who are learning how to test the waters themselves. Ew. Ooh, ew. ew. I use that one a lot. That's nasty. And it helps them to see the filters in action. It most definitely encouraged me to make others drink that water. I feel like once you see it yourself, it just make it a little bit better. Flint schools are still waiting for the testing results, but Dr. Love says the discoloration we saw in one sample wasn't caused by lead. That's why we do the analysis. If the water's been sitting for a few days, it might pick up some sediment and pull it through. Kids spend more time in school buildings than any other place second only to their home. So we know that this is an opportunity to provide them with water that is free of lead. Advocates say communities of color often bear the brunt of lead issues in their water. In Flint, some allege the government was slow to act because the community is predominantly black. Government officials there deny that race was a factor. Back in New York, the state's Civil Liberties Union, the NYCLU, has likened the situation in East Ramapo to environmental racism, since the majority of students are of color. The organization is calling for the state to intervene and take over. You sent a letter to Governor Hochul and other regulators comparing East Ramapo to, quote, the environmental racism seen in Flint, Michigan. Is it fair to compare this to Flint, though, when we're talking about a water system in Flint? And here we're talking about equipment. Still not great. But is it fair to compare it to Flint? What went on in Flint was that people were put at risk. What's going on in East Ramapo is that children are being put at risk because they're going to school. And that's comparable. This is 21st century Jim Crow 40 miles from New York City. The East Ramapo School District, School Board, and the State of New York did not respond to our questions about claims of racial injustice. But the State and the School District telling us they're working to replace the fixtures by the start of the new school year. What do you want to see done? I just want to be in an environment where I don't feel like I've lost opportunities, where I'm allowed to the same things that other people are allowed to around the United States. I want the water contamination to go away. I want them to prioritize the need for clean, accessible water. An eye-opening report there. Our thanks to Deborah Roberts for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, terrifying moments on a ferry boat. The rush to get people to safety after it started sinking in the Caribbean. But next, the U.S. House is adjourned until after Thanksgiving after a chaotic few weeks. We take a look at what's next by the numbers.
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. The House of Representatives has canceled votes for the week and will not return until after Thanksgiving. It has been a chaotic fall for the House, and they probably could use the break. Let's take a look by the numbers. The House has been in session for 10 weeks straight as it's navigated a series of crises and leadership shakeups. That includes the removal of one House Speaker with Kevin McCarthy ousted by a small group of hardline conservatives. It was the first time in U.S. history a Speaker had been forced out. That led to nearly four weeks of paralysis on the House floor as no legislation could move forward until House Republicans voted in a new leader. There were three failed Speaker candidates in that stretch with Congressman Steve Scalise, Jim Jordan and Tom Emmer all winning the GOP nomination behind closed doors but then failing to secure enough votes to ultimately win the speaker's gavel. It wasn't until that fourth candidate, little known Congressman Mike Johnson of Louisiana, that Republicans were able to finally agree on a new leader. There have also been three censure votes in the fall session, including against Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib over her comments on the war in Israel. We also saw one failed vote to expel Congressman George Santos, who remains in office while under investigation. And to top it all off Tuesday, one alleged physical altercation between former Speaker McCarthy and Congressman Tim Burchett, who 
accused McCarthy of elbowing him while passing him in the halls of Congress. And there is little sign that dysfunction will calm down once the House returns with some conservatives already pushing back on the new speaker's legislative efforts. And we still have much more ahead here on Prime tonight. See the moments an earthquake rattled Illinois, how powerful it was and how long it lasted. And this flight path may seem a little strange. The unusual incident on a plane that actually forced it to turn around. First to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America this morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war for nonstop live coverage. Stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Eight teens are accused of beating a 17-year-old to death. Terrifying moments when a ferry starts sinking and the unusual reason a plane was forced to turn around. These stories and much more in tonight's Rundown. The mother of a six-year-old accused of shooting his first grade teacher has been sentenced to 21 months in prison. Deja Taylor pleaded guilty to using marijuana while in possession of a firearm back in June. Her son told investigators that he found the gun in his mother's dresser and brought it to school in his backpack. The teacher, 25-year-old Abby Zwerner, was shot while allegedly trying to grab the gun from the child. She's suing the school district for $40 million in damages. 
A Las Vegas high schooler who was beaten to death near his school has died, according to Clark County officials. Police say they've arrested eight teenagers who were allegedly involved in the beating. They're all expected to face murder charges. Law enforcement is still on the lookout for two additional suspects involved in the fight, according to Las Vegas PD. The fight started over stolen headphones and a marijuana vape after school let out for the day. The investigation remains ongoing. Harrowing images show a deadly boating accident in the Bahamas, a ferry going under while carrying tourists to Blue Lagoon Island. Our boat is sinking. About 100 passengers in life jackets clinging to the ferry as it sinks in the Caribbean. Some people jumping into the water, swimming to a nearby boat. A 75-year-old woman from Colorado died. Her cause of death is under investigation. Residents in central Illinois were jolted awake by a 3.6 magnitude earthquake this morning. The U.S. Geological Survey said the earthquake was estimated to be about four kilometers below the surface of the earth. State records show Illinois has about one earthquake per year, and they're usually relatively minor. The largest earthquake ever recorded in Illinois was 5.4 magnitude in 1958. The free application for federal student aid, or FAFSA, hasn't been updated since the Reagan administration, with college students across the country and their parents parsing through more than 100 questions to qualify for financial aid. Coming by December 31st, some long-awaited changes. The form will be streamlined to less than 20 questions, taking less than 10 minutes to fill out. Officials with the Department of Education say the overhaul will make the FAFSA more accessible for low- and middle-income families who've long complained of complicated, burdensome questions on the form. A horse that escaped its cargo crate forced a jet airliner to dump tons of fuel and return to JFK International. The Air Atlanta Icelandic plane was flying that horse to Belgium when 30 minutes into the flight, the pilot radioed JFK air traffic control. We need to re return back to New York. We cannot get the horse back secure. It's unclear how well that horse did on the emergency landing. The family of Dexter Wade is calling for justice after the 37-year-old man was allegedly fatally struck by a Jackson, Mississippi Police Department cruiser back in March and later buried in a potter's field without his family's knowledge. Betterstein Wade Robinson reported her son missing on March 14th, nine days after she had last heard from him. She didn't learn until August 24th, more than five months after his death, that Dexter Wade had been struck and killed as he was walking across a local highway his body remained in a morgue for months before being discharged and buried in a potter's field. And joining us now is Miss Wade Robinson and her attorney, Benjamin Crump. Uh, Miss Robinson, uh, first of all, I thank you so much for joining us. Cannot imagine uh, what you've been dealing with with regard to losing your son and then this alleged cover-up that's happened. Just walk us through what you last spoke to your son um, at some point in March. You file this missing police report in March, and then in August, who reaches out to you and what do they say? Well, when they reached out to me in, in uh, August, they came, they say, uh, we found your son. The detective said, we found your son. So I said, okay. I said, where are you at? Um, what happened to him? She said, well, I sent a uh, detective over there and he'll talk to you and tell you what happened. So I waited till he came, and he said, I'm sorry about your loss or your death. And I said, I threw my head down. Then my mama said, what happened to him? He said, a police cruiser hit him on the highway when he was trying to cross the freeway, you know, when he was trying to cross the freeway. And have you gotten your son's remains back? Uh, what, what Did they apologize? I'm just, I'm kind of perplexed, really, by the story. Okay, well, at first I had to try to find him. So it took me another about another month, month and a half to find him in order to uh, find out where he was located at. So I finally found out where he was located. And I think I went out there around the first of uh, October and he was buried down there at Raymond, behind the Raymond Tension Center in a potty field. Mr. Crump, you cover so many cases of suspected police misconduct and police brutality. Have you ever heard of something like this? 
It is shocking, Lindsay. The fact that they knew who Miss Bettison was. She filed a missing persons report. All they had to do was look at their own accident report. His name was on the accident report, and they knew where he lived at because he had medication in his pocket that had his doctor, and the doctor told them that Ms. Bettison was his next of kin. Miss Wade Robinson, how are you feeling about all this? I I'm curious just what justice would even begin to look like for you. To me right now, um, I'm hoping I can get to some kind of answer to why it happened and what was the reason that it happened. But right now, I'm still not satisfied with all the, everything that happened. To me, it's just steady cover-up. It's just study a cover. Every time you move, it's study a cover up. Nobody never willing to take the responsibility of what happened. It's always it's misinformation or it's a mistake. And how many mis misinformant that you can have or how many mistakes you can have before you take responsibility of what of what happened. You know, you, it's some kind of accountability need to be taken. Lastly, what do you want the world to know about your son? I just want to know he was a loving person and he didn't deserve, he did not deserve this kind of treatment. He was really a kind-hearted person. I mean, he wasn't nobody that really did anything to nobody. I mean, Desta always gave everybody everything he had. I used to fuss at him all the time. You need to keep something for yourself. Uh -huh. But, you know, he just had that, that he helped people. He loved to help people. And he always wanted to do something in life to help. Well, Miss Robinson, we thank you so much for talking with us tonight, as well as Benjamin Crump. Appreciate you both joining us. Thank you, Lindsay. Finally tonight, every year, National Geographic releases its Pictures of the Year issue, which it describes as the wonder of our world in 29 pictures. Photographers chronicling people and animals from around the world in ways you've never seen before. ABC's Ginger Z has the details. From a lion's mane jellyfish in the Arctic Ocean to explorers preparing to dive deep into the dark waters of the Frasassi Caves in Italy and these elephants in India, wandering across a tea estate that was once part of their forest habitat. National Geographic's 2023 Pictures of the Year is a dynamic collection of 29 photos that were selected from more than 2.1 million images created by over 160 photographers working across all seven continents. Those images not only convey information, but also make you feel something um, and really take you somewhere. At first glance, this photo seems to simply show sunlight streaming through trees, but what looks like leaves are actually monarch butterflies at rest just before sunset. They migrate up to 3,000 miles across North America to end up in this spot in Mexico, and I think the picture is just incredibly beautiful. A remote-controlled robot captured this photo of spotted hyenas in Kenya. The retrospective also documenting the human condition, from women dancing in dolphin costumes in the Amazon, to a reverend standing in the snow in Norway, to Finnish and U.S. soldiers training for winter warfare on skis. Frames of life in the year that was. We have the ability to tell these stories that, you know, that you don't see other places um, and that really bring something to life that you otherwise wouldn't be exposed to. Fascinating photos. There are thanks to Ginger Z for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, a potential breakthrough in negotiations for hostages taken by Hamas. How many could soon be released and returned to Israel? 
And more details from the trial of the man charged in attacking the husband of former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. What the suspect told jurors about his original motive. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with that high-stakes meeting between President Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping in San Francisco's Bay Area. And we are waiting right now for President Biden to speak and take questions. We'll bring that to you live as soon as we see him. That sit-down, of course, required some careful choreography after the frosty relations for some time now. But today, you see it right there, that handshake and a smile after the two had not spoken in a year. We have team coverage tonight with our Karen Travers, Jacqueline Lee. But let's begin with ABC senior White House correspondent Selena Wang, who has reported extensively from Beijing. Uh, Selena, you're in the room where this presser is set to happen any moment now. Uh, what can you tell us about the talks today? Right. Any minute we're waiting for President Biden to walk up on this stage. They were in this building in this room for several hours for intensive talks. We've learned from a senior administration official already some of these concrete outcomes. They said that the U.S. and China have agreed to take steps to curb fentanyl production. The senior administration official said that China has agreed to specifically go after companies that are making these precursor chemicals for fentanyl. In addition to that, President Biden's big goal going into this meeting was to restore military to military communication. The U.S. and China have agreed to take steps to restore that critical link with more high-level engagement between senior military leaders. These two leaders also talked about artificial intelligence, technology, how to mitigate the risks. President Biden also, we're told, pressed Xi Jinping about using his influence and leverage with Iran to convince Iran not to take escalatory steps when it comes to the conflict in the Middle East. Now, earlier, right before they started their closed-door meetings, Lindsay, I was actually in this room and I had the opportunity to ask a question to Xi Jinping. I asked him in Mandarin, do you trust President Biden? He took out his earpiece, looked at me, clearly heard the question, smiled a bit and didn't answer. That does just underscore, though, that beneath the positive engagement today is still a very frosty relationship and the overall trajectory of that relationship is not changing. And it sounds like at some point then in that exchange you asked both of them, uh, President Biden and uh, Xi Jinping, if they trust each other. And still no response? No response. No surprise, especially from Xi Jinping, given that he does not engage with the press. But also, overall, this is such a carefully choreographed event. Every single detail meticulously planned. It took months of preparation to get this to come together for the Chinese to agree to meet with President Biden in this sort of format. And it really started all going on the downward spiral in the last several years, but became much worse over the last few months, over the last year, over more high-level U.S. engagement with Taiwan following last summer's Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. That's when China decided to sever the military-to-military -military communications. Then earlier this year, there was a diplomatic spiral and downturn that followed after the Chinese spy balloon that flew over the United States. But really, the disagreements between these two countries, it extends across defense trade, artificial intelligence, technology, export curves on semiconductor chips, human rights, the list goes on and on, the South China Sea. And really, this is just an agreement to have these two leaders talk more. It's not a fundamental change to the direction of this relationship or a resolvement of the fundamental differences. And I am curious, too, why now? Why are the U.S. and China both putting this effort together to, to getting the band back together, to getting this relationship back on track. What's at stake here? 
these are the world's superpowers and they have not really been talking to each other. And that is a huge risk for the world because these countries, neither of them want any possible competition, miscommunication to veer into actual conflict. So there is a recognition that they need some stability here. And President Biden himself said leading into this meeting that I just want to make it easier to be able to pick up the phone and talk to the leader of China so we can avoid any of this kind of conflict that would be bad for global stability. So there is a recognition that they need to put a stop to this low point in the relationship. In addition to that, from the Chinese perspective, they have a number of reasons to come to the table. They would like the U.S. to slow down these export curbs on advanced semiconductor chips. That is an impact on China's tech ambitions. They want some reassurances from the U.S. on Taiwan that the U.S. is not going to change their longstanding policy. And also, of course, Xi Jinping wants to show the world that China is open for business. China's economy has been in a deep economic downturn, rising unemployment, a sharp decline in foreign investment. Xi Jinping obviously wants to turn the economy back around. Selena, it, it sounded like, by all accounts from the White House, like this was a scenario where they wanted to under-promise and, and hopefully over-deliver. As we, you and I discussed earlier, there's really a low bar to what would be described as a successful conversation today. Fair to say that that, that mission was accomplished? fair to say for sure, Lindsay, that they are agreeing to talk more, which was really the bar that was set, the expectations that were set headed into this. And based from what I've learned so far from the senior administration official, looks like they do have some concrete deliverables, whether it is on fentanyl or it's about restoring military to military engagement. But this official did say they have to see how the Chinese follow up on this. They have to follow the progress to see if they stay true to their word. And I'm sure in just a few moments, we will hear the president talk about what he got from these conversations. He said many times in the past that his conversations with Xi Jinping are candid and frank. And another critical point is that as Xi Jinping has really amassed power in China and centralized power around himself, it's become more critical that the highest level engagement happens between Xi Jinping and President Biden to have real progress in the relationship. And, and Selena, give us a sense. We've we've been able to see a very limited video, one of, of Xi Jinping coming out of the car and then greeting that handshake and smile between him and President Biden, uh, then uh, them at a, at a long table, including uh, uh, Antony Blinken there as well, with a number of dignitaries from uh, both the United States as well as China, and then that walk. Uh, give us a sense of the time frame, and, and obviously we know that this was very well choreographed, but what actually, how the dance actually played out today? Well, we know that it was about four hours of meetings. They had short, brief remarks. I was able to be in the room at that time. And then they actually had a working lunch. And after the summit wrapped up, we saw them walk out together. And any moment now, I'm getting some signs that the president uh, may be walking on stage. So I may have to cut my remarks short. But this was a very substantive, a very long meeting, the first face-to-face -face talks between these leaders in a year. So there was a lot of discussion to hash out. And to your point, as you say, so carefully choreographed. The the location of this event was not disclosed. We did not know where we were going when we got on that bus from San Francisco because they wanted to make sure it was a private, secure place. And we happened to be at this historic estate in Woodside, California. In that location, figuring out where to go, that was a lot of planning as well going into this. All right, Selena Wang, we're going to continue to ask you to stand by as we continue to keep an eye on that podium. In the meantime, I want to go over to Jacqueline Lee, who's also there in San Francisco. And Jacqueline, we understand that there have been protests there all day long as well. Tell us the latest on that. That's right, Lindsay. The protest started as early as 6.30 in the morning here in San Francisco. And the number one object objective of those protesters was to delay APEC as long as possible. The way in which they did that was by physically blocking the entrance. The second they saw a delegate arrive and try to get in, what they would do is dozens of protesters would then swarm that individual. They'd be screaming in their face. They would even be physically pushing them, chanting shame, chanting to walk around, turn around, go home, uh, and ultimately uh, push them out. So then the police had to respond. The police would intervene and then give those delegates an alternate route, Lindsay. And Jacqueline, what are the protesters there trying to achieve? So the protesters are there as part of um, 
Say No to APEC Coalition. That's made up of more than 170 organizations um, and uh, members of the union, and they're there to raise awareness about different issues like climate change, uh, human rights violations, and they say that the deals that are brokered at the summit, uh, the deals made by some of the wealthiest corporations in the world, uh, state and world leaders, they say that ultimately leads to inequities all across the world. It, it actually pushes uh, the workers down by creating unsustainable working conditions. Um, they were also trying to raise awareness, trying to say they are demanding a ceasefire between Israel and Palestine. So by being present, they say they are achieving their objective by just raising their profile, Lindsay. All right, Jacqueline Lee, we thank you. I want to send it over to Karen Travers as well. Uh, Karen, uh, want to get a sense for, for what you're watching for as, as this speech begins. Yeah, I mean, the president is going to come out and be the first person to really give that official readout of these many hours of conversations that he and other senior officials had with Chinese President Xi and other senior Chinese officials. We've been asking the White House for how this meeting went, and we did get that briefing from a senior administration official with some of the top lines that Selena Wang went through. But really, they want the president to give the stamp on this and to give, uh, you know, set the tone for how this conversation went. They talked about a lot of big issues. We knew going into this that this was a very robust agenda from the war in Ukraine to the war in the Middle East to economic competition between the two countries. Of course, China's influence over Iran, which the president was going to try to push President Xi on. We also know that they talked about fentanyl, and a senior official said that there was an agreement reached between the two countries to try to curb those Chinese companies that are making the chemicals that go then into fentanyl. The president, according to this official, Lindsay, said that... Uh, the, the, this is one of the worst drug problems the United States has ever faced, really underlining how significant this is to his administration, but also to the people here in America. So that's something that I think that he's really going to tout because he knows how much this means to so many people across this country. And, and we know also from that senior administration official uh, that the president was very direct with President Xi on a number of things. What more is the White House saying as far as whether they felt that, that they really accomplished what they set out to today? One of the big priorities for the president going into today's meetings were trying to restore, reestablish those military to military communications. This is something that he said he wanted to do because they understand how critical that is when you have a relationship like this with China that is complicated, that is complex. They don't want it to tip into conflict. They don't want it to escalate to that point. This was paused back in August of 2022 by China because they were upset when then House Speaker Nancy Pelosi made a visit to Taiwan. So in sort of a protest move, they suspended those military to military conversations. The president had said this was a priority for him. He wanted to be able to just pick up the phone and have U.S. officials be able to have conversations with their Chinese counterparts. The senior administration official says that there were deep conversations about restoring that and what that would look like between the defense secretary and other senior military leaders having those ties now to Chinese officials. That's something very significant for the president. And we understand those senior administration officials don't want to get kind of ahead of their skis and uh, and say anything that that might preempt uh, what the president is about to to come out to say as we await his uh, address just any moment now. In the meantime, and Karen, thank you very much. I want to go over to ABC News Live anchor Kena Whitworth, who's also in San Francisco tonight. Uh, Kena, let's talk a bit more about this fentanyl issue that Karen just mentioned. Explain China's role there and how that crisis is Im impacting the city of San Francisco, where you are right now. Yeah, Lindsay, it may come as a surprise to some people that fentanyl is such a headline in this meeting, but really it was a highly anticipated headline because the president really thought that this was one of the most important and central things that he could do in terms of U.S.-China relations that would really benefit the American people. And I'm standing here in San Francisco right now. When you look at California as a whole statewide, there were some 6,000 people who died in 2022 alone, and that was all due to fentanyl overdose fentanyl poisoning. And when you really look nationwide and you go back to 2021, the numbers there are staggering, Lindsay. We're talking about 106,000 drug overdose deaths and 70,000 of them were all linked to fentanyl. And this is because these precursor chemicals are coming from China and they're going to Mexico and they're going to these super labs and then they're brought here to the United States and the effects have been devastating. And so when the president addresses the American people tonight, certainly he will highlight this agreement where they're 
they're saying right now, they have asked China to uh, go directly after these companies that are making these precursors of precursors of fentanyl. And they say, in fact, that the Chinese people have already acted uh, against several of the companies. In fact, they pointed out almost two dozen of them. And they say that, you know, the U.S. has provided information on these companies uh, to China and that they're already acting. But they also say it's something that we'll have to keep tabs on and continue to watch and make sure that they keep up with that. And, and another thing, Lindsay, that I think is interesting that came out of this meeting is that there's at least, it's delicate, but there's at least conversations and agreements happening around artificial intelligence. And this is artificial intelligence that is used militarily. And it's very, very important because at this point, uh, they're having to take the necessary steps to make sure that it doesn't uh, get out of hand when they're using AI. But they know it's a technology that will advance the U.S. militarily. And at this point, they're saying that the United States is substantially ahead of China with respect to certain capabilities in AI. And Lindsay, right now, the, you know, the administration really feels like it's very important to maintain that advantage. And what I thought was also fascinating, one of the, the, the senior administration official who did come out and speak in advance of, of the president's remarks tonight, he said that he thought that fentanyl, that according to the president, it's the single most important issue that we could do in U.S.-China relations for uh, the American people. So really just talks about how wide-reaching, how problematic uh, fentanyl is in this country that, that we often are, are find ourselves reporting on, Kena. Also, the summit is coming with some unprecedented security measures in the Bay Area as well. Just describe the scene, what you're seeing on the ground there. Yeah, it's really fascinating, and the unprecedented is the right word there, Lindsay. Um, so what you're seeing here is behind me, actually, it's dark now, but there are people with long guns up on the top of that building here, and there's fences all around the Embarcadero. And actually, Lindsay, as I'm talking, I'm seeing some kind of motorcade uh, that's coming down the Embarcadero here. So this would be the second one that I've seen. And all of this is happening right around a building where President Biden is set to ho host a major event tonight. Uh, Gwen Stefani is set to perform. Now, the State Department didn't want too many details uh, to be released. They're keeping it quite secret. Uh, but you have to imagine that this is the kind of security that is happening not just here but also at the Moscone Center which is the center of APEC and they put these huge 14 foot fences around that center as well they say they cannot be scaled and they're doing that to make sure that everyone is safe and you're really seeing these fences lining San Francisco streets all over the place they've also taken some steps like closing lanes on the Bay Bridge and they had to do that Lindsay it was really twofold for security reasons but they also also had to do that to help access as well and the California Highway Patrol is really in charge of the perimeter and they brought up some 1,000 officers to help with this so uh, you're seeing of course uh, Secret Service as well and even Lindsay you know we landed in San Francisco and we were trying to make our way to our hotel last night and as we're going through downtown San Francisco we had to get out of the car and start walking to our hotel because the streets were blocked with protesters and we've seen many different protests in this city throughout the week and this one that we saw in particular last night was people that were calling for a ceasefire and they were marching to the Israeli consulate and they were doing that right through downtown San Francisco and then that essentially collided with street closures because of the presidential motorcade that was going through the city as well. And we've seen a very dramatic cleanup of this city and we saw it firsthand last night, Lindsay, because we saw someone spray paint ceasefire now on the side of a building right in downtown San Francisco and within minutes someone was there trying to clean it up. They really want to put on a full-scale show here for the delegates that are arriving. And you have to keep in mind there's you know 12 uh, country leaders that are here right now and they all need that kind of security and actually look I'm seeing another motorcade showing up at this event that Biden set to hold so that Lindsay uh, is our third motorcade and uh, again we're waiting for President Biden to hold this event. We're also waiting and watching that podium for him to speak here. Things seem to be slightly delayed, but maybe that happens when you have a, a long four-hour meeting that the world is is watching. So it's certainly, um, it's upticking here, Lindsay, and it's almost, I feel like I'm seeing more activity uh, as the sun goes down out here. It, it sounds like it's really the perfect storm of all the peas. you got these presidents, you have the sure. protesters, you have the police. 
uh, uh, quite a presence yeah. uh, inside and, and outside as we're continuing to watch yeah. uh, more activity inside of the room there. Kana, if you'll stand by for us, we'll certainly be coming back to you. In the meantime, I want to go back to Jacqueline Lee, who is also once again in, in San Francisco. And, and Jacqueline, uh, we, we heard uh, from Kana talking about uh, the protesters. We know that there was a large police presence. Uh, can you talk more about their interactions with protesters? That's right, Lindsay. What was interesting was how it progressed throughout the morning. So when we got out there to the scene at about 6.30 in the morning, we saw dozens of police officers that were standing in formation, but they weren't wearing any riot gear. We saw that they had it, but they were just standing there observing. But as it started to unfold over the next several hours, we saw them very quickly uh, put on their masks, put on their helmets, um, and, and they were racking. We could hear the racking of their what they called less than lethal shotguns. Uh, as the protesters got more animated and more passionate, uh, which is what happened when they started seeing delegates start to arrive to APEC. As I'd mentioned earlier, they created human chains. They physically blocked the delegates from entering, getting in their faces, chanting, shame, turn around, uh, shut down APEC. Then you saw the police officers start to spring into action. They were physically separating the protesters and the delegates, they were pushing them back. And then, of course, the protesters started um, getting very aggressive with police officers. We quickly saw those police officers then form their own human chain with their riot gear, uh, just trying to keep the situation more peaceful. Um, but as, as we saw earlier, is the protesters were very dedicated to making uh, APEC as disrupted as humanly possible. Wednesday. And Chinese nationals showed up at the airport yesterday to welcome China's leader and some protesters as well. Uh, you were there. Describe the scene and the sentiment there. Yeah, so what was the most interesting about that is so they gathered at San Francisco International Airport. When we first got there, we saw uh, a handful of people from Hong Kong, Tibet, Uyghurs, uh, Taiwan, the people that were protesting Xi Jinping's arrival. And what they said to us was they wanted him to know here on the U.S. that they were against his policies and what they called to be very oppressive. Um, some people that we spoke with, one woman said that she was imprisoned in a, in, a, in a concentration camp and she was giving us some harrowing details in regards to that. Uh, we spoke with someone who was part of the um, Students for a Free Taiwan Coalition and he explained that if they were back on the mainland, they would not be able to dissent whatsoever. And they said that is why they loved being here in the U.S. And so they said their goal was the second that Xi Jinping touched down. They wanted him to see them and to see their presence. On the opposite side of that, we then saw hundreds of Chinese nationals come out to support their leader. Uh, we saw them holding both U.S. and Chinese flags. And one student that we spoke with, who was a student at UC Berkeley, he says Xi Jinping was his idol. He just wanted his leader to know how much he loved and adored him, Lindsay. All right, Jack Lindley, well, we're going to see uh, his idol and I'm sure many others in, in just a little bit, uh, or we've been seeing him today, and then we're going to hear uh, from President Biden any moment now. Do you want to bring Karen Travers back in for a moment? Because, Karen, uh, we, we heard Selena talk about how, even though she did ask a question of Xi Jinping, that she knew he wouldn't answer because he doesn't take questions from the press. And so I'm curious, obviously you have a, a a large number of uh, American uh, members of the American press there. Um, what about China? Is there is there a large presence uh, from the, the press there from China? Yeah, I think this is mostly White House reporters that are in there for the press conference with President Biden. But I, there are also maybe other reporters from other countries who were able to get in there, the White House letting other people in. The president's expected to take only a handful of questions. He doesn't usually go for very long, maybe five to seven questions after this. He's going to give remarks to start and lay out what happened in the meeting. Uh, you know, but Lindsay, one thing that was interesting in that readout from the senior administration official was how personal Just for a moment, Karen, was. there, because uh, we, we do see President Biden there at the podium. We're going to listen to the president. And I believe there are some of the most constructive and productive discussions we've had. I've been meeting with President Xi since both of us were vice president over 10 years ago. Our meetings have always been candid and straightforward. We haven't always agreed, but they've been straightforward. And today, build on the groundwork related over the past several months of high-level diplomacy between our teams, we've made some important progress, I believe. First, I'm pleased to announce that after many years of being on hold, we are restarting cooperation between 
the United States and PRC on counter-narcotics. In 2019, you may remember, China took action to greatly reduce the amount of fentanyl shipped directly from China to the United States. But in the years since that time, the challenge has evolved from finished fentanyl to fentanyl chemical ingredients and, and pill presses, which are being shipped without control. And by the way, some of these pills are being inserted in other drugs, like cocaine. A lot of people are dying. More people in the United States between the ages of 18 and 49 die from fentanyl than from guns, car accidents, or any other cause, period. So today, with this new understanding, we're taking action to significantly reduce the flow of precursor chemicals and pill presses from China to the Western Hemisphere. It's going to save lives, and I appreciate President Xi's commitment on this issue. President Xi and I tasked our teams to maintain a policy and law enforcement coordination going forward to make sure it works. I also want to thank the bipartisan congressional delegation to China, led by Leader Schumer, in October for supporting efforts uh, this effort so strongly. Secondly, and this is critically important, we're reassuming military to military contacts, direct contacts. As a lot of you press know, follow this, that's been cut off and it's been very worrisome. That's how accidents happen, misunderstandings. So we're back to direct, open, clear, direct communications on a, on a, on a direct basis. Vital miscalculations on either side can, uh, can cause real, real trouble with, a, with a, a, a country like China or any other major country. And so I think we've made real, real progress there as well. And thirdly, we're going to get our experts together to discuss risk and safety issues associated with artificial intelligence. As many of you who travel with me around the world, almost everywhere I go, every major leader wants to talk about the impact of artificial intelligence. These are tangible steps in the right direction to determine what's useful and what's not useful, what's dangerous and what's acceptable. Moreover, there are evidence of cases that, uh, that I've made all along. The United States will continue to compete vigorously with the PRC, but will manage that competition responsibly so it doesn't veer into conflict or accidental conflict. And where it's possible, where our interests are coincide, we're going to work together like we did on fentanyl. That's what the world expects of us. The rest of the world expects, not just in people in China and the United States, but the rest of the world expects that of us. And that's what the United States is going to be doing. <laughs> Today, President Xi and I also exchanged views on a range of regional and global issues, including Russia's refusal and brutal war to stop the war and brutal war of aggression against Ukraine and, and conflict in Gaza. And as I always do, I raised areas where the United States has concerns about the PRC's actions, including detained and, ex and, uh, and, and exit banned U.S. citizens, human rights, and corrective uh, co coercive activities in the South China Sea. We discussed all three of those things. I gave them names of individuals that we think are being held, and hopefully we can get them released as well. No agreement on that. No agreement on that. I also stressed the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits. It's clear that we object to, be to Beijing's non-market economic practices and disadvantage that, that disadvantage American businesses and workers, and that we'll continue to address them. And I named what I thought a number of those were. I welcome the positive steps we've taken today. And it's important for the world to see that we're implementing the approach in the best traditions of American diplomacy. We're talking to our competitors. And the key, uh, and, and just just talking, just made blunt with one another, so there's no misunderstanding, as a key element to maintaining global stability and delivering for the American people. And in the months ahead, we're going to continue to preserve and pursue high-level diplomacy at the PRC in both directions to keep the lines of communication open, including between President Xi and me. He and I agreed that each one of us could pick up the phone, call directly, and would be heard immediately. And that's uh, now I'd like to be able to take some questions, if I may. And I'm told that Dimitri of the Financial Times has the first question. Uh, thank you. And as an Irishman, I apologize for bringing the rain. Well, holy God, I wouldn't have called on you if I'd known that. No, I'm teasing. Go ahead. Fire away, Dimitri. President Biden, given that America is playing a key role in two major global crises in Ukraine and in Gaza, 
Does that alter your previous commitment to defend Taiwan from any Chinese military action? And did Xi Jinping outline the conditions under which China would attack Taiwan? Look, I reiterate what I've said since I've become president, what every previous president of late has said, that uh, we, uh, we maintain the agreement that there is a one-China policy, and that uh, and I'm not going to uh, change that. That's not going to change. And so uh, that's about the extent to which we discussed it. Uh, next question, sorry, was Bloomberg. It appears, among other issues, that your agreement with uh, President Xi over fentanyl will require, will require a lot of trust and verification to ensure success curbing those drug flows. I'm wondering, after today, and considering all that you've been through in the past year, would you say, Mr. President, that you trust President Xi? And secondly, if I could, on Taiwan, uh, you've, you and your administration officials have warned President Xi in China about interference in the upcoming elections. I'm wondering what would the consequences be if they do, in fact, interfere in the election? Well, I, may, I had that discussion with them, too, made it clear I didn't expect any interference, any at all. And we had that discussion as, as he was leaving. Look, do I trust you? I trust but verify, as that old saying goes. That's where I am. And, uh, you know, uh, we're in a competitive relationship, China and the United States. But uh, my responsibility is to, uh, to make, it, uh, make this rational and manageable so it, uh, so it doesn't result in conflict. That's what I'm all about. That's what this is about. To find a place where we uh, can come together and uh, where we find mutual interests that, uh, but most importantly, from my perspective, that are interested in the American people. That's what this is about. And that's exactly what we'll do. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we're in a situation where we agreed that uh, fentanyl and its, pre its precursors will be curbed substantially, and the pill presses. That's a big, that's a big movement. They're doing that. Uh, and by the way, uh, you know, I, I won't, I guess I shouldn't identify where it occurred, but John, I know uh, two people near where I live. Their kids literally, as that's a strange experience, they woke up dead. Someone had inserted in, whether he, the young man did or not, inserted in a, a, a drug he was taking, fentanyl. Again, I, I don't, I hope you don't have any experience with knowing anyone, but this is the largest killer, people in that age category. And, uh, you know, uh, I guess the other thing I think is most important is that uh, since I've, I spent more time with President Xi than any world leader has, just because we were vice presidents, uh, his president uh, was President Hu, I'm not making a joke, President Hu and, uh, and President Obama thought we should get to know one another. Wasn't appropriate for the president of the United States to be walking, dealing with the vice president. So we met. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was 68 hours of just face to face, just us and a simultaneous interpreter. So I, I think I, I know the man. I know his modus operandi. He's been. Uh, we have disagreements. He has a different view than I have on a lot of things, but he's been straight. I don't mean that it's good, bad, or indifferent. He's just been straight. And uh, so uh, you know, uh, we, as I said. The thing that I, I find most assuring is he raised, and I fully agree, that either one of us have any concern, Mr. Ambassador, any concern about anything between our nations or happening in our region, we should pick up the phone and call one another, and we'll take the call. That's an important progress. Uh, I am embarrassed. I think it's CBS, but I can't remember who is CBS. I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you, Mr. President. Oh. Dead <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. Uh, you continue to stress the need to ensure competition with China does not veer into conflict or competition. In the past two years, there have been 180 incidents of Chinese aggression against U.S. aircraft in the Pacific, and of course, ramped up military activity in the South China. If that does not count, veering 
than what does, and you issue warnings against that. Well, first of all, none of it did end up in a con conflict, number one. Number two, uh, you may recall I did a few little things like get the quad together, allow Australia to have access to new submarines, moving in the direction of work with the Philippines. So uh, our actions speak louder than our words. He fully understands. And because of the question about the idea of trade on the Oshima hospital, um, as it contain and out must that is there. This week you also said that we must protect hospitals. So when you weigh the target against the number of civilians by the hospital, is the operation way just well look, we did discuss uh, this by the way. Um, but we can't let that get out of control. Here's the situation. You have a circumstance where the first war crime is being committed by Hamas by having their headquarters, their military, hidden under a hospital. And that's a fact. That's what's happened. Israel did not go in with a large number of troops, did not raid, did not rush everything down. They've gone in, and they've gone in with their soldiers carrying weapons or guns. They were uh, told, uh, told, let me be precise. We've discussed the need for them to be incredibly careful. You have a circumstance where you know there is a fair number of Hamas terrorists. Hamas has already said publicly that they plan on attacking Israel again, like they did before. To everything, cutting babies' heads off to burning, burning women and children alive. And so the idea that they're going to just stop and not do anything is not realistic. This is not the carpet bombing. This is a different thing. They're going through these tunnels. They're going in the hospital. And if you notice, I, I was mildly preoccupied today. I apologize. I didn't see everything. But what I did see, whether I, I haven't had it confirmed yet, I am asked my team to answer the question, but what happened is they're also bringing in incubators. They're bringing in other other means to help the people in the hospital, and they've given the doctors and I'm told the doctors and nurses and personnel an opportunity to get out of harm's way. So this is a different story than I believe what was occurring before with indiscriminate bombing. Uh, well, what do you got? Washington Post. I think that's right. Thank you. Mr. President. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I couldn't see in the light. Uh, Mr. President, Israel's war in Gaza more than 11,000 Palestinians just for a month. And I'm created... sorry, you're breaking up. I didn't. We did. We did. Israel's war in Gaza has killed more than 11,000 Palestinians just over a month and created a humanitarian disaster. Israeli officials have said this war could take months or even years. Have you communicated to Prime Minister Netanyahu any sort of deadline or time frame for how long you are willing to support Israel in this operation? Are you comfortable with the operation going on indefinitely? And is there any deal underway to free hostages? Thank you. Yes, no working backwards forward. Look, I have uh, been deeply involved in moving on the uh, hostage negotiation. Um, and uh, I don't want to get ahead of myself here because I don't know what's happened in the last four hours. But uh, I have uh, we've gotten great uh, cooperation from the Qataris. Uh, I've spoken with them as well a number of times. I think the pause and that is really that the Israelis have agreed to is down to well, I'm getting too much detail. I, I know, Mr. Secretary, I'm going to stop. The, uh, but I am I am mildly hopeful. I'm mildly hopeful. Um, with regard to uh, when is this going to stop? I think it's going to stop when the. Uh, when Hamas no longer maintains the capacity to murder and abuse and, and uh, 
and just do horrific things to uh, the Israelis. And they're in, and they still think that, at least as of this morning, they still thought they could. I, uh, I, I guess the best way for me to say it is that uh, I take a look. Uh, the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, acknowledges they have an obligation to use uh, as much caution as they can in going after their targets. It's not like they're rushing in the hospital, knocking down doors and, you know, pulling people aside and shooting people indiscriminately. Um, but uh, Hamas, as I said, said they plan on attacking Israelis again. And uh, this is a, a terrible dilemma. Uh, so what do you do? I think that uh, Israel is also taking risks themselves about their folks being killed and one-to-one -one going through these hospital rooms, hospital halls. But one thing has been established is that Hamas does have headquarters, weapons, materiel below this hospital, and I suspect others. But how long it's going to last, I don't know. Look, I made it clear to the Israelis that um, to Bibi and to his war cabinet, that I think the only ultimate answer here is a two-state solution that's real. We've got to get to the point where there is an ability to be able to even talk without worrying about whether or not we're just dealing with uh, — they're dealing with Hamas that's going to engage in the same activities they did over the past uh, — on, on the 7th. So it, it's uh, — but I can't tell — I'm not a fortune teller. I can't tell you how long it's going to last. But I can tell you, I don't think it ultimately ends until there's a two-state solution. I made it clear to the Israelis, I think it's a big mistake to, for them to think they're going to occupy Gaza and maintain Gaza. I don't think that works. And so we're going to — I think you're going to see efforts to uh, bring along — well, I shouldn't go in anymore because that's been things I've been negotiating with Arab countries and others about what the next steps are. But uh, anyway. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. This ends the press conference. When Hamas, well, Hamas said they plan on doing the same thing again, what, what they did, what they did on the 7th. They're going to go in. They want to slaughter Israelis. They want to do it again. And they've said it out loud. They're not kidding about it. They're not backing off. And so I just uh, asked a rhetorical question. I wonder what we would do if that were the case. On the hostages, though, you said we're coming for you. What do you mean to the American hostages when you said, hey, oh. we're coming for you? What I meant was I'm doing everything in my power to get you out, coming to help you, to get you out. I don't mean sending military in to get them. Is, is, is that what you thought I might mean? Uh, I no, no, no. It's, it, it, I was not talking about a military. I was talking about we, you're on our mind every single day, five, six times a day. I'm working on how I can be helpful in getting the hostages released and have a period of time where there's a pause long enough to let that happen. And there are somewhere between 50 and 100 hostages there, uh, we think. And so was a three-year-old American child? You're darn right it is. That's why I'm not going to stop till we get her. No, I can't tell you. I won't tell you. Do you feel absolutely confident based on what you know that yes. that is the truth? Yes. And, Mr. President, after today, would you still refer to President Xi as a dictator? This is a term uh, that we used earlier this year. Well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he, he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that is based on a form of government totally different than ours. Anyway, we may talk Anyway, we made progress. That was, those are the final words as President Biden is exiting the room, taking questions for 
um, about 15 minutes or so from uh, the press there, hearing from him after that high-stakes summit uh, with China's leader uh, Xin, uh, Xi Jinping uh, there in San Francisco. He did take multiple questions on uh, Israel and Hamas, saying that he doesn't think that there will be an end to this until there is a two-state solution, but otherwise saying that he does uh, stand by Israel. Uh, and, and then talking about China, uh, saying that they had some of the most constructive and productive conversations that they've had uh, in a while. He said that their conversations are always straightforward, and today was no different. He really emphasized uh, diplomacy, uh, saying that it's important to talk to our competitors to maintain global stability and make sure there are no misunderstandings. And he really did highlight uh, the idea of uh, two main issues that uh, uh, he was able to accomplish, he felt, um, re resuming military to military direct contact, uh, as well as, he said, taking action to significantly reduce the flow of fentanyl from China to the Western Hemisphere. I want to take that idea uh, to Kena Whitworth, who's standing by there uh, in San Francisco for us. Uh, Kena, a lot of talk there about uh, fent fentanyl uh, from the president, uh, certainly a big issue here in the United States. Yeah, and Lindsay, he talked about how the issue affected him personally. I mean, he knows people who have lost loved ones because of fentanyl, and he certainly touted uh, this agreement with China to at least stop these precursors from going into Mexico, being turned into fentanyl, and then, you know, coming into the United States and being so deadly. In fact, he talked about how China took action back in 2019 uh, to stop the finished product of fentanyl from leaving the country. But then what has happened since then is that just these precursors and the ingredients to make it have been leaving the country instead. And so that is certainly something that they need to address. And he, he touted that as a success uh, in this meeting, uh, among some other things, Lindsay. I mean, he talked about these the critically important military to military contact, and he talked about uh, artificial intelligence as well. And he talked about the conflict, as he said, it, the conflict in Gaza and, and Russia's uh, going to war with Ukraine as well. But, you know, Lindsay, in terms of this military to military contact. You know, senior administration officials are saying essentially it's threefold, right? So they're going to establish uh, policy level discussions, but then they also want to make sure that there's operational engagements both at senior uh, levels, that they can have discussions at those senior levels, but also uh, these operational engagements between what they say is ship drivers and others at a much lower level. So really, I think they're trying to highlight how open those lines of communication are. But Lindsay, one thing that I find a little bit concerning, I think, is that, you know, we hear from these senior administration officials that there were discussions had about how China needs to be more transparent in terms of their nuclear technology. And Lindsay, earlier today when I spoke with our senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez, he said that is really, really important right now because China continues to build, build up their nuclear ICBM fleet. And so, Lindsay, we're talking about intercontinental ballistic missiles. And so that's something that the United States is watching very closely and very carefully. And so while the president can certainly tout some of these things as a win because they went into this with, as you mentioned, a very low bar, I think a lot of people around this nation and around the world were watching this very closely because, as, as a U.S. official put it, you know, this meeting ultimately is the opportunity to reduce the friction in what many see as the world's most dangerous rivalry. Lindsay. Uh, yeah, you have these two uh, world superpowers at odds. Uh, to your point, it, it, there was a low bar going in because they weren't even speaking until now, you know, for the for the last year. The yeah. two militaries weren't even speaking, at least. Now they're at the table and saying, you know, I'll answer your phone calls going forward. But, Kate and Whitworth, our, our thanks to you. Want to bring that point into Selena Wang. Selena, you were in that room. Uh, what did you make of the short speech by President Biden? Well, look, President Biden reaffirmed that there are tangible outcomes that came out of this meeting. We've been talking for the last several hours about how the bar going into this was very low, but it sounds like the president got what he wanted out of this meeting. One, he said they've agreed to curb that fentanyl production, those precursor chemicals that are made in China. He said there is some real commitment from China on that, but we heard earlier from a senior administration official who said they need to check and see if China follows up on that. Secondly, the big priority of the president was to restore that military-to-military community. -military 
communication. He says that link is being restored, that he feels confident now that he can pick up the phone and talk to Chinese leader Xi Jinping. In addition to that, he said experts from the U.S. and China, they will be talking together about how to mitigate the dangers of artificial intelligence. But he recognizes that this is a very competitive relationship, and the goal here is to prevent that competition from veering into conflict. And I do want to bring a question that I had asked uh, uh, Karen Travers about. I want to bring it back to you, Selena, because you were saying how you weren't surprised, even though you asked the question in Mandarin uh, to uh, Xi Jinping, that he, he didn't respond because he doesn't take questions from the press. I I'm curious if there is a large presence uh, from the press uh, there in China um, and, and how they do go about um, basically documenting his, his presidency since he doesn't take questions. Well, look, there is Chinese press here. I did not hear them ask any questions. If they were to ask any questions, I'm sure it would have been pre-choreographed. The concept of press is very different in China. There is not freedom of the press. It is an authoritarian system. They've been cracking down on independent journalists. I experienced that when I was a journalist based there. They've made it harder for foreign journalists to operate in the country. It is not the same way that we operate here when you are in China. When I was based in China, I never have had an opportunity to get that close to the leader of China. Ironic that the closest I ever got to him was here in the United States, here in Woodside, California. That kind of opportunity doesn't exist. The opportunities I have on a day-to-day -day basis to shout questions at the president or to ask questions to other officials, that does not exist in China. Any other deliverables today with regard to beyond fentanyl and the military's resuming conversations? The critical parts are those three topics I mentioned, and the president really emphasizing that this is about these two countries agreeing to talk more. The president afterwards, he also took some questions on other topics related to Israel, his views on whether or not Israel is doing what he believes is following the laws of war, that that explicit question wasn't asked. And he, he said on the topic here that he said, quote, um, I think the pause that Israelis have agreed to, he said he's mildly hopeful about hostage negotiations. He was also saying, when will this stop? He was asked, when will this conflict stop? He said, it will stop when Hamas no longer maintains the capacity to murder, to do horrific things to the Israelis. The president, of course, has been a lot of pressure to do more to rein Israel in. And he says the IDF acknowledges that they have an obligation to use caution, but they are facing this terrible dilemma. So the president trying to toe that line continually here as well, facing many questions about the Israel-Hamas conflict. Right. Sounds like he feels like there won't be an end there unless and, and, and until there's a, a two-state solution. Uh, going back to, to China and the U.S. here for a moment, did he suggest what's next? Well, look, I think he's saying these two countries are locked in for a long time into competition, but as of now, these countries are agreeing to responsibly manage that competition. But this doesn't resolve the long-standing issues on South China Sea, which was not brought up today, around Taiwan. Around Taiwan, he didn't say very much. He merely said that the U.S. reaffirms that they're committed to the status quo. I don't believe he said that. He reaffirmed that the U.S. does not support Taiwan independence. This is going to be a really big flashpoint, and we did not really hear the president elaborate too much on that area. There's still a lot of room for disagreement in that spot. But really, the critical point here is that at the highest level, these two leaders are now able to engage. And in a system in China where so much power is centralized around Xi Jinping, not distributed across the system, around Xi Jinping himself, it is critical that President Biden is able to have that communication link. And, and Selena, just want to ask, you may have been setting up for, for your shot to, to talk with us tonight, and so you may have missed it, but there was a moment where the president had moved away from the podium. He had suggested, basically, by his body language, that he was finished taking questions. But then he still took a few more. And then he, he was saying, and it was unclear for, for me here to, to hear, it sounded like he was saying that someone was a dictator. Was he talking about Xi Jinping uh, being a dictator? Can you elaborate if you did hear that response and what the question was there? Yeah, Lindsay, we were all trying to shout questions after he took his, you know, pre-list of questions, uh, pre-list of, of press people he was going to ask. And he did take a question asking, you know, do you still believe that Xi Jinping is a dictator? And he basically said, yes, well, he is a dictator. He basically was summarizing that this is a leader who operates the country, rules the country in a certain way. He is a dictator. This is a phrase we've heard President Biden use before. And that underscores the deep ideological differences between these leaders. 
since Xi Jinping has turned the country more centralized, has increased the power of the Communist power Party in every facet of society. Meanwhile, President Biden has emphasized over and over again about how America needs to uphold democracies against autocracies. And Xi Jinping is seen as trying to reshape the global order to benefit China's rise and to provide an alternative model to other countries for development and growth, an alternative model that is in contrast and counter to the way America believes other countries should be operating. Selena Wang for us. Selena, thank you so much. I want to go back over to Karen Travers now, uh, who joins us also from, from San Francisco. And Karen, uh, these are two of the biggest global leaders. Uh, what does the status of this relationship mean in the long term? Yeah, I think, you know, the president there talking extensively about the relationship that he and China's president Xi have. And I think that's important when you talk about the two countries as superpowers and what that means for the world. We heard the president say this over the course of today and in the lead up to today's summit, that the world expects the U.S. and China to manage competition responsibly, that the world expects these two countries to work together to solve global problems. And that doesn't mean they're going to agree on everything, but that there are expectations because of the stature and prominence of the United States and China. And Lindsay, I think it was very notable. We had the expectation coming into today that the president had that priority of reestablishing, restoring military to military communications. He did announce that in his opening remarks, said that was something that was very big. And he thinks it's going to go a long way toward maintaining better ties between the two countries and preventing mistakes from being made. But he also talked about the relationship between he and President Xi. He said at the end of their conversation, it came up, do I trust you? And he said there's that phrase, trust but verify. But he did seem to suggest that the lines of communication, not just between senior military officials, the Pentagon and their counterparts in China, but that he and President Xi now have a different relationship than maybe they've had over the past year. Because they haven't had any contact since their meeting in Bali just over a year ago. This is their first face-to-face -face meeting since then, but they actually haven't even had phone conversations. And he made the point of saying tonight that if the phone rings, the other will answer it at that high leader level, as Selena Wang was noting. That's a very significant deal. And, and just to kind of underscore, I think, the emphasis